So due to having a family that don't celebrate Christmas, due to religious reasons, I often spend Christmas with my girlfriend and her family. In my girlfriend's room at the top of her wardrobe is a music box which was a gift from her mother from a Christmas years ago, I believe. It's just a little wind up music box that you twist and it plays We Wish You a Merry Christmas. Anyway, we'd all done the standard opening of the presents, pulled some crackers, said Merry Christmas, etc. Then me and the girlfriend and her mom went upstairs to put the presents somewhere out of the way. My girlfriend's mom was talking about how her own mother, who died a few years ago, and how she loved Christmas and wished she could still be there with them all. Straight after that, this music box starts going off on top of the wardrobe, way too high for anyone to have reached and turned, and nobody had even been near that part of the room. Also interestingly, my girlfriend's room was previously her grandmother's room, my girlfriend only moved into the room after the death of her grandmother. My girlfriend's mother believes it to be a message from her own mother, letting them all know she's still with them. We're not sure, but it was interesting timing nonetheless, and I've no idea how it would have been set off otherwise. The only reason I believe ghosts exist is because I experienced an EVP on accident once when I was 15 years old. I was recording a 1v1 basketball game with my brother and I in our driveway. Watched the video a couple times and realised a little halfway through the video a voice said, What you doing Ian? And then laughs in an inhuman way. A sort of cross between a ghoul and cartoon character, hard to explain. I remember showing my sister and brother-in-law they said, Oh dude you're done for, and laughed. My mother, who doesn't really believe in ghosts, was trying to, her hardest not to hear it, and when she finally heard it, she said I did it to trick her. My friends straight up didn't know how to react. They don't believe in ghosts. Nobody else was home that day but my mom, me and my brother. My brother and I were playing basketball, and my mom isn't really one to play tricks or mimic spirits. She's straightforward and religious. There's something very, very unsettling about a spirit saying your actual name. It knows me. It didn't say something generic or random like hello or stay away. It literally said my name. That has to mean it's been around for a while. It makes my skin crawl to think something has been watching me without me knowing for knows how long. Growing up, I never experienced anything paranormal. Why and how would something say my name on a random video like that? Broad daylight, unprovoked. Where did it come from? Me and a couple of my friends decided to go out and eat dinner together to celebrate the end of term one. I'm from Australia. My buddy wanted to use the bathroom and asked if I could come in case anything happened. I said sure and we went outside of the restaurant to the bathroom. I waited outside while he went in to do his business. I was standing there waiting for what seemed like a while so I decided to go inside the bathroom and see what was the hold up. However when I went in the bathroom was completely empty. There was nobody in sight. I went and checked all the stalls and urinals. There's one stall and three urinals in that bathroom and there was nobody to be seen. I thought that maybe he had somehow gone out without letting me know. So I decided to call him and ask him why he did that. He didn't pick up. I began walking back to the restaurant. Then I looked back and saw him exiting the bathroom. I was so confused and asked him how he pulled it off. He was very confused about what I was talking about and said I must have been tripping. We proceeded to have a long discussion and he insisted he was peeing in the urinal and that I must have gone into the women's bathroom. I denied this and said it definitely went past urinals and went into the men's bathroom. We went back to the restaurants and my buddy told everyone I must have been doing drugs and about what just happened. There was no way he or I could have been in the women's bathroom as I could hear women chatting in there and if either of us went in, we would have been found out and kicked out. There are no hiding spots in the bathroom. I literally have no clue what happened. It was July 19th, 2016. I remember the date because we had our annual Christmas in July at my in-laws. 
and it was a crazy full moon. We had left to head home. We took the back way. We live in a somewhat rural area, so the back way is very dark. No traffic at that time of night, and the speed limit is 60 kilometers an hour. As we're driving along, and about five minutes from home, out of the corner of my eye towards the forest on the passenger side, I catch a glimpse of something moving fast. The moment my foot hits the brake, my wife's hand grabs my leg, getting goosebumps as I tight this. It was such a crazy experience. We come to a screeching halt in the road, and whatever it was stopped dead in front of us. It cocked its head to look at us. We both at the same time said, do you see that? It was huge. Best guess, seven foot tall, it had yellow eyes that glowed from the headlights, and it was muscular and skinny at the same time. The most memorable feature though were its legs. It 100% looked like a dog walking upright with the cocked angle in its leg. No sooner did it stop and glare at us, did it continue to bolt across the road and vanish into the forest on my driver's side. The only way we've ever been able to describe it was werewolf-like. And like I said, my wife and I both agreed. If we had not both witnessed it, I'd have called myself crazy and never mentioned it. But we both saw it. No question about it. Ghost? Werewolf? No idea, but whatever it was was huge, mean-looking, and fast. Me and my sister were now in our room playing, and my parents were in the TV room. Father was watching TV, and Mom was in the kitchen area. It was fine when, suddenly, my sister saw a white, translucent being with a beard and a grin on his face leaving our bathroom, which was inside our room, and moving to the TV lounge. My sister called me as I was facing backwards to the bathroom. I didn't clearly see the whole figure, just a white piece of clothing at the brink of our door, so I didn't completely believe her. After five or ten minutes, my father started choking very badly, and the creature returned to our room. This time I left the room earlier, but my sister was there. The creature this time made very evil loud laughter that I heard, and my sister then ran out of the room after hearing that. My father, after this laughter, after choking badly, fainted, and mom was outside calling the ambulance on the phone. It's been years. Everything's fine now. My parents are still unaware of any creature or a sound, but if it was only me or my sister alone, I could call it imagination. But we both at different places heard it and saw it, although I saw just a part of the creature's clothes. We changed our room after that and never used the bathroom. I did use it sometimes in daylight, but nothing happened. After we left home, the room and bathroom were not in use, just during monthly cleaning. One day, my mother told us that while they opened the room, there were hundreds of lizards on the walls. So many that the wall was barely visible and all in the blink of an eye rushed in a small hole outside like there was nothing before. This happened years ago, but I still remember that night. My bed was in the space next to my door. The hallway light was on at this point as I wasn't comfortable sleeping in the dark, as I was still fairly young. So the room wasn't as dark to the point it was pitch black, but it was only as bright as the hallway light would go. I was sleeping on my side, back facing my room and front facing the wall. I remember being in a deep sleep, honestly, a peaceful one at that. I heard whispering. I remember I couldn't understand what was being said. like. They were all talking in tongues or a whole different language. When I was younger, I wasn't bilingual at all, so I really couldn't have known if it was a different language. It was like it woke me up immediately. I remember my eyes being forced open by shock. Not the kind of shock where someone throws you a surprise birthday party or something you weren't expecting. It was that shock that makes your stomach hurt. I knew someone was on top of me because I could see their outline. I didn't dare to move. I was just so scared. At one point, they stopped speaking and slowly started to move to the side of my room. My eyes were stuck to where that thing used to be, and I remember having to talk myself up, trying to gain just one bit of courage to look. I eventually did look, but as you could guess, nothing was there. I don't remember much about what happened afterwards. 
I just know that I eventually fell asleep. I haven't experienced something so terrifying since then. Every time I talk about it, being reminded of that dreadful feeling. I was about eight when this happened. Me and my parents were living in a nice two bedroom house with a full furnished basement. My dad would be down there often, which is why one day I went down there. One of the lights was on so I could see half of the basement. But my dad wasn't there. But there was another man though. I remember him clearly, balding, round glasses, soft face. I'd never seen him before, but I was afraid of him. He didn't speak at all. He just stood in front of me, looking at me. It was a weird feeling, but I made my way back up to the stairs and didn't tell anyone for a few years. I told my grandmother for the first time, explain the man and how he was just standing there. She was more surprised than I thought she would be, considering that I assumed it was just my imagination. She asked me to describe him, and she was even more surprised when I did, but not entirely scared. She told me that I described my uncle perfectly, a man who I had never seen a picture of before. He was my grandfather's brother, making him technically my granduncle, who died when my dad was around 13, meaning that I had never had the chance to meet him since I was over 10 years yet to come. My grandmother thinks that my uncle just wanted to meet me since he never got a chance to while he was still alive. Another thing I remember is my dad always talking to himself while he was in the basement, a habit he still has and that I picked up on heavily. I wonder if my dad ever saw or spoke to his uncle down there while we still lived in that house. This was my only encounter with my uncle or a ghost in general. Mine was when I was 16 years old, March 18th. I'm 44 now. I was asleep in my bed in the dark. Suddenly, I woke up because someone called me. Immediately, I recognised my grandmother. I couldn't see anything in the darkness, but I knew it was her. She said she loved me and she had died. She had to leave. Suddenly, I started crying. I got up, stumbled around until I reached the door and opened it. It was daybreak, with a very faint glow in the lightening of the hallway that the door opened to. I sat down on the pavement of the hallway, crying for what felt like forever. In truth, it was less than 20 minutes. The phone started to ring. My sister got up, walked by me, looked at me and said, Why the heck are you crying? Then ignored me and went to answer the phone. I heard, I will go call her now. My sister enters my parents' bedroom, which is right in front of me in the hallway, and mom comes out. She looks at me with surprise, doesn't say a word and goes to the telephone, which is ahead in the entry area at the end of the hallway. I hear, when and how did it happen? At this point, everyone is up and about. Everyone saw me sitting there crying on the floor. I heard mom saying her mom, my grandma, died 20 minutes prior and her aunt had just called to give the news. At this point, everyone knows I knew she passed before the phone call, but no one says a thing. Everyone swipes it under the rug, acting as if nothing happened to me. I'm crying for hours. No one will believe what I say, even though they all witnessed it as it happened. I always knew that my little Leia was different. She was always knew how people felt and what they were trying to say without them saying anything. She's been in touch with the energy of everything around her for so long that after a while, I just grew used to it. But then one day, her father passed away. She was only four at the time and she was sleeping when I got the news, so I didn't tell her anything. I didn't even say anything until the week was done so that my oldest had a weekend to think before going back to school. So for days, I didn't say a thing. Even then, all my girls that were too small to understand death, I just said he got into an accident. The day of his funeral, my daughter gave me a drawing to give to her father, since she knew I was going to see him somehow. I said, of course, I'll be back after seeing Papa, 
We're in a bilingual family. And she, uh, I know. Then she says how much pain he was in. I was shocked and asked what she meant. She completely described all the damage his body got. He died in a skidoo accident. She said how his tibia broke, his back broke, he smashed his head. His glasses exploded in his face. His lips were bleeding and it was coughing up blood. There could be more, but that's what I remember. I was shocked and said I don't think it was that bad. Months later, I got the coroner's report and she was dead. Every little detail she got right. I started to cry. Did my daughter see what happened? Did her father visit her? How could this four-year-old know so much? Was someone in her body? Still to this day, this story gives me the creeps. And I'll never forget that day when she was able to say everything with a smile on her face. It was back in 2008-9, my great-grandmother GGM passed away. Fortunately, I had the chance to see her one last time, the week before she died and they told me that she left us with a smile. With that, I knew that seeing me was really delightful for her. So it was early in the morning, getting ready to go to the nurse before going to school with my little sister. We're both sitting at the back of the car, still a little sleepy. While I was looking outside the window, I saw a humanoid figure forming. I immediately recognized this face. It was my late GGM, wearing the same flowery purple blouse I've always seen her with, both hands on her stomach, looking at me and saying something. Today, I still don't know what she wanted to tell me. When it happened, I thought I was the only one who saw this. I told my mother about this the next day. She almost told me I was kind of crazy until my sister also told me she had seen the apparition. I was kind of disturbed by hearing that. That was thrilling and frightful at the same time. The only person who believed us without saying we were crazy was our grandmother, actually the GGM's daughter, because she was also seeing her in her dreams, in her prayers, and she kept talking to her for maybe five years or more until one night, my GGM didn't visit my grandmother. More recently, this didn't happen to me, but my sister last year. She was sleeping at one of her friend's places, and she had a sleep paralysis. Not really sleep paralysis, it was really strange. And during that, she was wide awake. She could walk and all but not talk. Trying to wake up one of her friends, she scratched him and she also saw our GGM saying something to her, but still, we don't know what. When I lived in the apartments, at a young age, I would always have nightmares. This is normal for all kids, of course, for them to be so afraid that they have to cover their heads in bed, etc. Unless the mass population lol, I would have these strange feelings and would be compelled to run outside as far as I could from the house. Obviously, they were maybe 10 years ago, so my memory of why I did this is still foggy. There was a time I ran to my friend's apartment building some blocks away, and I banged on the door and his dad answered. And I remember telling him someone was out to get me. Then he simply tells me to go home, so I do. As if the trance broke, I went home still slightly shaken, but I was perfectly fine and slept well. So this happens so frequently, I remember my dad locking my bedroom door from the outside with rope, so I wouldn't run away again. There was a time he caught me sleepwalking around the house at 11 p.m., but the rope didn't really help much. On a particular night, I had this insane feeling of fear and desire to get out of my room. I was so much in fear that I forcibly opened the door to my room, the rope snapped, and I ran outside. Everything after this went fuzzy, and I then remember it being around 6 or 7am, and I was a couple blocks away from my apartment home. I remember just walking around, and I was legit wondering why I was walking this far away, and how I stayed up the whole night. I walked back home and just in time to see my mom at the door. She thought I came out to help her with the groceries, so I never really told her the truth. Not long after that, the nightmare stopped. I ended up moving farther south of Jersey, but the sleepwalking and the sleep talking never stopped till this day.
I'm what I consider a very regular man in my early 30s. I have a stable job, I'm in a solid and happy relationship, I enjoy traveling and eating out, gaming, hiking, and culture. But my entire life, I've experienced something which I have called life bleeding. I've really struggled to find anything similar online, so decided to put the sensation out into the open world to see if anyone else has experienced something similar. It's a very broad yet subtle sense of memory and emotion, so apologies in advance if there's not much to go off. Every now and then, it could be minutes apart, weeks, months, or maybe even years, I get this sensation out of nowhere that I'm living another life. This life could be happening parallel to mine or in the past, but I've never had the sensation of anything happening in the future. It's also never the same life I'm feeling when it happens. The feeling itself is super hazy. I'm fully aware and in control of everything I'm doing in the present as myself. But my mind and memories for a brief moment open up. The most similar sensation I can describe it to is deja vu. But it's just I'm experiencing something from a different place, perspective, and from a different being. That's neither happening now or has happened. The events themselves are mostly mundane. It could be someone driving somewhere, eating a meal, or having a conversation. But I have had occasions where I've experienced traumas, such as bereavements or physical harm. I want to clarify that this isn't just me thinking and imagining these things. At least I don't feel I am. It always feels so distant in my mind, and it's a struggle to bring it into closer view. It's just something I've had with me for as long as I can remember, where for a second or two, my life is bleeding into someone else's and vice versa. I want to preface this by saying the house itself is only about 15 years old. I'm not very versed on haunting, so I don't know if it could be the area beforehand that was haunted, or a spirit being attached to the place. I digress. I'll list all that I can remember. Probably the most significant was my father hearing the voice of his deceased friend shout up to him from downstairs. He said he heard him clear as day and walked down expecting to see him. This happened not long after we moved in, 15 years ago. He also heard people generally speaking in the other room. He, my sister and I have all heard footsteps upstairs that sounds like kids ones, light and running around. My siblings sometimes visit, so you would think it was them if they were here, but I live alone most of the time. I felt someone tap my shoulder while I was eating, turned around to expect to see someone, and then realised I'm still alone in the house. I heard what sounded like a whisper, screaming in my ear once, as I was half asleep in the morning. I thought this could have just been high-pitched wind, but even last night I heard what sounded like a woman's voice in my ear, before I sleep, say something unintelligible. My younger sibling says she gets bad vibes from the house and doesn't like sleeping alone when she's here. I've heard things move in the kitchen. Recently, my father walked through the front door expecting mail and there was nothing. He said he heard someone slip a package through the letterbox and it hit the ground. I was woken up by a loud bang downstairs one morning. I went downstairs with a massive night watchman torch expecting someone to be there but there was nothing. This one could perhaps be down to a window being opened upstairs, but still no idea what could have caused the bang. Even this morning, I was woken up by the sound of the doorbell, but it was too early for the postman. I shrugged it off and went back to sleep. I spent August 2019 to August 2020 living in a Catholic volunteer house. While I was religious, I didn't really believe in much of the paranormal, outside of cryptids and extraterrestrials. The church was more of a social thing for me, and I was deeply drawn to the ritual of it all. I point this out to make it clear that I wasn't looking for an experience in that house. It didn't take long living there to start noticing odd things. It started off as the sound of footsteps. That was easy to write off. It was an old house, and perhaps the house was just shifting, as some people say. These footsteps became so constant that it clearly couldn't be the sounds of an old house. The footsteps were loud, the day and night, when the house was full and when there was just one person inside. I stopped denying this when the steps were obviously coming from the stairs. The clear sound of top floor windows closing and opening started, and nothing sounds like that other than just that. 
The basement door to the outside would open by itself after we knew for sure it was closed and locked, not even a minute before it suddenly opened. It was like these sounds were well thought out. They would lead me to the attic only for me to immediately hear rushing steps down the stairs on the floor below me. So often, I would be led to the basement and my attention couldn't shift from the doors to the call room. Looking at those doors filled me with an odd dread that would go away the moment I walked away. My housemates were scared and being the only male in a Catholic program put a bit of pressure on me to do something. Just a cultural expectation. I tried getting a priest out to do a blessing, but he couldn't because of COVID. A strange bummer to me given the theology. I ended up trying my best to bless the house myself with one of my housemates. That did nothing to stop any of it. I was in freshman year of high school when one of my friends asked if I wanted to go to Florida with him and his family. We went, and the first half of the day was fine at the resorts, until me and my friend went back to the condo. So a quick view of the condo. The front door was at the front left corner of the condo, and to the condo, from inside the condo, and to the right of the door was the kitchen and mine and my friend's room. In front of the kitchen and door was the living room. On the same side, my room is in the condo, but on the other end is my friend's mom's and little brother's room. Now onto the paranormal stuff. I was sitting on my bed, facing the door, looking into the living room. I saw a male, teen or early twenties, in red swim trunks. I remember he was white and had short blonde hair. He walked from the kitchen area to my friend's mom's room. I was shocked, but kind of felt fun seeing a ghost. Later that night before bed, me and my friend witnessed some stuff get dragged. A pair of earbuds was on the centre of the drawer by my bed, and a pillow got pushed from the centre of my friend's bed onto the floor. The next morning, we woke up to every drawer in my room and the bathroom, inside my room, forgot to mention that, and in the kitchen, was pulled open, including the bathroom door, the closet door, and our room door, which was locked. Later that night, or the night after, my friend went to ask his mum a question in her room, and when he walked by, the couch he saw a black, human-shaped lump on the couch. He thought it was his brother, so he kept walking. When he went into his mom's room, he found out his brother was taking a shower in her bathroom. He was freaked out for 30 or so minutes and wouldn't tell me what he saw, but he told me after a while. I don't remember anything else happening after that. It was a fun ride hanging out with that ghost. I have a bunch of other paranormal stories that are as wild as that one. As an avid horror fan, across all media and otherwise, I've always been interested in the paranormal. That being said, I've also always been a huge sceptic. I poke holes in other stories all the time. I always have. I've just never been on that side of the fence. I swear by science and logic and whatever, but earlier something fairly small happened that completely rocked me. I woke up at around 1.40am and went to the loo about 10-15 minutes later. At which point I was already properly awake because I'd let my dogs out into the garden and been on my phone for a little while. My bedroom is at the bottom of my stairs, my loo is at the top. Anyway, when I came back downstairs and into my room, I checked my door so my dogs didn't get out of my room when I went back to sleep and sat down. Not 20 seconds later, I hear a diamond coming from the stairs. This isn't uncommon in my house since five people live here so someone is always up to use the loo or get a drink or whatever. But when it got to the bottom of the stairs, my door opened and the hallway was empty and the lights were still off. I went out to lock and everyone's bedroom doors were shut and no one was up and about. Someone mentioned my stairs creaking on their own because yes, there would, but I've lived in this house for nearly a decade. They creak on their own all the time nowadays but anyone with old wooden stairs would probably know the difference between that and someone literally walking down them. My door, when shut, literally can't be opened on its own because of the type of latch it is or whatever it's called. I know no one here has any reason to believe me, but I was hoping someone would humour me and just give me their take on it. Being a sceptic has been a big part of me for a long, long time, so I guess I'm pretty rattled by this. 
Strange stuff happens around me all the time, but I'm almost always, always able to come up with a logical explanation. I can't do this one. So this just happened today, so it's super fresh. A little long also. A little background, I've had paranormal experiences before that were super scary. It always occurs when I'm half asleep, or even dead asleep at 3am. I've heard whispers in another language, and the next day was the worst day of my life. Maybe I'll tell the bad experiences in another post. So I learned in the past few years that these things are real. First hand experience. Coming to today, I moved to a new country, and ever since I moved to this home, I have weird dreams every day. I don't usually dream much, and I know it's in this home only, because last week I was on vacation in another place, and had zero dreams. But it never felt evil here. It just felt weird. So today, I had a major interview, which I'd been preparing for for a week. I'd set an alarm, and I'm that type of person who needs a single alarm to wake up. My interview was at 11am, alarm was at 9am. I snoozed unfortunately, but once I did that, I was still remembering my preparation and answers for the interview, while resting my eyes when I was half asleep. This is when I feel a distinct someone poking my shoulder from behind to wake me up. Twice. It was like poke, two second gap, poke. My eyes immediately open, and I see I'm laying facing my husband, so the wall is behind me. I could still feel a little pressure on where it poked. I started praying because at first, I thought it's another bad entity like the last couple of times. My heart is exploding and I'm praying, but unlike last time, I felt the vibes were not negative. So I turned around and grabbed my phone to see the time. It was 10.30 a.m. and the ghost woke me up for the interview. I just thanked him and told him to please don't help or come in front of me because I'm scared of this stuff. Some say that while dreaming, we can travel without any time and space limitations, and we can happen to share a peculiar experience with someone with whom we have a strong and close connection, meeting them while being asleep. This is what happened to my mother and I. We always had a special relationship as we always talked about everything. I can say that she probably transmitted me her gift being able to have different perceptions related to the paranormal world. That's why we happened to meet in a dream more than once. And it was very scary. The first time it happened, it was nothing scary. We were just at the beach, so I'm not gonna explain more. The second time though, we were in our living room. It looked like a normal dream at first as we were just chatting about unimportant matters. But then I said something out loud which really stuck out. We must pay attention to children's ghosts. I remember seeing a woman's face in my dream after this sentence, right before waking up. During breakfast, I always tell her about what I dream, as it's always something scary or weird anyways. And while I started narrating, her facial expression changed a little bit after I started. She said that she had the same dream, chatting with me in the living room, but instead of hearing my weird and creepy phrase, she saw the woman's face and the one of a child from the 1930s. He had straight hair, set with a row to the side, and he didn't look mean. He just had the typical facial features and clothing of children of those years. She also felt a little pressure on her, right before some sort of grab on the arm, but she was still sleepy, so she brushed it off and fell back to sleep. While talking to each other about the experience, we felt as if someone was watching us, so we no longer brought it up. Thinking about it though, still haunts me. This happened when I was approximately nine years old. I was at my grandmother's house along with her and my cousin. Just the three of us. There was no one else. I was lying down in the same room as my cousin, but we slept in separate beds. My grandmother was sleeping in her own bedroom. It was approximately midnight. For some strange reason, I couldn't fall asleep, but my cousin was already asleep. In that, 
I hear the singing of a woman in the living room. She also appeared to be wearing a white dress. I didn't see her face and only saw her partially. After a few seconds, she disappeared and the bathroom light, which was next to our room, suddenly turned on and then turned off. My cousin woke up suddenly and he told me that he listened to her too. We were in shock until we decided to leave our room to see what was happening. I went to my grandmother's room and she seemed to be completely asleep in her pyjamas and she didn't seem to have gotten up. My cousin went to check the bathroom and he said there was nothing. We also checked the living room and the kitchen and there was nothing and no one. The strangest thing of all is that this woman had the same tone of voice as my grandmother. But as I mentioned earlier, my grandmother was sleeping in her room and didn't seem to have gotten up. She also has very heavy sleep and it's extremely rare for her to get up at midnight. Also, as far as I remember, she didn't have any white dresses. For starters, she never wears dresses. My cousin and I were very, very surprised by this. We decided to go to sleep. The next morning, we didn't say anything to my grandmother, mainly so as not to scare her since she lived alone back then. However, we seriously asked if she had gotten up at midnight. She said no, that she was deeply asleep. With the passage of time, and until now, I'm currently 20 years old, I keep thinking about it. This is the only unusual experience that has happened to me, for now. There was a family of four that moved into our neighborhood. I couldn't figure out where they were originally from, but they look like Asian and Hispanic at the same time. They're very good looking people. I can't explain, but you can say they're very attractive. I've not seen them go out or talk with other people, and I think it's odd that they go out all together almost every night. The two members look like a couple, and the other two look like a mother and her teenage kid. I wasn't quite sure if the teenage kid was a boy or a girl, because they look very attractive in a way I couldn't explain. They have short, silk black hair, but not very short with pitch black eyes, and a sad body posture, like in a weak demeanor. At that time, I thought they were a bit weird. It was night, and I was practicing and running around the block, preparing for some school competition. On my way home, I saw a weird kid sitting in their front yard, and they were holding a water bottle. I said hi, and they just nodded, so I didn't try to make conversation, and I headed home. I never really talked to my family, but they stayed in our city for at least five years. Not quite sure. Then I heard from my parents that this family is moving to a different country to their, due to their jobs. I didn't ask my parents a lot about them because I guess I was too busy with teenage stuff before, but looking back, I wish I'd asked about them more. So fast forward to this day, I moved to this country. I'm not gonna disclose this for my anonymity, but I saw the kids sitting alone at my local coffee shop. Again, I'm a rational and logical guy, but when I saw them again, I got chills all over my body. Same posture, still very good looking and still young, but dressed maturely. I don't know if they remembered me, but I look older now. I don't know. Maybe this story doesn't mean anything. Maybe I'm just paranoid. But I did ask my parents about the family, and they don't remember them. So I guess this is a dead-end story. Earlier this month, I returned home after dropping my sons off at school. Except for our two cats, I was home alone. I was washing dishes in the kitchen while the cats scuttled to and fro in the living room playfully. After a moment, I realised it was curiously quiet. A strange sort of quiet, and I turned away from the kitchen and went in search for the cats. I couldn't find them. I called them and walked around the house. I went through the study towards their favourite window in the front hallway, but they weren't on the windowsill. I turned to go back into the study to see if they were in one of the shelves on the credenza and stopped short. There, in the centre of the doorway between the study and front hall, was an old, thick, heavy encyclopedia type dictionary, L through Z. I stared at it. It hadn't been there just moments before. I would have seen and or kicked it as I stepped through from the study into the front hall. 
I left her alone for the moment, stepping over it and back through the study into the living room. From here, I could now see one of the cat's tails under the sofa. This was very strange. They haven't gone under the sofa since they were small kittens. They had to struggle to get under there. I tried coaxing them out, but they wouldn't budge. I left them alone and went back to the dictionary on the floor. It hadn't been there when I stepped through the first time and, in fact, hadn't been there when I tidied up that morning before I started on the dishes. I picked it up and around the corner to the shelf in the front hallway where it belonged. The book is positively archaic and we have it because it was gifted to, to us more than 24 years ago by my parents, along with an entire set of encyclopedias. For their then future grandchildren, we lugged them around with us each time we moved. As I was mulling over how it came to be there, I heard my phone ring. It was my sister calling to tell me our cousin had a stroke and passed away. This scenario happened when I was younger, maybe eight or seven. My older brother and I shared a bedroom since we lived in a pretty small apartment at the time and it was next to a really busy road, so there was always a lot of noise. It was time for us to go to sleep since it was a school night, so I go say goodnight to my older sister and parents and head to bed. My older brother's bed was by the window, and mine was up against a wall. Since we lived next to a super busy road, the street lamp would shine through our window because our curtains were really thin. A little while goes by and I struggled to fall asleep because I could hear drunk people screaming and shouting at cars that drove past. Then all of a sudden everything goes quiet. No cars, no people, nothing. I find this odd but don't think much of it when my cat runs up to the window. Before I could question why she did, I heard the weirdest, loudest, unexplainable screech. I went to grab my cat away from the window because I didn't want whatever made that noise to see her. The noise obviously woke my brother up. We both looked out the window to see what it was. There was this weird pterodactyl looking creature sitting on top of the street lamp with its wings wide open. I look at my brother and he looks like he's about to cry. I grab him and my cats and we run to my bed and hide under the blankets since it's furthest away from the window. When we woke up the next morning, I told my older sister about what happened and she said that she heard the noise too. She looked out her window briefly and saw it fly out of view. I drew what it looked like just to make sure what she saw wasn't just a bird and she said that it looked exactly like that. We told our parents about it and they really didn't comment, comment much on it since my siblings and I have a history of telling our parents weird abnormal things. Like seeing a tall man walk up and down the stairs at night and another man standing at the edge of our beds looking at us. Let's just say... I hope I never hear or see that thing again. My parents built their house in 1974 in a very small, very old subdivision in upstate New York. Next door is a three level, three family home that was built long before theirs, sometime in the late 1800s. This past fall, my son and I were raking leaves on an unusually warm Saturday afternoon. I enjoyed telling my son about all the trees that are still up and how my friends and I used to use them as bases when playing wiffle ball or kickball back there. My parents don't have acreage, but they do have a pretty sizable backyard. While clearing an area by a tree found close to the back corner of the yard, I came across what appeared to be a small broom. It was severely rusted and seemed to literally be coming out of the tree, as the tree seems to be shedding some of its bark. It was very strange. I couldn't believe that it was there for a long time. Someone would have seen it somehow. Anyway, I picked it up and started feeling the bristles. They literally fell out as strings of dirt and just became a part of the ground at that point. We took the remnants of it inside to show my mom. She and my dad, who passed away nearly 10 years ago, used to live in that house next door when my grandparents owned it. During that time, she said that the Wheelers, a family living in the first floor of the house at the time, used to work on cars in that exact same spot before they built the house and put a fence up and so forth. We chatted for a while. 
threw the old broom away and finished raking the yard. Ever since that day, my two to three year old golden doodle literally sprints, beeline, like there's a squirrel there, back to that same exact spot as soon as we get into my mom's house, barks when she gets behind the tree, stops abruptly, wags her tail uncontrollably, and then nonchalantly strolls through the yard to find a stick, do her business, or whatever it is she feels like doing. It never happened prior to that day, and now we just laugh because it's her thing to do when we get there. When I was 10 years old, my brother and I were the last ones off the bus from school every day. We were nearing my house, which is in the Midwest countryside. Lots of cows and trees and fields, etc. Anyways, about a mile away from the house, I looked out the window and saw an orange blimp in the sky. Standard American football shaped blimp. Surprisingly, I didn't think anything of it. Because a day or so beforehand, me and a bunch of kids at recess saw a blue blimp in the sky. I watched it and thought it was cool to see a blimp this far outside of town, especially near my house. After a few seconds, the blimp shifted from a football shape to a star, literally shrunk before my eyes into a tiny shiny dot that resembled a star in the night sky. Except it wasn't a star, it was just a blimp a second ago. Not even two seconds after it shifted, it launched even further into the sky, shot down to its original height and then shot completely off into space. It was the most bizarre thing I had ever experienced. I was a quiet kid, but being the last kid on the bus besides my brother, I shouted about it. And when I got off the bus, I ran to my mother to tell her, like a crazy old man yelling end times. My mother said I was crazy, naturally, and I never told my dad because mom shut me down pretty hard and it killed my mood. Fast forward years later, shortly after I turned 22, my dad and I took a short road trip to go pick up a car he bought halfway across the state. We talked about a lot and somehow got on the topic of UFOs. He told me when he was 12 or 13, he and his brothers were playing down by a creek near their house, which by the way, his old house was only a few miles down away from our house. And they saw an orange football shaped object in the sky. I was absolutely blown away when he said that. My father's skeptical and doesn't believe in this kind of stuff ever. But when I shared my story, he paused and admitted it was very, very odd to have seen the same exact thing more than 30 years apart. I grew up from about nine years in Florida for the first part of my life living in St. Augustine and Jacksonville area. For those of you who don't know, St. Augustine is one of the oldest and most haunted cities in the USA. In particular, there are two different forts located on the main island, and on a smaller island across from each other. I cannot fully recall the history of the two forts, but they would fight on the daily, with the mainland firing cannons at the island fort and so forth. I was maybe about six to nine years of age when this happened. My parents had taken my brother and I on a day trip to tour the fort on the mainland. This fort was also a popular spot for ghost tours, telling stories about the prisoners kept underneath the fort, and how they would be brought to the outside walls to be executed and burned in a stone oven as well. I'm assuming this all happened during the early settlements of America, with colonists and whatnot. My brain can't recall the history, so don't hate on me. Common ghost appearances would be uniformed soldiers marching around at their stations and the like. The fort never employed real life actors to dress up or anything, so if you saw a uniformed period styled person, it was likely a ghost. The day we went to the fort to tour, it was like any other, with plenty of visitors meandering inside and outside the walls. Since it was a relatively small, my parents let my brother and I roam inside on our own. I had gone to the centre of the fort and noticed four to five men in period uniforms on the right staircase hauling a whole cannon up the stairs like it was nothing. Nobody around me seemed to take notice of these men doing this, and I stared in utter disbelief that they suddenly appeared and began to drag a cannon upstairs to the ramparts. Not a minute later, I heard a loud cannon boom and jumped. I went running to my mother to ask her if she, she heard the cannon as well. 
to which she replied that she heard nothing. Nobody saw anything or heard any noise except me, in the middle of the day no less. On December 25th, 2021, my mom entered the stage of life called active dying. Her skin was cold, her breathing laboured, it reminded me of a fish out of water, and she was completely unresponsive. My family and I spent our last hours with her alive. My father called the hospice to bring an oxygen machine, and we went to bed around 1am. During that time we spent in the living room, these walkie-talkies started going off as if someone pressed buttons on the other line. No speaking, just the static sound. My dad brought them out weeks prior so that my mom could use them if she needed him at night, since she slept in the living room and my dad was sleeping in their bedroom. Anyways, the walkie-talkies were making these noises randomly in the middle of the night, but I won't chalk it up to being paranormal, even if it didn't make sense they would go off at the time. The creepy thing happens a few days later. My dad is going through my mom's phone to tell people who were texting her what had happened and stuff like that. He comes across a call to my brother made at 1.25am on the 26th, right after we'd gone to sleep. She was in an unresponsive state. She couldn't have called anyone. We don't think she even had a phone near her while she was dying. It was probably in her purse since she had, we had just driven home from a trip. To do that, she'd have to get up to find her phone, when she could hardly breathe, let alone walk, and do it quietly enough to not wake up my dad who was sleeping on the couch. I doubt that my dad could have slept through her doing that since he would have just gone to sleep. He hadn't been sleeping well for that week because any noise she would make, he would get up to make sure she was fine. I doubt that night it would have been any different. Also, it would make sense that if she were to call anyone, it would be my brother since my phone is broken and my sister doesn't use hers. So either she got up while she was dying and made a phone call to my brother, or she was already dead when she made it. Either situation freaks me out when I think about it. Aside from wondering how this happened, I also wonder what would happen if my brother had answered the call. After a long car trip at night, I and two other friends decided to spend the night at my grandmother and grandfather's house because it was around 2am and we couldn't drive anymore. Since neither my grandmother or grandfather were home, we thought it fit perfectly and because it was halfway to our destination. For some reason, we all felt unusually happy during the whole evening. Everything felt easy and good. At that time in my life, it was unusual for me to feel good because it was a hard time in my life. I had very destructive life patterns marked by a criminal lifestyle. Now to the event. It was a crystal clear Swedish winter night with a beautiful night sky. So we decided to sit on their large terrace for a while and talk and look out over the big lake. After a while into the conversation, our eyes were drawn to the sky because as the sky began to change color to a brighter blue color, the sky became brighter and brighter in a very beautiful shade. Finally, an outline of a church window came up in the sky with an extremely beautiful blue harmonious color. The most beautiful color I've seen in my entire life. Now to the big one. At the point in the sky where the contour of a church window was located, there was a large contour of an angel that flew past in the church window itself. The figure in the window seemed to be wearing some kind of dress and it was huge. Me and my two friends froze and our body hair stood straight up. After we observed the phenomenon, we felt extreme love, happiness, euphoria and harmony. None of us really understood what was happening, but we felt extremely happy. Until we buzzed a few hours later, around 3.30am. It was the sickest thing I've been through in my 22 year long life. I hope someone else gets to experience what I did. I've become 100% more religious after the event. Today, I'm free from the destructive pattern of my life, and I feel that this was the beginning of brighter times for me. Today, I'm a person who wants to help others. Recently, we bought a home that was built a few years ago, and it's two stories. We're the second occupants. 
The original owners divorced and sold it to us. At least, that's what we were told. Nearly every day when I'm in the office, I can hear loud, and I mean loud, footsteps on the second floor. My son's room is directly above my office, and that's generally where we hear these footsteps. Though randomly, we hear footsteps upstairs in other sections, like when we're in the kitchen or living room. Every time, it freaks me and my wife out, and I run upstairs to see what's going on, but there's never anyone upstairs. I've even explored all of our attic spaces multiple times, just to see if we had a squatter. There's no evidence anyone is secretly living in the attic. I've checked more times than I care to admit. I thought it was our son when he was taking naps, like maybe running around. However, he's a young toddler, still in a bed he cannot get out of. I've tested him and it multiple times. He sleeps with a full sleep cover, so if he could get out of the bed, it's completely covered. And any time he's up there, I run up to catch him, but he's always still asleep. We have old school baby monitors, and they too pick up the footsteps. Now, if this were not crazy enough, since we've moved in, multiple items have come up missing or moved. For example, we finished up a wine bottle one night, and when we woke up in the morning, it was gone. And when I say gone, I mean we checked every inch, inside, outside, and in all the trash containers. It was gone. Randomly, items will come up missing and show up in places we never put them. Some of this is likely attributable to our toddler, but most of the time, items disappear and reappear in places he physically couldn't reach. We're at a loss. Maybe we're haunted, or maybe we live at a nexus point. Either way, we're looking to sell soon, because living in the twilight zone is annoying. Back when I was a kid, I had an imaginary friend named Charlie. From what I remember, Charlie was around from the time I was about four years old up until I was nine, when my family moved to a different house. So I spent five years talking and playing with Charlie. My parents encouraged it because I didn't have any real friends or siblings, and it wasn't uncommon for a lonely kid to create an imaginary friend to play with. I was a loner, and still very much am today. Charlie told me he used to live in my house before my family moved in. I believed him because we often played hide and seek and he knew all of the best hiding spots. He knew things about the house that even I didn't know at the time. A couple of times I asked him where his parents were and why they didn't live in the house with him and he never gave me an answer. After a year or so, he started asking me to do strange things like stealing change from my mom's purse or hiding my dad's car keys so he would be late to work. Random, mischievous stuff like that. When I refused, his requests became much more sinister, telling me to push my mom down the stairs, start a fire in my parents' bedroom, etc. Of course, I again refused. Charlie became more cold, and instead of wanting to play, he only suggested doing things to hurt me or my parents. I was scared of him. I never told my parents what he said, only that I didn't want to play with him anymore. When we moved out of that house... I didn't bring Charlie with me. I forgot about him for many years, until a few days ago when my mother asked me if I remembered having an imaginary friend growing up. That's when all of this started to come back to me. I did some research into the history of my old house and found that there was indeed a young boy named Charlie whose family lived in the house about 15 years before mine and apparently died at a young age. But I couldn't find any info as to how or where he died. Is it a coincidence that my creepy imaginary friend and the kid who died in my house shared the same name? Why was he telling me to hurt my parents? Did I imagine him or was he a ghost? I never know for sure, but feel free to share your opinions. Back in 2013-14, I lived in a house with three other roommates. In this house I can recount dozens of seemingly paranormal experiences, ranging from scary to odd to almost normal. But this one really stands out to me the most because I've never been able to figure it out. One night, I was in bed with my boyfriend in my room. We went to sleep early-ish because we both had work in the morning. We were both asleep, but suddenly, not sure of the time, 
My boyfriend woke up gasping and freaked out. He's almost yelling, there was a face right there. A face. It was getting in my face. I'd never seen him so terrified. He was always such a relaxed guy. He was sitting up in bed, sweating and breathing hard. I figured he just experienced sleep paralysis. It would have been his first. I tried to calm him down and he eventually went back to sleep. I rolled over in bed and was trying to get back to sleep. But I'm the type of person who can't just go back to sleep after waking up. As I'm laying there, I start hearing tapping in threes around the room. The first two times, I thought that the tapping was just the house settling. But the tapping in threes would change locations and pitch every time. It would be above the bed on the ceiling and go tap tap tap. Then it would be next to my head on the wall. Bed was next to the wall. Tap tap tap. Then it would be by the boar. Tap tap tap. Then on the other wall. Tap tap tap. Then on the floor. Tap tap tap. This went on for a while, but I'm not sure how long. It felt like hours to me. I was honestly so scared that I didn't open my eyes or even move. I just stayed frozen under my blanket. The next thing I knew, it was morning. I asked my boyfriend if he remembered the nightmare and he said yes. I don't remember if I asked him about the tapping. The first thing I tried to explain it with was some sort of pest, like a rat or bug. But I don't understand how it could travel so fast or make such strong taps. And we never had any pests in the house, to my knowledge. Just to start off, yeah, I believe in the paranormal and all that. I also practice craft stuff. So it's fairly well a part of my life. Not to mention that I've dealt with more than my share. As of recently, I moved states to live with my family in an attempt to disconnect from the other side of my family and to basically start a new page in my book. The house I moved into has been in the family for over 40 years and a few years back my great grandmother passed. It was sad and I missed her very much. However, I'm still unsettled about seeing her trying to get into her old room. M now my room. She hates doors and I had to put one up for privacy deals. While I was rearranging and taking some old things out of my room, I moved a brass photo frame thing that holds the Last Supper, the one with Jesus and his crew. Not Christian, please remember, no disrespect to those that are. I had sat on the floor to be hung up elsewhere in my room. I think it looks cool and like Da Vinci. It was chilling while I was putting books on a shelf and whatnot around my room when I heard loud thumping from the living room. That would be an issue if there was someone else in the house, even my cats, but it was just me. I firmly believe that was my great grandma telling me to put it back up. I did. Two to three months after I moved in, her husband, my great grandpa, passed also. They both still kind of roam the halls here and make sure things are still in check, which is fine and all. I'm just still getting used to seeing them so often. This isn't just the only few things that happen here though. The past three-ish months there's been a figure that wasn't invited into the house that seems to try and spook me and my boyfriend as much as possible, going as far as scratching me a few times. There hasn't been a night since my boyfriend moved in with me that we've gotten a full night of sleep because of this thing. I know it upsets the great grandparents to a degree, as well as really goofs with the energy of the rest of the house. I've tried cleansing, removing, even going to someone with way more experience than me for advice. I'm a 21 year old with no kids. It's important to know the story. So when I went with my dog for a walk this morning and was about to cross the street, when I noticed a girl about my age staring at me from the other street parallel to the one I was on, I first didn't think a lot about it and I kept going. Then I saw how she crossed the street to come to the one I was walking on while still staring at me. We crossed ways and when he was closer, I could see her expression and it was something like pity and nostalgia. It felt like she knew me from somewhere. Well, we crossed paths, but of course I didn't stop to stare at her back. So I kept going. Then I turned to look at her once more and she was still standing on the same spot I walked past her five seconds ago. 
and she was looking straight in my face with the same expression of pity. I continued walking and after a few seconds, I turned again and she was still there staring at me with the exact same expression as the last time I turned back to look at her before I continued my walk with the dog. I don't know why or how, but a thought came directly into my mind without any previous context. In my head, I was convinced that girl was my daughter from the future and she was looking at me that way because I died and she was missing me. The whole day, I'm still really freaked out by this experience and I thought about it. Look, my dad died when I was seven and the night of his death, my mom dreamed he came into her dream and talked to her. He said he's okay and that she doesn't have to be worried about him. What if in my daughter's timeline I died and this moment was me in her dream seeing her for like the last time, like my father saw my mother for the last time in her dream? My father seemed to recognise my mother in the dream and somehow I had that instant thought without previous context that that girl was my daughter. I recognised her instantly. I get shivers down my spine when I'm writing this. Like I said, I never had to do such things. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I've never believed in ghosts, but I have no explanation for this. Maybe I'm just crazy. About three years ago, my beautiful mom passed away. When she did, I got not only her ashes, but my dad's and my mom's dad's as well. Also last year, my mother-in-law, plus sister-in-law and two kids, moved in with me and brought the ashes of my father-in-law. Now they're all caught up on why I have so many dead people in my house. For the past year, once every month or two, I've woken up to something grabbing my toes. At first I would jump up and go to the end of the bed, thinking it was my daughter because who else would do it? But no one else would be there. After a few times of this happening, I decided that maybe it was my mom saying hello because she used to wake me up by grabbing my toes that way. So I tried not to freak out when it happened. Then, maybe two months ago, I was in the kitchen kind of late at night. I guess someone left the cupboard open, because it was open. And I kid you not, a cup came out of my cupboard and nearly hit me. It just flew out. It landed next to my foot. When I told my family what had happened, my sister-in-law laughed almost evil-like and said she thinks it was her dad messing with me because the cup was covered in pictures of butterflies. And any time they feel they got a message from him, it had to do with butterflies. So okay, my father-in-law doesn't like me. Then last night, I was laying with my daughter because even though she's 10 years old, I still put her to bed at night. And I dozed off for an hour or two. Then I just woke up for no apparent reason. Then, the covers pulled up my leg crazy fast and something grabbed a hold of my foot. I was wide awake and not just felt, but saw the covers move. I jumped up so fast, I don't even know how I got my arm out from under my daughter's head. The thing or ghost or whatever grabbed my foot wasn't cold like I would think a ghost might be though. It was just like room temperature. What's going on? That doesn't happen to any of the other six people in my house, just me. Why? Is it my mom grabbing my toes and my foot? My father-in-law throwing a cup at me? Or could it be something else altogether? And should I be scared? I live with my parents and older brother. I get up for the day around 12 or 1am every day. No one else gets up until around 7am at the earliest, usually later. Since no one else is up, I'm very careful about being quiet and turning lights off. To the point that I double and triple check that yes, I physically flipped the switch. The light went off, no more light. This occurs in almost every room, but mainly our small hallway bathroom. I go in, turn the light off, make damn sure it's off. No other light is on in the house either. I'll walk back out less than five minutes later. The bathroom light is on. Every morning, usually multiple times. Same deal with pictures either swinging or falling off the wall. No one is ever even awake besides me and I'm nowhere near the pictures. Same with dishes in our drying rack. My house is small, but I'll be standing in my living room roughly 12 feet away from the dish rack and it just rattles super loud. Not a little bit. 
I'm talking a ton of noise and commotion and movement, and occasionally a spoon or fork will actually fall out from the force of the rattling. These occurrences usually aren't connected to 3am, the witching hour, or dead time or whatever. They happen then too, but it's not exclusive to 3am. For a little background, the house was built in, I believe, 1984, and I'm pretty sure no one has died in it. We also have one room that freaks all of us out, just super unsettling to be in there, like you're being watched or something, and none of any of the animals we've ever owned have ever gone in there. They refuse and freak out if you try to carry them in. We pretty much just don't go in there. It's my dad's office now, but until recently, he had to work home due to COVID. No one ever really went in like ever. We each have a bedroom and the living room and kitchen are connected by just a big open space. If anyone has any suggestions about what might be causing these occurrences or has had similar experiences, please let me know. I've lived in this house roughly 17 years and this has always happened, but it's happening much more frequently and much more intensely lately. I'm wondering why that is. For years, my best friend and I have collected an array of stories, from minor encounters with the paranormal to the almost horrifying. To make this story a small step into the weird will be easier to understand my best friend and I. It was a late Saturday. We were both passed out in her full-size bed. She liked to sleep against the wall, while I like being free to move by the edge. I remember my dream so vividly, like if I could fall asleep while typing this, I could be right back where we were. There were stacked rows of desks, like the classic college class auditorium. At the front there was a solid, light wood desk. It looked yellow in the scene, contrasted against the green Berber carpet. There was a smart board with a presentation on. I don't remember the exact words of the slide that well, but I do remember after I read my slide, it was my boyfriend's turn. I clicked the next slide and turned to her, indicating her turn to present the slide. As she began reading, I awoke halfway through her sentence. But when I woke, she was laying beside me, still reading the next slide. I freaked out. How was she reading the slide? I'm awake and she's still asleep. How? I started slapping her arm, trying to wake her up. She groggily slapped me away and said, I'm not done reading the slide yet. I was freaked out even more. I ran to the bedroom light and flicked it on. I bounded onto the bed and declared that she and I were going into the kitchen to drink coffee and talk about this. She was confused at first, but while the memory was fresh, I had to ask her what she remembered. She told me the layout of the room, the desk, the carpet, the smart board. She even pointed out that I had read the slide before hers. We both kept tossing back and forth about how there was no way. I think at the time, we remembered the topic of the presentation and she said she had no idea why she would know that stuff. We'll still reminisce on that scary dream hopping, and every time we do, I always wonder if we really had transported ourselves into each other's dream, or somewhere else. I've lived in this house since I was eight. I'm 19 now, and I always knew there was something off about this place. From the cold spots randomly appearing in my upstairs, to the slightest movement of anything hanging around my house. I always figured there was a ghost here. I eventually started calling this ghost Patrick, a namesake given after a dickhead I knew in my high school. Mainly given since he was being quite a dick to us in the house. He didn't like that much, restoring to such messages as fucking with the lights on random occasions. To even going so far as to push in my ribs, I couldn't breathe. I still have an indent from where he pushed my ribs in very badly one time. Eventually, I'd had enough of his torture, resorting to using a typical ghost app, I know, how original, to try to ask him a few questions. Firstly, I asked his name, to which he replied with Charles. I addressed by the name he'd given, feeling a tinge of cold running behind my neck. After asking a few more questions, is there anyone else here? No. Where did you come from? King Mass, London. How did you die? He didn't answer that one, etc. 
I eventually went to turn in for the night. I jokingly said goodnight to Charles, to which the app said bye back. I had a few nightmares that night, so I kept waking up and going back to sleep constantly. It was annoying, and upon the fifth try, I had my hands sticking out in such a way that the palm was sticking up toward the ceiling. An intense cold rushed over it. My fingers suddenly curled together as if someone were holding it. And that's when I realized as I was drifting off that Charles was holding my hand, probably seeing how I was having such a shit time sleeping in an attempt to hold me. And you know what? It actually did help. I went back to sleep without any problems after that. Waking up the next morning only to find that he must have left at some point since there no longer was a cold. There wasn't anything on a Charles from London that used to live in this house as far as I could research. I don't know if that's truly his real name. But for whatever reason, ever since I started calling him that, he's left me in the house alone, only appearing when I call for him. This experience happened about six years ago. I was dog sitting for a family of my then girlfriend's family for some extra money. I would go over to their house once in the morning and once in the evening to feed the dog and walk it around the backyard on a leash to do its business. It was a smaller dog, one of those that seems to overcompensate for its size by trying to be big, bad and scary, barking at everything with no fear. I was doing this for a solid week. On the second to last night I was over there, I was walking the dog in the backyard as usual. It was fairly dark by that time, not pitch black, but dark enough that you couldn't comfortably walk around without a light. The moon was out, so that helped a bit, but I also had my phone's flashlight on. The backyard wasn't fenced, hence the leash, and it was probably a good 15 feet of flat ground before it became thick, tall, grassy weed type fo foliage. Behind that was just woods. The dog always took a long time sniffing around every damn weed, rock, what have you, then it suddenly froze, as if too scared to move a muscle. At the same time, I heard a rustling maybe 20 feet ahead of me and to my right. I shined my phone's flashlight over in the direction, but it was obviously not helpful. The rustling grew louder, but did not sound like it was getting closer to me. Finally, I started seeing the tall grassy foliage start to move, and then I saw something emerge from it. Its size was similar to that of an adult black bear, but it was covered in skin that was whitish in colour. It wasn't filled out or bulbous like a bear, but seemed rather lean instead. Imagine a large white gorilla, but with no hair, hunched down on its front arms and legs. It didn't make any grunting or growling noises, and somehow it looked like it was moving in slow motion. The dog, which would normally bark at anything, started to whimper. At this point, my eyes had started adjusting to the dim light, and I saw the thing turn its head toward me. I don't believe I had a face. I ran back to the house with that dog so fast, I would have beaten Usain Bolt. The next day, I went out with an actual flashlight, but nothing out of the ordinary happened. So this has happened twice. I suffer from anxiety and get really bad adrenaline dumps. So that paired with hypochondria, I'm almost always feeling weird. It's been like this since I was nine and I'm 36 now, so I've gotten used to talking myself down. Unfortunately, when something really messed up, I tend to either ignore it, or if it's too bad, pop a clonopin or two and ride it out. About eight years ago, I did that. I was feeling super dizzy and kind of sick. But during a panic attack, I always felt super dizzy and kind of sick. So I just did the thing and laid down with a movie on. About 10 minutes later, I smelled my grandpa. My grandpa had a very distinctive smell, like sandalwood and something else that was just him. And I heard him say, turn off the stove. Like, in my head? He had passed like three months or so before, so I thought maybe it was from a sweater of his. But you don't ignore your grandpa, dead or not. So I checked the stove, the gas was on. I lived with two smokers, turned it off, aired the house out. The second time wasn't very long ago, maybe a month or so. I'm diabetic but not insulin dependent, but my sugar still tends to run high, so I don't generally worry about it getting too low. 
And again, the whole anxiety thing. Anyways, I wasn't feeling very good, so I went to bed kind of early and had a dream where I was in the house I grew up in. The entire house was dark and I was standing in the dining room watching the kitchen, which was bright and a bunch of people were wandering about, which was pretty normal as our house was kind of the family hub and where everyone went when they needed a place to go. My stepdad and my aunt were sitting in their usual places. My aunt eating pizza, she loved pizza like Ninja Turtles level loved. And I wanted to go into the kitchen so bad. Because I mean like, holy crap, that's home. My aunt gestured to a pizza box and I was just about to walk in when my stepdad looked over and was like, poke your finger. My aunt looked kind of sad and then I woke up. Went to check my blood sugar and it was like 50 which isn't deadly, but it's pretty damn low when you run like 130 most of the time. Both of these stories took place seven or eight years ago, but I still remember them vividly. They both took place at my grandma's house, which always creeped me, my siblings and cousins out when we were younger. My parents have told me they even found the house creepy, like someone was watching them, but didn't want to scare us kids. Both events aren't that big, but I figured I'd share anyway. One night, me and my cousins were up late at night playing video games, probably 2 or 3 a.m. Of course, we got hungry and wanted to make some pizza rolls, so we sneaked by our grandmother's room. She didn't like us being up so late. And now we decide who's going to go downstairs first. To paint the scene, it's pitch black, like you can't see your hand two inches from your face black. And we're all a little scared, so my cousins forced me to go down the stairs first. Since it's so dark, I'm slowly going down as I don't want to fall down. I also couldn't tell when I reached the bottom because the stairs and floor were both made of the same wood. So when I reached the bottom, I took a few more cautious steps forward just to make sure. That's when I bumped into something taller than me that felt like when you run into a person taller than you. It completely stopped me in my tracks. I looked up and saw this figure right in front of me move to the left. Remember, it's pitch black. And at the same time, one of my cousins turned on the light. And there I was, standing in the middle of the living room, with nothing around me. They of course saw nothing, and I found it more creepy that something was probably just watching us walk down the stairs. The second story takes place in a very sim similar scenario, except I'm only with one of my cousins this time. We sneak downstairs to grab a bite to eat around 2 or 3 a.m. He's eating some cereal, and we're chilling at the dining room table, sitting across from each other. I'm talking while he's mainly focused on eating. Then there's this very loud growl next to my left ear, which freezes both of us. I look at him and slowly say, Dude, did you hear that shit? And he nods. Then we both started laughing, probably because we didn't know what else to do. The race to get upstairs once the lights were out was full of panic. I occasionally bring up the second story with the cousin who was there, and he still remembers exactly like I do, so I know I'm not imagining it. I've always had strange experiences my whole life. I used to think most houses were haunted, but the older I'm becoming, the more I think it's me. I often hear whispers directly in my ear. Smell odd things that are unexplained, like perfume, tobacco, herbs, and get the sense of someone watching me see things in mirrors. From ex-boyfriend's houses, friends' houses, the many houses I've moved to, there always seems to be some sort of activity or strange feeling. I've had too many to mention, but I will mention one that stuck with me. It was about five years ago. I was renting a house. It was a very comfortable house, and there wasn't much activity. It was in a mining village. I got a strange feeling in the back bedroom, but it didn't stop me going in there. Just a bit uneasy. Anyway, one night I woke up in the middle of the night to go on the loo. I was half asleep and nothing seemed unusual. After I was done, I came out of the bathroom. The bathroom was directly opposite the front room, so you can see right in it. I looked into the front room and saw a man standing there. He didn't look completely solid. I could see through him. I could see the TV behind him. He was short, looked like an adult. 
I can't remember his clothes, but I can remember his face and he was wearing a flat cap. He had a broad smile and kind eyes. Not that I could see the eyes as normal eyes. There were no pupils or colour. He was all grey. But it was night. And there were no lights. He was looking at me. I couldn't believe what I was looking at and really wanted to make sure it wasn't my eyes playing tricks on me. I stood there for a good solid five minutes just staring. I didn't feel scared, just curious. He moved and started looking at the TV. It felt like he was curious about it, like he had never seen one before. I'm 100% sure of what I saw. I spent the time making sure what I saw was correct. After about five minutes, I felt he was doing no harm and meant no harm, and I felt comfortable to go back to bed. I really didn't feel scared, but I have felt scared in other encounters. The scary ones happened more recently. I grew up in a house that was over 100 years old when we moved in. For years, I never experienced anything remotely paranormal. But when I was 13, I moved into the basement. On the first night, I didn't sleep. This isn't uncommon because I'm an insomniac, but this was different. My room was pitch black at night because the only window was tiny. I rolled over in the night and heard my inflatable chair. Hey, it was the early 2000s. Move. As if someone was getting out of it. I felt that someone was standing behind me watching me and the feeling didn't abate until I started to see the sunrise. I lived in that basement for seven more years and had a myriad of other experiences. I heard a man and woman arguing in the laundry room when nobody else was home. I'd set three alarms, again, I'm an insomniac, and all three would be turned off in the morning. I'd hear whispers in my ear when I was laying on the couch trying to nap. I saw a shadow figure going up and down the back stairs, which led to the basement, but the creepiest experience happened when I was 14. If you hadn't leaned it yet, I have trouble sleeping, and this is mostly because I'm a light sleeper. Literally anything will wake me up. One night, my friends and I were having a sleepover in our basement living room. My two friends and my sister slept together on our fold-out couch. I slept on the recliner, which was in front of my bedroom door. When we woke up in the morning, we found that my friend Kristen, who'd been sleeping in the middle of the other two, was gone. My parents were still asleep, and we didn't want to wake them, so we searched the house ourselves. All of her stuff was still there. When we didn't find her, I decided to go into my room and call her parents. I moved the recliner, which was still in front of my bedroom door, propped up against it with no wiggle room. There was no other way into my room. I opened the door and there was Kristen, asleep in my bed. She had no memory of getting up in the night and she wasn't a sleepwalker. People have tried to tell me that she must have gone past me, but that's impossible. I would have woken up if she'd even walked past me, let alone if she moved the recliner I was in to open the door. My sister and I still get chills when we talk about it. When I was in my 20s, I used to live in this apartment on the edge of the city. I used to walk around to explore, because if you went down to the main road, there was a long stretch where there wasn't really much except woods, fields, etc. If you kept going, though, it would become another subdivision. I should say that many weird things happened to me and my friends in this area when I lived there. I'm pretty sure it was built on burial grounds or something. Anyways... One day, I was walking down the side of the road away from the city, and I saw a sign at the end of a little gravel road that said Antique Shop. I don't remember the name of the shop, but it's irrelevant. Anyways, I remember that I had been looking for a specific item, so I decided to walk to the shop to see if they had it. As I walked down the gravel driveway, there stood what looked like an old log cabin, but it was the antique shop. A little behind and to the left of the shop, about 50 feet away or so, stood a house. The house was inhabited by the woman who owned the shop, which I found out later. I walked into the shop, and it looked very old and rustic inside. I was the only one in there, except behind the counter, an older woman with grey hair. She immediately started talking to me, and was very friendly and welcoming. Felt like I'd known her forever. We chatted for a while, 
and I remember asking her if they had the item I was looking for. She said no. We talked for a while. I felt like I lost track of time, like we were in our own little world. After chatting with her for a few minutes, she told me I could go up to the house and ask the shop owner if she knew if they had the item. I walked up to the house and knocked on the door. A different older woman answered and I asked her about the item. I told her that the woman in the shop had told me to come up to the house and ask. She immediately got really wide eyes and had a look of fear came over her. She explained to me that no one else worked in the shop except her. I guess she was taking a break from running the shop and relaxing in the house. Still looking scared and shocked, she quickly tried to shoo me away and told me goodbye and closed the door quickly. I just walked away, not knowing what had just happened. It still gives me chills thinking about it. Who was the woman I had talked to in the shop? Hi guys. So basically, this is a story about a house I lived in a year ago near my IT campus in the west of Ireland, which I believe was haunted. To begin, before living there, I was always pretty skeptical of haunted houses, and for good reason. As a teenager, we would often visit haunted houses in our locality, which never really proved to be so, at least while we were present there. A few days after moving into our new college house for our final year of college, me and my friends went out to do shopping and get food. Upon arriving back, we noticed someone had left the oven on. We each denied it, but we knew someone had to have left it on. Looking back, this was probably the first unexplained incident as thinking about it. Nobody had even put food in the oven. Over the following few weeks, we started to notice odd things happening. Creaks, groans and movements from the side of our eyes. At this point, two of the housemates were convinced of a haunting. However, myself and another were still not convinced. It was soon only me that was left unconvinced, as one day, while the other non-believer was home doing study, they looked up to see a face peering at them before vanishing. It finally clicked for me when I woke up one night, just before Christmas, to see a very large man, or what I believed to be a man, staring at me from my wardrobe. Then things started to get really strange. Boot prints started to appear on the ceiling, making tracks across the roof by the year's end. One of my friend's girlfriends swore she saw him upstairs in the room when he'd been downstairs with me all along. Our shower, for which there were three switches needed to turn it on, would come on in the middle of the night, and one room off the kitchen would send shivers down our spines any time we went in there. There was one night in particular which really scared me. I always locked my door before going to bed and distinctly remember doing this that night. When I awoke in the night, I could see the large man again, this time at the end of my bed. I shut my eyes, telling myself it was a dream and went back to sleep. The next morning, my door was wide open. So were all the doors in my wardrobe, and the guys had told me it sounded like I was dragging my school bag from one end of the room to the other all night. Let me start off by saying that this happened when I was 13 years old. I'm now 30. My great grandpa was in the beginning stages of Alzheimer's when she came to live with my grandma, her biological daughter and her son-in-law, my grandpa. I'm very close with both my grandpa and my grandma and was very close with my great grandma. I remember being excited when I found out that she was coming to live with my grandparents, but I didn't fully understand the reason why. I would see her most every day and we would be talking and she would forget who I was. It would forget to speak English and start speaking to me in Spanish, which I didn't understand. This is when I was told what was going on. Fast forward a few months and we were at the dinner table. Great grandma was eating her food, as was everyone else. And out of nowhere, she said, I love you baby so much. I'm really going to miss you when I leave. Of course, we all told her not to say such things and that she was going to be all right. Not long after that, I stayed the night at my grandparents' house. My cousin and myself slept in one room, my grandparents in another, and great-grandma in the room across from ours. That night, I had a dream or vision, I don't know. But I know it was great-grandma telling me that she was leaving us. 
I was looking through the eyes of my grandma, who was looking at me, leaning over the bed with my head on my great-grandma's chest, to see if she was breathing. I saw myself lean over the bed while I was looking through my grandma's eyes, standing in the doorway. That's when I woke up to my grandma shaking me frantically, saying, I think grandmama is dead. I shot out of the bed and ran into the room to see her lifeless. And just like I saw in my dream and vision, I leaned over the bed and put my head on her chest to listen for any signs of breathing. And when I looked over at the doorway, grandma was standing in the exact location where I was looking through her eyes, looking at me. I don't know why or how I saw this. I feel as if this may have happened because we all had this strong connection. My great grandma, grandma and myself. Or because she wanted to let me know she was going. I'm not sure. Either way, it still kind of haunts me and I miss her terribly. There are times when I'll randomly smell her perfume, which is comforting. And I feel like she's around me. So we moved into an old farm a few years ago, did lots of renovation work, found lots of strange things, boarded up rooms, bricked up the entrance to a cellar, loads of old abandoned items left there too, etc. The thing that's really bothering me is in our main kitchen, there's a small larder there. When we renovated, we wired some electrics and plumbing into there, and the room is used to store the fridge, foods, washing machine, etc. However, shortly after we started using that room, I began having a recurring nightmare. During the nightmare, I'm stuck in a wall cavity. I can hear moaning, screaming, crying and scratching sounds, etc. I scream for help, but nobody or nothing can hear me. I'll usually wake quite agitated and worked up from this nightmare. I've never had this nightmare before we moved into this house. After the first couple of times, I noticed a small pattern. I only had that dream when the door to the larder was left open. I dismissed it at first, but after a couple more occurrences, I started making sure it was shut before I went to bed. The nightmare stopped. Now I've always been a bit skeptical and dismissed it as a subconscious thing, knowing it was shut was enough to stop the dreams. However, shortly after I had the nightmare again that night, I got up to check and the door was open. I closed it, bolted it and went back to bed. I asked my fiancé about it and he had got up in the night to get a drink and he left the door open. I told him about it and he was also a bit sceptical but thought it was odd. Regardless, he agreed to make sure it was shut in the future too, if it made me feel better. We've been really strict about this and the door has remained closed every night, since for just under a year. Two days ago, my aunt had to borrow the washing machine. She lives on the farm with us but in a separate building, as hers had broken down. She forgot about her washing and popped in to get it, after I'd already gone to bed. She left the door open. I had the nightmare again. I can say with 100% certainty, I only have that dream when I'm in this house and that door is open, even when I'm not aware of it being open. I'm struggling to find a non-paranormal explanation for this. Is my kitchen, or rather the larder, haunted? Since I was a child, I always had some kind of perception. I often felt like someone was watching me, as if I wasn't alone in my house, or you know, just perceiving weird energies around me. I was little, so I didn't pay any attention to it. I never told it to my parents, and even if I did, would have been odd. Because the house in which I lived, and still live, where what I'm about to tell happened, was new, and it had no history of deaths or murders. When I was around 11, I used to sleep in the same room as my parents. Don't judge. <laughs> and basically my bed was attached to the opposite wall of theirs. So when I looked at the ceiling, I could see the corner where the walls met. One night, I randomly woke up from my sleep, shifting uncomfortably and feeling a huge sense of fear. I was uneasy as it was very late, past midnight. As soon as I opened my eyes, I saw the detailed silhouette of a girl which was around my age at the time, or even younger, and she was basically floating in the exact corner in front of me. She wore an expensive looking dress from the 1800s, and she also had a hat in the same style. While her hair 
was in curls. I could only see the outlines of a figure. And they were white and bluish, and I felt as if I was about to die because of how scared I was. For the same reason I wanted to scream, but I couldn't, and only some seconds later I could run into my parents' bed. For many years I had been reassured, because I'd successfully convinced myself that it was a sleep paralysis experience, but two things made me realise that it probably wasn't. First of all, when I climbed in my parents' bed, I turned around for some seconds to check if it was still in the corner, and I can vividly remember that the mysterious girl was in fact still there. But the most important thing was, was much later discovered that the land on which the house was built previously belonged to a rich family from the 1800s, and they had a daughter who died very young. I'm still afraid sometimes because I still sleep in the same room without my parents, and I often feel as if someone sits on my bed as soon as I lay down. I can literally feel the mattress bending from an unknown weight, and I still feel something watching me when I'm by myself. My mother and two older brothers would visit my auntie and three cousins around Christmas. The whole family would get together too. Uncles, aunties, you name it. Anyway, they lived up near Inverness in Scotland, in a place called the Black Isle. It's actually in a place called Cromarty, but Inverness is more well known, so I'll say that. The Black Isle was said to be used back in the day, as a place where witches would meet up on Halloween and perform satanic rituals. Animal sacrifices, that sort of thing... Whether or not that's true is another story. I'll get to the story now. We all rented out a holiday home just down the road from my cousin's house. It had multiple bedrooms in it, so perfect for a lot of guests. Me, one of my older brothers and his friend from Africa were all staying in one room. They were fast asleep, but I was not. I woke suddenly and I didn't know why. I scanned the room with my bleary eyes. It was very dark. I couldn't hear anything but the snores from my brother and his friend. The door to the room slowly opened with a creak, I swear to God. I froze with fear, I didn't see anything enter through it. But as I tried to scan my eyes around the room, I started to see shadow-like figures pulsating and hovering around the two adjacent beds. Hovering and pulsating over my brother and his friend. There must have been at least three of these figures. The third one stood over my bed, although this apparition didn't have any human-like features, except for maybe the shape of something human. I could feel like it was staring right at me. I decided then the only course of action was to turn over to face the wall and go to sleep. The morning after, I told my experiences to a few of my family members, and they joked that it might be witches that performed those rituals in the past and generally didn't believe me. Except one person, my brother's girlfriend. She told me she experienced something as well. She was only sleeping next door and she told me she felt like someone sat down on the end of her bed at night and said she could feel the weight of someone on her legs, but nothing was there. Very frightened by this, I decided to read the guest book to see if anyone else reported anything else weird and unusual, but nothing of the sort was there. I'll never forget what I saw that night, and if you're ever up near the Black Isle or stay in the same holiday home I did, just be aware of any strange figures entering your room at night. So this happened when my sister and I were in high school. We rented this semi-detached house for a few years with our mom, dad, and eight-year-old brother at the time. It was a newish area and was a very family-friendly neighborhood. Our house always gave me weird vibes in general, but I had no idea why. It was kind of small and the layout was weird. When you walked into the kitchen area from the living room, you had the actual kitchen, stove, fridge, table, etc. to the left. Then to the right side of it was carpet, and there was a little electric fireplace that didn't work. Our parents' wedding picture was hanging on top. We never used that space, so my dad put a Bowflex machine there, which made it even more ugly. Moving on, we bought a dog that year. She would frequently bark in the corner of our room, mine and my sister's, when nobody would be in there and it was pitch black. When we'd go upstairs to see, she would still be barking. It was like a scared or territorial kind of bark. As she barked, she would back up at the same time in fear. It was spooky, 
but I never saw anything, so I was just whatever about it. I also saw my brother come down the stairs in the morning, only for him to be sleeping in his room. Now what I'm about to write is still unexplainable to this day. Our parents still do not believe us. We're all hanging out in the kitchen, my sister, brother and I, when suddenly we looked on the wall in the weird carpet area and there was a ginormous spider crawling on it. It was probably tarantula sized. We lived in Canada, so this was not normal for us. We were both like, oh, let's take a picture of it because nobody's going to believe us. So my sister whips out her phone and it won't turn on. Never happened before. So I was like, whatever, I'm gonna go upstairs quickly to get mine. So I jolted up the stairs and came back down quickly. As I was coming down, I just saw the rest of the spider's body as it disappeared behind my parents' wedding picture on the wall. The thing is, we inspected this picture and it was literally flat against the wall. There's no way anything, especially a spider that big, could have fitted behind it. We were so confused and still are to this day. We've had a few weird experiences afterwards, but nothing crazy after leaving that house. My sister and I shared a weird dream once and that's kind of where it ended. For context, I've been friends with someone for a couple of years now, and he had a very rough childhood to say the least. One of the reasons was he spent a large portion of his childhood without his mother. That's important. As he got older, he tried to look for her and the reason for her disappearance from his life. I promised to help him look for his mom, and I did try, but my research was pretty much fruitless. Until two weeks ago. He lives in a different country, so we can't physically meet yet. We went from texting most every day to not texting for weeks at a time. So naturally I was concerned. I hit up another friend of mine who reads tarot cards and asked her to tap into his energy for me to check if he was doing okay. Things were normal until she told me she kept hearing a woman crying and saying, I'm sorry, and mommy did not abandon you in Korean. The guy is ethnically Korean. Immediately after, my friend tells me she was starting to lose control of her movements. And all of a sudden, I hear what sounded like a completely different woman crying and talking to me, completely in Korean on the other line. In other words, my friend was possessed. At that point, I was freaking out because I didn't expect a random entity to pull up during a tarot reading. I'm a scaredy cat by nature, so normally I would hang up right then and there. But this time, I felt compelled to stay and listen. And the spirit didn't feel like a bad one anyway, so I thought, what's the worst that could happen? I felt deep in my soul that I was speaking to my friend's mother and I couldn't shake that feeling off. So I said her name and asked if it was her that I was speaking to. She confirmed it was her. She understood what I was saying in English, but replied in Korean. Because I didn't speak Korean, she would let my friend come back to her normal self to translate what was being said to me. We spoke for a while and I learned quite a lot about her. She seemed to be quite fond of me and explicitly stated she didn't mind that I was from a different race and culture from her son. She was a very sweet lady who was a victim of life circumstances and was looking out for her son, even in death. This is my craziest paranormal experience to date, but it's also one of the most wholesome experiences I've ever had. I don't think I'll ever forget about it or her. So, I've been witness to a lot of paranormal and unexplainable events in my life. It's not that I go looking for it or anything, I just always seem to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Honestly, I would think myself a loony tune if others hadn't shared some of these moments with me. One day my wife, a friend and I were sitting on the couch watching God knows what, and having a discussion about something, when my wife stopped mid-sentence and said, what the hell is that? Is that a spider? She pointed at something, but at first, me and my friend didn't know what she was trying to point at. Then we saw it. In the centre of the living room, there seemed to be something small and black hanging in the air. We all at first thought it was a spider or some bug. My wife is scared of spiders, so being the man of the house, I step up to remove the pest from the premises. When I got up and approached the thing, I quickly realised it was in fact not a spider or a bug. 
What I was looking at was, to me, what seemed like a drop of tar black ink suspended in the air. I was like, guys, this is not a spider. Look. I then proceeded to wave my hands around it, above and below, and there was absolutely nothing holding it in place. Being either incredibly brave or stupid, I went to touch it when my wife screamed to me, No, don't touch it, are you crazy? I stopped short, but not because of her. As I was going in to touch it, I saw movement from this ink. It was your typical teardrop shape, but the skinny top part of the teardrop was moving around like a squid tentacle. This was some for real, Marvel's Venom, symbiote looking shit. I pulled my hand back and I sat back down on the couch between my friend and wife. For the next five minutes that felt like an hour, the three of us sat in total awe at this black ink floated about seven foot from the center of the living room, past all three of us through the storage room door that was closed. It just materialized right through it. My first question was, we all saw that, right? Of course they had. My wife was the first to see it. My friend left immediately after, and my wife and I, still to this day, talk about the mysterious ink blob that floated through our living room. Crazy stuff, man. I'm currently 18, and have been living in my house for I'd say about 8 years now. My family, which included at the time my two sisters and my mother, moved in with my nana because of a few reasons I wouldn't want to bore you with. But for the first 10 years of my life, we lived in a house where so many unexplained things happened. Even since we moved, a few horrible things have happened there, which I won't go into detail about, possibly later. Firstly, this was before I was born and when I was a newborn. My elder sister, who was three when I was born, had a friend who she played with in the house. She described her as skinny, blonde hair, and she distinctively remembers her having a mole on her left cheek. My sister is also blonde, so when my mother saw a young blonde girl dash past her doorway, she would assume it was my sister. Only until she realised that my sister was in the same room as her. My sister would blabber on about her friend to my mother quite frequently, saying how much she liked to play with her. Another time, my mother was asleep on the couch. She said it was around 9 or 10 at night when she awoke suddenly, a man she'd never seen before screaming her name in her face. She still says it was the most terrified she's ever been and had called the police as well as my dad, who was at work at the time, to come home. The house was searched, but no signs of anyone. There were even times where my mother would lose her keys or phone or whatever, check somewhere, for example, the kitchen side, and they wouldn't be there. She'd go look somewhere else and then come back into the kitchen to find whatever she was looking for sat in a place she'd already searched. In my own experience at that house, I'd hear tapping on the walls, footsteps, but I am a person who thinks rationally and logically, so I pass these off. Yeah, I can't explain my personal experiences, but I'm not as clueless as to immediately say that it was something paranormal. A few years back, however, my mother got a message on Facebook from the people who moved in after we left asking if anything weird happened there when we lived at the house, so some weird stuff must have happened to them too. It's pretty depressing, because everyone in my family has some memory of something strange happening at the old house, apart from me. Well, if you don't count the tapping and footsteps, etc. But being in the house did feel unsettling, and even though the idea of cold spots in a haunted place is a bit of a cliche, there would be times where you just suddenly feel cold. For some context on this situation, I live with four roommates, and several days ago at around 2.30 in the morning, it sounded like someone was moving pots and pans around in our kitchen very loudly. At the time, I thought nothing of this as we're all college students, so someone was surely making a meal late at night. I asked all of them in the following days, and no one was out of their rooms or was awake at that time. One other roommate heard this and had the same thought. After this, we searched the whole house and even checked in our attic to see if someone was there. No one was up there, and nothing has occurred since. Besides the gaping hole where one of my roommates fell through the ceiling, he's okay, and it was hilarious. Until I had a very strange occurrence earlier in the day. I'm still pretty creeped out as this happened a little less than an hour ago. 
I was sitting at my desk just doing some work and had been there for a couple of hours, not doing much, just in the flow of work and in my own little world. I have a journal with a pen resting next to it that's been stationary for hours. I notice the pen start to move slightly and move back to its original position and think nothing of it. But once I take my eyes off the pen and back to the monitor, it rolls to the middle of my desk and stops in the middle of my mouse pad. This may be a tiny thing that I chalked up to me doing something that caused it to move. I was looking for a song on my TV and was completely motionless when this occurred. I proceeded to stare at this pen for a minute or two and I say out loud, roll it back please. I was hoping for something, but unfortunately nothing occurred. I put the pen back in its original spot and started messing with it, seeing what caused it to move and if something minor could have caused this. I can confidently say that it took some energy to get this pen rolling from the side of my journal. This was not a gust of wind that caused this and was not caused by a banging on the desk or any other type of motion in the room, as there was none. The other very concerning thing about this is that the pen continued to roll down the entirety of my mouse pad until it hit my keyboard unlike what it did when it first moved where it stopped in the middle of my desk. I've tried rolling this pen repeatedly for the past hour and a half and cannot recreate it without it stopping the pen itself. I know this is pretty minor compared to other people's experiences, but this was enough for me to sage my house and hope for the best. My family went camping over the weekend, down in the Wyoming slash Yellowstone area. It was my immediate family and my cousins. One night during that stay, it began to rain, and my cousin and I decided we didn't really want to get soaked in a tent. So we moved into my mom's red suburban and put the seats down and just stayed up and talked. I'm not entirely sure what time it was, given I didn't have a clock, but I'm assuming sometime around 2.30 or 3. We were talking for quite some time, to the point that even the forest was quiet. I sat up and looked out the back window of the vehicle and stared deep into some trees. Before anything bad happens, I always get a feeling beforehand. I remember staring down this line of trees and just getting an overwhelmingly bad feeling. Anyways, that feeling had caused me to just lay back down and continue talking to my cousin. I really didn't have the time or energy to see anything that night because I knew if I kept staring in that direction, I would have seen whatever it was. As I was laying next to my cousin, a blue orb swiftly passed around the car we were in. It was about the size of a basketball, maybe bigger. It was incredibly fast, so fast it shook the car. I jumped due to it surprising me, and I quickly grabbed onto my cousin and asked him, Did you see that? He gets a little startled from my sudden grab of his arm, and he just says he didn't see anything. I brush it off, and assume it's just my lack of sleep messing with me. Anyways, Fast forward about two minutes, a massive light blue glowing orb start to surround the vehicle we're in. It's making a noise that I will never forget. It's sort of like when a car at high speed passes you. It gets loud, then quiet, then loud again. The whole car was shaking as these orbs continued circling this car at this insanely high speed. This time, he's experiencing it too, and I'm clenching his arms so hard and screaming while he's screaming with me. This happens for what, about what feels like forever, but in reality, it was probably just a matter of seconds, maybe ten. After the orbs vanished, we kept holding on to each other for a couple minutes while shaking. Neither of us wanted to open our eyes. He says he saw something different than orbs. He described it as a tesseract triangles, absorbing into each other, like a dolphin swimming through water. He described them as light blue and glowing, just as I did. So a while back, roughly around mid-November 2021, I was working night shift at my local 7-Eleven. My co-worker was in the back cooking chicken, and I was out front taking care of customers and making sure our write-offs were done. When I heard the alarm telling me the door opened and a customer had entered the store, I spun around to greet them and as I did, I saw a black blur rush through the door and dart down the nearest aisle. At first I thought that it was a customer that really needed the washroom or something, 
but noticed I didn't see them pass by any other aisles leading to the washroom. So I decided to take a quick look around the store to make sure they weren't trying to steal anything. However, I couldn't find anyone in the store. They just disappeared. Roughly five to 10 minutes later, a woman entered the store and walked down all the aisles, seemingly looking for someone before calling out their name, Wesley. She only said it once before leaving the store. After that strange night, up until three days ago, things were normal. Nothing really seemed out of the ordinary, but the only incident I found slightly strange was hearing banging through one of the walls in the kitchen one day. However, one of the bathrooms was on the other side of that wall and I was cooking at the time, so I really didn't know if we had any customers in there at the moment, which is completely possible, and could have been countless things they may have been doing. We've had extremely high people banging around in the bathroom before. Teens will sometimes decide to have sex in there. Needless to say, that washroom definitely seen some shit, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was a customer. Anyways, on Thursday, January 20th, I was once again working the night shift. And while doing my end of shift paperwork and printing off everything I needed, I was standing in front of the window facing all of the gas pumps. When for some reason, pump one popped up on the gas till saying that someone clicked the request help button. But when I looked out the window, there was no one anywhere near the pumps. The entire lot was empty, except for a couple of cars belonging to other people in the area who also work night shifts in the neighboring stores. Later that same night when I went to the washroom, the door handled jiggle when I was inside. This was an employee washroom in the back, customers do not have access to. When I came back out, I asked my coworker if she was trying to open the door, but she was getting cookies boxed to sell to customers and never left the front of the store. Chuck Hin was believed to appear as a young virgin with 150 centimeter long hair. The goddess, infuriated at her exile to the outhouse by the supreme deity Chun Ji Wang, and kitchen goddess Zhou Angxing, was said to spend time by counting all her hair. The goddess was believed to appear in the three days containing the number six. Koreans avoided the outhouse in these three days in order not to accidentally provoke her rage. Thus, Koreans held Jesus, or rituals, to her in the sixth, sixteenth, and twenty-sixth days in the lunar calendar, or when a shoe or a child fell in the pit toilet. Jesus was also done for when a pig contracted disease and died, when a prophecy warned of the anger of the goddess, or when the outhouse was built. In the Jesus, dedicated to Shukshing, Koreans put all ingredients possible inside a teo, which was called the Tong Teo, meaning dung rice cake. The Tong Teo was then served to the goddess. Non-gluttonous rice was also served. She was regarded to be the most dangerous of the Gashnin. She was believed to despise children, possibly because of her downfall by the child Nokti Singing si, uh, and toppled them into the pit toilet. When children fell into the pit, it was believed that they would die before reaching maturity unless a Jezza was done to appease the goddess. If anyone entered the outhouse without coughing three times, Chuk Hin was believed to use her long hair to attack the intruder. When the hair of Shukshin touched the skin of the intruder, the intruder grew sick and died. Even a mudang or shaman could not appease the goddess if she attacked a person with her hair. She was believed to embody a strip of cloth or white paper on the outhouse ceiling. She was also believed to be the deity of legal punishment, following the orders of the house deity, Song Dushin. No gut or shamanistic rituals were held to dedicate Shukshin. Unlike the many guts and bone pulis, biographies of deities, dedicated to the other Gashin, this was because it was believed that Chukshin was an evil and malevolent deity, unlike the other Gashin. Because of the conflict between Zhou Shin and Chukshin in Korea, it was taboo to bring anything from the outhouse into the kitchen, and vice versa. Four years ago, my uncle passed away. He was only 60 and had the kindest soul. 
He would call me all the time and tell me how he wanted to take me to the casino and when I was old enough. Unfortunately, he never got the chance, as at the time of passing I was 20. The beginning of January is my birthday. On the 10th of December of 2016, my family and myself laid him to rest. We were all pretty sad about it, but in good spirits. We laid him to rest with all of his favourites. Whiskey, some sweets and an entire pack of cards. We placed him in his hand, a full ace, and said our final goodbyes. At the time, I lived in South Philadelphia for school. The morning after, I was expecting an Amazon delivery of Christmas presents for my girlfriend at the time. So I went into the kitchen to wait for the package that was supposed to be delivered soon. Taking a look out the window, I noticed the weather. I remember it vividly being a wet, rainy morning. Fog was in the air, and you could see maybe 20 feet in front of you. Definitely an odd vibe given the time of the year. Decided to take a quick look at my step. The package wasn't delivered yet, but I looked down and saw this small wooden box sitting on my doorstep. I had no idea what it was, so I took it inside to sit on the kitchen table to get a look. I open it up and see the box. I was absolutely speechless. I looked it over, around the house to make sure that nobody was playing a weird joke on me. I then noticed that both sets of cards were gone. This could either be an odd coincidence or something else at play. The reason why it's so odd is because I have absolutely no idea why someone would be walking around with this in South Philly, and out of all people, leave it on my step. All of my roommates were gone for the day, so it had to have happened after they left. Also, in South Philly, you can't really leave stuff on your step or porch unless you want to get rid of it. I told all of my family about it, and they were just as weirded out as I was. I took the set back to my grandparents' house, where he lived at the time that he died. As soon as I set it down on the table, it all of a sudden looked not as pristine. It could have been the light, but as soon as I went to move it for dinner, it fell apart in my hands. Like the glue from the box all of a sudden dried up in my hands and no longer became of use. I don't know whether or not this counts as a ghost story, or if this even counts as an encounter, but it definitely was one of the weirdest experiences I've ever encountered. Nothing like that has ever coincidentally lined up in my life like that. Ever since I can remember, I've had some scary experiences with things I can't really explain. From things falling off counters to seeing people that weren't there, it became a norm for me and my family to the point of us ignoring things. I believe it was all connected to the house we were living in at the time, because as soon as we moved out, these unexplainable things hit a plateau. But this experience was too stunning to ignore. First, a little bit to know before I start the story. It was a pretty chill night at my house. Everyone was asleep except me, my sister and my brother's baby. Avery, who was about 10 months at the time. Avery was very attached to my sister, so she often slept with us. Me and my sister shared a room with a bunk bed. And of course, being the youngest, I got the top bunk. This bunk bed was worn and creaky. If someone was moving or doing anything at all, it would make a noise. Anyways, on this night, I was watching TV while my sister went out to do something, leaving Avery sleeping on the bottom bunk. She had been in a deep sleep for about 30 minutes, and usually when she hits the 10 minute mark, we know she's out for the night. To my surprise, my sister came back to the room pretty quickly and sat down very aggressively on the bed, as well as leaving the door open. Her heavy sit caused a loud creak to come from the bed, so loud it made the baby wake up. I heard a quiet shh come from my sister from the bottom bunk. Avery started crying heavily. I've never heard her cry so hard, but I chose to ignore it because my sister was with her and would calm her down. But after 20 minutes of constant crying, I couldn't take it anymore. I wondered what my sister was doing instead of comforting the screaming baby right beside her. I was annoyed beyond belief. Are you serious? I bend my head over to look at the bottom bunk and all I see is Avery, sitting there, tears rushing down her face alone. My heart completely dropped. It felt like I couldn't breathe for a second. My body went completely cold, although I was in a well-heated house. My sister then bursts into the room, screaming at me for not doing anything about the crying baby. I was absolutely stunned. I saw my sister come in. I heard her sit down, and the door was still wide open from when she first came in. She asked me why I wasn't doing anything, and I simply replied, 
I thought you were in here. To this day, she says that I was the palest she'd ever seen me. Neither of us can explain who or what I saw, or what I was trying to do to the baby. So my grandpa died because of cancer on New Year's 2021. And it was shock because he didn't feel sick before and doctors found out he had last stage and there's no way to help him. Only he can live a little bit longer, but he would suffer a lot and at the end he died one month after diagnosing cancer. We spent one week at grandma's house because she's lonely now and we wanted to be her support and day after my grandpa died, my dad was sleeping on the couch and he woke up because someone was walking next to him and he thought that it's my grandpa. But he turned the lights on and there was literally no one and he heard loud footsteps coming to the kitchen at 3am. My grandpa was always up at hours like this and ate food late at night. He told us in the morning what happened and same night I had a dream with my grandpa where he came home from the forest and we all were in shock because we thought he's dead and he looked younger in my dream and my aunt had a dream with him too where he looked younger too and she woke up from the dream at 3.40am coincidence same night my dad heard footsteps at 3 a.m my aunt had a dream at 3 a.m and i had the same dream but i don't know the time this isn't everything why i believe he's still here this happened after like four or five days after he died only me dad and aunt had experience with him and no family member saw him in dream or something before My mum was sleeping with my younger brother in the room where there's a PC and my grandpa very often used PC late at night. My mum woke up exactly at 3.15am because something woke her up and told her in head to look at PC and boom, exactly when she looked at the PC, it turned on. She called me and grandma to come and see what happened and we had feeling like someone is there but for me it was creepy because it was 3am. And then we started to pray and mom told me to turn off PC because she wanted to sleep then. I turned it off and after a few seconds it literally turned on again in front of me. Also after this, PC turned on second time. My grandpa didn't have a classic keyboard but it had red lights. And all of a sudden they started flickering and this was crazy too. After that my other family members started to have signs from him too. For example, his smell etc. Also, last thing to say, my grandma was alone after we left and she was very sad and thinking about grandpa and then her glass cracked for no reason. I was about nine when this happened. Me, my mum and my sister moved into this old house that was made before the Second World War. My great uncle, who was a veteran, told us stories about it when it was in its glory days. Well, everyone in our town said the place was haunted. That just set off signals in my head, especially when I remember driving past the front of the house and seeing a girl in the attic window. I eventually rubbed it off, but I still hated the house. I always felt like I was being watched and never felt alone. I was always uncomfortable and I just hated it and begged my mom not to move us in. Yeah, that didn't happen. Whether you believe in mediums or not, both of my grandmothers had a hardcore belief that we had medium blood or something stupid like that, but it skipped a generation or something like that. My room was the worst to be in, always freezing, always felt heavy and always had something weird going on. My sister always hated going past my room to go to the restroom and I always hated being in my room. When we first moved in, I would knock on the floor and something would knock back. I would grab midnight snacks and see shadow men, women and children from the corner of my eye. One time, I was even making a sandwich. I saw the shadow woman in the hall and I just said hi and made my sandwich. I turned for some reason and saw a shadow man maybe a foot from me. It took a moment before I ran to my room. One time when I was sleeping in the living room, I felt a hand press against my back and heard light footsteps. It felt like a male's hand. My parents had divorced and no one had their boyfriend over. Another time, I had a few pieces of paper on the table in the living room and I made the joke that the ghost should move it. It took a moment before it shot across the table and just stopped on the edge. 
I jumped and ran. Another time, I woke up in my room and saw a girl in my doorway. I'm not like skin tone and hair colour. She was translucent. She was grey with gouged out eyes with blood going down her face. She had a dress on with a coat. I stayed frozen before I jumped up and moved past her. My sister rubbed it off until her boyfriend stayed in my room while I was at a friend's house. He saw the same exact thing but rubbed off until he heard my story. But what made this so much weirder is that it's the same girl from the window before we moved in. I have so many more stories about this house and I hope it falls soon. It was a sad house and I don't know how else to describe it. So this happened to my family a few years back, but I believe it's a rather interesting unexplained phenomenon and I just discovered this sub. A little background before I get started. Me, my mum and uncle all reside in Texas. Grandmother, uncle too and cousins too reside in New Mexico where my grandmother has a shop. Cousin one is off at college in Colorado. Uncle one decided to go visit cousin one at school. But on his way, stops in New Mexico to see the family for a few days. While visiting, a strange woman stops in the shop and asks for directions. She and Uncle Wong get to chatting and I'm not sure of the specifics that led to this conversation, but she proceeds to tell him about a dream that she had recently. She says that in her dream, she was driving through the mountains and suddenly came to a halt. She realises that there was a mountain lion lying dead in the middle of the road. She gets out to see if there's anything she can do. But when she approaches the mountain lion, takes life again and runs away into the mountains. The conversation comes to an end and the woman takes her directions and goes about her way. Uncle Wan brushes the whole thing off as odd but doesn't really give it much more thought. Days later, Uncle Wan convinces Uncle Two to accompany him to Colorado to visit Cousin Wan. It's important to note here that Uncle Two has emphysema. Where they were visiting was at a higher altitude and Uncle Two ended up getting severe altitude sickness. It became so bad that he ended up in the hospital in an induced coma. Me, my mom, aunts, grandma and cousin Two all travelled to Colorado to be there with him. Days turn into weeks, turn into months and he's not getting better, let alone coming out of his coma. One day, we're all tired and stressed as things are looking grim. We're trying to decide where to eat when one of cousin Two asks for Applebee's. No one else wants to eat there. We try to talk her into something local, not a chain. She's insistent and since Uncle Two is her father, the family takes pity and caves. This is where things get weird. As we're sitting at our table, that same odd woman from a whole other state from months before appears standing beside our table. She looks Uncle One dead in the eye and says, it's time to go. And in a blink of the eye, she's gone with nowhere to be found. Months later, the hospital calls and says it's time to take Uncle Two off of life support. We abandon our meals, head to hospital, and they do just that. Uncle One never sees the strange woman again. I was 14, so maybe my memory is foggy, but I swear to God it's real. Spirits and ghosts were always a joke to me, until this moment when I legitimately felt like something happened. So three or four years ago when I was around 13 or 14, I was with my close friend at the time. Me and him always hung out and I would stay the night and all that jazz, as one would do as a 13 year old. I trusted him. His house was kind of a big backyard, where we would always play soccer. Now, if you're standing flush to his house looking at his backyard, there's a normal wood fence straight ahead, and a normal one to the right. To the left, there was only a two cinder block high little wall. He would always tell me that he saw big black figures and shit in his neighbor's house windows and yard and porch. Meanwhile, might I add that nobody lived there at the time. I would always write it off as him just jokingly saying these things to mess with me. He would always describe them as these eight foot tall black masses. Just pitch black things standing there or existing there. And when he would look away, it would go away or move closer. Keep this in mind. So me and him are in the backyard messing around, playing soccer, kicking the ball. 
eating whatever you do at 13. We have our goal set up with shoes instead of the cinder block wall. Dumb as hell. I shoot a couple, they bounce off and come back. When I hit one and it goes over the wall, into the neighbouring house's yard, and rolls to the furthest corner of the yard. Of course, my friend being him said, you kicked it, go get it. Willingly, I jump over the little wall and head to the ball. As I walk over, yes, walk, I don't know what I was thinking. I feel the only way I can describe my stomach dropping like a roller coaster. I turn my head towards the neighbor's house and standing against the wall is this massive, at least eight and a half foot black mass, just there, existing. I froze, ball in front of me and all I could do was stare. I felt like it was holding me mentally. I wasn't focused on anything but it, its entire body. I heard my friend tell me to hurry up and I finally snapped. I grabbed the ball and I looked away for half a second and when I looked back it was gone. But I said fuck that and I grabbed the ball and ran as fast as I could back over. I went inside and got a drink and just didn't mention it. The next morning I asked my friend and he said, yeah bro, I say that all the time. It never does anything, it's just kind of there. So I never knew my grandfather. He passed away two months before I was born. He died in November of 96 and I was born in January of 97. And I'm the only grandchild he didn't get to meet in person. So growing up, I always knew who, who he was and I always assumed it's because I was told who he was when I was little, until I was 15. So I'm at a hospital visiting someone who just had a baby and somehow the topic of dead relatives visiting people in dreams comes up. My mother proceeds to tell a story of when my grandfather visited me when I was little. I got so emotional at 15, I had to leave the room in hospital entirely to collect myself after the story was told. The story goes like this, as my mother told it. I was playing in the living room one day while my grandma was looking at photo albums. I was maybe three at the time, and I walk over to my grandma as she's looking at a picture of her late husband, and I say, that's the man that plays with me in my dreams. My grandmother responds, what? I continue to repeat what I said before, but I add, before he leaves, he kisses me right here and tells me to be good. I gesture to the middle of my forehead and between my eyebrows. This is where my grandfather kissed all of his grandkids before telling them bye. Something I would never have known unless I was told or experienced. My grandmother freaks out and calls my mom at work and asks her if she had ever mentioned Herman, my grandpa, to me. My mother responds no and says, the only thing I've told him is that daddy is his guardian angel and he'll always look over him and I told him that the day he was born. My grandma proceeds to tell my mom to come home, so she does. Once my mom arrives home, my grandma pulls her to the side and asks her a bunch of questions, then brings her into the living room where I'm just doing three year old things. She then pulls me over and says, tell mama what you told me about this man, as she points to the picture of my grandpa. I responded, that's the old man that plays with me in my dreams. Before he leaves, he kisses me right here. I gesture to the middle of my forehead between my eyebrows once more. My mother and grandmother are now both freaking out as I continue to play with my toys. That's where the story ends. As far as I've been told, my mom never mentioned to me who my grandfather was, other than what she told me when I was born. I've always known who he was and had this weird connection to him. I guess since he never got to meet me, he made up for it in that way. He's the reason for my obsession with music. He was a traveling bluegrass musician in Kentucky. I was raised hearing stories of him singing and playing guitar. I've idolized him my entire life. So that story was very emotional for me to hear. My brother and I have different dads. Unfortunately, his dad passed away a year prior to when the story is set. My mom and his dad did not go well together. He wasn't a bad guy, just troubled and really didn't know how to be a good partner. My mom said that after they separated and she met my dad and got pregnant with me, my brother's dad said, you finally got the girl you always wanted. This was something she had told him when they were together, that she always wanted a daughter, but obviously they didn't stay together to have another kid. When I was little, he was always really sweet to me. 
Not in a creepy way, just always interested in asking how I am. My mom said she felt like he always felt drawn to me, maybe because he regretted the end of his relationship with her, and I in some way made him think of what could have been. Who knows? Okay, so moving on to the story. A few weeks after my brother's dad died, I had a dream that I was in a hallway with him. He told me he was okay, and that he wanted to show me something. He grabbed a door handle, opened the door, and the brightest light came through. But then I woke up. I wish I could remember what he showed me, or if he did show me anything at all. Okay, now fast forward in time. It was Christmas Eve 2009, a year later. I was upstairs in my bedroom, and I heard music playing. We had a room next to mine with all kinds of toys, because I had a lot of nieces and nephews that came over. I assumed the music was coming from there, so I walked into the room to check. It wasn't coming from that room, and I realised it was coming from the bathroom. Uh, the bathroom? Odd, I thought. I went in there and realised the music was coming from a three-tier box, each tier with a drawer where my mom kept jewellery and other keepsakes. As soon as I touched the box, the music abruptly stopped. I was 21 at this time, and in all the years of living with my parents, I'd never heard music coming from this box, and she's had it my entire life. I go downstairs and tell mom the weirdest thing just happened, and I tell her the story. Her face goes completely white. She looks totally freaked out, and her eyes well up with tears. She then tells me that it's a jewellery box that her ex-husband, my brother's dad who died, gave her on their wedding day. She said she hasn't played music in 35 years because it broke. We even went upstairs to try to recreate the music and get it to work with no luck. I just smiled and shrugged and said, well, I guess he's saying Merry Christmas. I don't know why he chooses me to go through with these messages. We weren't close. But I do think part of it is that he knows I won't brush things off as my brain or something weird. I feel they're from him and he knows I'll share the message. My brother pretty much hasn't been very receptive to the messages and I don't want to make him uncomfortable or upset him. About 10 years ago when I was in my early teens, I experienced my first and so far only paranormal experience. During the summer when this happened, I was visiting my father in Hungary with my two sisters. The night this happened was just like any other night. My grandmother was staying over and between her, my father and my sisters, all three bedrooms were taken, leaving me to sleep on the sofa in the living room. My sisters and I had just gotten back from a late night of hanging out with some friends and decided to get ready for bed immediately since we were all very tired. As I got into my bed for the night, my sisters continued talking quietly in their room with the doors open and the lights from their bedroom on. My father and grandmother were asleep. My father's house wasn't creepy by any means, but the one unnerving thing about sleeping in the living room in the dark was the fact that all three doors leading into it had a large panel of frosted wrinkled glass on the top half allowing you to see fuzzy shapes or figures of people on the other side of the door. This made what I saw all the more mysterious, and at the same time mis terrifying. Still wide awake, I looked up through the glass of one of the doors, and looking as clear as anything I'd ever seen, was a hooded figure staring right at me. Grey and featureless, it was standing on the other side of the door and perfectly backlit by the light streaming out of my sister's room. I immediately froze, unable to take my eyes off of it. The figure was clearly watching me, although it didn't have any eyes or face that I could see. Any defining features were obscured by some type of hood or shawl it wore over its head and shoulders. As I lay there frozen in fear, my mind quickly eliminated all of the possibilities of this thing being a human. Both my grandmother and my father were asleep, and my sisters were still talking in their bedroom. Not to mention, why would any of my family just stand there, looking at me without moving in the dead of night? After some time, I finally plucked up the courage to call out to one of my sisters to come, unsure of what else to do. She told me she'd be there soon, leaving me staring at this figure for another terrifying period. Then, just figures before she was about to step out of her room, and through the very same door the figure was standing behind, it glided away out of sight and my sister walked through it as if nothing had happened. For me, this was the nail in the coffin that I witnessed some type of spirit, ghost, or guardian angel that night. 
The way in which it glided away on the other side of the glass was so unhuman-like in its movements. I know that what I saw that night was something paranormal. I moved to Texas, but I had to fly to Utah to pick up my car. It's February 2020, and I leave Utah at approximately 6pm, with a friend who flew with me. We decided we'd spend the night in Albuquerque, New Mexico, so we could get some sleep and we'd arrive there around 4am. So we're driving, things are fine. You have to pass through a reservation to get to the main highway for Albuquerque, and something felt off from the second we entered New Mexico. It's maybe 2 or 3 a.m. at this point and my friend was fast asleep with her head against the window while I played the music loudly. We had to drive slowly as the speed limit was only 35 or 45 miles an hour. As we got further into the reservation, I heard a sharp knock on the roof of my car. It was hard enough to be clearly heard over the music. My friend was startled awake and asked what happened. I shrugged because I didn't want to stop. This might have been intuition, but I'd rather have rock damage or drive on a flat tire or anything else than stop on that road. It was dark and something just felt wrong. I had really absurdly bright LED headlights on my car and as such, I could see a few miles ahead of where my car was going. My friend was watching the road and I slowed down to get a better look while I was still a good distance away. What I saw freaks me out to this day. The best way I could describe it was a body of a human, half contorted downward. The hair and head was upside down, and its arms were like large, stalactite looking things. The thing was so dark that my headlights couldn't penetrate it. However, it illuminated everything around it. Its face wasn't looking at us originally, but it twisted its head around to look at us. It didn't have facial features, but it looked distorted like it had a broken jaw or something, and it was almost blurry. I pride myself on my photographic memory, but it was like it didn't want me to see it. At this point, we're no more than 50 to 75 feet away and I step on it. My friend asked if I saw that and I nodded my head. I didn't even want to talk if I was being honest. I didn't want to breathe. I was shaking so badly. It felt ominous, evil. I can't explain in full detail the fear I felt. It was like it penetrated my bones. It was a primal instinct to run and run as fast as I could away from it. I told her not to look back. We don't want it to follow us. I swear I drove a solid 120 plus miles an hour until I got off the reservation. We didn't end up stopping in Albuquerque. I've drove all the way to Lubbock instead and we spent the night there. I think I'm going slightly mad, but who knows? I bought my first house two years ago. It was built in the 40s or 50s, a terraced house with a converted attic. At first, I lived here alone and everything was okay. I felt watched sometimes, but I figured it was just me living alone for the first time. I then started looking after my family dog during my first lockdown. I didn't feel watched as much, but whatever it was felt further away. I mentioned it to my mum and sister, but they just thought I was being odd. As I wasn't scared, whatever it didn't want to hurt me, they just observed, so it was dismissed. My partner moved in and I started feeling watched at night, as I'm a night owl, but I just closed the door or I would feel whatever it was peeking in through the crack of the door. We got a puppy who just seems sort of oblivious but is always around me, especially when I go upstairs. I've always been sensitive when it comes to these things and I've only seen something very scary once, but that was a very long time ago at a different house. My mother moved in with my partner and I and stayed in the converted attic. She used to be a sound sleeper. Since she moved in though, she can't get a good night's sleep. I'm pregnant and things have been getting creepier. Firstly, I keep seeing something standing out of the corner of my eye, no matter what I'm doing. I'll look to where it should be, but I see nothing. When I go back to it, it's gone for a little while and then comes back and I have to check again. Today, it was while I was working and it was standing by my window, but each time I looked, it was gone. Second, when I was awake at night, 
I love pregnancy insomnia. There's something peeking from the bathroom. The dog sleeps on the bed and he ignores it. But then I started getting an image in my head out of nowhere of something crawling from the bathroom down the hall. This has only been since I've been pregnant and only when it's dark. I have to check the door is still or I swear it opens more. Probably an overactive brain in the wind. Third, so my mom hasn't been sleeping well. Waking up a lot, she thought it was stress from work. Last night she feels something tapping her on both sides of the chest. She was awake. The next thing she feels when she turns over is something tapping her on her arm, keeping her awake. She feels that it may have been waking her up for a while, but this is the first time she's been awake for it. Pretty sure there's been more than what I've put, but nothing springs to mind. So what do you guys think is going on with my house? Moving out isn't an option at this time, even though I do plan to move in the next few years. When I was a child, I always got a weird feeling from my grandmother's house. Specifically at night. It was just always so hard to sleep for some reason. One night, I had a nightmare. It scared me so much I had to get out of bed to walk to my grandmother's room. My grandmother's room, however, was on the complete other side of the house. I walked down the hall, past the atrium, and I saw my shadow on the wall. This didn't frighten me right away, because I figured it could be the moon shining light on me through the glass of the atrium reflecting a shadow. But I noticed my shadow was extremely tall. I knew shadows could look distorted, but this didn't look like my shadow. I turned around to find a seven foot plus tall shadow figure standing clear as day in front of me. Being a child, I reacted the only way I knew how to. I kicked it in the private area and ran away. I went to my grandmother's room and told her what happened and she just waved it off. Now, I would just say this could be night terrors, etc. But growing up, I told my siblings about it, and my sister had seen the same thing. Years had passed, and we started to get too old to spend weekends at my grandmother's house. My brother lived there for a short while, and one of his previous girlfriends had seen it too. To this day, I wouldn't spend the night at her house. It's unsettling. I've even woken up to my grandmother staring at me while sleeping once when I was there. This hasn't been the only time I've seen shadow people though. I've seen them in the reflection of my TV, in the backseat of my car, out of the corner of my eye. I choose to ignore them. To me, it's not so consistent for me to think of its hallucinations. I've seen many shadow people, felt presences, and just recently seen a full body apparition. One thing I felt something watching me sleep so strongly. I was paralyzed in fear because I knew it was there. I've had sleep paralysis before and this wasn't it. At one point, I swore I felt my shirt riding up while sleeping. I tried to ignore it, but when I felt something touch my back, I told myself, oh hell no, and got up. I find it strange that I see things a lot while others don't. I do believe in ghosts and the paranormal, but it honestly scares me. I don't invite that energy. I don't want to communicate with them. I just want to be left alone. However, I can't help be curious. I've heard shadow people are mostly negative and that just frightens me because I've seen so many of them. If anyone has more info on them, I'd appreciate it. I'm a male in my 20s and do medical work from home. Therefore, my internet is a need for my job. After phone issues, I never reconnected my number since what I need it for is on Wi-Fi anyways and I rarely travel. So figured it doesn't pay financially when there's access to most needs. Anyways, all morning long, my programs were running slowly and things weren't responding. While currently living with my grandmother, as I'm working, I hear when the family calls to check in on her. My uncle normally calls earlier than normal on this day and claims he called her multiple times before while no calls came through. Around 1.50pm, everything crashed completely. No phone or internet was available. I tried to restart the router multiple times, completely shutting off and checking wires. Previous DSL wires were spliced and have managed to be fixed, but after all, still no phone or internet. 
no service on my cell phone, so all means of communication were down. You got this rundown, so this is where things get odd. 2.50 p.m., a state trooper shows up at my door, claiming they received a 911 call from our landline number. Confused, I asked her what, about what time she received the call, and she replied 15 minutes before she showed up at the door. My grandmother doesn't have a life alert for when I'm not there, so I informed her of it. She did restate that the call did come from the landline number, also confirming the last few digits. She asked to come in and we talked some more. She made conversation with my grandmother and I went to grab the house phone. I saw the screen still displaying the check telephone line, stating it's still down. I went back to her, saying we couldn't possibly make the call while giving her the phone. She picked up and it was dead air, no sound. 11pm as I'm writing this and still no connection. I told her about the situation this morning and that when she received the call, it was within the time frame of not being able to receive a connection. Her face said it all. I still have no clue what happened and I'm trying to wrap my brain around it. We have the internet back, but still no phone. The internet came back about 15 minutes after the trooper headed out. I've dealt with paranormal events in my life and even more. Recently, I found a painting known as the Crying Boy in an antique shop near me and have photos of it. DCB is known as a cursed painting. Not sure if there's relevance of having the photos of it on my phone or not, or if this is just another paranormal experience to add to my list. After all, the trooper did mention my deceased grandfather's name, who I've also had several visual experiences with after missing him some nights. Would love to tell more stories about my life, have photos and more to go along with some of them. When I was six or seven, we moved out to a ranch in the countryside of Laredo, Texas. Not a lot of people with good income lived out there. Most houses were isolated and surrounded by woods. My mom and stepdad decided to rent this house because rent was cheap. Only three fifty a month. No indoor plumbing or central air. A lot of low-income families lived out here. There was a family that lived next to us. A family of six kids, all girls and two adults. They were also low income and often didn't have much to eat. My mum would often help them out with food and in return the kids would come over and help my mum clean the house. This one day they came over and ate dinner with us, helped my mum clean and me and the youngest girl that was about my age fell asleep on my bed. After a while my mum woke us up because it was getting late and she needed to go home. Her sisters had left her behind because they didn't want to wake her. It was a good walk home, as there was a dirt road leading to our house to get to hers. My mum was going to send my brother to walk her, but I butted in and said, please can I walk her? As we were friends, my mum said yes. So I then walked her to the gate. After we departed, I started on my way home. When out of nowhere, she comes running behind me crying, throws herself at me and pulls me down by the shoulders. I ask her what's wrong, what happened? She points up and says, look up there, look. She was pointing up at the top of some abandoned train cars. And what I saw till this day, I cannot explain. There were three skeletons walking back and forth. It was like, what the? One was laying on its side and it had clothes on too, like a tank top and shorts. The other two were standing up, just walking back and forth be behind that one, stopping and waving high. We looked at each other and ran to my house. I quickly told my mom what we saw. My mom and two brothers plus us went back to look and they were still there, waving high at us. We threw rocks at them, but the rocks didn't phase them, just like went through them. Either that or we were bad at aiming. After a while, we went home and never saw them again. Till this day, I can't seem to understand or be able to explain how those skeletons were moving. Someone probably say we were hallucinating, but how can five people see the same thing? Some have said it was Halloween props, but no, it was the 90s and I never saw any Halloween props that moved that well during that time. The technology wasn't real yet for that kind of movement. Halloween props like that cost a lot of money and that family couldn't even afford to eat. We were in a dirt poor country.
When I was younger, around 12, my dad moved into a house. Now this house always gives me weird vibes. I constantly felt like I was being watched. I couldn't sleep with my door open or without the TV on. Now this is gonna be two separate stories put into one. The first experience I had was around 2 a.m. I was in the living room watching TV. It was the weekend, so I was living up to my bedtime. Now the layout of my house was slightly weird and the living room was dead center in the house. Surrounded by dark hallways and rooms. I started hearing noises in the kitchen, but thought nothing of it because we had dogs. A couple minutes go by and I can faintly hear my parents in their bedroom doing stuff. Gross, I know. They were being loud, so I went to turn to look in the direction of their room. I was sitting with my back to the hallway, and as I'm turning clear as day, I hear a child's voice in my ear say, don't turn around. I froze in place, absolutely paralyzed with fear. Then I felt a tug on my hair. I promptly jumped up and turned on every light in my house as fast as I could. I didn't hear anything for the rest of the night, but needless to say, I didn't go to sleep until the sun was up. Fast forward to a couple months later. It's Christmas Eve. Me and my siblings were sent to bed to prepare for Santa to drop the presents off. It was around midnight and I was laying in bed watching TV. I was too excited about presents to sleep. I saw something out of the corner of my eye and looked over at my closed door. As I looked over, I saw a bright blue mist figure float through my door. It was glowing, but not enough to light up my room. I watched as it floated from my door and through my closed closet door. I was once again absolutely shocked. I covered up my head with the blanket for a couple minutes until I felt better. I then laid on my side facing the other side of my bed. The blanket took the shape of someone lying next to me. I laid there and watched as the blanket moved as if someone was breathing. This went on for a couple minutes and then suddenly the blanket laid flat on the bed again. This all happened 12 years ago and at the time I told myself I was just imagining things. However, the older I got, the more I'm convinced that something was up with that house. When I talked to my dad about it, he told me some stories they had about hearing a little boy when no one was there. I've done research on the house and never found anything. However, as we moved out, we found handprints made in the concrete on the driveway. Two sets of child's handprints with 1978 written underneath. This happened nearly 10 years ago, but I, 32F, can't shake the experience. So I've had deja vu a thousand times, like many people, but it always seems to be gone in the blink of an eye. However, when I was in my early 20s, I had an entirely different experience. I was hanging out with a couple of friends, Dane and Corey, at Dane's house. Now, I've had multiple strange experiences there, mostly paranormal. Dane has lost two fathers, and he believes, as I do, that his biological father has stuck around, but that's neither here nor there. So me, Dane and Corey are all hanging out in this shed in the backyard where we normally do. We were just sitting there chatting when all of a sudden I got struck by a serious case of deja vu. Instead of it ending in an instant, it seemed like it was never going to stop. My heart started racing and the guys could see that there was something wrong. I told them what was happening and the only way I could describe it was that it felt like a film strip stuck on repeat in my head. Like when a CD skips. I started to panic as the minutes passed. I felt disoriented, but I knew I needed to get out of that shed. It had been about five minutes since it started, which may not seem very long, but it felt like a lifetime. I tried to gain my bearings and stood up, but I quickly tumbled back into my chair. I tried again and stumbled out of the shed. Dane's backyard has a big, beautiful oak tree right outside the shed. As I stepped outside and my feet hit the earth's surface, I felt a calm come over me. A breeze came out of nowhere and the branches of the tree started moving rhythmically. It's hard to explain, but I felt planted, just like the tree, like I couldn't move. I felt an odd connection with the universe, like some force was trying to connect with me as if an invisible laser beam came from the sky straight to my mind. This frightened me even more. 
The guys came out to check on me and I snapped out of it and broke down in tears. We decided to go back in the house and I told them what happened. Corby was freaked out and left. I kept telling Dane about the film strip. I felt scared and out of it, not like myself. I really thought I was going to have to check myself into a mental institute, so I decided to go home. Once I got home, I calmed down, but I still felt uneasy for the rest of the night and was too scared to sleep. I had this giant book of different phenomenons and unexplained mysteries of the world that I've glanced through a few times. I looked up deja vu and sure enough, right there on the page, my exact words were printed. It said that sometimes deja vu can be long and frightening and can be described as a film strip stuck on repeat. So I live in the tropics of Australia. My house is situated in a remote part of the Daintree Rainforest. I live in a house that sits on stilts, I'm a Queenslander, and from my bedroom window it's about a 3 to 4 meter drop. My closest neighbourhood is about 1 kilometre away, or 0.62 miles. I don't live on a main road, however I'm close to a creek. There is literally no one near me. This only happened around two nights ago. I was alone in my house except for my cockatiel. I was sitting in bed watching some TV, nothing out of the usual. I then got that all too familiar feeling of someone watching me or something's about to happen. A feeling that I've gotten accustomed to over the past 20 years. At that point, I heard the tap running in the kitchen, which I thought was strange. So I got up, went to the kitchen with my phone's torch as my only guidance. I didn't want to wake my bird by turning the lights on. I've gotten used to these type of things happening and I'm not really all that scared of them anymore. However, as I turned off the tap, my wall clock did its Westminster chime. I looked over and the time showed 12.38am. This straight away caught my attention as I only set the clock to chime every hour. Then, as I was near the clock, the tap turned back on full force. I jolted, quickly looking in its direction. I went to turn it off. There was condensation all over the handle and all over the window that sits above the tap. The tap was freezing cold even though the water coming out was boiling hot. My bird at this point was now awake due to my clock as it was, had just chimed a second time, roughly 12.44. I quickly got my bird and brought him back into my bedroom with me. I left the kitchen and the clock so I just couldn't be bothered to put up with what was going on. My poor bird was scared shitless. I kind of admit I was too. As I sat in my bed, there were three knocks on my bedroom door. When I ignored them, they moved to my window. I got up and opened my curtains to nothing but trees and the black as ink sky. I opened up the window and my God, I'm getting goosebumps writing this. I heard whispers at the bottom of the ground, far below me. I couldn't understand what they were saying. Then they stopped. As soon as they stopped, three knocks yet again hit my door. I slammed my door shut and locked the door. I yelled out, Can you please just leave me in peace? They stopped. Nothing else happened that night and I finally got some sleep. It was really creepy. Not too scary. But scary enough to give me some trouble sleeping. Many years ago when I was in college, I lived with my brother off and on. The house had a downstairs with the living room, dining room, kitchen and master bedroom, and an upstairs with the kids room on one side, the bathroom on the other, and a bit of space in between in front of the stairs. It wasn't really big enough to be called a room, but it wasn't exactly a hallway. They set up a futon for me, and that became my area. I remember thinking that the upstairs felt a little off, especially my niece's room. After a few months, I started sleeping on the couch downstairs, partly because the kids would disturb me in the morning, but also because I never felt right up there. There were several strange things that happened while I lived there. One night, my brother, sister-in-law, niece, nephew and I were at the table eating dinner. From upstairs, we heard one of my niece's talking dolls say something like, I want to play with you. It sounds like horror movie cliche bullshit, I know, but it was extremely unsettling when it happened in real life. 
No one else was in the house and they didn't have any pets. Another time, my niece was coming down the stairs when she fell suddenly. I remember thinking it was really strange because it didn't look like she tripped. It was more like she had been pushed. Her necklace had broken during a fall, but not on the clasp. The string had just broken like someone yanked it off. Then one night while I was still sleeping upstairs, I woke up and felt really uneasy. I think it was around two or three in the morning. Since the kids' room were across from the bathroom, they had to walk through my area to get from one to the other. I opened my eyes and saw what looked like someone in a pink bathrobe go into the bathroom. I didn't recall my niece having a pink bathrobe, so I thought it was kind of strange. After a while, when no lights had switched on and I didn't hear the sink or the toilet flushing, I started to get up to see if anyone was in there, but I got this really bad feeling that I should just leave it alone. In the morning, I asked my niece if she had a pink bathrobe, and I asked both my niece and nephew if either of them had gone to the bathroom in the middle of the night. They both said no. Sometime later, I mentioned the whole thing to my sister-in-law. She asked me if my brother had told me to say that. I was confused and said, no, why? She told me that when they had first moved in, she kept having this dream that there was a lady in a pink bathrobe sitting in the living room. They kept telling her to leave, but she wouldn't. Then one night, she dreamed that the lady was in the doorway of her room, screaming, and then flew at her and started choking her. A while after all this happened, my sister-in-law went around the house saying, Okay, lady, I know you're here. Then she had the dream of moving in again, and this time they put the boxes all around her instead of telling her to leave. I moved out shortly after, but the incidents mostly stopped after that as far as I know. My sister-in-law said they just had to learn to live with her. Now before I continue, the stories I'm going to recite might not have occurred exactly how I described them, since both of the stories I'm going to tell happened when I was pretty young. Nevertheless, here are two stories that didn't happen to me, but happened to both my grandmother and my sister. Back in 2006, my granddad passed away and at the time, I would have been four, but as someone who has a terrible memory, I can still remember him pretty well. When he passed away, It hit everyone pretty hard, and my nan, for the first time in her life, now lived by herself. My nan used to have a queen-sized bed, which essentially had a bedside table connected to it as well, as a headrest which was big enough to hold pictures and small ornaments. So basically, it was pretty big. On the two bedside tables, there were two huge lamps which turned on and off whenever you touched the lamp itself. It didn't have a switch. One night, not too long after my granddad passed away, my nan was just laying in bed, when the lamp next to where my granddad would sleep lit up and then turned off. She brushed it off as something possibly leaning against the lamp, but then it happened again, so she was understandably pretty spooked. She decided to ask if it was my granddad and the lamp turned on. My nan began to cry and began to say various different things, and she was getting a response as the lamp turned on and off. She recorded it happening, but considering it was 2006, and I'm unsure what she even recorded it on, I've never seen the footage, but both my mum and nan both said that it exists. As a sceptic, when it comes to the paranormal, I hope that it would possibly make me a believer. Around 2011, my gran passed away, and at the time, she was not in a position, both physically and financially, to live on her own. So she lived with my dad right up until she passed away. My parents split when I was really young, so when we would go to see him, I would sleep in his room, which was pretty big, big enough for an extra bed and my sister slept in another room. But when my grand passed, my older sister slept in her room from then on. One day, she opened the door to go to sleep, only to find my grand sitting on the edge of the bed. I clearly remember her running into my dad's room in tears, screaming, saying that she saw my gran. I remember my dad trying to calm her down and when he went into the room himself but saw nothing. My sister was terrified of going back there and subsequently didn't spend weekends with my dad for a very long time. I'm both grateful but also pretty annoyed that I never encountered anything like this. It probably really shit me up. I'm the sort of person who hates horror films so I'd rather not have an experience like this but then again... I always brush off stories, but I myself have never experienced anything relatable in any way.
While growing up, there were things that I saw that could be in a horror movie. In elementary school, my friends and I saw a dead cat look like a dog and got a hold of it, so we buried it in the backyard. The next day, what did we see? The same cat in a ravaged looking state, walking by the gate, and it started menacingly before disappearing, never to be seen again. Could be a coincidence or mistaken identity, so let me explain the other occurrences. There was a door in the dining room that always, and I repeat always, was closed properly, but it always opened by itself. You could slam the door, check the door, lock the door, but it always opened as if someone slowly entered the room. In high school, I recalled using the desktop in the front room, reading after I learned about Nostradamus. After doing so, I showed my older brother and cousin. My brother sat in front of the monitor while my cousin and I were to the side. Suddenly, as we reached the part where it was said that his use of the occult led to him predicting his soul go to hell, there was a black disembodied arm that rested on the table. And in shock, my cousin and myself said, do you see that? Then without saying initially at the same time, we said the arm and decided to close the website. Now as we get deeper into the things that happen, there was a friend of my brother who needed a place to stay, so she was invited for a while. Ironically, the same things I just typed I said to her, and she said that in school on the island, they played with a Ouija board and the participants saw a witch who was haunting them. I thought nothing of it and felt she was telling a tall tale, but strange things started happening. I can't say if it was the house I lived in or maybe something that was up with me, but when she came, it was as if her energy I could have felt. It started with me hearing voices, similar to relatives who for a fact were not there at 3am in the morning. To see more things like shadow figures and even spirits. I always told people if I see a spirit, it was a slight white while being translucent, but I always saw a full figure with details. Then suddenly I'm being bothered by a presence when I'm by myself. It was like a deep growling, like some sort of beast in my ear and I always had to break free and it led to insomnia. My sister and myself even saw while my mother was in the kitchen cooking a large thing and I'll do my best to describe it. It was huge, at least over six feet, walked on hooves, bulky wax looking skin and a face with hair that reminded me of the predator. It got really bad to the point where I had to get prayed over and anointed with oil. That night, after the pray prayers as I lay in bed, the thing came to bother me, but it slammed up against a barrier that was solid white and I found peace. For a while that is. My best friend died in 2017. I still don't know if it was suicide or an overdose, but yeah, he left our world when he was 18 years old, but it felt like he never left my side. His presence was almost more intense than when he was alive, especially in my dreams. I won't go into details, but thanks to him, I found my passion again. After his death, my dreams changed drastically. The location in my dreams was always the same, a very abstract but peaceful place. Sometimes I was alone, sometimes he was with me, and sometimes there were many beings. We were both beings too, genderless, pure and almost childlike. We both met when we were 14 and 15 years old, so I don't know much about his childhood. The theme of my dreams was always adventurous. I felt love, sadness, anger, happiness, fear, and all these feelings in the most intense way. I was one with everything. I really wish I could explain my dreams better. I wish I could show you all what I saw in these dreams and what they taught me, but I just can't find the words for it, not even in my native language. As I mentioned before, I found my passion for art again. He loved my artistic side. He even told me shortly before he died that he really wanted to see me creating art, that he would buy me a piano. That was a joke, but in a loving way. I really wanted to learn the piano at the time. He visited me in my dreams for about one or two years and it suddenly stopped. I never dreamed of that place or beings again. My dreams were never the same again. And I think my cat did the same. My cat also died suddenly in 2021. His death was too painful to bear. I felt like I was about to go crazy. I wanted to die with him. He didn't visit me that often in my dreams, but one dream struck with me. He told me over and over again that I need to stay alive, that I'm strong, that I have to fight. 
His voice was almost like an angel. It sounded neither masculine nor feminine. He looked me intensely in the eyes while he spoke to me, and since then, I truly believe that he was our angel all along. He protected me from myself. He showed me what it means to be strong, in his lifetime and in my dreams. He taught me to be kind to myself and to others. He taught us what it means to be a family. A few months after his death, our whole house smelled like him. It was such a strong smell, as if he was right next to us. My family had these experiences too. Dreams, his scent and his presence. I don't know if I'm just imagining things, but even if it was just in my imagination, it helped me. I found my purpose, and as much as I want to die, as weak as I feel sometimes, I feel blessed for these experiences. It puts a smile on my face when I read my dream diary. That friend of mine has a fellow student who comes from an old noble family in North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. That owns a rather large and old estate built a few generations ago, where the family lived ever since. He moved to his university city a few hundred kilometers away and only stays at the family house over the holidays and a couple of nights a year. One of those times, his parents left for a weekend and he was the only one home and spent the evening in the living room watching TV. The living room was the heart of the estate with an open fireplace and posh furniture. He was sitting in an old armchair he knew was older than himself and maybe even his parents. The armchair stood freely in the room facing the TV so that the closed living room's door were in his back. As you might have imagined, we now come to the ghost part of the story, as he heard clearly audible footsteps coming from the parquet floor in the lobby downstairs. He turned the TV off and tried listening closely when he heard them again. He knew he was the only one home and thought of intruders and whatnot. Maybe someone saw his parents leave and wasn't assuming anyone to be home, since he had moved out a couple of years ago. He got up, went downstairs, turned all the lights on, checked the locked front door, and searched the kitchen and the downstairs bathroom. No sign of intrusion, nor any more steps. Relieved, he made his way back to the living room and continued watching TV. After some time, the footsteps left his mind. After all, it was an old house and he wasn't used to its noises anymore. Then, after some time, he felt what he described as a chilliness suddenly filling the room, as if brought by a light breeze. Once he noticed it, he was sure it hadn't been there before. Then the footsteps reappeared, but this time right behind him, between the door and the back of the armchair, sounding as if it was approaching him. He turned around hastily, only to find an empty room. The footsteps had disappeared and took the chilliness with them. Nothing more happened that night, but the eerie feeling remained. It wasn't ghosts per se he was afraid of, but he couldn't explain what he had experienced. The next morning, he tried to casually mention this weird experience to his father on the phone. His father wasn't surprised or incredulous, quite the contrary. He told him to call the priest, and as it was probably just his grandfather wanting to sit in his armchair and wasn't able to because it was occupied. Apparently, his father was used to calling the priest every now and then to speak a blessing and put souls to rest, and they experienced steps, noises or chilliness a couple of times a year that stop after the priest has visited. They'd been doing this even while he was still living at home and never told him to not scare him. His father apologised for not thinking about that before leaving for the weekend, but nothing had happened over the last 10 or so months and he simply forgot, and he was so used to that casual haunting. My dad was a great dude. He was the heart and soul of our family. He was diagnosed with cancer in 2009 and passed away a few days before Christmas 2018. He rarely missed a day of work throughout the many surgeries, chemo and radiation. Anyway, I've struggled with addiction my entire life. Started with pills and such and ended up a full-blown IV heroin slash cocaine addict. My dad never gave up on me and was hell-bent on straightening me up. A few months prior to his death, I went off the deep end again and lost my job and got myself in a bad way. When I came home and saw the shape he was in, it broke my heart because I knew he wasn't going to be here much longer. I immediately checked myself into detox Halloween 2018 and have been sober since. Now on to my story. 
My mum and I are living in the house he actually passed away in. For the first year or more, nothing happened. But in the last year or so, there have been some really strange occurrences that anyone who knew my dad would attribute to him. At first, it was just the televisions cutting off and on and stuff that can easily be written off. My mum and I even started jokingly saying, cut it out, dad, every time something happened. Then it was his alarm clock, which made us really give it a second thought due to the fact that he was the most organised and punctual man you'd ever meet. He was an hour early to everything. Also, the blinds on our back door are open every morning, even though we keep them closed or else our other dog will stay there looking in and whimpering all night. Every day I tell mum to quit opening the blinds and shut them, and every morning they're open again. My dad used to do the same. When my sister and I were in high school, my dad would come into our rooms every morning on weekends and open our blinds to make us get up. Finally, once we started to acknowledge the things happening, a timer that my dad used to teach my niece how long to brush her teeth every night when she was a child, she'll be 14 in May, went off in the middle of the night. It had been at least six or seven years since it had been used and took us forever to find it. It had been set to 10 minutes and was powered by a single AAA battery. It's not a scary thing, it's actually kind of comforting. It's just the way the things are befitting of dad so much. My sister and mom always say, if anyone could have figured out a way to hang around and make sure I act right, it's dad. Brings me some sense of solace in the fact that maybe he can see that I've gotten my shit together and this is his way of acknowledging it. There have been many other instances in the last few months and in researching, I read that when a lot of emotion is in a room where someone passes, it can cause a spirit to linger. When dad passed, there were probably 40 family members all gathered when he took his last breath. Anyways, this happened to me when I was about 9 or 10. I was preparing to go to sleep on a weekday and I got under the blankets when I heard someone walking to my room. When I was a kid, I always left my bedroom door wide open, but because of the layout of my bedroom, I can't see anything outside when I'm laying on my bed. I only realised it was my dad when he stepped into my room and stood by the door frame. That's when I noticed something really weird about him. He had this expression on his face like he wanted to kill me, or like if I had done something terribly wrong and he was furious at me. His eyes were completely open. At first, I thought I'd done something wrong like I'd clogged the toilet, or he tripped on one of my toys and came to my room to scold me. But he just stood there with the most serious look on his face for about 10 seconds without saying a single word. My dad is the least serious person I know and he's really talkative so this unsettled me deeply. Then I asked him what's going on and he didn't react at all. Now that I think about it, I don't think he even blinked during this whole thing. He stood there for about 4 seconds after I asked him and then he just straight up disappeared. Like he edited out a video or like he'd logged off from an online video game. I was dumbfounded. I sat on my bed completely frozen, thinking of an explanation to what just had happened. Was I dreaming? I recall being wide awake with my bedroom lights on, not being tired at all. In fact, at the time, I couldn't fall asleep if I didn't have my blankets covering my head. And I was also playing with my PSP before I heard the footsteps. So was he really in my room and I had just suddenly fallen asleep? Then I woke up and he wasn't there? If so, then why did he have that terrible expression on his face? I checked the time on my PSP and only a minute had passed since I turned its screen off. I concluded that I could have had a quick memory lapse and he actually did leave the room normally. So I quickly ran to my parents' room to see if he was either in the hall walking to his bedroom or inside it preparing to sleep. I woke him up and his eyes were bloodshot red as they usually were when he had been sleeping for a long time. His hair was also really messy, unlike when he came to my room. I asked him in a serious tone if he had gone to my room before going to sleep. He saw that I wasn't playing around, sat on his bed and answered that the only time he had gone to my room had been at noon. I literally cannot explain what happened to me. My dad thinks it's pretty weird and I stopped mentioning it because he's pretty scared of the paranormal and I don't want to stress him out. 
I don't tell the story often since it's so ridiculous. I know nobody would believe me, but it's been bugging me for so long, I just want some sort of explanation. You can't make this shit up. This happened about seven years ago, but I still remember it like it happened yesterday. I was maybe 16 at the time and super into the paranormal. I grew up in the church and was told time and time again that the paranormal did not exist outside of the realm of just demons and angels. So as any curious teenager who had to find out for themselves, my friend and I snuck out to buy a Ouija board. The two of us then drove out and parked on a deserted dirt road so there would be no chance of either of our religious parents finding out what we were doing. Because, as you would assume, a Ouija board was a big no-no. The two of us climbed in the back seat of our car and set out the board. I think about an hour went by of absolutely nothing happening besides one of us getting jittery and moving the planchet slightly. Then it started moving. It was slow but it gave a year and spelled rape. That was it. We tried to ask questions, but no response. We said goodbye and drove to a grocery store and threw the board away. I looked up the year and sexual assault cases in our area and unfortunately found one. The case happened in the late 1970s, so I couldn't find much information, but I was definitely unsettled and overwhelmingly confused on why this was communicated with us. Went home that night, felt super anxious and had a hard time falling asleep, but nothing happened. Nothing happened for three weeks following that night. Before I get into what occurred, I need to describe my bedroom at the time. When you come in the door to my room, there's a closet on the left and then my bed is a few feet away, tucked into the corner of the wall. Straight ahead is a big window and to the right is a desk and dresser. On the left wall, starting at the door and going around to my bed, there was a line of posters and records, with a bulletin board right above the head of my bed. The right side wall is covered with even more. So anyway, I come home from school and go about my business. That night I went to bed, still feeling uneasy, but fell asleep rather quickly. When I wake up in the morning and roll over, I feel multiple sharp stabs on my side. I sat up and saw that the bulletin board had fallen down right next to my head, and the tacks were all over my bed and stabbing into me. I looked around my room and felt chills. The posters and records from the doorway to my bed on the left wall had all fallen off. The ones on the other wall were all still up, not even crooked. I checked around the rest of the house, especially rooms sharing that wall, and nothing else had been displaced in the slightest. So... To me, it seems that something had come into my room, knocked everything off the wall moving towards my bed, and stopped when it was right over my head while I slept. Cutting to the chase. In October, we lost our dog of 13 years. Her name was Bella. And no, I didn't name her after Twilight, though it was in vogue at the time. As a two-month-old puppy, she witnessed the murder of her then-owner. She was one of six pups. Ironically, her brother was adopted by my parents' neighbour. They'd ardently play through the chain-link fence whenever we visited home. I raised her in my first year alone at college. She and I were practically attached at the hip. She accompanied me throughout the six years it took to get my frickin' degree, marrying my best friend and moving across the country. I'm trying to express the depths of my love for her, and the words just fall short. Five years ago, I took up the notion that we needed to adopt a sister for her. I think this was a mildly telepathic moment, but she was eight, and I figured it would be good to close out her last years with a companion. Then she started losing her fur and gaining weight. Six months after we adopted our second dog, Aria, Bella was blind. She had cataracts and undiagnosed diabetes. We were told that the $6,000 surgery might not even work, and we're too poor for it anyway. She was insanely intelligent and, after a bout of depression, coped swimmingly. One day, her breath became laboured, and I knew that our time was almost up. In the two days leading up to her death, we were literally attached at the hip. 
I've got a lot of experience with death and knew she was terrified. I held her in my arms as she took her last breath. After she died, I immediately started looking for a puppy. I wasn't trying to replace Bella. I knew that I never could. I'd raised Bella on my own and Aria was two when we adopted her. I thought it would be good to raise a puppy together. It certainly tested my husband's patience. We adopted Lydia two and a half weeks after Bella died. She's, well, a puppy and a shepherd mixed to boots. The only way to calm her down is to wear her out. Today, while I was at work, my husband took her on a walk which made her tired. I'd just done yoga and was meditating. This is now a rarity since Lydia is always crawling on the mat, vying for attention. But today, she sidled up to me whilst I meditated. I laid down with her on the yoga mat. She was the little spoon and I the big one. Bella and I always fell asleep like this together. I was telling Lydia that I loved her and that it was nice to cuddle her like I'd done with Bella, my nickname for her. Then, I talked about how much I missed Belly. As I talked to her and cuddled her, I felt the unmistakable feeling of a dog's nose nudging me on the thigh. I felt there, thinking it was Aria, but she was on the couch. It's nice to know that, even though I can't hold her, my baby's still there. Yesterday, when I was going to sleep, I walked up the stairs to my bedroom at about 1am. I live with my parents, so my mum was sleeping in her room, my dad fell asleep on the couch, my dog was sleeping in the bedroom. When I closed the door, I heard heavy footsteps coming up the stairs. I have a very creaky staircase, so you can hear when someone is walking up. I checked and there was no one there. My mum's still sleeping in her room and my dad's still asleep on the couch. So, I just moved in from an apartment building to a quite old house a few months ago, which was at first quite strange to me since the apartment I lived in was small and the family wanted to quickly swap, even though they had a bigger house and they th have, I think, three children that will have to share one bedroom, but they still really wanted to swap with us. So we did the swap and there was not much going on at the start. Things began to get a bit weird after about three months. At first, I started only hearing some weird sounds, like footsteps coming from upstairs. Didn't really pay much attention to that. After some time, occasionally doors in the house, mostly to my bedroom, started opening by themselves. One time on Halloween night, the doors to my room busted open like someone kicked it. I then started waking up sometimes at about three at night by my dog that sleeps in my room every night, barking and growling at nothing in the room. This happened a lot, not every night, but maybe a few times a month. I started hearing heavy things being dropped in my bedroom from time to time, but when I went to check, I could never find anything that might have fallen. Although sometimes I can see things falling on their own. One night, a cabinet opened up itself and a jar dropped from it. I remember a few days ago, I woke up in the morning to get ready for college and my dad's guitar started playing by itself. There wasn't any songs, just like something was hitting random strings. After that, the guitar just fell. The guitar was standing there for about a month without anyone ever touching it. A few nights ago, I remember I woke up at around 3 a.m. to see my dog growling at nothing in my room when suddenly the door opened by itself. My dog walked out of my room through that door and started barking at something at the bottom of the stairs. I told her to go back in closed the door, but she didn't stop growling. This might also sound a bit weird, but sometimes you can feel like something is staring at you when you walk up the stairs. I've also got an Alexa, and sometimes when no one says anything, she would randomly go, sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Or she would start saying some random Wikipedia articles when no one was talking to her. I have an EMF, so I tried to leave it on my shelf and record through the night with a night vision camera, but I didn't manage to capture anything. One night, I did record something that looked like an orb, but I thought it was just a bug. As I said, I don't know if I'm overreacting or not, but just thought it might, I might ask someone for help. My family is pretty abnormal, I'd say. Either that or gifted. 
We see lots of things that people would probably call us schizophrenic or crazy for. Hence, why I don't share these things with people outside of my family or inner circle. And normally, when I do have other people with me, they can see these things too. My mother and stepdad had recently finished building their house when I was about 9 or 10 years old. It was kind of in the middle of nowhere and actually right next to a prison as well as a military facility. My brothers and I all got to pick our new rooms and I chose the room with the windows facing the front of the house. Since the house was brand new, we hadn't had the blinds installed yet. Really, the only furniture the house consisted of was our beds and a couch in the living room. Before I experience these abnormal or paranormal things, I always get chills down my spine. I can sense it before it happens, and it's as if the hairs on my neck perch up, and I can feel the direction energy it's coming from. I believe it was the first night of our stay there. I had my bed right next to the window. I was struggling to fall asleep, so I just stared outside at this single street lamp right next to our driveway. I instantly felt sick, nauseous, and just overall icky. Something was going to happen, and I was sensing it, and I just couldn't look away. I have a bad habit of just staring directly into the direction the energy is located. As I was staring, I saw this large humanistic creature thing. It was terribly skinny and freakishly tall. My heart just stopped. I've seen many freaky things before, but not like this. It's so tall, just slightly shorter than the street lamp, with long skinny arms that drag behind it as it slowly limps across. God, I was so frightened that I was frozen. I probably was holding my breath from the fear that just capsulated me. As I see it limp across my yard, it crosses that street lamp. It illuminates all of its features and it's just disgusting and horrifying. It has no hair, it's fleshy, it's tall and skinny. Its features and its face are sunken in yet it has no eyes, or lips, or any of that. Its legs are slightly bent as its arms drag behind. It's so vivid in my memory even now. I remember every detail and I'm 18 years old. Anyways, I just stare at it in complete fear as it crosses slowly. And after it passes the light, it just vanishes. I ran into my older brother's room after that and just slept on his floor. Let's just say, I basically stayed up the whole night making sure whatever that was didn't come in. The energy just located in the area in general was terrible. I never left that house at night alone unless something was watching me. Does anybody know what that creature could have been? I've got many other stories to share. My family is pretty cursed with seeing these sorts of things. In 2006-07, I had a huge change in my life. One of those things, those pivotal decisions that create a shift in reality. I lived in Italy where I was born. I dumped my boyfriend of eight years. I met my now husband, which I married a year later. I moved to the United States. I had two kids while living my whole life until then, 31 years, with the certainty I didn't want kids ever. Around 2015 or 2016, I had the most crazy lucid dream I have ever had in my life. At that point in this reality, I had two little kids. I was overweight, still dealing with losing baby fat. I had copper brown hair, about the top of my shoulder length, changed my fashion from black widow to hippie happy-go-lucky spiritualist chick. In the dream, I was in this house which I couldn't recognise. Literally in the dream I told myself, where the hell am I? I looked around me and there were a bunch of people partying, eating snacks, smoking pot, drinking beer and wine. I recognised the infamous ex and a friend of ours with his girlfriend, not the others. I kept looking around and I found a large mirror hanging on a wall. I went to it and saw my own reflection on it. Yes, it was me, but as skinny as I was when I broke up with him pre-children. Long, dark, black, blue hair. My old black wings. Eye makeup and dark, cherry lips. Dressed in black. I wasn't seeing the dream with my own eyes, but I was there. I felt trapped inside my body, which wasn't my body. Somewhere with people I knew, but not really. And I thought, this is not my life. I have two kids, I'm married. I realised in the dream that I went somewhere else. And this wasn't a dream really. 
This place was real. It existed somewhere. Those people laughed. I could hear them and it was loud. The clinking of the glasses was very real. The sunlight on my skin felt warm. The bright room was blinding my eyes. Mind me, though all this I was sleeping. This was the first and last time I ever saw myself in a dream. In the reflection of a mirror through my own eyes. Usually, I either see but don't have a body, or it was like it's watching a movie of myself as a spectator of my own body interacting in the dream. What I see and lucid dreaming are two different entities. In this dream, it was me. I was inside that version of me. I woke up from it feeling incredibly uneasy. I ran to check on my kids to make sure they all were there. When I realised I was back to my reality, I had this huge sense of relief. Because the other alternate reality I saw was ugly. I felt how that made me feel and it wasn't pretty at all. I'm convinced I did astral projection of some sorts and I entered an alternate reality, seeing how things would have been if I didn't leave my Italian ex. This one happened to me when I was young, like elementary school age, pretty sure fourth or fifth grade. There's absolutely nothing to do in this little town. At least there wasn't when I lived there. So more often than not, this leads to kids being mischievous. This night was no exception. I waited until my grandparents fell asleep and then I snuck out. Yes, at fourth or fifth grade and met my friend up the street. We really had no plans. Like, what the fuck was a couple kids going to be doing out at night anyway? Wasn't the safest idea looking back. Anyway, I went with my friend on his bike, and we just rode around together and teased each other and did typical 4th, 5th grader stuff. Now at the time, my friend only lived a few blocks away from me. Maybe two or three blocks total. Wasn't that far, and I probably would have been too sketched out to go any farther at that age, honestly. So we're just riding up and down the street between his house and mine and we both suddenly got a horrible feeling. I say both because he had to have felt what I felt at the same time as we simultaneously stopped riding our bikes and just stared at each other for a second. I still can't really wrap my head around what happened next but I have a few guesses. As we stood there with this horrible feeling in the air it was almost as if the air suddenly had an electrical current through it. It's the best way I can explain it. All the hair on my body stood up and there was this sort of tingling feeling, I guess you could say, followed by a deep, deep primal sense of fear. As soon as this primal fear hit, me and my friend for some reason looked into the sky. Now again, small town, not a lot of industrial lights. You can see the stars pretty clearly, especially on a night like this. What we saw and the best way I can explain it is this blacked out rectangle shape, extending for maybe a block and a half over us. It was a silhouette in the sky, and you couldn't see the stars through this thing. There was a perfect outline around it, and it definitely was a solid object. At this point, we realised it was hovering over us, I'd say maybe a couple hundred feet in the air overhead, and was projecting a shadow over us. Now I've experienced some scary stuff in my life, but I still don't ever remember feeling this primal of a fear. Sheer terror. My friend and I looked at each other and screamed and I booked it out of there, riding my bike as fast as my little legs could go. The weird thing is though, I was only a block or two from my grandparents' house. It felt like it took an eternity to finally get back there, despite me pedaling as fast as I could. Now as an adult, 20 years later, I guess you could chalk it up to some sort of experimental craft that maybe we weren't supposed to see. I don't know. I can still feel primal fear even thinking about this situation and I still can't figure out what exactly happened that night. First, I'd like to establish some context. I'm not exactly a believer in the paranormal, but I try to keep an open mind. Really, I kind of want to experience something that makes me believe, but until it happens, I remain agnostic on the subject. 
That isn't to say I haven't had some experiences that fall into the realm of the unknown, though. The house that I grew up in was built two years before I was born, so late 80s. My parents were the first occupants. The plot it was built on was just some northern New England farmland, bordering some woods. No Native American burial grounds or anything, as far as I know. The unexplainable experiences I had both could be explained as auditory hallucinations. If they were, the good lord did they sound real. I'll start with the more benign and less freaky of the two events. It was I was probably about 12 years old, staying up on a weekend playing video games and watching Newgrounds cartoons on my dad's computer. It was probably around 10pm. I believe specifically I was playing StarCraft, and while I went about cheesing my opponents, with Nidus Canals and Hydralisks, I was singing a song in my head. Kind of embarrassing, but I'm pretty sure it was Limp Bizkit. Anyway, I'm reciting the song in my head, when suddenly I hear a young female voice very clearly saying, I know what you're singing. Like, I could hear the song in my head, but my ears actually heard this young woman's voice. It's not the voice of my mother or sister, totally unfamiliar. I immediately look around and start freaking the fuck out. My parents were asleep, my sister off to college. I looked around the house, even went outside to see if there were any signs someone was there. Nope, nothing. I heard this voice clear as day and never found the source. The second instance was much more menacing. I can't remember the exact details, but the circumstances were similar. I believe this was a few years later. I was probably about 14 or 15. I believe my parents were away for one reason or another, and my sister's still off to college. So I'm home alone this time. Another late night of gaming, and I finally decide to go to sleep. I fall asleep, but wake up not long after to go pee. When I got back into my room, I started hearing the sound of heavy breathing. It started out somewhat faint, so I held my breath to try to hear it better and make sure it wasn't just me breathing weirdly without realising. It gradually, over about 20 seconds, gets louder and louder. I'm looking around the room, trying to figure out where it's coming from. While it gets so loud, it really sounds like someone is right behind me, and they're breathing deeply and with rage. It felt fucking terrifying, and it was loud. This went on for probably a minute or two before it eventually stopped scared the absolute shit out of me and felt very clearly malevolent, whatever it was. I have always been into the paranormal as a kid. I was completely fascinated by it, and I found over the years the more open to it you are, the more downright bizarre some of the stuff you experience is. This tops my list of weird experiences. Roughly four years ago, my sister came to my flat one night to spend a bit of time with me, as we both had been working like crazy and hadn't had the time to catch up. It was like the two of us, and she suggested having a game of cards, something we've always done since we were kids. It's a favourite pastime in our house. Once I had gotten the cards out and started shuffling them, she asked me to look at the time on my phone as she had worked the next morning at 7am and needed to be home for a reasonable time. She had lost her phone on a night out a few days previously, a terrible habit that she has. I told her it was about 10 past 6 in the evening. She replied, okay, well I'll have to be getting off around half 8 or quarter to 9 to get my uniform washed and dried, so keep an eye on the time for me. I agreed and we started playing a bit of rummy to start with. Now we weren't drinking alcohol or taking any drugs, we were just having a relaxed game of cards, chatting about guys and work. The usual stuff I suppose. Everything was normal. We played cards for what felt like two hours easy. I mean you can't mistake that length of time when you've had about 16 to 18 hands of rummy and were in the early stages of playing a game of poker, having got bored of the other game. I remember having the weirdest feeling come over me, like the light in the room dimmed and I distinctly felt an electrical crackly feeling start in the bottom of my spine and creep all the way up to my skull. I looked at her and she was looking at me all wide-eyed and silent, like she knew something was up. 
I blurted out, something is wrong. Really very wrong. Without blinking or reacting in any other way, she just says to me, look at the time. Which I thought was strange. I picked up my phone and looked at the time. A mixture of shock and dread creeps over me. I can't be right. It's not possible, I mumbled out loud. To myself, if anything. My phone must have glitched out or something. Getting up to turn the telly on to see what the time is on there. She's looking at me like, what the hell is going on? What is it? What's the time? She asks me again. I just repeat that it can't be right. And as I switch the telly on, the time flashes up in the corner of the screen. It said 1829. She sees it, and it's now just as freaked out as I am. Amy, that can't be right. Did your phone say the same time? I told her it did. I pull out a laptop to check the time, and even get a watch out of my drawer to see if they all matched, and sure enough, they did. We just sat there in a bit of a fog, like, what on earth has just happened? We tried to discuss it, but we couldn't make any sense of it. To be honest, it felt uncomfortable. Even to this day, to talk about it, it doesn't feel right. She breaks the silence with a joke, something like, Oh well, at least I have another couple of hours to chill with you. We just tried to forget about it. I just wondered if anyone has any ideas as to what it was. My family and I moved countries when I was young. And the first house we moved into in that country was about 40 years old, owned by a young guy. It was a rented property, and nothing out of the ordinary other than multiple neighbourhood cats roaming around the dying garden with very much dead lawn. When we moved in, we were fine for a few weeks, and then it started. I had a really good relationship with my family until we moved into that house. Everyone started to pick fights with each other, and when we were living there, nothing ever was going right. Everyone was on edge. The vibe was off. I sometimes saw pearly dust floating above me at night while lying down on the bed. I reasoned it as cars passing by, producing that reflection on the walls or something. But it was still there, even after the cars passed by in the street. I didn't think much of it at the time, and as a kid, I just thought we moved to a dusty old house. Then, the house would randomly get cold, and when it did, it would never get warm, despite the three portable heaters in the same room, and scarily enough, they were all functioning fine. And where it would get cold in the house would vary every time. At the time, we just thought that the construction of the house was old and maybe we had thin walls, or the heaters were all defective. Then one day, I saw it. Before I get into details, I want you to imagine this corridor, right in the middle of the house, surrounded by bedrooms and bathrooms. Basically, this corridor had no natural light, and it was very, very dark if all the bedroom doors were closed. Going back to the encounter, I was in the bathroom washing my hands, and as I opened the bathroom door to exit, I see this fog that resembles a human arm moving back and forth as if it was walking and disappeared at the end of the corridor. A full arm stretching from shoulder to the tip of the fingers, moving as if attached to an invisible body, resembling a brisk walk in that dark corridor. There couldn't have been some light coming outside from the windows because it was in the corridor that didn't have any natural light available. Plus, it was daytime. Only after this encounter, I felt the shiver down my back, a genuine shiver that you get when you see something that you cannot logically process. I didn't share these encounters with my family back then because I didn't want to scare anyone and I was in doubt about the experience. When we found a new place and moved out of that house, I finally felt ready to share this experience with my family, jokingly saying that the house was haunted. I only got to know then that everyone had their same experience, seeing something in the air, nightmares, ghastly arms and cold spots. My mum would have nightmares of these black shadows trying to enter into the house while she would hold them back out. My sibling, who also saw the arm, told me that while the arm was moving away, exactly the same way I've described as above, he swears that the temperature in that corridor must have dropped in that moment as he could see his own breath. I feel like this whole thing could be explained due to the stress of moving to a new country. I don't know. I'm just thankful we were only renting it temporarily, and that we were able to leave. So as a kid, and just generally growing up in that house until moving away when I was in middle school, I did occasionally from time to time hear voices. 
where I'd hear the voices varied from the house itself to the garage that was next to the house. I didn't really think much of it until I brought this up to my sister, and she told me she once saw a spirit in the house. She remembers once seeing a reflection of someone in my older brother's bedroom window. This window was on the second floor, so we know for sure it wasn't just some guy in the distance. She described this reflection as a bearded man in his mid-thirties. He had a little bit of a gut, but it wasn't like he was obese. He just seemed a little fat, and his outfit seemed fairly normal. She told me he wore a flannel shirt with jeans, so this spirit just looked like a lumberjack. So after swapping these stories, we decided to go to our parents about this. And let's just say, they had something to say about it. So when my parents bought that house, it really needed to be worked on and repaired, because the people that used to own it haven't actually lived or just looked after it in a long, long time. So they actually worked on repairing and just repairing the house for the first year they got it. My parents weren't all on their own when they were working on the house. They had a friend with the exact physical description. And when we asked what happened to this guy, my parents told both of us that he actually hung himself in the garage when they were close to being finished with fixing the house. So our story starts in Maine, in a neighbourhood reasonably close to Portland. I was up there to visit family pretty much, and the house in question belonged to one of my aunts. And I was with my aunt from Boston, who wanted to drive up to visit them too. We showed up at the house, and I was just told that the house was already pretty old when my other aunt's family moved in. And that's the most I know about the history of the house. I might ask later, because it sounds interesting. So we come in, settle down in the guest rooms, and we all start talking about the trip so far. And I make a joke about my outfit saying, oh yeah, I look like I'm a Salem lesbian. We all have a laugh, and I soon forget about that comment. We jump to that night, and occasionally throughout the night, I hear scratching on the door. I wasn't that concerned yet, mainly because my aunt's family had a dog and a cat. But most of the time when I got up to let them in, the hallway was empty. Now at first I wasn't worried. I was used to hearing scratches before the trip, because I just have a generally needy cat. So to clear my mind before bed, I decided to take a shower. But when I got out of the shower and I settled in, I heard my cousin walk to the bathroom and loudly say, ah, damn, forgot to turn the light off. And from that moment, I knew something was up. Next night, pretty normal, though I did still keep hearing the scratching. So I decided to go downstairs to grab a glass of water. But as soon as I was gonna head back to the room, I heard a very clear yet feminine, you're not allowed to do that, in my ear. And after a moment of confusion, I was kind of just happy I was leaving the next day. Over this summer of 2021, I was visited by an angel named Tibri. I know how this sounds, but I need to document this on the web in case anybody else ever comes across a similar situation. I was driving to meet up with my friend and go and have as much fun as you could in New York during peak COVID restriction times. I was depressed, driving and listening to all my favourite sad songs on my way to hang out with my friend. I park up around the corner of his house and just start crying thinking about my future with school and my business that I'm launching this year. I lit up a cigarette and a few seconds later I was begging God for an answer and crying about my future. Out of the corner of my left eye, a random guy who looks like a Greek god with golden blonde slash straight slash dread like hair, think Zeus, appears next to my car on the sidewalk, one way. He had a golden aura surrounding him as if he was going super cyan from Dragon Ball Z, but very light. I could not tell you for two billion dollars whether he was white or Mediterranean, or what, but he looked like an actual representation of what churches make gods look like in their art, even down to the halo part around the whole head. He walks up to me on some very casual New York shit, Queens. As I'm crying, he asks, Angel, I got bud if you need. Me, nah bro, <laughs> I'm good, I appreciate you. He starts walking away and comes back once more asking, You sure bro? Take my number down, I'm always around here. And for some reason I respond, you know what? Yeah, man, you seem cool. I've just been going through a lot. He goes, you shouldn't be sad. Everything's going to be okay. You got this. 
I got goosebumps. I ask the angel for his name and he's given me his number and he says, Tibri. I texted the number saying, nice to meet you, bro. And he walks away and responds exactly three seconds later. You too, my brother. I'll see you soon. And walks to the corner of the block, less than 15 yards. An immense light just shines down this one-way street and he disappears. I turn my car on, drive to the intersection, and there's only three places he could have gone. Straight, left, or right. He went neither. He vanished. In less than 10 seconds, this man was gone, and he walked to the corner. His phone number no longer works. Goes straight to, we're sorry, this number has. Some of you may laugh, but I feel like if an angel were to ever approach you and send you a message, what's the best way you think they could do that won't make it too obvious? For me, being raised in New York, you always got someone trying to sell you weed and take their number down, so I'm used to it. So instead of an angel coming down with its wings out and an obvious halo, what if they just pop out as a regular customer at your job? Or just someone you let cross the street, even when you have the green light? Or that homeless person who truly wants something to eat? What if that's why we are told to love each other equally? Because you never know who you could be really talking to. For all we know, this reality is all a test. And you need to pass the test by shedding kindness onto every soul you meet. If I caught my angel slipping, just know, Tribby, I'm going to make fun of you for eternity. So I know people talk about deja vu a lot. And people love to explain it away with science, like your brain is tricking you because insert logical reason here. You just feel like this scenario has happened before, but it hasn't actually happened yet. I do agree with this to an extent. All of my deja vus initially occur in my dreams when I'm fully asleep and unconscious. When it happens again in reality, I always stop and think about it. But I dismiss it because it most likely is just my mind recreating a sense of familiarity. I always try to find simple, logical reasons for unexplained things, because not everything strange has to be paranormal. However, I had this one deja vu moment where I can't explain. It's nothing spooky, just strange. Hear me out. I was 14 to 15 at the time. I was visiting my sister's boyfriend family in their vacation home, I was having a lot of trouble sleeping at the time because it was just really hot, humid, and I was uncomfortable as hell. I would only get like three hours of sleep a night and I'd never go into a deep sleep. One morning I woke up, but I didn't fully wake up. My eyes were half open and I was just staring at the wall in front of me, but it felt like I was in a trance. My brain wasn't registering that I was unconscious. I was in a state between being asleep and awake. I can't explain it well, and that's the first and last time that's happened to me. I imagine this is what the beginning of lucid dreaming feels like, if I had the ability to lucid dream. So I'm staring at the wall and a picture of a little girl pops up in front of me, just floating on the blank space of the wall. I've never seen this little girl before in my life. She's white, has blonde hair, is wearing a black and red uniform, black blazer with buttons on top, red skirt on bottom, and has a star hairpin in her hair. She has a super distinct red birthmark on the left side of her face. In my dream, I'm confused because I've never seen this girl before and I'm wondering who she is. After, I fully wake up and I actively think about what I just dreamed about. I remember everything and I write down what she looks like on the notepad in my phone, jotting down everything I mentioned in this post in case I forgot. The whole day I'm thinking about her. Later that night, my sister's boyfriend's daughter, who's the same age as me, is showing me her school yearbook. She flips through several pages and I see that little girl's picture, that same exact picture I saw that morning in my dream. The red and black uniform is her school uniform and she's in the second grade. The hairpin and the birthmark are all there. I'm super freaked out and I start to tell her about it. She's obviously very confused and skeptical. So I show her the notepad on my phone and she's like, how do you know her? I said, I don't. And I saw her in my dream. 
So understandably, she's creeped out, doesn't believe me, and I'm very sure she thinks I'm a weirdo. When I was around 14 or so, I had two friends very interested in magic, Wicca and the supernatural. I'll call them Abby and Brittany. One day, Brittany wanted to try something she had read about, a massage that was supposed to open up the senses or something and be a spiritual type release. This massage was supposed to only be done with two people in the room, but we were young teens and didn't care. We decided to try it in Abby's room, in what was basically an attic. Brittany would massage Abby first. We turned off all the lights so it was pitch black and Brittany started on Abby's shoulders. I was sitting on the floor, unable to see anything and that's when it happened. I began to feel weak and lightheaded, like I was about to pass out. I took a deep breath and was suddenly no longer in Abby's room. I had been transported somewhere else entirely. A bright blue sky, no clouds and no sun expanded above me. Flat, beige rock was as far as I could see. From the rock, people were growing, almost entirely made of beige rock. Some were formed more than others, some were just tall blobs. It was like the blobs were being shaped by an unfelt wind. I walked along in the eerie quiet surrounded by these people, until I came to a rock woman in the middle of my path. She was older, her hair in a bun with glasses on her face, and her arms had not been formed yet. I was just standing there looking at her when just as suddenly as I had arrived, I was back in Abby's room. Abby was crying and Brittany quickly turned on the lights. She told us that she'd seen a dark place with reds and blacks. It had scared her badly. I didn't tell them what I saw. I had thought that was that. We never spoke of it again. A couple of years later, Abby and I were at the mall. I had to use the restroom, so I went and did my business and walked out the store to the sinks. And that's when a woman approached me. She held out her hands, they were wet from washing, and said in what I'm thinking was Italian, scusi. She was dressed in beige from her glasses to her high heels, with her greying hair in a bun. I was shocked, but showed her how to use the air dryer for her hands. She said grazie. We smiled at each other and I walked out. I never saw her in real life again, but a few years after our encounter, I had a dream. The beige woman was laying in a canopy bed, surrounded by thick purple and red blankets and her family. A window could be seen looking over a beige city with a bright blue sky. It was clear she was on her deathbed. She told me something and I wish I could remember what it was. And then she peacefully passed. That's when I woke up sobbing. For years when I would think about her, I would tear up and would feel like I was having an adrenaline rush. When I finally was able to tell others about this, I couldn't speak about without crying. I often wonder about the beige place with the bright blue sky. Was it creation? The matrix? The place where we're all connected? Why her? Had I not seen her before, wouldn't that be a completely insignificant encounter? And of course, what does all this mean? So someone talked about the Telfair mansion. I'll call it a mansion, museum and a house, and Mary Telfair herself. And as I've come to find out, she might hate me. I've tried to go in there to look around, you know, the museum collection a few times, and I step in and it immediately feels like either A, someone is screaming into both of my ears, and or B, someone is pounding a brick against my skull. So I just don't go near there too often if I can help it, especially not at night. On the same token, the building is beautiful. Absolutely amazing. Unconfirmed, but I'm pretty sure that when she was basically the last of her family line, her wealth rivaled that of the Rockefeller and Vanderbilt. Like, filthy rich, you know? And there's a lot of superstition surrounding her will. Allegedly, in her will, she had demanded that female actors never be allowed near the home. And some other things I don't need to get into. You can read her will on their website, Telfair's Will. Anyway, on to my experience. So back in early September, I was about to leave Savannah for a bit and decided to drive the tour one more time late at night with my then girlfriend. So we're driving around and get to Telfair Square where we both get really quiet. 
We both feel like something is up, but neither of us says anything. So I pull over in the square adjacent to the mansion and start just looking around, trying to get the jovial mood back. She's on a phone when I look over to the museum. That's when I see it. A woman is standing next to the building, arms crossed, glaring at me. I'm used to getting odd glances, but she was shooting daggers through my skull. Metaphorically, thankfully. And I, looking back, was staring right through her. Literally. She was opaque. And standing behind her is a shadow. Tall and only identifiable between the literal darkness. And it's the purple-like outline that kept flowing around it. Like liquid darkness. Red eyes slanted in like some demonic entity pulled out of a movie. The moment this happens, my girlfriend, looking up from her phone, just says, Drive, in the super concerned voice. So I do, because I don't want to stick around. I peel out of the square and it feels like we're being chased. She couldn't see anything, but it felt like we were surrounded by an inexorable darkness, trying to close in on all sides. And the red eyes blinking in and out of my rear view. Best idea was to not stop. That's when she starts spilling out directions. Simple, turn here, next right, go. Simple stuff, but all super concerned and rhythmic like a GPS without a destination. Just an escape route. We travel halfway across the city before the feeling begins to fade, and we both start panting as if we've been running for our lives. There's no safe feeling between us. We're scared. We find a safe, well-lit spot and we debrief. So I say what I saw, and she just said she suddenly didn't feel safe, so somewhat on the same page. Neither of us knows what happened, and this wasn't the first time she's felt that way and told me to drive. This was the first time, however, where I saw everything. I don't know what happened, or what I did to upset anyone near that house, but I still make a point to never travel around the city, especially near Telfair Square, alone. Summer before last, my boyfriend and I took a road trip to Omaha, Nebraska, with the main purpose of visiting the Museum of Shadows. We're both somewhere between believer and skeptic, and thought it would be a great experience for us. Leaning in, he even paid the $20 to rent a spirit box to use as we walked around the museum. If you haven't visited the Museum of Shadows, I'd recommend it, even if only because I found it very cathartic. It's mostly dolls with tragic stories attached to them. But walking around reading all the stories of suffering and sadness, families associated with many of these items, was very heart-opening, for lack of a better way to word it. Some items I felt were just creepy, and that's where people associated haunting coming, when people own them. I believe sometimes people create their own hauntings by just being afraid of an object. Same with the dolls owned by children who had passed. The families are just so saddened and grieve so hard, they begin to assign their child's spirit to those items. It's so sad, but really made me feel a great connection to people I didn't even know, which I think is great for the spirit, however sad. So our spirit box was not giving us anything, literally not a single intelligible word. We were not angry or disappointed. It was sort of a neat if we hear something, but understandable if we don't sort of thing, because we sort of assumed a majority of items in there couldn't be haunted. They've got this doll, Demas, and when I say my heart rate increased just typing her name, I'm not lying. And she lives in a chicken wire cage toward the back of the first floor of the museum. She's scary looking, not a normal looking doll. I got uneasy when I just saw her, and this isn't a building of frightening dolls. Maybe that's intentional though, maybe they put her in the cage to raise your apprehension. There's a sign above her that says if you choose to speak to her, always say goodbye, which of course you should do with any spirit, but Demas is apparently particularly malicious. I'm a pretty bold soul, so as we're standing there together with the spirit box, I decided I wanted to talk with her. Hello Demas, I said, and the spirit box just kept clicking. I didn't know what to talk to her about, but I'm always worried about lost spirits, so I decided to ask, are you okay? And without hesitation, the spirit box said, Amanda, extremely clearly. My boyfriend and I both heard it. I said, did it just... And he was like, yes, absolutely. It said your name. I said above that I'm brave, but I was immediately filled with a sense of dread. 
Something about it saying my name and that we've gotten absolutely nothing else. So that box the whole time was terrifying. And I do not scare easily. I didn't continue the conversation. I just said, goodbye, Demas, and ushered my boyfriend away from her because I was so uncomfortable with her following that. Just now, I went through their Facebook feed to see if I still felt the same about her and saw an event where they let people hold her. I've never felt so appalled seeing such innocent seeming photographs. That doll is the only item I've ever encountered that I'm sure is 100% haunted and maybe even malicious. My story starts off a couple months before I was born. My mother told me that my dad was into demons and thought that doing a ritual on my mother and myself would make us luckier. I don't know much about what was used except skulls, candles and a wired liquid my dad put on my mother's stomach. Nothing much happened after that with my family, except when I was two years old, I was crying and pointing at a corner as my family asked what was wrong. Growing up with my little brother, that's not regular behaviour for a two-year-old. All I can remember about that was a big spider with the face of an old white man. I addressed the colour because my dad didn't really like white people all that much. This memory is a weird one because I remember it through a different person's perspective. Fast forward a few years and I'm around five or six and my entire family, even people I don't talk to, now we're at my grandparents' house for about seven hours. And me as a kid, I wasn't paying much attention and just playing around until my grandma told us all to gather around the table. She was just talking about how she and all the women in the family were having dreams about losing something important like money or family. In all their dreams, it would be an old white man who's taking it from them. At the time, I didn't care because I was bored. But the thing I remembered so clearly was my grandma saying that her family was cursed. When I was seven years old, I moved into a new house and I've had the worst experiences in my life at this house. One of them was when I was sleeping on my couch and I woke up and I couldn't breathe for a good couple minutes. And I was just there screaming for help. Another one where I seen a pair of shoes in my house that were too big to fit anyone, but I was a kid and didn't care. But as I was sleeping, and I woke up at around 7.30, I saw an outline of a man looking at me. And the last one when I see a headless thing run into my sister's room. Four years later, we moved into our last house. And this house wasn't the scariest or the worst. Just a lot of stuff happened there. The third month, my grandma died, which broke my family apart like bad. About a year in the house, I had a weird experience with my brother. And it was summer and around 3 a.m. And I was laying down when I heard sounds coming from my brother's, 19 years old, bed. And when I look at his bed, I seen him looking down at something. And when I looked down at what he was looking at, I saw him sleeping that scared me. So I just went to sleep. I told him what happened and he just said he had a bad dream. I have some more, but I think that's for another time. But when I was 12, I had sleep paralysis. And I seen that spider with the man's face. And I also seen my grandma, but nothing about her was her. And she just had a big smile on her face, but it didn't look human. I also saw people I didn't recognize as well, but they looked the same as well. I always joked about dad doing voodoo, but he confirmed it a couple of months ago. And a day after he told me that I watched a video of someone having sleep paralysis and seeing that spider with a man's face. This experience happened to me around a year ago. I had just moved into a new apartment with a few roommates. We'd been there about a month or two at most at this point. I had just come home from an excruciatingly taxing day at work. I walked through the door to the apartment and realized that nobody was home. Awesome, I thought. I dropped all my stuff by the door, pet the cat, grabbed a towel and got into the shower. It was one of those days where you just kind of sit down in the shower and just let the water pelt you just to let the muscles relax a bit. I was in the shower for not more than five minutes before I heard a loud bang on the bathroom door, followed by the jiggling of the doorknob. Naturally, I'm shocked. 
The bang was loud enough to sound like a gunshot went off. It was too loud to be the pipes. It sounded like someone tried to kick down the door. I'm thinking, did someone break in? And I then made an executive decision. If I'm going down, I'll go down disorienting them. So I jump out of the shower and rip open the door while unclothed, and there's nobody. Not a single person was there. I grab my towel and I start checking the rooms, windows and doors. Still nobody home. All the doors locked. All windows still intact. Hell, even the cat was still asleep. I reluctantly go back to the bathroom to finish my shower and don't think anything of it. Later that night, I'm just chilling in my room. Still nobody home. I left my door open for the cat just in case it wanted to come hang out in my room. My roommate's room was almost directly outside of mine to the right and I heard the cat in the hallway just hissing and angrily meowing at their room. The door was closed so I'm thinking what the hell could she possibly be meowing at? I walk up to the esper and I say what's wrong sweetie? There's nobody in there. And as soon as I say those words something falls and clatters onto their bedroom floor and the cat bolts away. Just in case someone had gotten home without my knowledge, I knock on their bedroom door. I get no answer. I peek into their room and there's a bunch of CDs on the floor seemingly ripped off their disc rack. I pick them up and put them back and leave the room. I leave the door open this time just to make sure I'm not being crazy if it happens again. My fiance stopped by not an hour later after she'd just gotten off of work. We were chilling in the living room just watching TV and talking. From the way the apartment was set up, if you're sitting on the couch, to the left you can see all the way down the hallway and into my roommate's room if they had their door open, which it was for now. My fiance got a sudden chill and to my left, I can just see out the corner of my eye, an all black silhouette of a man just standing in the doorway. I turn to look at him and he walks away to the right, where their closet is. I ran to their bedroom and slammed their door shut. I look at my fiancé and say, did you see that too? She nods her head with a scared look on her face. And I tell her we're just going to leave for a while. We grab our stuff and head out. I call my roommates later and ask them if they've ever experienced any weird stuff since we moved in. They told me that sometimes while I'm at work, they hear people talking in my room, even though nobody's there. Needless to say, I'm happy I don't live there anymore. First off, I've never really had anything paranormal happen to me in all my relatively short life, 25 years. Being a scientist, it never really made much sense to believe in something that can't be proven. However, that all changed one night. About four years ago, I was attending a college in southern Arkansas for my bachelor's in biology. My then girlfriend and I didn't have much money, so we shared an on-campus apartment so our scholarships would cover the rent. This complex was on the outskirts of campus, right next to a rather large pine forest that some people went to to smoke. But you could always hear them. In between the forest and our apartment was a dirt parking lot. Our apartment sat on the first floor of the complex, on the side closest to the tree line. We came back to the apartment after grocery shopping one night. After bringing all the groceries in, I decided to sit out on the patio, looking at the forest in the night sky. It was a nice spring Arkansas night with not a cloud in the sky, so this didn't surprise my girlfriend. She went inside and I sat down. As I'm listening to the whippoorwills, I notice a green light coming from just behind the tree line. It was blinking relatively slow and looked as if it was around someone's neck and that thing was digging. Not digging with a shovel, but more animalistic, like a wild boar digging for grubs. It was making no sound and seemed to be minding its own. As I'm watching this thing very intently, a car pulls into the dirt parking lot, briefly flashing its headlights over the light. At this point, the light stood up, turned solid red, and darted in a straight line through the trees, away from the car. Not like a deer running through the trees, mind you, but straight, without moving. I estimated that it would probably moved about 40 to 45 miles an hour. Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night. The next day, I got up early and went to investigate where the light was. There was a small opening next to a creek where I estimated the light was coming from. 
However, there were no signs of digging or tracks of any kind. I walked in the direction the light fled to. The clearing quickly went back to being a thick understory made up of lots of scrub oak, greenbrier and limbs. I could barely walk through without getting cut up and I certainly couldn't walk a straight line. I do not know what I saw that night. I've certainly never heard of anything like this and I've never seen that light again. I talked to some of my wildlife management friends to see if they had tagged some animals with an LED collar or tag and they looked at me like I was crazy. Doing so would make no sense and would reduce the survival of the animal. So what was it? An ET? A lost spirit? A person? Or an animal? I guess I won't ever really know for certain. Since then, I've seen many other paranormal things. I've stayed in cabins where the chairs moved by themselves. I've witnessed green orbs from the sky crashing to the earth. I've witnessed spirits vocalise and speak out about possessions my friends have taken from them. It all started after seeing that light. My question now is, why? What was that light? Why did it start this paranormal chain of events? For a long time, I've had encounters of the paranormal kind. Mostly while awake, but there have been a few instances that the spirits of loved ones visit my dreams. Back in 2005, I was living in New York. I moved here from Texas due to heavy involvement in drugs and gangs. I was there for about five months, met a girl and moved in with her and her family. One night, I had an incredibly vivid dream about my grandmother. In my dream, I was walking on a beautiful beach with white sand. Just ahead of me was a canopy or something. You know those pop-up things people put up at picnics and barbecues to give shade? Well, I woke up to it, and there was my grandmother, sitting in a folding chair, in front of a folding table, wearing a beautiful black dress. Totally out of place for where we found ourselves. I sat down in the chair opposite her and looked around, confused. It was an odd scene, to say the least. Oh, hey, she said, realising I was there. Want to play some Uno or Dominoes? We used to play one or the other every time we were together. Still confused, I said, sure, but what are we doing here? As she set up the dominoes and did the whole shuffling thing, she said, well, you weren't around and I wanted to say goodbye. Goodbye? Where are you going? I asked. She didn't answer my question, but did say, please promise me that you'll stay out of trouble and be a good man. I promise, but where are you going? What are we doing here? I asked. And she looked out over the ocean. Remember, I love you, I heard her say. As I turned back to say, I love you too. She was gone. I stood up and looked around and saw her walking into the surf. I walked after her saying, Nanny, Nanny. That's what we called her. Where are you going? She didn't answer and kept walking out into the ocean until she was completely gone. I was stricken with a sense of panic, but only for a moment, because as I looked around, I realised the canopy, chairs and table were gone and had been replaced with a set of wide, white stone chairs or stadium-type seats, and sitting on all of these were all of my family, uncles, aunts, cousins, and my mother. I woke up gasping for air with a totally weird feeling of urgency. I had to call and check on my grandma. I called my mother immediately, and before she could say anything, I asked, Is Nanny okay? My mother paused, and I heard a sniffle. Son, Nanny passed about an hour ago. I was about to call you and let you know, she said through restrained sobs. The dream suddenly made sense. She had come to me to say goodbye. See, I was raised around my mother's side of the family, who's a bunch of white country folk. I'm mixed, and I'm a little more brown than the rest of the grandbabies. Growing up, I was treated less than welcome by quite a few family members, but never Nanny. She loved me like I was just one of the babies, never made me feel unwelcome. If anything, she made me feel more loved than some of the others. We were pretty close. It was so heartwarming to know that before she left our plane of existence, she came to say goodbye to being thousands of miles away. It's a moment in my life that I'll never forget. My dad was bought an old house. 
It's a homestead from the 1840s in rural Nova Scotia. It's been a ski resort, a bed and breakfast, a farm, an artist retreat, and had a woodman on the property until the 1960s. It has a very long history, and many people in the community are familiar with the house and the lakefront property it sits on. Locals have told us how much the place meant to them, and told us stories about the owner of the house between 1971 and 2004. This guy was properly loved in the community, and used to let community children swim in the lake. The house isn't on the lake, the house sits on a steep hill over the lake. It's about 200 feet in elevation change and 300 feet between the lake and the house. One winter, a brother and sister wanted to play on the ice and asked the owner of the property if they could. The owner said no, but they were welcome to walk down to the shore of the lake. The sister was fine enough with this answer, but the brother decided he wanted to do what he had done a month ago when the ice was thicker. He decided he would toboggan down the entire hill, onto the gravel and then onto the ice, a popular stunt many kids have done before, but never in late February slash early March. With his sister begging him not to, he slid down the hill, across the gravel and onto the ice. The ice along the shore was strong enough to hold his weight, but he slid further and further until he slowed over thin enough ice to break from underneath him. Firefighters failed to find him for hours, until he was found, by the shore, under the ice. It's unknown if he was trying to swim to shore while trapped under the ice, or floated that way. Shortly after my dad moved, I was in one of the guest rooms that overlooked the lake. It was a June evening, and the world was filled with the sounds of small frogs trying to fuck. I was admiring the view from the window, when I saw light over the lake. The sun had been down for maybe 5 or 10 minutes, only orange and blue haze was left around the horizon. As I looked over the lake, I saw a small light moving quickly around the lake. I assumed it was a reflection of some sort, but it caught my eye enough to watch. It was darting to seemingly random points, quickly stopping and continuing again in a new direction. I thought it may have been a bird or a group of moths. It was dark. All I knew was that what I saw was strange, and I remembered it. This was long before I knew what happened on the lake. A couple of months later, and I'm back at my dad's house with some family, and over drinks the topic of witnessing paranormal activity came up. People shared stories and eventually I talked about the light on the lake. My dad's significant other begins grilling me with questions about how the light moved and so on, and she claims to have seen these lights as well. My dad would see the light on the lake a few weeks after. A close cousin sees it a few weeks after that. We would go into the shared theories about the light that darts across the ice for a while. A couple of months ago, by and my dad is at the neighbour's house. The neighbour also lives on the lake. They were telling my dad about all the stories about the lake, pretty much a detailed account of everything that took place at that lake in the past 40 years. And eventually, the story about the kid who drowned came up. As the husband finished telling my dad about the story, the wife said something to the effect of, me and my mum have been seeing a light over the lake occasionally since that day. They then had a long conversation about witnessing paranormal activity. This was around five or six years ago. I would say I was a skeptic, but not adverse to the idea of ghosts. I worked in a nursery, kids, not plants. And the building itself used to be a hospital for tuberculosis. The baby side of the nursery was in the old morgue for the hospital, not my side. I'd never heard anything in that building in the nursery, but numerous girls, staff, had said they had seen a woman walking around the baby's nap room in the old morgue. But when they ran in, it was empty. It had a video monitor, so they would see her on the black and white screen. The older kids were in the old hospital. Anyway, I had covered many times in the old morgue, and had worked in the old hospital side for three years, without any incidents or hearing of any incidents. One night though, when I had moved to the office, not working with the kids anymore, I had a few things to finish up when the nursery was closing, so I spoke to the manager and got their keys so I could close. The owner lived in a house right behind the nursery, and there were houses all around. Also, again, I would worked there three years and was often the person, first person to arrive in the morning. So when I decided to close, I wasn't worried. It was also Scotland in the summer, so even though it was 6 at night, it was very bright outside. It was about 6.30 when I finished what I was doing. I was in no rush and was in a great mood because I had managed to finish something so important. So I was kind of swanning around the building. 
As the last one out, I had to check every room to make sure there were no kids or fire hazards. And as I was checking a room at the back with glass, Perpix walkway looking into the entrance, I saw a tall man dressed in dark clothes walking in the front door. I ran to the entrance to tell them all the kids were gone already and to check the other building, but no one was there. Very strange, but I figured I must have imagined it because I was looking from the other side of the building. So I cracked on with checking the rooms. I got to the next room and I had a panicked feeling telling me to get out, run as fast as I could and not look back. I have anxiety, but I've never experienced anything like it. It was like a serial killer was chasing you. As soon as I got outside the door, I felt a wave of calm over me. I locked the door and cycled away. I actually met one of my colleagues just driving away. That's how quick I'd been. Anyway, the next morning I told the manager and basically said I wouldn't close again and I wouldn't want anyone else doing it on their own. That's when the girl who'd been doing it for months said that she had seen the figure, the same as I'd seen, every night, either at the door or preschool, and she always felt that it meant her harm. She needed the pay increase with closing, and she was very level-headed, like me. We actually worked in the same room and got on for that reason. I didn't want to think about it too much, but she did what she had to do, then got out of there ASAP. During the day, we had no problems at all, so we thought that maybe the entity was fine with day-to-day -day business, but once it was done, they wanted us out of there. Either way, that feeling and the clearness with which I saw that man has made me seriously rethink ghosts. I'm not even sure if that's what it was, but honestly, that feeling was unlike anything I've ever felt before or since. Pure hatred in your heart. When we first heard of this trend, we saw it as a way to try something new, to explore the boring and strange neighborhood in which I live, with the hope to see an unforgettable and creepy happening. What we saw, I'm sure, could definitely be described that way. It was dark, it was around 11 p.m. We were spent after trying to find something cool with the Randonauts app. We had tried to manifest something scary, an abandoned building or an entity but the randomly generated points would always lead us to the countryside, and even trying to reach them was impossible as they were private properties. After some hours, we decided to surrender, and just to walk around my house as we had never really explored those old streets, and we found a weird and chained gate that blocked the way to a huge, seemingly abandoned house. There was a couch in front of the door, on which a black cat was comfortably sitting and there was a dim light that came from a window that made it look as if there was someone inside. Near the couch, there were some objects from the 50s, like a basketball basket covered in rust. The atmosphere was spooky and there were bats flying around, but we decided to keep walking until we found something that looked like a dead end street. A street lamp started working at once, making three gates visible. The first gate was right at the end of the small road. The second one was on the left, and the third one, the most important one, was on the right. I saw another black cat behind the first gate, but I turned around, and after a little bit, I looked back at the gate. As soon as I did that, I literally jumped after seeing a black sheet on the ground, which was basically being dragged, but it quickly disappeared. I asked my friends to leave, as we had previously seen a weird shadow, who could have been someone behind some bushes and it was giving me anxiety. But we decided to stay and check behind the third gate. There was something strange. It was sitting against the wall as if it was at rest. And it seemed like it was holding a huge stick even though no hands were visible. Now that I think about it, it may have looked like the Grim Reaper's sickle. A little far from it, there was an old chair and a drawing resembling a face appeared right on the wall. It was smiling and it had eyes, a nose and a curved drawn line which represents a smiling mouth. There was some sort of noise close to it on the same wall and a house which was behind it had a five pointed star on the balcony. After seeing this, I really felt as if we were in the wrong place. I started panicking and convinced everyone to leave. 
and we got back home safe, but still with many questions regarding what we saw. These questions had led us to go back to the creepy street some days later. We thought about going in there in the daylight, but somehow we ended there even later than 11 p.m. and we met a different scenery. A huge white van was resting in the exact same place where we had seen the hooded man, and the drawing on the wall wasn't there anymore. We still can't explain what we saw and probably we never will, but it's a mystery that will probably haunt us forever. So I do ghost tours in Savannah, Georgia. A great start already. I love paranormal stuff. Ghosts, demons, angels, etc. And ever since I've started working here, I've yet to have a tour where something weird hasn't happened. So I have a lot of experiences around this. This one though, was my very first. So a few months back in August, when I first started walking there, we gave tours through some homes. I'm contractually bound to not say where, sorry. But basically, super famous homes, and on the second floor of this house, there's a nursery. Now, a nursery is already super creepy, with period dolls and furniture, and scares most people, including myself. I'm not scared of the dolls, yet, but I am kind of scared of the kid that lives there. Oddly enough, there's no evidence or news that a child ever died in this home, but I was told about him by my former co-workers. Three people have told me they've caught him on camera on my tour, and one person last week put a name to him. He's a young lad, about eight years old, in a late 1800s nightgown, and a bowl cut. He's a devious bugger, and has been known to turn on people's phone flashes and ringers as well, to scare many young kids whose parents do not believe their kid when they say stuff like, Mommy, can you tell him I don't want to play with him? And stuff like that. So in August, there was a three-day stint where he would be caught in the room in different spots. The second night, my friend was on the tour and sent me the picture he caught of the kid in the back, peeking over a crib. This isn't what bothered me. What really messed with my head is what happened the following week. The house got a different feel to it. No one liked to be there for too long and everyone, including myself and my co-workers, noticed it seemed much colder than normal. Note, we contractually cannot touch or alter anything in the house without receiving a massive penalty, fine, and being fired which includes the thermostat, obviously. Well, as we all braced ourselves through the week, I got caught up in something I really wish I hadn't. As we were moving people to a different room and I was waiting to get the next group into the house, I remembered that my manager had gone to the basement to use the private restroom, and I wanted to make sure that they turned off the downstairs light. So I make my way over the nook and open the door. There's a woman standing at the bottom of the steps. In the quickest instant, I noticed she had flowing brown hair, and was dressed in a very formal, very 1800s hoop skirt dress. That was just in a split second, because before my brain could process a response or a greeting, she looked up the stairs at me, and her eyes were glowing green, like flashlights through the dark downstairs area. She glared right through me, and started running up the stairs. I say running, but more so like flying, charging right up the stairs. I slam the door and buck out of the house, call my manager to notify him and take a needed break. Once shift was over without another hitch, I got to asking around and four separate people told me that I had seen Mary. Again, can't give the full name, sorry. As fate would have it, Mary died in that home and had quite a few children, not all of whom are fully documented for. They proceeded to explain that since infant mortality was so high, it's very possible many kids went unaccounted for thus leading to a possible explanation for the kid upstairs. My major issue then is, why did she come after me? My son is nine years old, and he's always been sensitive to energies and spirits. He's able to see how energy changes colour too. This past year, we're struggling with these shadows. When I asked him to describe them to me, he said they're small. They move incredibly fast in every direction. They don't interact with him. He stated, it's like they can't see me, but I see them. They feel frustrated. Now, I myself about all Claire's more or less. Some stronger than others. I have a 100% accurate radar of creepy, dangerous, or annoying energy, 
Whatever it is, a simple pissed off spirit or something way lower in the scale. I can't sense those shadows. I don't feel my radar go crazy, but my son is really scared of them. He says there are so many. For the past few months, we've had a long ritual before bedtime. First, I set a UV light in his room. UV lights don't allow a safe energetic vibration for ghosts to manifest. We do the energy bubble. It's a grounding and protection exercise I do, where I breathe in and out and dip into the universal life force. I call in the flow from the source. I let it pass through my body and I create a shield all around the house. Fun fact, I often change the energy I call in, whatever is needed. Healing is green. Protection is blue. Comfort is purple. My son, nine times out of ten, tells me the right colour I produced. Second step is the sigil of protection we make on his third eye, using an oil made with Solomon's seal root, which seals off all evil. The same sigil I reproduced in a magnet I handmade, and he stuck it right above his head. He has a bunk bed. Third, I got him a St. Benedict medal, which he rubs every night before going to sleep. Patron protector against evil, used in Catholic exorcism too. Sometimes, the shadows are so prominent that all this is not enough, and I have to use my own energy to blast them. This is a last resort, though because it's depleting for me. After I use my own energy, he says a lot of orbs appear in place of the shadows. Have any of you ever seen or heard of the shadows? Note. I am able to not only feel, but also see with my own eyes the shadow people. This house is shielded in ways you all cannot even fathom. I'm a holistic healer, a crystal healer, a reiki healer, an earth witch, and I dab in pranic healing. I never before heard of the shadows he mentions. Be warned that I never taught my son any of this. Just recently, I taught him breathing exercise to calm his anxiety with strange stuff happening to him. And of course, the ritual we do nightly and why. But I kept both my kids well separated from my spiritual activities. My most prominent theory? Dimensions. Since he also sees orbs which are manifestations of spirits of different nature, my best guess is that these shadows might either be remnants of a lower dimension or visible through the veil presences from another reality. But my guess is as right of, as any of you all could have. Okay, so it started about two years ago. Fairly short story. I love a bubble bath, my way of relaxing. It has always felt safe and comforting. One night, I was soaking in the bath, nodding off a bit, enjoying the silence. Then all of a sudden, I had the strongest feeling. Mm, when I say feeling, it was like a vision, a flash. That a woman was going to rush into the bathroom and hold me under the water. I can still see her when I think about it. Young, blue eyes, pale, dark hair. I had a vision of her kneeling next to the bath, holding me under. The feeling was so strong, and I felt so scared that I got straight out of the bath. After that, I felt a bit uneasy in the bathroom, like she was watching me. I just tried to put it in the back of my mind, tried to convince myself it was a silly thought. Nothing else happened for a few weeks, and I was starting to feel comfortable again. Until one night, I was brushing my teeth in the bathroom, getting ready for bed. There's a huge mirror on the side of my bathroom wall. I glanced in the mirror and I saw her. She had her arms outstretched towards me, like lunging towards me. I could feel a breeze, like the vision was only there for a few seconds, like a flash. I was scared and it stayed with me. That was the second time I'd seen her and she didn't feel friendly. I did what a lot of people do. I spoke to her. I told her firmly that she had no permission to be in this house or to harm me or anyone in it. I repeated this message around the house whenever I felt uneasy and was alone. My partner would think I was crazy. I haven't seen or felt her since. I still feel uneasy in the bathroom. The most recent scary experience was only last year, late last year. I was in bed, asleep. 
I remember I was having a nice dream. Can't remember what it was. Probably about Johnny Depp. <laughs> and I remember I woke up with a start. You know, like when you have that feeling of falling. When I opened my eyes, I saw a man coming towards me. He looked so angry. Again, it only lasted a few seconds. I remember feeling like I needed to protect myself. He was tall, had a dad bod, brown hair, brown eyes, and a pink polo shirt on. I remember closing my eyes, and when I opened them again, he was gone. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. After that happened, I spoke aloud that no one, good or negative, was allowed in the bedroom, and I still visualized a barrier across the door, stopping anything from getting in. I also now have a selenite in the room. Nothing has happened in that room since. On a side note, I do have a dog that sleeps in the same room as me, and it didn't react. That makes me feel that it could have just been a bit of a dream, you know? Like a dream imprint. It felt very real to me and still does when I think back. Make of these stories what you will. I don't normally have things like this happen and I feel I have a very good grip on my emotions. When I am freaked out because of a film or when it's in real danger, I can understand which emotion is real and which is my mind playing with me. As I mentioned previously, I usually get feelings, smells and hear voices. The stories I've told here are the only times I've seen something. That's three times in just over 30 years. This took place a lifetime ago, as I was still a kid living with my parents. I recall the event to best of my memory, but the order of such events might be different, so bear with me. The experiences took place during the span of a year or so and were very traumatic for me while not being excessively scary for the most. Remember, I was around 12 or 13 years old. We used to live in a big semi-detached house spanning four floors for a total of 400 meters squared plus garden. I'll skip the basement sounds as I think those were suggestions of my mind and not worth reporting. Besides, there were unexplained sounds from the basement which was converted to a playroom and where I didn't feel the need to spend much time in. Anyway, the ground floor was a living room with a big pendulum clock. It was missing the internal weight to prevent it from ever going off. Decorative, let's say. Kitchen, a service toilet, and a small bedroom for an au pair living with us and taking care of the house. The second floor was the night area where we had a pa my parents' room, my brother's room, my room, and a guest room, which was closed most of the time as unused. The third floor was an attic where we had a table tennis table, a computer, and two small rooms for all the stuff we didn't want to trash. I used to spend my afternoons with friends playing Super Nintendo and stuff. One afternoon, I was still playing on my own as I was in the house with a cleaning lady only. She was in the garden doing some stuff, when I clearly heard the clock going off. It was a busy day, so I didn't pay much attention to it as it was not scary at all. I did mention it during the dinner, and I was jokingly deemed as delusional as my father opened it, clearly showing that the mechanism was blocked, and sounds from it were impossible. I took it like any 13 year old, and I left the table pissed off heading to my room. A couple days passed by, and one evening I was playing in my room as always, while my parents and brother were on the ground floor watching TV. I was on my way to the toilet when I heard a very loud laugh coming from the upper attic level. That scared the living shit out of me, as it was so real that I started calling my father in panic, saying a man had a very loud laugh in the attic. He rushed up and went up for inspection while I was holding my breath. Again, it was a no-show. Nothing there and I started double-guessing if there was something wrong with me. Following these two events, I became not paranoid but reasonably scared. Hence I stopped sleeping with my door open like that would save me from a horde of ghosts. A few nights later, it must have been 3 or 4 a.m., I woke up for no reason. I've always been a light sleeper, and I saw the window curtain moving, like there would be a significant wind blowing on it. I stood up to close the window, just to realize it was perfectly closed and there were no wind nor leaks. This was spooky enough to switch the lights on and wait for the sunrise to show up. In the following months, I tried to ignore minor events like curtains moving while walking to my door, like to inform than that they saw me coming. Lights and open doors which I was sure would be closed. 
Eventually, we moved out due to some financial complications. Not to mention that I was the only happy person in my family when that happened. To this day, I'm 40 now. I remember that house with terror. I was never hurt in a material way, so at least I acknowledge that. This story takes place in Texas in December 2018. Weeks leading up to this incident, my mom did notice a hand. The hand had a lot of fur and claws at the end of each finger. It looked like a mix between a human hand and a dog paw. My mom saw it was clawing slash scratching the window. She went back to sleep and didn't think too much of it, and there was a curtain at the window, so she didn't see anything else that night. A couple of nights later, I woke up randomly. When I woke up, I noticed something with thick fur. I rubbed my eyes to make sure of what I saw. I looked through the spaces of the curtain and saw a werewolf creature six to seven foot tall. I remember it looked like the head of a husky and the fur was thick. The colour of this werewolf was dark grey, brown and red. The werewolf had pointy ears with some white on them and had ice blue colour eyes. I was very intrigued by the werewolf. I didn't feel scared or threatened in any way. I felt the werewolf was curious and had muscles all over the body, had abs and was on its hind legs. It stood up like a human. I did feel I was hypnotised for some reason and I'm not sure if he saw me. I do say he because I felt it was a he, not a she. Hard to explain. I did feel the werewolf with blue eyes was coming back to see me again. I've never seen him again, but yet I felt like I knew those eyes like I've seen them somewhere. I know it's strange. Like a week later, I woke up to the howls. In the area I live in, I don't usually hear coyotes or wolves. Then I checked my phone to see that it was 3.30am. I thought it was an odd time to hear howls so deep. The howls were so deep the ground felt it was shaking a little. Then I heard something horrible. I heard a poor dog being torn apart by giant werewolf beasts. There were at least four in a pack. They sounded big. The howls kept going. The poor dog kept crying and yelping as it was being eaten. I was too scared to look outside, but it didn't look that close, maybe a mile away. My mom heard the howling and a dog being ripped apart alive and the poor dog crying and yelping. My dad was in a deep sleep. My neighbours heard them too and my next door neighbour. My next door neighbours were young people who would drink at parties and go out late. So they were about to leave and open the door. And I heard them scream and one said go back inside. And I heard another shut the door and lock it up. I'm not sure what scared them but they don't usually get scared easily. I heard my other neighbour from downstairs talking on the phone saying crazy things happen late at night. He kept saying the stories you hear when you were young just aren't stories, they're real. He said he can't sleep at night. I don't live in the countryside. I live in a mall and stores nearby. There's some spaces between trees and some spaces of land and I've seen a candle in the areas of the land with fences. Luckily, I've never seen any werewolves and I've never seen coyotes in the area or any of that. I still hear howls from time to time, but I hear it from miles and miles away. It's weird. I do hear them from far away, I know. I just wanted to share this story because it's something I never expect to happen to those bloody screams from a poor dog. It's something I don't want to hear again. This all started when I was 12. It was around late 2012. We met the girl, let's call her Sarah, and her boyfriend at the time through my cousin and a bunch of his friends. Sarah was a really kind-hearted person, almost too pure for the world. She was black, although lighter skinned in complexion, had short natural red hair and freckles. She was also very heavy in weight, I believe almost twice my size, and keep in mind I'm a plus-sized girl myself. And almost everyone she knew, including her boyfriend, who was also cheating on her and let it be known, made fun of her for her looks. I was going through the exact same thing and still am, so I understood. My family and I, as in my mom, stepdad and little sisters, tried everything we could 
to at least get a smile out of her, with varying degrees of success. But we all knew she was very depressed, and her self-esteem was very low, to the point of no fix. Sarah stayed in our apartment for a couple of months before moving in with my cousin's then girlfriend. Let's call her Susie. My building is in the front of Susie's was all the way on the other side in the back. So Sarah would come back and visit on a regular basis. All seemed normal until one day she showed up. I don't remember everything that was said, but I do remember one thing vividly. She sighed and told my mom she was leaving. I didn't think much of it at first. Then one day, I came home from school to the news that Sarah had committed suicide, and I'm 100% sure it was her boyfriend, mainly, who drove her to her breaking point. She was only 23, she was also pregnant at the time, and it happened a month after I turned 13. Susie moved out of the apartment complex very soon after that happened, and if you don't already know, when you commit suicide or die a violent and unexpected death, your soul tends to remain trapped here on Earth for various reasons. The experience I'm about to explain in a minute made me believe in this even more strongly. So in other words, she is stuck in the apartments in which she died and haunts it. Several months later, everyone pretty much has moved on. I made the dumb move of taking a shortcut through that particular building. When I walked past the apartment door, I started catching a smell that I very much associated with Sarah. I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me at first, but the smell was so strong that I started feeling dizzy. I felt like I was being watched and I started hearing heavy, lazy footsteps. The hairs on my neck and arms were standing at attention. Something urged me to turn around and that's when I realised it wasn't my imagination at all. I saw a huge, shadowy figure at first. Remember I mentioned she was very large in size. Then saw the edge of a blue lilo and stitch blanket that once belonged to me, emerging from the shadow. I remember giving the blanket to her months before she died and because she loved it so much, she always covered herself in it. The closer the figure was coming to me, the more I got scared, the sadder was the atmosphere and the heavier the air. I booked it the hell out of the building and was even amazed at how fast I got home. To this day, I get chills and feelings of being watched when I walk past that building. I never saw her physically again, but I still try to avoid that building when I can. As for her boyfriend, I rarely hear from him now. Maybe he settled down with another woman and he's now laying low. Maybe he moved. Day and night, Mount Hope Cemetery is always unsettling. Every time I pass by it, I always feel like I'm being watched. Most of the time it's an easy feeling to brush off, but there are three instances where I've been shaken to the core. The first. I was in fourth grade. My whole class went on a field trip to the cemetery. From the very beginning when I, it was brought up, I expressed my lack of interest in going, but I was the only one not showing enthusiasm, so I knew then it was going to happen. I dreaded it hoping that my teacher would decide to cancel the trip. I wasn't allowed to skip school as a kid, so I never even asked. I went to the cemetery with my class. They were all having a wonderful time. I was immersed in vibes that were making me sick to my stomach. We were told to make rubbings on paper with a crayon of at least three gravestones that caught our eye. I didn't want to, but I did anyway. While I'm rubbing these gravestones, I felt like I was stepping on the toes of someone and that I was bothering someone. I managed to rub too. The third I picked, my crayon was still in my left hand. I grabbed a piece of paper from the pile near me. When I knelt down to begin rubbing it, I had an overwhelming feeling of anger wash over me. I stopped dead. For a second, I couldn't move. This gravestone didn't want to be rubbed. I tried to tell the reason to myself. It's a 117-year-old rotted corpse. It can't possibly be anything. To no avail, I could have forced myself to rub this one. I decided that wasn't best. I didn't rub a third one. I couldn't get myself to do it. It freaked me out. I said it out loud to no one in particular. There's something wrong with this grave. It doesn't... I stopped talking. I wasn't really comfortable talking about the experience to anyone around me. I knew they wouldn't have believed me anyway. I know what I felt and it wasn't peaceful. If I rubbed that grave, someone or something would have attached to me and it would have been nearly impossible to shake off. 
The second, it was in summer of 2012. I biked home from work. I worked at Wendy's and lived in Vizi. The cemetery was on my right. I looked because I saw someone. I thought it was a dumb teenager doing something stupid. It wasn't. I saw two shadows watching me, one looming over a grave. It had long, creepy fingers and a thick, dark, malevolent energy that seemed so bent on anger and misery. It must have been an entity of pure evil. The other was a man, a shadow standing right next to it. It was akimbo to a thick tree. His top hat brim remained straight, even as close as he was to the tree would have bent the brim. He must have been seven feet tall. The looming one lunged toward me. Fuck, I yelled, completely unsure I was about to get possessed. The akimbo one flinched, and they were both gone. I was still myself and relieved, heart pounding, but I was okay. The third. I was biking home again, through Mount Hope Avenue. I almost got through the cemetery without seeing anything, then suddenly, two lights caught my attention. They were moving crazy fast. One was chasing the other. They crossed the road in front of me, the one lagging behind suddenly pounced. They let go. They both darted past the road and on the other side. The moment they began get getting smaller, they were gone. Conclusion. Of course, there are times when I can't avoid going past Mount Hope Cemetery. I sense other spirits and the like. I just completely downright refuse to acknowledge them. There's definitely something sinister about the cemetery, and part of me feels like there might be something that wants to latch onto me. To start off, I work at a donut shop that is open literally 24 hours a day. Everyone wonders why we're open so late, but homies need their donuts, so it is what it is. I am lucky enough to work late night shifts, which I guess is prime time for paranormal activity. When I first got hired, I was pretty indifferent to the ideas of ghosts, spirits, demons, etc. I'm a college student, so I have a lot more important things on my mind, like not drowning my ass in debt or just having a good time. Right after I got hired, one of my friends who convinced me to get the job asked me what position I got hired for. When he found out it was for the late night shifts, my guy busts up laughing and says, good luck bro, hope you know how to catch flying donut boxes. He's usually a bit of a clown, so I really didn't think anything of it. The first experience I had came on my very first night. I was being trained on how to ring up orders correctly and navigate the menu system. It was around 2am at this point and it really wasn't too busy, so my trainer felt like he could leave me on my own for a bit and to call him over if I ran into any trouble. I pulled out my phone and started to run my playlist when all of a sudden I felt a cold finger tap me just under my shoulder. This made me freak the hell out immediately for one reason. My back was to the glass used to separate the customers from the register, COVID, which means nobody else could be standing there. I immediately turned around only to see nobody there and I called over my trainer to explain what just happened. He just nodded and smiled before saying, yep, welcome to the job kid. Surprisingly it took this long for something to happen honestly. The rest of my night was a tale of donut boxes constantly being thrown from shelves, lights turning on and off, my phone battery draining from 70 to 5% in about 5 minutes, you name it. One of my most frightening experiences to date involved me actually seeing something. One of my duties at my job is to check the bathrooms to make sure they're clean and everything is in working order. On one of the nights I had to do this, my manager was with me. We began wiping down the sink when all of a sudden the door swung open. We both turned to look at the doorway and a huge guy walked in. He was probably close to 6'5 or 6'6 with a beard that would give Gandalf a run for his money. When he walked in a bit closer, the room just filled with the stench of rotten sour ass. It smelled like someone went to Chipotle, ordered everything on the menu and decided to unleash the depths of hell on our walls. This guy looks at me and asks if the bathroom is open to use. Me, assuming the man needed to unleash the contents of his pants, grabbed my things and walked out with my manager to let him do his thing. We both rated right outside the bathroom door for about five minutes before my manager suggested we go check on him. When we walked back in, it was completely silent and the stall door was closed. My manager and I both looked at each other in confusion and decided to knock on the stall door. 
No answer. I pushed it a little bit and it was unlocked. Nobody was there. This dude was nowhere to be found and there's only one exit out of that bathroom. I can say for absolutely certain he didn't walk out of that bathroom. Obviously, there have been so many more experiences that have occurred not only to me, but to everyone who works there as well. I will say though, it's a lot more fun to be the veteran of this place watching the new hires get freaked out at the voices, flying donut boxes, physical touches, etc. Because now I've been through it all and seen it all. So, I go to a relatively old college, built in the 1800s, and there's a bunch of stories of it being haunted, but I don't really buy into it that much. I've been here a couple of years already and haven't seen anything too weird, minus what I'm about to say, which is possibly the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. My roommate is never here. She always just stays at home and commutes to school for classes, which means I basically live alone in my dorm. As an introvert, I couldn't be happier. After dinner, I usually just go back to my room, lock the door and work on homework. So a few nights ago, I was at my desk working on my paper in the dark and listening to music on my phone. All of a sudden, the music stopped and my laptop switched off on its own. Neither the computer nor my phone would turn back on, like something had just disabled all the electricity in the room. At that point, I just kind of accepted my fate and decided that would be a good stopping point for homework. It was probably after midnight anyway, and the next day was a Saturday, so I didn't need to use my phone to set an alarm. I decided I'd probably just go to bed and let both devices charge. Less than a minute after everything shut off, there was a knock at my door. I remember walking to the door and going to look through the peephole, but after that, I remember nothing. I woke up in my bed the next morning on top of the sheets, which I never do, and I didn't even remember going to bed. On top of that, when I checked the door, it was unlocked. I never leave it unlocked, even when I'm in the room. I'll check the door three times an hour out of paranoia, just to make sure I didn't forget to lock it. I've even turned around halfway to class to see if I remember to lock the door. I figured it must have been my roommate who came to the room that night, and I was just so tired I don't remember. So I texted her to tell her she'd forgotten to lock the door last night but she responded by saying that she was never at the apartment. I thought she was lying or something, but then she FaceTimed me. She was in a completely different state. The only two people I would have opened the door for were her and campus security, and I have no idea why security would have been at my door past midnight, especially since I was making zero noise, and no one else has a key, so I would have had to have been the one to unlock the door. Nothing in my apartment was out of place or missing, I finally assumed that I must have dreamed the whole thing and that I'd somehow unlocked the door in my sleep. My phone and laptop were working fine, after all, and showed no signs of damage. A couple of days later though, I started telling my friend in class what had happened. And as soon as I mentioned that my electronics stopped working, some other girl that I didn't even know butted in and asked, was there a knock on your door after? The girl proceeded to match my story almost exactly. She was alone in her room all the electricity shut off, there was a knock on her door. She went to check through the peephole and she remembers nothing after that. Her only difference is that she woke up on the floor next to her bed and not on top of her bed. She says she also knows someone that this happened to, but she won't tell me who. I'm just thinking that if there's three of us, this may have happened to a lot more people that we don't know about. Has anyone experienced anything similar? Is there anything I should do about this? I don't think campus security would do anything about it since nothing was stolen. I wasn't hurt or anything, and there aren't even any cameras in the building. Great security plan, I know. They barely even do anything about actual crime, so I'm pretty sure I'd get laughed at if I said anything. What was this, and what do I do? I can see a couple types of shadow people with my own eyes. The first time happened when I was with a friend. She's also sensitive. It was late evening and we were on a street which usually is busy, but at that time of day is fully emptied. She was driving. I was on the seat next to her and another friend was in the back. Suddenly, I see the shadow zap super fast in front of us crossing the road. 
It was shaped as a human, but completely black, no see-through. We all were laughing and chatting and making loud jokes. Suddenly, I shut up. She shuts up and stops the car right there and then. We both look left, and then we realise we both saw that we look at each other and simultaneously say, Did you see that? The person in the back, which also was looking forward as we did, saw nothing. Same spot, some time later, I was walking back home and I saw it again, but this time I was standing next to the streetlight. My friend and I did some digging and found out some months prior that a boy died at that intersection in a motorbike accident, which still made waves because of some controversies. Earthbound spirit, we wondered. Fast forward a few years and I met a few times a different kind of shadow people. I'm not sure what it is, but I call them leeches. Why? Every time I saw them, they were hovering behind or next to a living person, like they were attached to them. I thought I was losing it, but this event that happened once at a friend's home made me rethink it. She was a woman with a lot, and I mean a lot, of unresolved anger. The type that are hyenas to everyone but their friends. We're at her house, a total of four people. Three female, one male. We had dinner. We were sitting in the kitchen having drinks and snacks. We were telling funny stories and we were laughing loudly. You know those situations where you laugh so much that tears form in your eyes? Well, I'm there, talking with my girlfriend I mentioned. She's sitting at the head of the table, alone, and I see this perfectly formed human-shaped shadow, fully black, dark and perfectly defined. The thing is bent on her right shoulder, looking forward, listening. And I felt this sudden ice in my veins. I had a sudden fit of nausea and my guts felt like twisted in my belly. I kept looking in a state of shock and the thing, when it realised I could see it, jumped back. I could feel its surprise that I could see it and in a fast, sudden, instant whoosh it disappeared. Run away so fast all I saw was a black whooshing blob for an instant. I was telling a joke but suddenly I shut up. Imagine the scene. Three people that were loudly laughing suddenly and simultaneously are looking at me with a terror-struck face, all asking, what? What did you see? They said my face suddenly turned grey. They saw the blood wash down my face. I was petrified. Each one of them was directly looking at me since I was the one speaking when this happened. I explained to them what I saw. The friend went silent and she said that an uncle of hers saw something similar not long prior but she was laying on the couch and her uncle saw a dark shadow hovering over her. Once I calmed down, I realised three things. The shadow felt as if it was feeding off my friend's energy, hence why I call them leeches. My friend's extremely negative attitude was fuelled by this shadow thingy. The shadow was scared that I could see it, was surprised of it, and ran for its life away from me. Just now, I completely just saw a man in my living room. I was crying in my room because of something going on in my life, and I went downstairs to get water. I felt like somebody else was in the living room, like another person was just there with me. My initial thought was my dad, because he usually wakes up at absurd times because of his sleep apnea. I walked into the room and saw somebody staring at me. I thought it was my dad at first, but when I focused a little harder in the dark, it was not. I blinked and he wasn't there anymore. I got so stuck to my stomach and literally just ran away. I ran into my room and I cannot stop shaking. I'm so afraid of what just happened. This isn't even the first time this has happened. A few months ago, while I was alone at home for the week, I thought somebody broke in. From my room upstairs, I heard my dog barking. I thought he needed to go outside and when I went to let him out, out of the corner of my eye, I saw and heard a kitchen chair move. My, go my dog started screaming, barking at it, totally freaking out. While I was standing there in the state of frozen shock, both TVs turned on at the same time. I freaked out and made a sprint for my keys on the table, got in my car and called my parents, sobbing. I wanted them to check the cameras before I called 911 and they told me they saw nothing on them. 
They thought I was being dramatic and do not believe the full extent of my explanation that this chair had moved out from the table by itself. Aside from that, and what just happened not even an hour ago to me, smaller things happened to me too. A light in my room that has never once flickered started rapidly flickering, turned off, then back on again a few days ago. A door slammed in my face by itself not too long ago. Things are always being misplaced, lost, or randomly turning up after not being able to find it for a long time. Sometimes, I think I can see someone or something move out of the corner of my eye. I get these random feelings that someone is looking at me or in the room with me when I'm alone, usually accompanied by full body chills and goosebumps. At times, I've heard fully audible words. The night terrors are so unbearable to the point where I avoid going to sleep. Waking up screaming is a common thing for me, and my parents have run into my room to wake me up countless times. These are all recent, occurring within the past six months. But I'm often told by my parents that I used to talk to my dead grandfather, who I never met as a young kid. I was too young for me to have any current memory of it today. They say that I used to say I have a friend who brings me flowers and looks just like dad. Apparently, when they showed me his license, I got really excited and told them he looked like that. Another thing I happen to actually remember is seeing something in church when I was a kid. During a service, I had seen a thick golden blanket kind of thing pass through the aisle. When I saw it, I remember turning to my dad and saying, Dad, I just saw God. And he laughed and said, no, you didn't. Ironically enough, I grew up to abandon the Catholic faith. I wouldn't call myself agnostic, atheist or a skeptic, but I do always try to think of a logical explanation to things. I just feel like I'm going crazy. I'm so done being afraid and feeling this way and I have no idea where to turn to. I'm begging for someone here to help me understand what's going on. Since I was young, I've been told I can see spirits. I moved around a couple of times while growing up here, and each house had a spirit or more in them. When I used to live in an apartment at six to eight years old, I remember waking up in the middle of the night and seeing two white yellowish figures at my doorway. I rolled my eyes to see if I was tripping, but I really did see them and saw them move. One was tall, the other was short. I didn't feel scared, but in disbelief, especially when they started dancing for me. My dad has always been a skeptic, and still is, but apparently we drove past a cemetery one time, and I was too scared to look because I said, I don't want to see no white people, ghosts, and he told my mom that. Another time, still the same age, we moved into a house by a forest, and I saw a huge brown figure pass me at the corner of my eye, and I legit thought it was a bear inside that house. I chased after it, but it was gone. Then my aunt's house caught on fire. Her first son passed away in 2000. My mom decided to take me to the burnt house. When I walked through the doorway, I immediately felt pressure or a force pushing me. My mom felt it too. My instinct was to go upstairs to my cousin's room. I went inside and I felt sorrow, even though I had never been in this room, nor was I attached to it. The room also felt cold. I found myself in tears and I didn't know why I was crying. But maybe it was my cousin's spirit's feelings. Maybe he was sad his home got burned down. I remember seeing photos of the house right after it got burned down. I saw orbs in the pictures and handprints on the walls with long fingers. I asked my aunt for the photos, but she doesn't know where they are. My aunt's friend was also a medium and told her the house was a bad spirit or his bad luck. I don't remember which, and that she would sell it. But she never sold it after many years. Years later in middle high school, I moved to this townhouse. I lived there until I turned about 21. This house has always made me feel uneasy. I'd hear creaking of the floors upstairs like someone is walking. I thought it was just the house being old, but it was built in 1981. There were a couple of times my dog would stare up at the staircase and growl at it. I remember her first sticking up. After that, she would sit by me like she's scared because she was shaking. 
My mom also had left food out purposefully for spirits. She even cursed her co-worker to death. I'm not sure if it's even related to the house. I used to pray every night because I knew I felt scared all the time when it got dark. I think that house was the only house I truly felt scared every night or whenever it's dark. But one time I was praying, I felt someone's breath on my left ear and heard a male voice whispering in a different language. It felt sinister. I was so scared I froze. I told my dad, but he didn't really believe me. We then moved to Arlington by the courthouse in a newly built apartment. I never felt or heard spirits since then, and I was never scared. More time passed, and I decided to move to my aunt's house, which was rebuilt on the same ground. I remember seeing a white figure pass me. It literally looked like someone in a white t-shirt went into my room. I tried to follow it, but it was gone. Another time I was eating with my aunt at the dining table. We were just talking, and I looked up and saw a black figure above her head. I froze because I felt scared but then it disappeared after two or three seconds. It was weird, because I saw it clear as day. This story happened three years ago when I was 15 in my village. I don't tell this story much because people tend to think I'm making it up, but I've been thinking of it quite a lot this week and I want people to know. My village is located in a rural area that's protected by the government because it's been considered a natural paradise for the last 30 years. This means that exploration in the area is quite difficult nowadays since it's forbidden to cut trees which means that it's a huge forest. I was spending my summer there and my favourite thing was going hiking, although I'd never gone alone into the woods, just roads with people. My grandma had told me that cleaning services had opened and rehabilitated a path that has been covered in bushes and trees for the last 30 years because of a race that was being prepared, like runners and stuff. Usually, I'd go to the nearest town, one hour away by foot, by the only way I knew, the road. On my way back from seeing friends there, I took the new path my granny said was safe alone. Mistake. The first part of the path was the easiest, just too many obstacles and slides, but it was nothing compared to the rest. The second part was a hill full of rocks that was the hardest thing to go up. Literally had to climb on four legs like a dog. When I got to the top, I looked around and found some animal bones. I didn't pay much attention to it since the area is known for its big population of wolves and bears that go out at night. I continued my way faster than before. This part was plain floor, where the woods really begin, so it was a relief until I got to a dead end. Some huge trees had fallen exactly on a row on the path, and it was impossible to pass them. This seems really off to me, because there were no other fallen trees. The weirdest part? Aside from those trees, there was a little barn. Yes, a barn, in the middle of the woods. I thought to myself that it was probably abandoned. It looked like it. So I decided to throw my bag into the little field that belonged to the barn, and then I crossed the fence. I crossed it running without realising the most bizarre thing. That field had no trees in it. It was clear. No bushes, no big plants, nothing. It really shouldn't be like that if it was abandoned. I started feeling concerned about how the location of the fallen trees was so coincidental. How there casually was a barn inside, a clear field, when that path had been closed for 30 years. It just seemed really off. I went on and luckily, I was reaching the last hill my grandma had described, the one that connected with the village. Suddenly there was a moment of silence in the woods, which allowed me to hear some branches cracking behind me. I thought to myself if it was a bird or something, but they came closer. They really sounded like footsteps. After trying to convince myself it was probably an animal, I was so afraid I couldn't look back. I started walking faster. Guess what? So did the footsteps. I just started running after noticing that, and so did the footsteps again. I was running for my life at this point. Suddenly, I started hearing incredibly loud grunts. Everything was going really fast. Luckily, I got to my village in a minute or so after that. I got into the patio of the first house I found and closed the door. It was a relative's house, no need to call the police. I stayed there for 10 minutes until I got my breath back and then came back home. 
I get chills from just remembering the place, not having a signal in the middle of nowhere, and the grunts. It makes me think there was something following me since the barn, and the trees were just a distraction to slow me down. Never went into the woods alone after that. I'm not sure what I wish to gain from this, other than potential insights from what actually happened here. This is something I've never forgotten, all the feelings associated with it, and I want to hear if anyone has ever experienced anything similar. This is my earliest childhood memory. I don't know the exact age I was, but it's one of the few memories I'm able to recall from my childhood as early as I possibly can. I remember waking up next to myself in bed. It felt like I was in complete and total control of my body, totally aware and conscious. I recall being extremely confused and worried about what was happening and stepping out of bed. I'm unsure of what my motive was, but I like to assume it was probably to go and wake my mom up out of concern. Now, this is the part that has never left me. I feel as if I can put myself back in the situation and see it just as clearly as I did when I was a child. As I went toward my door, I turned back to see a tin garbage bin at the end of my bed. The lid started to move and an illuminated fiery orange figure started to crawl out of it. It looked like it was made out of magma or a personified fire. I remember screaming, but there was no sound to it, which scared me even more. I ran out of my room and down my stairs. When I looked out at these windows that surrounded the front door of my old house, I saw what looked like an animal, more specifically a dog. It was completely white and had yellow eyes, and it was staring back at me through the glass. I completely remember how I reacted to this, with genuine panic and fear. I ran back up the stairs and felt like crying, but I couldn't. I was only able to hear my own thoughts, and was unable to make noises. The environment around me, my house, was, however, it was actually very vocal. I recall the noises of my stairs and the sound of what garbage made out of tin would actually sound like shuffling around, constantly. The ending makes no sense at all to me. I was at the end of the hallway facing my room after running back up the stairs, and saw the garbage monster thing struggling to leave my room. Everything was almost completely dark around it, and I swear it's like I can relive seeing how the monster itself illuminated the furniture it was close to just like how a fire or flame would in a dark room. I clearly remember hearing, it's not real. This was the voice of my mother who was asleep. When this happened, a dream catcher I had hanging in the corner of my room began to consume everything around me. My memory of this part is not as clear as the rest of the dream or experience, but I remember there being light, with the center focus being the dream catcher. I'm unsure of what happened at the end of all this, I do not remember waking up or anything at all related to the event from that point forward. The only thing I can recall afterward is the feeling of knowing it wasn't actually real and that it was a dream. From what I believe, I'm confident this was some sort of out of body experience or a lucid dream. However, I also firmly believe that this was the first experience I ever had with feeling raw, genuine terror. There has never been a time I can recall such feelings of intense fear other than this incident, from whatever age I was when this occurred. I'm now 21 years old, and I've absolutely encountered the feeling of fear many different times, some of which where my life was actually in danger. But nothing has ever felt as intense as I did in this dream. I think that's why it's never left my memory. I just want to know what some of you think, because I'm unsure of what to make of any of this. Some of this is far weirder than I would like to admit. But as I go along in each post, you'll notice the serious escalation in activity, much to my mother and sister's horror. Although I loved spooky stories, I never experienced anything myself until we moved into number 74. I swear my mother is a gypsy at heart, and we moved around a lot growing up, but this house was different. It was in the country, a small village, and the house was on a council estate. We had a row of garages behind our garden 
where people on the estate could park their cars with a few little secretive cubby holes and dens that were hidden by trees and thickets a kid's dream. The very end garage owned by a local creepy bloke had been vandalised. Someone had spray-painted Red Rum Believer onto his garage door. I never knew what Red Rum meant back then. One warm day, about a year after moving in, we were all eleven, my sister six. A small group of us consisting of me, my sister little Jem, my best friend Gemma, next door neighbour Kiri and her cousin Michael, were hanging out in one of our dens shaded by the trees, just mucking around as kids do, beside the vandalised garage. Michael, being a bit of a class clown, stood up doing an impression of one of our larger teachers at school. My attention was drawn to the ground where he was standing. The solid, smoothed dirt appeared to be moving like fluid. It looked like it was rippling like water. It was the strangest thing. I think it was only me that saw this. None of the others confirmed what I was witnessing anyway. What came out of my mouth next was even stranger. We need to dig there, I told them. I couldn't explain what was compelling me to say this. Something's under there. I continued. They all just looked at me and started asking why. I couldn't give them an answer besides we just need to have something buried there. I think boredom and looking for adventure convinced my friends and my sister to go along with me. So we found sticks. I had my sister go and pinch two spoons from our house, which was only yards away. And we began digging in silence this little circle of mud. They must have thought I was mad, but I couldn't explain it. I just knew that there was something under there. Kiri stops because she has dislodged something hard a few inches long. We scrape the dirt off with one of the spoons and can see it is a bone. One end is all sharp and jagged like it's been snapped. We look at each other a bit spooked, but decide to keep digging to look for more. It's probably an animal bone, Michael tells us, but this weird feeling had come over our little group. Finding more bones the deeper we go, we collect this little morbid pile and start digging a wider circle but our finds start to dry up. I think there were about 15 bones, roughly. Some were a fair size, others small and broken. We gathered them up, and I remember putting them in a sandwich bag and taking them to school the following Monday. I plonked them on the teacher's desk and informed her we had found all these bones near my house. I'll always remember her face like a kid for really getting these gross bones off my desk. She told us that they were probably just animal bones and put them under her desk. I'm sure they probably went in the bin after we left that day. That's probably all they were, but I think it's curious that if I hadn't seen the ground moving like that, we would never have found them, and the fact it was next to the creep's garage didn't help. I only learned a couple of years later, Red Rum was murder backwards. A bit slow to catch on, I know, but it does make me wonder if someone knew something about him. We never heard any more about it. Little did I know, it was the start of something far more terrifying and long-lasting. About five to seven-ish months again, I decided to hang out with my ex-wife to see how things were going. A foolish mistake that I chose to partake in. I meet up with her at night time and I drive around town. I had a feeling that I shouldn't be around her due to the obvious reason as to why I divorced her in the first place. But my human mentality and maintaining a relationship took over. There were three warnings, I guess you could say, that happened throughout the night. I would like your thoughts, interpretation or explanation on this strange night. I would gotten pulled over because my lights weren't on. I haven't gotten pulled over in about three years since this experience. The officer, being a kind man as well, informed me that my tail lights weren't on. I gave him a surprised expression and said, huh, that's weird, because from what my switch here is telling me, they should be on. He raised his eyebrow, walked to the back of my car, came back and said, surprisingly, they're on now. I didn't touch my car's light switch at all. They were supposedly on the entire time from when I started my car, like 30 minutes prior to this. The officer apologised for the misunderstanding and bid me a good night. Nice guy. We were driving around on the country back roads and ended up in a small town. I wanted to park and chill because the cop experience weirded me out a little. 
I pulled into the parking lot of an older church and drove all the way in the back as no other cop would pull in and question me. I parked in the back and turned my car off. Me and her started conversing. About 20 minutes into the conversation, we both noticed that the street lamp in front of us was flickering at an odd pattern. The lamp would flicker violently for a couple of seconds and fade in and out of brightness before being shut off. We looked at each other confused. The lamp next to that one had shut off, repeated the same pattern but backwards. It faded in and out of brightness, flickered violently and then shut off. A sense of dread and doom filled the atmosphere around us. I turned my car on and slowly drove out of the parking lot. When I turned into the main road and began to drive away, I glanced over to my rear view mirror and saw that the two lampposts turned back on simultaneously. Coming from the old church, we drove back to the city that I had gotten pulled over in. I park in front of a closed coastal Mexican food restaurant. We started talking and the atmosphere in the vehicle got hot and heavy. She wanted to make out and made the first move. Me being me, I didn't decline this offer. We started to make out. I told her to get in the back. She did and I followed. As things were on the verge of getting far from just a simple make out session, as clear as day, we both heard a loud, intense and heavy growl from what seemed like a beast coming from the rear passenger side of my car. The growl vibrated the vehicle from what it felt like. We stop, sharing an expression of fear towards one another. I hear a disembodied voice say, tell her to leave. I get out and investigate around the car. Me and her are the only living things out here. I tell her we need to leave and the night is over. I drive her back to her car and we go our separate ways. I later found out that my ex-wife had been using black magic on me for years and had been paying witches to manipulate my emotions and beliefs as a result to continue staying with her and seeing her when I shouldn't be. My personal belief is that my guardian angel or whatever being was trying to warn me and alert me to not see this woman again. Me being stubborn as hell and or having my judgement clouded by dark forces didn't listen until it became obvious. A whole ass different level of craziness. So, what are your thoughts on this? This happened when I was a kid, and I'm 23 now, and it still gives me chills. Okay, so I'll jump right into it. Both of my parents were volunteer firefighters, and I practically grew up at a fire station around all sorts of first responders. This fire station was connected to one of the county police department's offices, which was a small four-room office upstairs with two entrances, a door that led outside and another that led downstairs to the bay area where the fire trucks were. Everything seemed normal and fine, until a friend of my cousin and my cousin's husband, an EMT, used a Ouija board to try to talk to an officer that had just died a week before. So let me give you a rundown on this cop real quick before I get into the paranormal stuff that started happening after his death and the Ouija board use. So from what I remember of him, which isn't a lot, he was a pretty crooked cop. He would arrest people in the small town for drug possession and then he'd give the drugs to his son after they'd been processed into the system and counted so his son could sell them and they'd split the profits. This goes on for years and there's rumours, but no proof of who was stealing the drugs. Until he died. This officer had a surgery and was taken stolen pain meds and accidentally OD'd. They found his body and a large amount of stolen drugs in his home. Okay, now to the paranormal. So my cousin told me about them using the Ouija board there. This officer's death was recent, so them doing this to talk to him, well, me, a kid who loved horror movies, was super cool and fascinated. The one key detail I remember from the story my cousin told me was that they asked the spirit who it was and the spirit whispered the officer's name into my cousin's ear. For a while, I thought my cousin was messing with me to scare me until a few months later, I had an experience there. So I was about 10 when this happened, maybe 12 at the oldest. I used to go work out with my parents at the fire station because I was a chunky kid and the family doctor rode my parents' ass to get me to lose weight. Well, one night, we had finished working out and my parents got a tone to a house fire and my mom agreed to stay there with me until my dad got back. 
So we're sitting there watching old training VHS tapes on the TV in the dark, and we hear loud stomping upstairs. My mum and I immediately froze and looked at each other, because we thought it was just us there, and we're pretty sure it's just us. It was bizarre. The stomping would start in one room, then stomp to the other. Filing cabinets would open and slam, doors would open and slam almost as if it was looking for something. Then the stomping got to the middle of the room and stopped. It was so quiet you could hear a needle drop. The way this fire station was set up, there was a ramp that went down to the bay where the trucks were. So my mum and I are sitting there in silence, just listening. And we hear the door to the bay open and someone walking up the ramp. My mum got up and went to the open door that looked out into the hallway at the ramp and nothing was there. Not a soul. But as clear as day we heard a person walking up that ramp. Moments after that, every sink in the downstairs bathroom turned on. All eight of them. And I know someone will say it could have been faulty pipes. But do faulty pipes turn all the knobs on the sink? I don't think so. This all took place in the span of 10 or 15 minutes. We turned off the sinks and shortly after, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, my dad and all the other firefighters pulled into the fire station. My mum and I told my dad and everyone else what had happened, but they didn't believe us. They told us we were making it up and we were hearing things. Ever since the Ouija board was used there, the feeling of that place is just weird and creepy. Where before it seemed very familiar and welcoming, like a place of safety. My room at the time was decently big. I'd say about 14 by 10 feet across. Now I was going to bed and I dropped some stuff from a snack run in a plastic bag against one side of my room opposite of my bed. And I was sleepy, so I decided to go to bed. One important thing to note is I only had one previous paranormal thing happen in the house. And it was almost seven years prior to this. And it was voices from the main floor, which I heard from the basement. Back to what happened. So I'm passing out, and about what feels like two or three hours after falling asleep, I didn't check the clock, I hear that plastic bag moving. I thought maybe one of my family members was getting into my snacks, so I was about to roll over and scold them. Right before I do, I hear the most blood-curdling growl in my ear, like a cross between a bear and a big dog and I was close enough I could feel the humidity of its breath. Nobody in my family could make a sound like that, nor would anyone do that to one another. Anyways, I'm on my side still paralysed, but the weirdest part right after I hear the growl, the bag continues moving as though somebody is rifling through it. This continues for probably 10 minutes or so, it felt like hours, till I pass out again. Honestly, I was so tired from a long day, I crashed hard. I worked in construction back then. The following morning, I woke up to not only see the bag moved about four or five feet, but its contents moved around in the bag. I've got a very good memory, especially when it comes to judging environments, etc. Needless to say, I just about jumped out of my skin. Ten years later, I still remember what it sounded like. The fear of being so powerless, so resigned to fate. Guess I'll die, comes to mind. Now since that happened, I feel like my body sleeps with one eye open. This kind of feeling of fear was not something I've ever felt before since then. It does help that I'm a bigger dude, 6'1", about 190 pounds back then. But to feel so overpowered really cuts at the core of your being. Now this was the only encounter that truly scared me. I was doing laundry and the light flicked off. I looked over and see a hand and at the top of what I thought was my dad's head. Our family dynamic is a little rough housing with the parents when I was growing up. So I was running over to pester my dad. Well, to my shock, nobody was there. I searched that basement low and high. Nobody but me. I bolted upstairs after and I got my dad. We cleared the basement a second time. This time I was armed with a knife. Like that would do anything. Nothing. Again. Laundry again, but this time, I had my laundry next to the switch, and I was putting hangers on them, folding, etc. Suddenly, I feel a breathy whisper in my right ear. I flip around, and there's an older gentleman with a striped red and white shirt, horizontally striped, with jeans about four feet away from me. 
I glanced at him long enough to know it wasn't somebody I knew and booked it. Thinking back on it, he looked so neutral, almost confused. Anyways, got my dad again and we did a full clear again. Nothing again. It's also important to point out there is no way to get in or out of the basement without the whole house knowing, as the stairs are super loud and the basement windows all have bars which are all locked. Also, there's no way he would have been able to get behind me, as I was just working there. Also, the space between me and the entrance would have led him to bumping into me, as it's only about half a foot due to laundry baskets and clothing piled there. I have a fair amount of encounters, but these are some ones I remember well. My grandparents have always acknowledged that their house was haunted, and I've had several experiences there, and so has everyone who spends enough time at their house, so it's definitely not a secret. Though it's known that both my great-grandparents hang around, my great-grandfather actually passed in the house, and the previous owner of the land is supposed to be hanging around too. More on that some other time. But when I was still a kid, 14 years old, my brother and I had a shared experience in our grandma's art room that also served as our bedroom when we would spend summers with them. My brother, 12 at the time, and I were wrestling around on the bottom bunk of our metal bunk beds when we heard my grandma come down the hall and open the door next to ours. It was the back kitchen slash living room. It was a duplex, but they added a door to connect the two houses once my uncle was injured and they needed access to both parts of the house. Where they kept my other uncle's dog because he had fleas. Sad, I know. But they would go to the back to let him outside. We heard her and George, the dog, walk down the hall, and the door of my uncle's room opened and closed. To get to the hallway, he had to go through the front kitchen, and my uncle's room to get to the back hallway. My brother and I thought nothing of it, because it was normal for us to hear the back and forth foot traffic in the hall, either to the bathroom, the closets, or the back kitchen slash living room. But not long after my grandma and George had left, probably five minutes or a little more, we weren't really paying attention because we were too busy goofing off. We heard a knock on the bedroom door. We stopped playing and looked at each other for a minute because we hadn't heard my grandma and George come back and it was too soon for her to be letting them inside again. We said come in and heard the sound of the baby gate scraping. My grandparents put the baby gate up so my grandma could leave the door to her art room open without the animals getting in. Mainly the fat cats that were allowed to go anywhere but the art room. And we both saw the doorknob turn. It was one of those bar ones I really don't know what they're called or how else to describe it. And the door swung open, but no one was there. We both panicked and ran down the hallway because there was no way anyone could open the door and just disappear before the door swung open. The hall was just too long and we would have heard the footsteps on the old echoey hall floor. We found my grandma in the front living room playing games on a Kindle like she loves to do. And even though we already knew it couldn't have been her or my granddad, who was asleep in their bedroom connected to the front living room, since they took shifts such for my uncle who's handicapped and my granddad was always on the night shift before we passed two years ago. We asked her if she had tried to play a prank on us and that it wasn't funny. She asked us what we were talking about and we told her that I've already written above. Without skipping a beat, she told us we shouldn't be scared because it was just our great grandma Marion, my granddad's late mother, and that she was just saying hi and checking up on us and that she does the same for my grandparents by turning the TVs on and off randomly and would do so persistently until whoever was experiencing it said hi and told her everything was all right before letting them go back to whatever they were doing usually sleeping. But needless to say, it still freaked my brother and I out pretty badly, and we decided to stay up front with Grandma for the rest of the day, and for a week or so after that, we refused to go to bed by ourselves, and would wait until the other sibling was ready for bed before going back to the room to sleep. Looking back, none of the experiences anyone has had in the house has been scary, so it feels foolish to have let the experience scare us so badly, but we were still just kids. And the idea of our great grandma coming to check on us, especially without us being able to see her, scared the living hell out of us.
This happened to me about four or five years ago while I was living in a major metropolitan area of the Pacific Northwest. My wife and I lived in a condo on the second floor of this oldish two-story building. While my wife was back home in Texas for the long weekend, weird shit started happening in our home. On the first night I was alone, I started hearing footsteps on the roof. Mind you, these sounded like stomps and not like little feet, just in case you thought it might have been a raccoon, possum or any other night creature. They were loud, as if someone was running in circles just right above my bed. It really freaked me out, but I ignored it. The following night, my sister and mom stayed the night because they were visiting from just a few towns over. That night, I let my mom and sister sleep in the room and I slept on the couch. My sister and my mom heard the stomps too. They didn't know what to make of it. So they woke me up to go check the roof. I went outside and looked, but there was nothing to be seen. They left the next day and we still didn't have a clue what the fuck was going on. It was getting really freaky by this point. So the night they left, I slept by myself in the condo again. I laid there without being able to sleep and by 2 or 3 a.m. the stomping began. It would run all across the roof and when it would get to the room, it would start stomping hard. So I'm really freaked out at this point and I decided to load my handgun just in case it's some crazy homeless person or someone being crazy on the roof at 3 a.m. It kept running on the roof as I loaded the gun when all of the sudden the stomping stopped and then I heard a loud thump by the door as if someone had jumped from the roof to the front of my door. It knocked on my door three times loud as fuck. By this point I'm paralyzed in fear but I said fuck it whatever it is I'm gonna get bullets straight to the head. I walked carefully towards the door opened the door as fast as I could but no one was there. I checked the roof, under the stairs, and there was no sign of anyone. The fear I felt ran cold through all of my body, because I still felt its presence, but I just couldn't see anyone. I went back inside, locked the door, and laid in bed with my gun next to me. I was terrified, and couldn't sleep all night. The next night, my wife comes home. I told her everything that had been going on, and she just couldn't believe it. She asked me how come I only heard it when she was gone and it had never happened in the past while she was there. I told her I didn't know why it happened that weekend when she wasn't around, but it happened. I had witnesses, my sister and mom, who had also heard the stomping. So I'm not going crazy, and this isn't just my imagination. I'm perfectly healthy, mentally and physically, so this couldn't have been some mental disorder. We went to bed together that night, and she told me not to worry, and I probably had smoked a little too much cannabis during the weekend. I'm a bit pissed at her because she doesn't believe me and thinks I'm being superstitious. As we're falling asleep, something pulls on my toe. A hard pull on my toe, not some light touch. It was a violent pull on my big ass toe. I get up and wake up my wife and tell her. By this point she thinks I'm having some sort of hallucination. That I should probably not smoke weed anymore and I even started believing I was losing my mind. But as we're getting comfortable going back to sleep, the entity violently pulls her toe as well. She gets out of the bed in complete disbelief and trembling in fear. We turn the lights on, check to see if someone was under the bed, but there was absolutely no one. We couldn't get back to sleep that night, and a few days later, the nail on my big ass toe turned a light shade of purple. What the fuck happened? I have no fucking idea. To this day, I have no fucking clue. This story happened about four years ago. I'm in my late twenties and so is my friend. It was around June in Toowoomba, Australia. My friend, let's call him Mark, asked me to come pick him up from his college, Downlands. June is when it gets its coldest in Toowoomba and that night I remember it reaching minus four degrees Celsius or 25 Fahrenheit. It was around 6.30 when I reached the college. Mark's a teacher there and apparently his car had stopped working. I wandered through the dark trying to find the admin block. I finally reached the block and Mark was inside. He looked shaken up. I asked him what happened. He said in his shaky voice, he's here, a ghost. We're at the school too late. He's been moving stuff. Now as you can imagine at this point, I started to absolutely freak it. 
Dowlands is a boarding school, so I know there was a small amount of people still here. However, the boarding block and admin block is a far, far ways apart. And I wasn't about to wander through the dark pathways with Mark spouting the stuff he was. Instead, I decided to go back to the car with him. So we locked up the office and cautiously walked out. As we were blindly walking the concrete path in our thick jumpers, the wind was making an eerie howling noise as it started to blow gusts. Then I saw a flickering light, an orange light, coming from behind us. All of a sudden, it got really warm, and I mean a quick, sudden boost in temperature. We were about halfway down this hill, so Mark and I turned around to see who was at the top of the hill. This still freaks me out when I think of it. It was a man on fire. He was standing there watching us. When we turned around, he stared at us for about five seconds. It felt like five hours then. He then let out the most horrendous scream and started to run at us. Mark and I ran and fell over to the side of the path. The man on fire ran past us, down the hill and into the forest. I got up. I looked down toward the oval. He was still running. He just came out of the forest and was running towards a road until him and the fire vanished. At that point, we decided to run to the boarding block and find another member of faculty. We reached the block. We found one of Mark's colleagues. He let us stay the night. We were told, it's a common thing to see if you stay in the admin block too late or if you're walking those paths at that time of night. Even from this block, everyone can hear his screams at least once a week as he terrorizes the school grounds at dark. Apparently, the faculty member, who was also a teacher, said he had only seen the burning man once. When I asked Mark the next morning what he had seen in the admin block, he replied with, all the drawers started to open and I heard a voice say, the fire has been lit. When I first started to work here, the office ladies warned me that I shouldn't stay late near the building. Now I know why. Before we left the next morning, we went to the admin block and asked the office ladies if they had ever seen him. We went in and saw a younger lady in her 30s. She asked, do you have an appointment, Mark? No, but we just wanted to ask if you had ever seen... Then an older lady, maybe late 60s, early 70s, came back out from the back and said, you two saw the burning man, didn't you? Mark replied, yes, we did. We saw him last night. The old woman came close and said, yes, all the drawers were open. I've seen him many a times. Not a pleasant experience. Try not to stay late. If you do, don't come anywhere near this building. The younger lady spoke up. I've seen him twice. I hated it. I've never stayed late again. We both left. Mark got the day off. I never stepped foot on those school grounds ever again. The Burning Man at Downlands College has been noted as one of Toowoomba's most minacious paranormal experiences. I always hated the house on Pond Street, ever since the first moment I saw it from the outside. It gave off a creepy energy that left a knot in my heart. Inside, it was full of six-foot mirrors. Every single room had something off about that I could never pinpoint accurately. The only room that gave me relief from this feeling was the bathroom in the downstairs efficiency apartment. I'd use it often. Every time I walked into the house through the back middle door, I feel someone watching me through the wall hanging a quilt. There was also a sense of annoyance and frustration emanating from that covered mirror as if the lurker's view was blocked. A few times at night, in my bedroom, I saw figures in the mirrors on the closet. There was a man wearing a top hat standing in the middle of the room. A tall guy rocked in a glider in the corner of the room right next to the closet mirrors. I didn't have a gliding rocker in my bedroom. The highlight of living at this house was having the pool, at least in the summer. Something lurked in and by the pool that wasn't happy. The pool was dreadful during the winter months. We moved to this house in the fall and couldn't play in the pool immediately. Since the first moment I noticed the pool, I could tell there was a strange eerie energy hanging around the pool. The pool and the surrounding pool deck looked inviting and comfortable more than anything, but never exactly comfortable. From the very beginning, I felt there was a little boy with weird evil intentions. He didn't want to hurt anyone, but at the same time he wanted to hurt someone, whenever he pleased. 
I dismissed the energy as electrical impulses from the pump and filter. I later realised I was wrong. Very wrong. During the first summer, I was the only one in the pool. I swam to the bottom of the deep end, about 12 feet. I was on the other side of the pool where the floor filter was. I felt a slight tug on my leg. It felt like someone skimmed against it. It freaked me out, but I thought nothing of it. Thought it must have been some sort of debris. But my opinion changed during the winter. When the pool was closed up and covered with snow, I was drawn to it. There were several instances where I'd go outside to make a snowman or a fort, or sled down the hill on the side yard. I did these things, yes. But I'd also have to frequently check the pool. I would have to stand on the pool deck at the edge, overlooking where the deep end drops off. Just look. Sometimes I'd see the top of a little boy's head up and down beneath the ice. Sometimes I'd be by the pool and I'd have no recollection of opening the gate, or walking into the area. One time, on a cold day in January, I found myself by the pool. Just as I realised I didn't remember getting there, I had a sudden urge to check the strength of the ice by standing on it. The conflicting voice of logic told me not to, and I didn't. At least I thought I hadn't. Next thing I knew, seconds later, in a trance, I found myself stepping down onto the ice. All the while I'm thinking, this is how I'm going to die. I'm going to be 11 years old and I'm going to get trapped under the ice of my pool. I tried to resist, but I couldn't. My heart was pounding. As I'm standing on the ice, I managed to turn around. I tried to step up and back on the deck, but I'm paralysed. I'm terrified. I don't want to die, I thought. I heard an extremely faint, almost inaudible crack beneath the snow-covered ice as I plummeted into the icy water below. Instantly, after the, the trance lifted and I pulled myself out, I plummeted waist-deep. I wasn't cold, but I felt shaken. I actually questioned if I had actually fallen in. Wet ski pants were a confirmation. I couldn't get the boy out of my head. As I went about my evening, the boy was on my mind. It was confusing. A chilling thought popped into my head. Is Pond Street named after a long-gone pond? Did a boy drown in the pool? Is there a mirror world where a boy drowned in the pool? So this happened about five years ago now. To this day, I cannot explain what happened to my quiet country neighbourhood, down a dead-end dirt road south of the Oregon border. The following events occurred over a few months, in summer and autumn. It started off with little things. The dogs randomly barked and howled, mine and the homes across the lane. We lived in a fairly rural community, so it was common for pesky animals such as coyotes, raccoons, foxes, or even larger predators to come close in search of livestock or barn cats to eat. So we figured it was just the security team doing their jobs. It wasn't until we realised it would start and stop at the exact same moment. Every dog either inside or outside, spontaneously going nuts for several homes, that we started to raise questions. Another time was when I had come home from town with my mother. We were just unloading the weekly shopping when I needed to use the restroom. I excused myself and heard my mom leave, come back inside and unpack the last bag and put things away in the pantry. I finished my business, washed up and heard the back sliding door open and shut. I figured that she was heading out to check on the horses. It wasn't until I left the washroom and went out onto the back deck that I realised something was wrong. My mother, the only other person living in the house, was all the way clear across the pasture adjacent to our neighbour. She would have had to actually grow wings and fly over that several acre distance in the ten seconds it took me to head down the hall and out the back door. So who was messing around in the kitchen that whole time? It only got stranger from there. A mysterious shadow man kept appearing in people's homes. One time, it even got recorded on the neighbour girl's phone in the background of a video. It took a concerned family member who was watching to notice and ask, Hey, why is there a man in B's bedroom? He would also cross the road at night in front of our headlights. You could hear voices in the house and random knocking on my bedroom door. But nobody was there when I'd check. There was one time that my then boyfriend, now my husband and I, were watching a movie in the middle of the afternoon in the living room, and we heard my mom call my name from her room across the house. We paused, I got up, 
and nearly ran into her as she's leaving her room to come out. Asked me why I was calling her. Jay and I shared dumbfounded looks and I said I was getting up to see her since she called me. She turned pale and said no she hadn't. It all came to a head though when there was a knocking at the front door one afternoon. That same three knocks. It was so forceful that I heard it in my room and when mom heard it too she yelled all right I'm coming. I figured it was a neighbour coming to talk about a loose animal or something. But then it hit me. The dogs were totally silent. Nobody could ever come up to the front door, let alone pound on it, without our dogs barking. I'm halfway across the room when I come to this realisation and a chill runs through me, hard. I rip open my door and dash to the front room where my mom is standing facing an entirely empty front porch. With our wide open driveway, there was no way in hell some random kid could play a prank on us in the middle of nowhere without us seeing them running away or the dust trail from driving off. I took one look at my mom's confused and terrified face and I whistled for our biggest dog to go with me outside to search for anything I could find. The rest stayed in the house with mom. I never found anything but there was a very heavy weight of being watched. After that nothing else happened. No more noises, shadows, anything. Though every now and then I still can't shake that there's something unfinished about it all. To this day, the sound of someone knocking on my door, as innocent as it is, gives me chills. First of all, let me start off by saying I usually don't believe in evil spirits and being haunted by one. However, I've had such creepy encounters in my sleep that I felt like this is the right place to share. The past couple of years, one or two years, I haven't had that good of an experience with sleep. I visited a small town in Italy with two of my best friends who happened to be a couple this past summer. Of course, they slept in a double bed while I slept on a convertible sofa in another room. Our accommodation was, to our surprise, located on top of a mountain, far, far away from the town we initially wanted to stay in. I'd say about a 15 or 20 minute bus ride and the bus only drove three times a day. That was a huge disappointment, but not really part of the story. Since we were located on top of this mountain, right along the main road where vehicles passed very seldomly, I tended to feel uneasy during the night time, especially since I slept alone and we rented a holiday apartment, not a hotel with many other people or something of that sort. The first night, I only got a little bit of sleep, also of poor quality, but that was only because the sofa was a bit uncomfortable. On the second night, however, I woke up once in the middle of the night, only to see a tall and slim outline of a person standing right at the foot of my bed, staring at me. Since I was so flustered and still tired, I didn't really process what was happening, pulled up my blanket over my head and continued sleeping. The next morning, I realised what happened overnight and I was petrified. I told my two friends at the breakfast table and of course they called bullshit. I insisted that I knew what I saw and I persuaded them to let me sleep in their bed for the next night, which was no problem since their bed was huge. The next night rolls around and my best friend's boyfriend falls asleep relatively quickly. However, my bestie and I were still up for 10 or 20 minutes, talking and whispering, trying not to wake her boyfriend up. Then, we hear what sounds like someone putting keys in our front door and entering the hallway. We both were convinced there was a person in our apartment walking around the kitchen and living room where my sofa was located. We both froze and I initially thought we were going to die that night since I've always had sketchy vibes ever since we first arrived. We woke up the third party only for him to tell us to go back to sleep which we did. The next morning it turns out that there's another family staying in the apartment right below us and a possible explanation would be that they entered their apartment yesterday night but the both of us genuinely believe that there was someone in our apartment casually walking around. On another not so pleasant occasion, I went to sleep normally in my bed a few months ago when I suddenly woke up in the middle of the night, only to find that I couldn't move my body, my limbs were numb, I couldn't turn my head, I couldn't speak, I felt completely paralysed. I've had sleep paralysis before, so I knew that this was just another night of bad sleep. However, this time, it was different. 
I saw my dad turning on the light and walking around in the hallways, passing my room, which isn't unusual. Probably to get a glass of water or go to the toilet. I desperately and unsuccessfully tried calling out for him, but of course, nothing but a whisper came out of my mouth. At that moment, I felt so helpless. My dad got what he needed, turned off the lights and went back to bed. And the moment he switched off the light, I saw a dark and tiny creature or blob of shadow sitting on my desktop chair and staring at me. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it wanted from me. All of a sudden, this shadow jumps up, runs right up to me on the side of my bed, then jumps onto my bed, only to repeatedly hop from one side of my pillow to the other. I felt so scared and terrorised in that moment, but I guess that terror finally woke me up and I could move again. The shadow was gone. I turned on the light and had to walk around my room for a few minutes, just to return to reality and collect myself. I've had many similar events to this one, but none were as horrible. After that night, I was afraid to go to bed for a couple of weeks. My old house felt weird. I'd always thought I'd seen shadows in the corners, but I just shook it off as I got older. There were two times I remember something sounding like it had fallen. A big bang or boom sound, followed by a clattering sound, only to never find anything that had fallen. It happened once when my mom and I were in the kitchen, and we went to the basement to explore what it was, but found nothing. We moved in 2000. The new house didn't have any weird feelings or events other than the first night. I could have sworn I saw someone move by the bedroom door. I thought it was my dad walking by, but when I got up to ask him, he was downstairs watching TV and said he never walked by my door. I always thought it was my dad's father checking up on him. Didn't have any real experiences outside of that. A few times in the woods smoking a joint, I got the noia hitting hard and felt like either a bear was coming or we were being watched. Got in the car shortly after. Then my mom passed away in the 2010s. At the time, I wasn't religious, but a couple weird things happened. The last word she told me was that I was a good person, which was weird because at the time, I was always thinking about how I needed to work towards being a better person. Then, she was supposed to be pretty much brain dead from a stroke, but the first day in the hospice when I arrived, she had a huge smile on her face and looked right at me as I entered. I didn't know what to think at the time, but now I feel like it was her way of saying goodbye. She never did it again that I saw, and passed a few days later. I distinctly remember having a dream with her in it a while after. We were at our old church, and she was in the foyer chatting with someone. I noticed her sitting, talking to her friend, and I think I said, Mom? But all I remember is she looked right at me, smiling, and I felt a bunch of positive emotions, just pure love. Later, I remember I was chatting with a woman and she just happened to mention something about finding dimes left behind by your loved ones. What was so weird about that is since my mom had passed, I had noticed specifically dimes popping up in weird places. And when this lady told me that, it felt like it all clicked. It even happens now and I always think of my mom and dad. After my mom passed, I was more open to everything since my mom was really spiritual. Some things she had told me before, just general stuff, and they started to come true, so I knew I had underestimated her teachings. A few years after that, my dad sadly passed as well. Both were tough to let go, but I was more understanding this time than with my mom. Back then, I was very angry, but now I realised this was just how things had to go. My dad didn't pop up for a while in my dreams and I was worried. Then one day, I had an extremely vivid dream. I guess I should have mentioned that I usually don't remember my dreams, so sticking with me means more, I suppose. Basically, in the dream, I'm in bed and someone is coming to smother me with a pillow. But I see it coming, so I'm ready to explode when they do. As I do in the dream, I wake up. The lighting of the room is the exact same as in the dream, fairly bright and sunny. I'm a little shaken up by the dream, because I couldn't see the figure in the dream, just the pillow. My room door was closed and I heard my dog whining outside, probably to go outside. I opened the door, and much to my dismay, my dog has shit everywhere on the main floor. 
It took me a while to put the dream and the dog pooping together, but then I realised someone woke me up and it had to be my dad. He was always funny about waking me up when I was a kid and he was very close with my dog. I did see my dad in later dreams, a few times with my mum with his greyish hair and then once looking much younger, which admittedly threw me off. I'd only seen a few pics of him from the 80s and even fewer from the 70s, but it was him for sure. I did notice my mum in my first dream, encountering her looking younger too. In my late 20s and last month, I had one of the most scariest experiences I've ever had. My family attracts spirits. As in the 18th century, some of my family dabbled in some of the spirit stuff. They got blamed as witches and they got burned at the stake. That's a story for another day. Anyway, I was on a four wheel drive adventure with my dad, mum and my dog. We have a buffed up Pajero. Not the best four wheel drive, but it still makes it across desert tracks. It was on the 12th of December, I believe. We were crossing a track in the Northern Territory, Australia. We had just finished crossing a rocky portion of the track and was now on flat dirt road. We started to set up camp for the night. As I stepped out of the car, I went around the back to the water containers to fetch some water for my dog. But as I walked near them, I heard a trickling and gushing noise. Sure enough, a rock had punctured both external water containers. I quickly went and told Dad we had barely enough internal water to last us a day. So we made the decision to drive at night. You should only really drive at night if you most definitely have to. Otherwise, you should generally avoid it. We knew there was a small community just outside of Yundumu, around 45 minutes away. It was already 7.15 and pitch black. We got in the car and started to drive. This road was particularly dangerous as it was long and straight. People often fell asleep and drove off the road doing 110 kilometers an hour. We were about halfway there. I was sitting in the back with my standard schnauzer on my lap. He was drifting asleep until his ears pricked up. He then jumped up. It looked like he was trying to look behind us. I turned around and saw nothing but a black, empty, eerie desert. I turned back to the front to see my mum drifting to sleep and my dad wide awake. Then all of a sudden, my dog started to whine really loud. A really bright light was reflecting in the side mirrors and rear view mirror. My dad said, what, is that a car behind us? I looked behind us. There were two extremely bright lights tailgating our car. At this point, my dog was barking and whining. My mum had woken up and immediately started to panic. The lights continued to tailgate us for the next two minutes. We then passed a tree and all of a sudden the lights had stopped. The car was no longer behind us, it had disappeared. My dad stopped the car, he turned it around thinking the car may have crashed. We got near the tree, I got up on the roof, turned on the giant spotlights we had fitted for this trip and shone it all around us searching for the car. There was no sight of it, just empty red dirt. We searched for another 15 minutes, even on foot, nothing. So we continued on with the drive, hoping to find some help in the coming community. Once we reached the small settlement just outside of Yuendumu, we raced into the pub. The pub was ext empty except for the bartender. He immediately asked us, what's wrong, something up? My dad replied with, we were just driving along the track. We saw a car disappear off the road. Someone could be hurt. The bartender put down his rag and said, you guys saw the Northern Nissan. No one's hurt. At least not now. I replied in a somewhat impatient tone, what do you mean? Someone could be hurt. He then pointed to a news article up on the wood wall. It read, Nissan crashes into tree, killing all two on board. What you saw was the ghost of the Northern Nissan. It crashed about a bit more than a decade ago. It was two brothers quickly making their way into town as one of the brothers was sick. They crashed into that tree at about half past seven. Many people who make that road at night see them at around the time you guys saw them. My mum's mouth had dropped. My dad sat down. We stayed in that small settlement for the night. In the morning, we decided to go look at the tree. What we saw was a scar from a crash and exactly where we saw the car disappear the night before. It was creepy to think. I got out on foot searching for a ghost car seconds after it had disappeared. 
my family had seen the northern Nissan. A little background. This house was built in 1995 by my dad and mom. It's a big house with two floors and a basement. We were the only family that has ever lived there. My grandmother died in the bathroom upstairs in 2010. No one else has died in that house besides her. My sister and brother, who I'm going to be mentioning in the story, had moved out of the house before things ever started happening. I moved out about a year ago. It started a few years after Granny had died. We started hearing steps going up and down the stairs at night. We were spooked a little, but forgot about it soon because we just thought that it was Granny's ghosts, since she's the only one who's died there and we heard those steps very rarely. Maybe a year passes, and I'm looking through pictures my relatives and I have sent to each other on Messenger. I found a screenshot that she had taken when we were on a video call at night, and I saw some weird grey mass behind me. I zoomed in and was completely taken aback. There was a grey torso and face behind me in the darkness. I put some filters on it so I could see it better, cropped it because I had an ugly face on the picture, and showed it to my family and friends ASAP. Everyone except my dad was completely shocked. My dad didn't believe in the paranormal at the time and kept denying when stuff happened. My sister said that the grey apparition looks like granny and I agreed. Anyway, a few years forward. My mum and dad are downstairs cooking something in the kitchen and I'm on the second floor in my bedroom, sitting on my bed. I hear exactly three knocks on my door. It's normal that people knock on my door first before entering but this time no one opens the door to enter. I just stare at the door for a while and eventually ask who's there. I get no answer. I call mom on the phone because I'm spooked. She said that nobody had gone upstairs. I went on to Google about three knocks on the door and I did not like the answers I found. I panicked a bit and just waited until I felt like enough time had passed that it was safe enough to open the door. I went downstairs and told my mom and dad what had happened. Dad didn't believe me like usual, but mom was a bit spooked. By now, I've also seen shadows walk past my bedroom door. Creepy, but nothing special in my opinion. Again, a few years have passed and my mom and I have moved out. It's a long story about what happened and why we moved, but in short, domestic violence. Only my father lives in that house now. The house is empty and freezing most of the time because we live in Europe and father travels a lot due to work. It's also been put on sale. Since I moved out, the activity in the house has increased. My father has told my sister that he's been hearing someone walking around, faucets turning on and off, doors opening, etc. He didn't believe in the paranormal before, but now he's experienced the spookiest of it himself. Yesterday, my sister, mom and I had met up at the house while father was at work to just catch up. At one point, my sister informed me her and mom were planning on staying the night there and asked me if I was staying too. I declined because I hate that house and it makes me have panic attacks. Well, fast forward to today. Sister called me and told me that she was absolutely never going to stay in that house again because of what happened that night and I was lucky for choosing to go back home. Apparently, she had stayed up a bit late and at one point she heard someone walking downstairs fast and going into the garage. She thought it was mom up late, so she wanted to go check what she was doing. To get downstairs, she had to go past mom's room, and when she did that, she, th she saw that mom was sleeping. She was spooked. The steps were fast, so how can it be granny? She went back to her bed and couldn't sleep anymore, so she stayed up. After a while, she heard steps again, but this time in the room next to her. It may not seem scary to you because it's just some steps, but after years of thinking that it was our granny and then hearing steps that fast, I would have absolutely obliterated my pants and woken up mom to an invisible sword fight the ghost away. It was a December night, very windy night. A lot of dust was in the air, my brother and I were going to eat at the restaurant, which is far away from my home, around 30 minutes away. We don't eat outside, but for that day it was special, because we dropped corns out of fields at that day, 
and we were tired, so we decided to let's go and eat outside. The place I live in is really lonely and spooky at night, because fields and fields everywhere, and the woods, though we've been living there for years, but nothing really scary about it. Anyway, we reached the restaurants and we had a really nice dinner. Strangely, there were no customers except us. I don't know, but the lady from the corridor was staring at us for some reason. Though we talked and enjoyed ourselves, we finished our dinner. After finishing our dinner, my brother asked who will drive the way back home. I definitely didn't want to drive because I felt exhausted and sleepy, and he was feeling the same. And we fought for it, but I couldn't win, so I decided to drive. I was driving us home, and about ten minutes of our way yet to be... And my brother who was sitting behind me screamed my name in a demonic voice. And I pulled my brakes and freaked out. I got off the bike and was about to punch my knuckles on his neck. But he pointed his hand in the woods and said, look. And I looked in the woods and I saw two bright eyes. I was scared, but my brother seemed okay. He wasn't even scared seeing that on this empty dark road going from the woods. So I turned my flashlight on and beamed it in the woods, and I saw a small, lamb-like size of a back. And my brother just started walking towards it without saying anything, and he grabbed the lamb and asked me, I want pet. At this night, I was super worried, and was in a hurry, so I let him. I can clearly see my brother's obsession over that lamb. I started my motorcycle again, and started to drive home, and I had a really bad feeling about this rabbit. After a few minutes, I sensed that we were slowly getting surrounded by clouds because I couldn't see. And I saw my brother whispering something to that lamb. After a while, I started feeling something odd, like something wasn't right. I felt something heavy. And I saw my motorcycle speeding down, strangely. I saw brakes aren't pressed, though. When I turned back on my right side, I saw lamb with five feet long legs laying on right of my side. i never seen anything like that i never seen five feet of lamb's leg. I doubted that, and I rechecked, but this time I turned back with left side. I again saw large, scary, five feet long legs. I could see symbols on its head. I really, really got scared. My body went cold. I couldn't drive. Because it was something odd I've never seen in my life. I told my brother, who was sitting back on the motorcycle... I told him to throw it away because at this point, my bike was really slow. Because I didn't know if that thing was gaining its size unnaturally. He didn't want to let it go. I was scared. I screamed, throw it away. And he heard that I knew he was possessed at some point and he threw it. And I felt my bike like a cloud. I could speed up. And I turned around and saw a goat-faced demon who was about to fly. I didn't turn back after that. I accelerated my bike like godspeed and I know my brother just witnessed something of natural itself. He couldn't speak properly for three days. I drove us home, I locked everything and we together were super terrified by the event. We didn't sleep. We hugged each other all night. Later that night and saw two very bright white coloured eyes peeking through our window. I don't believe in God but that night I was begging all gods to come and protect us from that thing. The next morning, we met a few people who were locals and bandits and talked about that event and they told us that we were really lucky that he didn't choose us. The place where we found that lamb was materialised with witchcraft, lockets and the size of human voodoos. Not sure if this is true or hoax, but we were baptised by locals and trying to forget the event we've just been through. Nearly five years ago when I was 16, my dad and I went on vacation around Christmas to Boulder, Colorado. We rented this little house pretty far out of town in the mountains. It was located in the sort of ravine or meadow in between two tall, steep mountains and had a medium-sized stream running right in front of it. It seemed like a really neat house when we were just looking online at it because one side was completely made of glass and was isolated in the forest. When the first night came and everything still seemed alright, I had brought my little dog along and of course he needed to pee in the middle of the night. I was kind of spooked at the idea of going outside at 1am, but more because I was afraid of bears or cougars or whatever. I tried to wake my dad up, 
but he had taken some sleeping pills and literally refused to wake up. I put on my coat and everything and went outside with my dog. I had a high powered flashlight and as I was walking out to the yard, I was sort of scanning the light along the edge of the valley. I saw something across the creek that I wasn't expecting. There was a man standing out there. I froze for a minute, then like a total idiot, I yelled, who's there? I really just thought it may have been, I don't know, at the moment I thought it was like a night ice fisherman. I didn't get scared until he didn't answer, and by then I started to notice some weird things about him. It was freezing, like probably minus 10 Fahrenheit at least, but this man wasn't wearing a coat. It was like I couldn't see any details about him, almost like he was a solid shadow, even though I was close enough and the light was bright enough to see the trees behind him in detail. I was shining this super bright light right into his face, but he wasn't recoiling whatsoever or putting his hands to cover his eyes or anything. Also, the longer I looked at him, the weirder he seemed. He didn't seem to be moving at all, like not even shifting his shoulders to breathe or anything. He looked to be average height and build, but the other weird thing? At first I thought he was wearing a face mask, like the kind people wear when they go skiing, but this mask covered his entire head, as if the entire face was one smooth black surface. He was certainly facing me though, I wasn't looking at him from the back. The longer I stood there the more scared I got until I sprinted back inside, yanking my little dog behind me. I could still clearly see him through the glass side of the house and I was very alarmed to see what he had swiveled. He had sort of smoothly tracked my movement into the house, but it didn't seem like he had moved his feet or anything. I ran upstairs and tried again to wake up my dad. I told him there was a man standing outside the house. He sort of shuffled over to the window, saw him, but said it was probably a druggie and went back to sleep. I probably should have called 911, but my dad didn't seem concerned. I thought he would get mad if I caused a stir about it, so I didn't do anything. I did watch the man though, all night. The man stood in the exact same place for hours, never moving, not even seeming to breathe. He didn't seem phased whatsoever by the extreme temperature. He just seemed to stare right at me and I stared back. At one point I looked away and when I came back to the window, I was shocked to see that he was gone. An odd movement grabbed my attention though. This is the bit that I find the hardest to describe or explain. He seemed to be glitching. He was behind a big tree, so I couldn't really make out a lot. But over and over, I kept seeing his arm and let it come out from behind the tree then smoothly slid back to a normal standing position. It really looked like a video game character glitching, but in real life. At some point I dozed off, and when the sun came up, he had disappeared. It was such a bizarre experience because I wasn't sure if it was real. It just didn't seem like the quintessential ghost or Slenderman or whatever, so I didn't know what to make of it. My dad reconfirmed though, the next day, that he had definitely seen the man, so I at least wasn't hallucinating. I also walked across the bridge to where the man was standing, in the daylight of course, and there were not any footprints or any other confirming evidence that the man was there at all. It all continues to be one of my most significant paranormal experiences I've ever had. So it's 2am, I'm very tired right now, procrastinating going to sleep. So apologies if this is incoherent. I've never told anyone this story before because they'd probably think I'm crazy. I myself am atheist, though this memory sure raises some doubts. I've decided to believe it was hallucinations caused by anxiety, since at the time I had terrible social anxiety, along with generalized anxiety disorder. It was also during the same year I had my depression came on suddenly and hard. My parents divorced, my mom moved into an apartment and I spent every other weekend at the old house with my dad. Now, this was in eighth grade and I remember middle school was when the vast majority of my nightmares were about demons and ghosts. So that would also have raised my anxiety surrounding that. So probably the easiest thing to dismiss was one weekend, I saw a tall dark shadow moving out of the corner of my eye. Another time, as I was getting into bed, I saw a bald white man walk toward the wall only for a split second. Those are whatever, 
People see things out of the corner of their eye all the time. Whenever my dad was out of the house and I was sitting in the bedroom upstairs, I would constantly hear footsteps downstairs. If I went downstairs to look, nothing would be there and the sound would stop. I'd go back up and into the bedroom and I would hear it again. You know the cracking sound of settling? I would hear it relatively frequently at night. Okay, so now I'll describe the big night that absolutely terrified me. My dad was out of the house and I was in bed upstairs trying to sleep. I heard that cracking sound non-stop every few seconds. Then I started hearing the very distinct click of the plastic cap of the string on the curtains hitting against the wall. It was very regular, like it was tapping the wall once per second. At that point I was getting very anxious and I put on my headphones and started listening to music to calm down. At the time I used Tumblr, so I was scrolling through that. Suddenly, a chill went down my spine and I got a very strong feeling that I was being watched. I think this was because I subconsciously heard the garage door open because my dad did come in the room a few minutes later, but I'll get to that. Anyways, chills down my spine, feeling of being watched. Soon after that, I started hearing people talking through my music. I couldn't make out any words. It was just a man's voice, just sort of talking normally. First, I closed Tumblr in case there was an ad or something on there, but it didn't stop. Then I closed the music app, it still didn't stop. A second or so after I stopped the music, the voice turned deep and angry, and honestly demonic, and was yelling. At that point I ripped my headphones off, ducked under the blankets, and started hyperventilating. Maybe a minute later, my dad ran in the room asking what's wrong. I just told him I didn't hear the garage door open and thought someone broke in the house. I didn't want to say I was hearing voices. Something like that has never happened to me since. A month or two later, my dad moved into an apartment and I never had to go back to that house again, thank God. Although in one bedroom in my mom's apartment, if I'm in it at night, I would constantly hear footsteps from the kitchen downstairs. But nothing extreme ever happened like in the original house. And now she's moved out to that and bought her own condo. So I'm completely free of haunting paranoia. I'm just sharing this because I'm curious what someone who believes in hauntings has to say about my story. Oh, and another experience that I can't explain. In sixth grade, I heard the future. Though it's actually a pretty boring story. I had a male bus driver in the morning and a female bus driver in the afternoon. One morning I was on the bus and suddenly heard my afternoon female bus driver yell, Hey! I looked around, but no one had reacted to it. And I double checked the driver. It was definitely the male one. That afternoon, I was on the bus home with the female driver. At one point, a girl on the bus screamed, and the bus driver yelled, Hey! And it was exactly the same as the yell I had heard that morning. When I was younger, about eight or nine, I spent the whole day at the local fair. I was showing my 4-H animals, and because the shirt was itchy, I had gone to my parents' car to change it. For some reason, there was just this old man next to the car though, I hadn't put much thought into it. This guy didn't give much explanation, but he asked me to get into his truck. I hadn't really been educated in kidnapping and stuff like that. I knew it wasn't a good idea to trust strangers, so I quickly said no thank you and finished changing before running off. Skip forward several hours and once I was done hanging out with some friends, I went back to the car for it to be gone. For context, I've never had a good relationship with my parents and I really shouldn't be living with them with all they do to me. Of course I was worried and really didn't have any way to get back home, but walk, but that old man was still there. He said that he knew my parents, even said their names, and said he was going to take me home since they had forgotten me. Being a small town in Ohio, it didn't take much for everyone to know each other, especially when your grandfather was the favourite high school teacher for forever basically, so I really didn't question him and then climbed in. It was at this time that I noticed the first weird things, beside him still being in the same spot as earlier, as if he knew it was going to happen. His face would almost change if that makes sense, never appearing quite the same as it had only a few minutes before. 
yet still recognisably being him all the same. Of course, he didn't take me home, but instead to his own home. Besides the normal kidnapping crap, there were many things off about this. We were seemingly phasing in and out of traffic, as if we weren't entirely there. Another thing of note is that when we finally did get to our destination, at first we had just turned into a cornfield before a small path just barely large enough for the truck made itself known. It was as if we were entering something otherworldly and that I was witnessing something that I really shouldn't have. At the point of him shutting the truck off, I had understood that I had been kidnapped, but something about him just made me feel so calm. Like I knew that nothing could go wrong in his presence, like no harm could be done to me. My time there was, for lack of a more fitting word, perfect. I had no worry of getting hurt from my parents, no stress to be as perfect as possible. No worry that every little thing I did wrong or forgot to do would get me hurt. I got to do whatever I wanted, play games with him or bake or help him around the house or anything else my brain could come up with. Eventually the time came when I realised that I really needed to go back. No matter how perfect it was, I couldn't stay here any longer, simply just because I needed to get back home. Thus, I left as soon as I knew he had fallen asleep, and just as we came into the corn parted just large enough for me to pass through, while some fireflies fluttered about as if to light my path. It took me what felt like days to get back home, though it was probably only a few hours since nights hadn't broken. The whole time, it felt as if I was pulled in two separate directions. One down what I assumed to be the proper path home, and a lighter pull back to that farmhouse. I kept trudging forward, and the moment I reached home, the moment dawn broke, the tether to the farmhouse was gone. After managing to somehow get inside, I learned something horrifying. I'd been there for ten days, and just as suddenly as I disappeared, I had reappeared. Years later, around eleven this time, while out with friends, I noticed I was near that magical cornfield, and just kind of went over to it, expecting something to happen, but nothing did. The corn simply swayed in the wind, and even going deep enough into it that I should have found the house, there was nothing. No clearing, no beat up old pickup, no kind old man. I want to say this was just the delusions of a scared child, and that trauma has made me misremember some, or most of the details, but that doesn't feel right. Still to this day, I see him sometimes, but it's always out of the corner of my eye or passing by in the streets. Only for me to turn around and either the person have a completely different appearance, or that person just wasn't there altogether. Technically, exorcisms are rituals done by ordained priests. But they did exorcisms with priests. Deliverance rituals if without a priest, visited haunted places for research, etc. We had a storage and collection of occult items, cases being documented and reviewed by their ministry. They guested in schools, institutions, prisons, for example, talking about the importance of spiritual wealth warfare. My dad also had a meeting with the late Pope John Paul II in Rome back in the early 2000s and appeared in local media from time to time. They also did pilgrimages, local and international, alongside talks focusing on spiritual warfare. I have tons of photos to support this. He was like the Warrens and John Constantine combined. So I'll be focusing on my perspective growing up in a very religious family, a life filled with preternatural and supernatural events, which also might have led to my father's demise, as per the team of the chief exorcist of our archdiocese who handled my dad's case in the end. I'll be going back to some history first, as documented by his ministry and the accounts of my uncles and auntie. He grew up with some abilities, as simple as turning the TV on and off using his mind, to being an experienced practitioner of astral projection. With astral projection, he was even able to help the military to locate a plane crash by giving exact coordinates in a rural mountain region and identified the bodies by directly speaking with the victims, no survivors, since he worked for that airline too. With those abilities, a group of cultists was able to locate and identify my dad, through astral projection as well, insane, and went to our house and tried to recruit him. 
He was open arms with them until he felt so much negative energy emanating from these people. He drove them away and felt he was starting to get possessed and tried to run over our maid with the car. Now coincidentally, his priest friend came by. He was supposed to be a priest but left the seminary when my grandpa died to take care of my grandma. Just to visit him and witness my dad's possession and exercised him. This is when his spiritual path started, after his priest friend left. He had a vision of the roof opening up to the sky and saw St. Michael the Archangel, intense light, drew his sword and reached out to him. My mom and I were made witness this and were all dumbfounded. This happened in the early 1990s. He went soul searching for 40 days and nights in Mount Banahar, a holy mountain, where we met different personalities. Fast forward, all possession cases that our parish, National Shrine, receives were being led straight to our house. Not just that, local and international cases happened as well as that my dad handled in the years that came. Growing up, we were taught to pray exorcism prayers on the rosary, all in Latin since we're susceptible to attacks given my dad's exposure. It was a common occurrence to wake up in the middle of the night to pee and hear someone screaming at our garage where the cases were being handled and would just tell myself, here we go again. Our house also became a gateway for spirits, given the exposure of my dad to these entities. A lot really latched onto him, good and bad, and also shared a good number of personal paranormal experiences with them. My dad passed away in 2007 due to kidney cancer. He only had four months to live after being diagnosed, from being normal to his passing. Many ruled out it was spiritual warfare, because when my dad was already bedridden, paranormal shit came by storm and was the worst. Five demonic entities were in the house, handled by the team of the chief exorcist of Manila. It was crazy. When my dad was also in the ICU, he practiced deliverance on a fellow comatose patient due to an entity harassing this patient in the hospital. I have so many stories to tell, specific cases and personal experiences being the son of this man. But when he passed, everything died down. Paranormal and preternatural experiences happen from time to time, but not as often as when it did when my dad was still alive. I'm now agnostic for personal reasons, but demons are real. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to help restore a 100 plus year old church that's been vacant for roughly 45 years or so. The church is attached to what once was a primary school that had already been restored into office spaces. This was a no-brainer since it was a literally a couple blocks away from my house, under the table, and the responsibilities were incredibly easy. Since the church had been empty for years, we only worked during the day, since the electrical system had yet to be installed. But during the days I would work, I'd always see movements in my peripheral vision but nothing was there when I'd look in that direction. This happened a lot, to the point where I'd become accustomed to it. This all changed a few months later when the building became operational, as we converted the church to an event hall designed for any event you'd pay for. Well, after business hours one evening, I got a call from a tenant saying that something was making noise in the basement of the church. Since the power hadn't been installed into the basement at this point, I made sure to grab my brand new charged flashlights and keys to see what was happening. As soon as I got to the basement door, I could hear what sounded like a power tool running. I go in and start making my way through a pitch black labyrinth of a basement towards the noise. I found the cause of the noise was an air compressor. I know they bleed air at times, but I made sure I bled all the air before I left earlier that day and unplugged it. I looked to see if someone plugged it in after me, and it's still unplugged. At this moment, my brand new flashlight started to flicker, and another unplugged power took turns on behind me. When I turned around to shine my fainting light on it, the light went out completely. I haul ass out of the basement through complete darkness towards the door. I get out and see the tenant is standing at the door with a puzzled look on her face. She asks what was wrong as I'm out of breath and freaked out. I tell her what happened and she smirks and says, that doesn't surprise her. She's lived in the neighborhood her entire life and tells me that as a child, she attended the school and church. 
She then tells me a story of a woman who held the last wedding in the church before it closed down. It was a sad story because the woman was stood up on her wedding day and ultimately committed suicide because of it. After that night in the basement, the paranormal activity happened more and more often. It got to the point where a co-worker fell off a ladder. This ladder was always secured and he'd been up and down it a hundred times. When I asked what happened, he said it felt like he was pushed while leaning to paint. There were even times where the movements I had always seen in there started to take shape. Instead of a blur, I started to see a person standing there, but nothing when I looked in that direction. What finally pushed me over the edge was the nights I guess you can say I met her. Since events were always held there, I'd always lock up afterwards. After an overnight booking, I ran into the guests as they were leaving. A gentleman asked me if there were any other people in the building that night. I said no, as we make sure the office part of the building is vacant during overnight bookings. He proceeded to tell me he heard yelling from the basement and footsteps on the balcony. I assured him they were the only ones and began to lock up the building. As I'm locking the doors, I hear faintly what the gentleman was referencing. I could hear footsteps on the balcony and I yelled out, is anyone still in here? I didn't get an answer, but at this point I'm ready to go. What I hated most about locking up is the light switch was nowhere near the door. So you'd have to shut off the light and then walk about 30 feet to the door in darkness. I shut off the light and immediately sprinted towards the door. As I reached for the door, I hear footsteps behind me and a muffled voice say, leave. I didn't stop to see what it was. I made my way to the glass entry doors and to the other side as fast as I could. As I'm locking the door, I see movement inside of the church. I look up and see a ghostly or shadow-like figure standing where the altar once was. I quickly look down to ensure I lock the door, and by the time I looked back up, the shadowy figure was now making its way to the glass doors. I honestly don't remember if I locked the door or not, because I immediately got the hell out of there at that point. After that night, I made sure I never entered that building after dark again. I live in eastern Washington state, and all my life I've always wanted to experience something unnatural. This night, I had just finished playing Among Us with some friends on Discord, and I went out to my living room for, I guess, my kitchen. They're both connected, and I grabbed a glass of water. And I looked at the orchid, and we have a small chicken coop in that orchid, and underneath one of the apple trees to the right of the chicken coop for the small chicks, I saw a pile of sticks I've never seen before, and I thought that was weird. I looked at it jokingly. I was like, oh, it's like a gnome or something, since I'd already recently heard a story about them. And then I felt this feeling of being watched, so I went around the cupboard and I peeked at it. And I got this disgusting feeling, this dread I've never felt, so small and weak before in my life. I never thought I'd feel something so wrong. I felt hunted. I felt like an animal. I started heading towards my room and I looked back and it felt so wrong. So wrong. I can't get over the feeling of horror that I felt while looking back at the window. I messaged a friend on Messenger about it, and then it started happening. A bump on my window, and he told me to record it. I recorded it, and it happened again. And I know there's no one there. There's no trees by my window. The closest tree is a pear tree that's about maybe four yards away from my window. I cut that bloody thing every year because cutting the grass around that fucking thing is miserable. I know that the pear tree didn't touch my window, but what assured me with the general feeling was there, and that it felt small. I tried to ignore it. I tried to watch something. I need to fight the feeling of fear. I even tried to ask for help, but my parents' room is on the way by that window, and when I peeked it, it felt wrong. I ran back, and that's when I heard it. I heard this beating. This beating, it was like a heartbeat. I couldn't tell where it come from. I think I was on my roof, I got scared. No, and I hid under my covers. I hid under my covers like a little bitch. I hid. I was scared. I've never been so scared in my life. The closest thing to this feeling when I got assaulted by a bunch of dogs when I lived in Peru. And that's when I started hearing it this moaning. This horrid moaning. 
and I, I asked my friend what to do. And he told me to record and I did. I recorded it. I recorded it and I sent it to him. And I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was man or animal. What it was. I sent him two videos, but then I felt the covers move by my leg. And I felt it grab me, it picked me up with one arm or I don't know what it's appendage or some fucking thing. It was a mess. If you could grab hold of me with that entire arm in my small room and I saw his face illuminated by my aquarium light. It was vibrating. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was. I can't describe its face. I just can't. I just can't. My body shakes and goes numb when I think about it. I know it had a mouth. It laid me on the ground off on the side of the bed and it put its big arm over my chest and put its mouth next to my face. And it said, it said in perfect English, it said in the most perfect English I could ever have heard. It was like if a dog decided to speak. It sounded wrong, but it was so fucking perfect. And it told me, it told me, don't peek. And as abruptly as it came, it left. I don't know how it got in my room. I feel so unsafe. Oh my God. How did it get in my room? How? I don't know. All my life I wanted to feel high. Wanted to see something unnatural, something supernatural. I've never, I've never been religious. But I would, I said this night fucked me. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was. And it's face and it left me intact. And no, it wasn't sleep paralysis. It moved me. It moved me from one place to another. And I sat there shaking and I fucking pissed myself. I don't know what to do. I've never been so afraid in my life. My friend told me to ask on forums for what this was. If anyone knows what this thing was, what this thing is, please tell me. And if you're into cryptid or monsters, ghosts or anything of that or aliens, it's not worth it. It is not worth it. It's not fucking worth it. So I moved into my current house around a year ago, after falling out with my previous roommates. It's a tiny house, built probably around 1922, and you can tell. It's had little renovations since then. A lot of it needs work, but it's really cosy. My fiancé and I have been here for close to a year now. Since moving in, we've experienced paranormal activity that resembles something of a cat, which is hilarious to us. And we're not alone in this. We've actually had more than a few people confirm to us that they've either seen said cats or have felt the presence of one. Going back to the first few experiences we had, it would just be seeing a little black ball dart around corners or even up the stairs. One day, my fiance and I were sitting on the couch watching TV. From my living room, the dining room is to the right if you're sitting on the couch and you can see clearly into it. So we're chilling after a long day of deep cleaning the house and there was a paper towel roll just sitting in the middle of the table, standing straight up. As we're watching TV, the roll just flies off the table. Well, not flies, more like just fell. Which was weird, because it was directly in the middle of the table and nowhere even close to the edge. So it was more like batted off. I get up, pick it up, put it back where it was and go back to what I was doing. I don't think anything of it. Some 10 minutes later, it happens again. So now I'm wondering what's happened. I'm thinking, was it wind? So I start crossing off things it could have been. It's the dead of summer. So is the window unit AC on? No. Nope. Ceiling fan? No. Nope. Nothing. There was no reason for it to just be falling on the floor. Regardless, I shrug it off as just maybe it was some weird gravity phenomenon, or maybe the simulation of life is glitching. Later that week, we had a friend over. He's never really been over and we never told him about the experiences my fiancé and I had. As soon as he walks in the door, he kind of does this weird sidestep slash step over manoeuvre. So I ask, what was that? And he goes, I thought I was going to step on an animal for some reason. And of course, there was nothing there. A couple hours later, my fiancé and I and our friend are eating dinner at the table and an empty grocery bag in the kitchen falls from the bag of bags. Everyone else does this, right? Do you all save bags? And it just kind of sits there for a minute, deflated. Then it just opens up. Like something crawled in it. And the top starts batting around unnaturally, like it's being played with. 
We all hear this and watch it happen for a few seconds, and then the bag returns to its deflated state. And we're all just like, what was that about? Because again, it didn't look like wind. Wind would have made the bag move around the kitchen more. So we now tell him about our previous experience, and we all come to the conclusion that it's most likely a cat. So we settle on the most cliche name ever. We name it Catspa. I spend a few minutes making fun of the name and ridiculing its antics. And later that night, around 4am-ish, I woke up to the sound of something moving on my bedside table. I brush it off as just sleep delirium and try to go back to sleep. Then I just feel the gentlest whack on my head, like a paw swatting at me. Then I hear something jump on the floor and skitter down the stairs. This time I jump up, turn on the light and investigate. Nothing. Not a single animal in the house. I know for sure it wasn't a house or anything. I exclaim, all right, you win, you can stay. Another time we had a few friends over and someone who we didn't know who'd shown up with another friend asked my fiance, hey, can I meet your cat? And of course we tell her the whole shebang and she goes, huh? I thought you guys had a cat. I saw it run up the stairs. And we're just kind of like, yeah, it does that. So now we just have a ghost cat. And whenever I give it a lot of shit for being a shithead, one of our decorative fake cactuses will just fall from one of the shelves for no reason. But on good days, we feel a gentle brush up against our legs when we're sitting on the couch, and an overall sense of comfort from the house. We've never felt anything malicious or had any other bad experiences living here, just the cat. According to our landlady, the previous tenants had a lot of pets. It's entirely possible one of them passed and their soul just stuck around. I'm not complaining. The next time it swats my head in my sleep, I'm getting the ghost cat spray bottle. The roof was technically not the exclusive use of our kindergarten, as it was shared between our building and the next, and their penthouse also had access to said roof, but the family that owned the contiguous apartment had an agreement with Baba to let them use it. Said family also happened to have a daughter, who we were told was sick, but once she would make full recovery, she would join Baba and be able to study while play with us. This girl, by the way, is the protagonist of this story. After noticing her looking at us from inside her home, and having taken as much of a liking to her as a little kid of that age can, I asked her to come play with us, to which she replied she was not allowed to, as her parents told her that it could make her more sick. However, after a few days talking from her window, we found a way to cheat the system. She would leave the door of her house open and would throw a ball at me, which I would throw at her in turn while we talked, which her parents thought was cute and so did our caretakers. So much so that they told my parents, who wasted no time to tease me and claim that I had a girlfriend, which embarrassed and angered me, and would tease me almost daily, whenever they would fetch me and would find me playing with her. This detail would be important later. After a few months, however, the girl stopped showing up. I was told by one of our carers that her health had gotten worse, and that she could no longer play with me, and I never saw her again. While I was very upset about it initially, my parents and I moved away during that summer, and soon I was too busy making new friends in my new school to remember about her, as kids are wont to do. Ten years passed, until one day, after I told my mother that I had gotten my first girlfriend, she decided to tease me and claim she was the second, as the girl in the kindergarten came first. This tease made all the memories of that girl come rushing back, and after a few weeks of not being able to take it off my head, I decided to return to where Baba used to be, and with some luck, find the girl and see if she would remember to me. Luckily for me, the family still lived in the house, and after I introduced myself and told them a very abridged version of the story through the speaker, they invited me to come up and talk. The father explained to me that sadly, the girl had passed away all those years back, but not to worry, as rather than inconvenience them, it made them happy to meet someone else who remembered their daughter after all those years, although he did say he didn't remember her ever playing with me. He did, however, confirm that they didn't let her come out to play with the kids from Babar, as her health was very bad, and they feared it may got worse if she runned around. Her mother, however, seemed somewhat bothered. 
and she mostly just stared at me silently. And once her father began showing me pictures of the girl that they still conserved, which by the way, was indeed the girl I remembered, she suddenly asked me how old I was, to which I replied that I was indeed 16. And this is where the story turns weird. The second I mentioned my age, both her and the father were visibly shaken and disturbed. And the father quickly asked me to confirm my birth year, which is 1986. After looking at each other and then at me with bewilderment, the mother, which as I mentioned had been mostly quiet, began telling me, visibly upset, that it was impossible that I had met their daughter because their daughter had passed away in 1986. That made no sense because my mother remembered her just as much as I did. And I do remember our care rep mentioning that she was ill and could no longer play with us. So that's two adults and myself that remembered her. Yet her parents insisted that she passed away in 1986 and her father even borderline angrily threatened with showing me her death certificate. Things got very tense and I felt extremely uncomfortable and so did the family. So I excused myself, which they did make no effort to stop and left, never to return for another 10 years. By the time I was nearly 26, I decided to return to the house once more, despite feeling extremely uncomfortable about it because as silly as it sounds, I could almost not believe my own experience and I wanted to find out the truth. But by then, the apartment belonged to someone else. I'm now nearly 36 and I still cannot forget this story, which keeps coming back, usually after I have a dream about it at random, every couple of years. My husband and I live on a farm of about 100 acres and raised cattle. It's a family farm. My dad grew up here and my grandpa lived and worked this land until the day he died. I'm familiar with every inch and have never felt scared walking the farm or the surrounding land. A few months ago, one of our cattle disappeared. She had a calf, and if you're unfamiliar with cattle, it's pretty strange for a cow to leave her calf, depending on the cow, of course. Our farm is in the Appalachian foothills in Kentucky, so there were quite a few hollers. We figured that the cow went down into a holler, died in the brush somewhere, or got out into a neighbor's field. My husband looked and looked, but never found her, never found a body, never found any evidence of that cow. The day she went missing, there were some strange spots in the grass of the field, where it was all laid down like something had smashed it, and oddly enough, two vehicles ran out of gas right near those weird spots. I thought it was just a weird spooky coincidence. Until today. Today, my favourite cow went missing. My husband, sister and I spent approximately five hours searching for this cow. We combed every inch of the fields. We searched the hollers. We checked the neighbor's fields. No sign of her. She also had a calf and was a notoriously good mama and the calf was still here. I figured she got out into a neighboring cornfield or perhaps someone stole her, which would have been weird because she was an older cow and was the only missing cow until I experience the strangest thing that makes me think maybe it is supernatural. My sister and I were looking out for the missing cow around 6.30 or 7 p.m. And between two of our fields, there's a piece of land that we don't own. That's just in between two of the fields we do own. It's mostly wooded and bordered with a barbed wire fence. I knew our cow sometimes crossed over, so I wanted to search there. My sister and I are both in our late twenties and grew up running wild in the woods. We hunted, climbed waterfalls, dodged snakes, pulled ticks off ourselves. Nothing scared us then and nothing scares us now. I crossed over the barbed wire to go look for the cow and my sister stopped, which is weird. She's my younger sister and always follows me. I was teasing her, calling her a chicken and telling her I'd been there before and that I wouldn't take her anywhere dangerous and that she knows that. She kept stalling and I finally got short with her and yelled at her to come on. She crossed the barbed wire but kept stopping. Finally she caught up to me. But as I walked further into the woods I got a bad feeling. The only way I can describe it is dark. My sister also kept saying she couldn't hear me even though I was talking loudly and was only two feet away from her at the most. 
I finally stopped, turned around, and we booked it out of there. Once we crossed back over the barbed wire, the bad feeling went away. My sister went home a couple hours later because she was unusually tired. I texted her and asked her if she thought the woods felt off. She says that she was terrified the entire time. I'll quote her text now. It was like we were going down a dark path to nowhere. I like to explore, but it didn't feel right. It gives me chills and almost makes me cry thinking about it. So I just told myself I was psyching myself out. It was right when we passed the fence, like we were somewhere we shouldn't have been. I was actually scared. I trust you and everything, of course, but the feeling I got standing and looking into the woods was just telling me not to go, not to cross the fence. The farther we went, the worse it got, like a dark shadow or something screaming at my insides, telling me to go back. Afterwards, I got a heavy feeling, making me so tired. This all happened this evening. We never found the cow or any sign of her. I also have this horrible lingering feeling from being in those woods. I feel dread when I think about it. I'm exhausted and I'm jumpy. I wanted to recount this story somewhere so I wouldn't forget the details and to see if anyone had any similar experiences or thoughts on what might be happening, supernatural or otherwise. I can tell you, I've never felt anything like that in my entire life. And my sister is never scared, which scared me even more. I want to preface this by saying I'm not religious. Spiritual, but not religious. I believe in cleansing with sage, incense, crystals, all of that. Pretty common nowadays, I know. I like to think I'm pretty in touch with the unexplained, but this has been taken to another level. So I've had sleep paralysis since I was 15. It's just something I grew used to. Other than the initial shock and fear, it didn't really bother me. When I was 19, I was living with my aunt and I could just feel there was something in the house. But there was one experience that changed my perception entirely. I was working at Ulta at the time. Most of my job was showing customers products and swatches. I normally used to get sleep paralysis when lying on my back, but this specific night before I worked, I had fallen asleep on my stomach and ended up having a really bad episode. And she, my sleep paralysis demon who was always the same woman, was sitting on my back this time, pinning my wrists down. I could paint the picture of it all, of the details so well. This was by far the most intense. Skin crawling episode I ever had. My wrists were throbbing. I thought I could feel her digging her fingers into my skin. I could feel her legs squeezing my ribs and even her hair brushing my back. It was so vivid. I came to, of course there was no one actually in my room, but my skin was crawling. Well, I went into work the next day as usual, went through my normal day. I'd been washing my arms off from all the swatches and my coworker pointed out this weird brown shade that wasn't coming off. I brushed it off, but when I was showering later, I tried scrubbing it off and although it didn't hurt, it didn't budge. There were identical bruises on both wrists where she had been holding me the night before. This changed my perception of sleep paralysis entirely. It no longer felt just like bad dreams. It became very real. Moving out of that house, things seemed to halt. I hadn't had sleep paralysis or negative spiritual experiences for about three years, until last night. So I moved in with my boyfriend about two months ago. The house has never felt bad or negative to me. Me and my now four month old puppy have been doing pretty great. Brutus, the puppy, has had a couple of weird incidents. Barking in an empty dark room, waiting in front of the doors with no one inside and randomly going nuts. I figured I'd sense anything awry, so I chalked it up to just being a crazy puppy. I saged the house regardless when I moved in. It's just part of my personal anointing process. I light incense pretty regularly and things have been really good. Until last night. I get home a little after 2.30 in the morning. I wasn't super tired and my boyfriend and I stayed up for a while talking. I decided I probably needed some sleep so we went to bed. He fell asleep holding me in a very specific position. I fell asleep but it was kind of like a weird half awake half asleep kind of feeling. I was asleep with my eyes closed though. It was weird because it felt like I was awake. It was so vivid. 
In my dream, I was looking at my boyfriend in a different position than I saw last, and right behind him was a woman. Not the same woman I used to see either. Her image shook me to the core. All of the stereotypical sleep paralysis demon features, dark hair, pale skin. The thing that freaked me out the most was its eyes. They were wide open, staring at me from behind my boyfriend's head. I couldn't see her mouth because only the top part of her head was peeking over him, but it looked like she was smiling. It took me a solid 15 seconds to force myself awake. I physically had to pry my eyes open, which is why I don't believe it was sleep paralysis, and I could move as soon as I actually woke up. When I looked and saw that my boyfriend was now in a completely different position, the one he was in in my dream, I instantly felt nauseous. This did not feel right at all. As soon as I woke up, I sat up hyperventilating and crying because of how bad this energy felt. My boyfriend just tried to comfort me by telling me it's just a dream and all that, but this was different. This felt demonic. I ended up shaking and crying in the bathroom last night, dry heaving from the image. Her face has burned so deeply in my mind I can't sleep. I'm cleansing the house again today, but something is telling me this is deeper than that. My boyfriend believes in the paranormal and doesn't have a problem with the way I handle things, but he's one of those, if I don't see it, it doesn't bother me kind of people. A few years ago, my mom went on a solo road trip. She doesn't usually like to travel alone, but I was in college and she wanted to visit some family a few states over. The trip went well, up until the last night on her drive back home. She had booked a room in a and b that looked really nice online, but everything went off the rails when she actually arrived, which I witnessed since I was on the phone, FaceTime, and being informed with texts and photos from her almost the entire night. When she pulled up to the house, it was totally dark. There were no lights on inside, and it seemed almost deserted. When she called the B&B to say that she'd arrived, she was told to take a key from under the doormat and unlock the door herself, as the innkeeper had been caught away in an emergency, and she would be the only one there for the night. She was already a bit uncomfortable with the situation, but went inside anyway, since she had already paid the fee and didn't have anywhere else to stay. The interior was old-timey looking, with velvet drapes, thick, dusty carpets, shelves full of photos and trinkets, and weirdest of all, many decorative plates with babies and children painted on them all over the walls. My mum locked the door behind her and went upstairs quite quickly, since she was feeling scared. Upstairs was worse though, with the continued vintage furnishings and the unfortunate addition of about 15 ceramic dolls in each room arranged on the beds and propped up on the tables and shelves. At this point, my mum was really freaked out, but kept trying to convince herself that there wasn't actually anything scary about the inn, or the dolls or anything else there. So she picked a room and started trying to go to bed. She did find herself turning the dolls around in her room so they faced the wall, even though she's usually a stark disbeliever in anything paranormal. That's when everything got really strange. She started hearing sounds all over the house, very human-like sounds. It started with creaking, then footsteps and whispering. My mom was overtaken with fear in a way she'd never experienced before. She found herself frozen in place, where she quite literally couldn't move, while hearing more and more activity. The sounds eventually escalated to screaming, crashing and banging sounds from all over the house. After a few minutes, my mom managed to shake herself from the paralysation and realised that she needed to get out as fast as she could. She was so terrified that she actually tried climbing out of the window on the second storey. But the roof below was too steep and she had to climb back inside. Then she took a fireplace poker, since she said she didn't know if the noise was from some robbers or something, gathered up her stuff and ran into the hallway and down the stairs. She was quite shocked to see that everything was exactly as it was when she came in. Except for one thing. A single one of the baby plates had fallen from the wall and shattered on the floor. There were no people in the house, the door wasn't bashed in. All the furniture was in the same dusty spots as before. She booked it from the door, threw it open, dropped the house key somewhere in the front yard and drove away. She had never been more afraid in her entire life, 
and had never been less sure in her opinion that ghosts were fake. She drove around the town for a while and ended up in a Motel 6, where she probably slept about 45 minutes, then came home. Unfortunately for her, though, that isn't where the story ends. She had been looking forward to arriving home so that she could be finally done with the whole frightening occurrence, maybe get some sleep, and watch some reality TV that had been recorded while she was gone. What she didn't account for was the ghostly hitchhiker that seemed to follow her back. That first night home, she fell asleep on the couch with the TV on. Around 2am, the TV turned off on its own, and she woke up suddenly to hear loud footsteps running through the living room. She lives totally alone in a standalone house. Weird things continued to happen for about two or three months, including a constant problem with the TV turning on or off, changing volume, changing the channel by itself. She would hear voices, screams and footsteps throughout the house and would often wake up to have items in the kitchen and living room moved around, very weirdly, with no explanation. The most notable of which was when the toaster has mysteriously moved to the top of the fridge one night. Fortunately, my mom really dedicated herself to 100% ignoring the ghost and trying to avoid feeding negative or scared energy into it. And after a few months, it went away. She felt like she knew for sure that it was a ghost and that it latched onto her that night in the inn. She certainly isn't much of a skeptic anymore. I had a friend I made in Indonesia while I worked in Jakarta. I was chatting to her one night via Yahoo Messenger with the video on. This was back in 2010, a few months before I met my wife. I've been chatting to her for some time and at some point I noticed a girl behind her sitting on the floor. She was just chilling out, smiling with legs bent in front of her. I was really amused because my friend had been chatting to me for some time and it turns out she's been ignoring her friend the whole time. So I teased and said, hey, a head just popped up behind you, expecting her to say, oh, that's my friend, such and such. She's just hanging out. Instead, she said, what head? I'm alone. And I say, there's a girl with glasses behind her and she looks totally freaked out. I joked that she had a ghost. I didn't mean it. It just looked like an ordinary young woman. And it kind of looks like the woman ducks down and is gone. I asked my friend to get up so I can see her room and it's empty. She says she's totally alone. My friend looks really frightened and I try to calm her down and say I might have been imagining things, but I only say it to calm her down because she looks so scared. It was late, but at that time I regularly went to bed late and I felt pretty awake because text checking always makes me a bit nervous for some reason. Then. She says that three of her other friends told her they can see a girl in her house, but she's never seen the girl herself. They all described her as wearing glasses, except everyone else, she is wearing different clothes. One, actually two, says it's a red dress. Another, a dark blue shirt, and for me, she was wearing a white sort of blouse, shirt and pants. Her glasses are big and square, and she looks to be in her late teens or early twenties. Indonesians can be hard to age. Anyway, she tells me she basically didn't take her other friends seriously. Indonesians can be a bit superstitious. For example, I had an Indonesian colleague who was training to be some sort of shaman. And my friend was not into any of that stuff. Did not believe in ghosts or have any real religious beliefs. I didn't believe in ghosts either. And if she hadn't looked so freaked out and told me about her friends, I might have put it down to a hallucination. The other thing was that the video window was quite small, but the picture was clear and it wasn't glitchy or blocky. It would be weird if my imagination overloaded a hallucination so perfectly to appear partly obscured by my friend's desk on the floor behind her. The funny part of the story is that we both thought the other person was lying. I thought she was lying there being no one in the room and she thought I was lying and didn't believe I saw someone. Nevertheless, the fact I saw this girl independently of her other friends, each of the other three also saw the girl independently of each other, intrigued my friend, and so she asked me questions about her. Although I only saw her briefly, I still remember exactly what she looked like. The next time I chatted to my friend on a different day, we
we talked about it again. Apparently, she asked more questions of her other friends. She had a friend that claimed to be a psychic that supposedly communicated with the ghost. And the ghost said she liked it in the house and that she was kidnapped, murdered there back when the area used to be farmland. My friend lived outside of Jakarta in a place called Deepak. I don't know if I believe any of this bit. I only know what I saw and what I saw just appeared to be an ordinary young woman. Totally solid, not transparent or anything like that. I went back to Jakarta as part of a Southeast Asian holiday with my wife and met up with my friend. I asked her again if she was playing a joke on me and she still claims she wasn't and we chatted about it again. If she's playing a prank on me, one, she's an amazing actor. She really looked scared when I said there was a girl in her room. Two, she improvised a story about her friends also seeing a girl really quickly. And three, it really wasn't her style of humor. It's made me more open to the idea of ghosts, but being scientifically trained, I still have in my mind that it might have been a joke or a trick of the mind. I kept the transcript of the text chat though, and it still strikes me as very genuine on my friend's behalf. It's a shame I couldn't save the video, and even if I could at the time, I didn't think I was seeing anything unusual, apart from the fact I thought my friend was being really rude and ignoring a guest. I'd post the transcript, but there are bits of it I find cringy because we had a running joke where we sort of jokingly flirted with each other, but it only makes sense in the context of our friendship and it's a bit embarrassing. I went to middle school in a smaller town slash community. There honestly was absolutely nothing to do, besides go to the mini mall or to the community rec center where they would hold these teen dances and play horrible early 2000s music. I ended up going to one of these teen dances per usual with a group of friends. And per usual, said group of friends got into it with the preps or jock kids. Fight breaks out, police are called, everyone scatters. Me and this kid who I'll just call Nate end up walking back to his house on this bike path that runs along the backside of this rec centre. It's night time and there's a skate park to one side of us for a while and then nature trails and a river on the other side. We keep walking along this path and suddenly Nate stops and says, do you see that? Pointing into the pitch blackness as he faced the direction of the nature trails and river. Now this kid was admittedly at times not always too nice to me and I thought he was just messing with me at first I said, see what? There's nothing there. But at this point, this fool is walking towards whatever he thinks he sees. I see him walk right up like he's approaching a person. Looks back at me and he just crumbles. It was like he fainted or something. So now I'm in the middle of this path completely alone. And there may or may not be some type of presence that just caused my friend to pass out. I'm scared to death at this point, obviously. And this is all becoming too much for my 13 year old brain to handle. I'm half Hispanic and grew up around very religious elders and was always told when I had nightmares or if I ever felt evil that I needed to pray. I started walking towards my friend because I didn't want to leave him there, but I also didn't want to be alone. And I began praying. Now, as an adult, I am not religious, but at this time I was doing whatever I thought would help. I went to try and pick my friend up and he was so heavy, abnormally. I was big for my age and he was much smaller than me, height and weight wise, and it was like I was trying to pull a grown man. I know dead weight, but this felt different. He also was ice cold to the touch, despite it being the middle of summer. I started to drag him and was praying and focusing on this one particular star as I did so. Not really sure why, looking back. But I focused on the star and prayed and prayed repeatedly. And my initial thought was to drag him to the hospital. But I swear the more I prayed, the brighter this star got. And it was like he was revived or something. He woke up annoyed that I was dragging him and scuffing his Iversons and confused about what had happened. He said that he saw an old man near the tree line when we were walking and that he motioned for Nate to come towards him. He said once he got close to the old man, this thing put his freaking hand inside of Nate, which is what apparently made him pass out. I was happy he was okay and that I wasn't alone, and we ended up walking back to his house like nothing happened. But I believe something did happen to Nate that night. 
Flash forward a month or so later, and per usual, I'm meeting up with my friends to once again to go to one of these teen dances. Because per usual, that's the only thing going on. I get to Nate's house, and the whole feeling is just off. Hard to describe, really. I go downstairs to Nate's room, and he's not in there, but sometimes happens, and we were good enough friends that I would just wait for him to pop in, which he would normally do. But this time there was nothing. I go back upstairs and every single animal this dude had, which was like a cat and two or three small dogs if I remember right, were all standing hair raised, with their backs to his front door, staring up. And I see my friend Nate sitting over this banister he had in his house in a weird way, feet dangling. Didn't see him there when I came in and he's just silent, scribbling and mumbling something. What's up man? I asked him nervously, not really knowing what the hell was going on at this point. Nate looked up at me and looked like he hadn't slept in a few days. Deep circles under his eyes and he says, I'm fucking scared. Confused, I ask, scared of what, bro? And he jumps down from the banister with a paper in his hand and gives it to me. The paper has the word death and then just black scribbles like he'd been sitting scribbling the same circle in the same place for a long time. Instantly got all the bad vibes and nope energy and I flat out told him, I'm going home, man and opened the door, leaving his terrified animals in a corner, and wondering if they'd be okay. Long story longer, Nate eventually got into a lot of trouble, dealt some pretty crippling vices, and though he's still alive now, looks like a shell of his former self, or just not what you'd have expected this kid to grow up, to say the least. I think I witnessed a possession happen to him. I haven't told many people this story, and I don't think I've ever shared this in detail. I have other equally crazy stories from my time living in this strange small town, if anyone else is interested. My family believes in the paranormal. Growing up, they would tell me stories about past experiences in the family. There were stories that ranged from a ghost in the garage of my aunt, to the more spectacular stories such as about a painting that my grandmother had bought on a market that was supposedly haunted and would eventually take the life of one of the 11 grandchildren. All are great stories, worthy of their own post, but I always took their stories with a grain of salt. I was always very interested to hear them, but I never truly believed them completely. That would change. My grandmother lived in a grand old farmhouse from the late 18th century with a big and beautiful garden. My mother grew up in that house and would tell me that she believes the house to be haunted. My grandmother, mother and aunts have all seen a woman in white at some point during their lives there. When we stayed over as a kid, we never wanted to walk through the house alone, especially at night when we had to go to bed. You would always have the feeling of being watched when roaming the halls. Luckily, nothing more than that ever happened and growing up, I just chalked it up to me being just a kid. Four years ago, my grandmother's health started rapidly declining. Instead of bringing her to a nursing home, we decided to take her into our house. She still lives with us to this day. Her mental health started getting worse after living with us for a year. Because of this, we decided it was time to sell her house that had remained untouched. We put the house on the market and after a year, we had found a buyer. Before the sale, we went to the house a couple of times with the family to do some maintenance but nothing out of the ordinary happened during any of these events. Then came moving day. We had a small trailer and were going back and forth between houses, moving all of the furniture out. By the end of the day, only me and my stepdad were still moving. There was only one more piece of furniture to move, a big closet from the bedroom that we had just disassembled. Unfortunately, the trailer was already completely filled and we would need to come back to pick up the closet. We placed the closet in the entrance hall and drove off to unload the trailer. We came back to the house about 30 minutes later. When we opened the door, we saw that a plate from between the wooden beams and the ceiling, above where we placed the closet, had fallen to the floor. I thought it was weird, but I didn't really think about it and went to start moving the closet to the trailer. When we got to the closet, we both see a necklace of a cross laying on top of it. That necklace definitely was not there before we left. The closet was completely disassembled and carried sideways down the stairs. If it was there before, it would have already fallen off. 
It either was on top of the ceiling plate that fell and landed perfectly on the closets, or it was placed there. In hindsight, this isn't a smart move, but we took the necklace home to show it to my mother and asked my grandmother if she had seen the necklace before. We got home and instantly I told mom about what had just happened and showed her the necklace. We had a Dora the Explorer doll on our desk. In the kitchen for my sister's children and I kid you not, when I showed my mother the necklace, the doll of the opposite side of the room started speaking her voice lines. Weird, but okay. Coincidence, I guess. We asked my grandmother if she had seen it before, but she hadn't. A few days passed and I was going to be home alone for a week. Nothing had happened since, so I was already starting to forget about the necklace. Everything was fine for the first few days. On the third day, I decided that I was going to take advantage of being home alone for a week. I put on a movie, rolled up a joint and lit it inside my room. The moment that I exhale the first puff of smoke, I hear the loudest bang that I've ever heard knock on my door. I immediately freeze up in terror, knowing that I'm home alone and that we have kept the creepy necklace that we found at my grandmother's house. Time goes by, about 30 minutes, I start to relax again. But I haven't yet tried to smoke again. Continued watching the movie, when a scene made me laugh a little. The second I made a sound, another loud bang knocked on my door. It sounded like someone punched the door with all of its power. I froze up again. After about a minute, I mustered up the courage and decided to see what could have caused it. I opened the door but saw nothing, inspected the door but couldn't find anything. For the rest of the week, I felt watched when I walk inside the hall. I could feel where it was watching me from, but I never actually saw something. When my mother got me home, I told her everything and demanded that the cross would be thrown away. I tried to show her how loud the bang on the door is by punching it with full force, but shockingly, I never managed to get a bang as loud as the ones I heard that day, even though I'm a pretty strong guy. She agreed to throw away the cross, and she got rid of it. I believe that the ghost from my grandmother's house was attached to that cross, and that it had followed us when we took the necklace home. Ever since then, I became a complete believer that there is something more to life than what we can see. If there's one thing you can learn from the story, don't take the creepy necklace home. Now, I've lived in the same house since I was four and I'm currently 20. The bathroom adjacent to my bedroom is the kids' bathroom and appears to have been since the house was built in the 40s. It's also funny because when we moved in, we remodeled some parts of the house, including that bathroom. It's all white with white tile and granite and bright lighting, which doesn't really seem to fit with the fact that a ghost haunts it. The first time I ever experienced anything really scary in that bathroom was when I was around eight. I was taking a bath and I was alone. I was just chilling, reading a book or whatever, when I heard a girl's voice inside the bathtub. Like, it sounded like it came from directly above me, as if the ghost was hovering a few inches above me in the bath. It said hello several times, and I was terrified. At first I was frozen, then I absolutely hightailed it out of there. After that, I hated the bathroom near my room. I refused to even enter it for at least a month and had to go all the way downstairs to go to the bathroom and shower and I brushed my teeth in the kitchen sink. Well, nothing much else really happened for many years after that. It wasn't until I was much older, probably around 13 or so, that things started happening there again. The next run-in with this ghost was by far the worst. I was alone at night. My mom was out on a date. It wasn't a big deal and I was used to it, so I wasn't already scared or freaked out. I was hanging out in my room and I had my dog sitting next to me. The door to my room was open. I wasn't paying any attention, listening to music and playing a game or something, when my dog jumped up and looked at the door. I followed his gaze and saw a dark figure at the door. It was at child height and appeared to be a little girl. She had black hair that was dripping wet and the rest of her face looked to be dark grey. She was peering around the corner of the door so that I could only see her head. As soon as I saw her, she ran down the hallway and stairs. I could hear her running. It didn't occur to me whatsoever that it was a ghost at the time. The fact that both the dog and I could see her, then I could hear her running down the hallway, made me think it was an intruder. I was so scared that it also didn't register that the intruder was a small girl. 
I just thought that there was someone else in the house. It felt like lightning was coursing through my body. I ran into the bathroom and hid myself in a cabinet, then called the police. The police came and searched the entire house and had to come pull me out of the cabinet. But they said they didn't find anything. In fact, the house alarm was still on when they arrived, which meant that none of the doors or windows had been opened since my mum left. Not a week after this incident, another thing happened. I was standing in the bathroom washing my face. I got a strong feeling something was behind me but ignored it, thinking it was just because my eyes were closed. Out of nowhere I was, well, almost like possessed. I lost consciousness for a moment and it was as if I were taken to a different place. It was like an empty black space with nothing anywhere. The floor was made of water and I was soaking wet. In the distance there were these glowing purple lights. Then I heard a voice. It was the same voice that I heard in the bathtub years ago, but this time it was in my head, not out loud. It said the name Lucy over and over. Then I woke up and I was on the floor of the bathroom. It was so strange. It was like I'd been on some spiritual journey or something. I suddenly knew things about this ghost. I knew it was a child. I knew her name. Like I knew instinctively that Lucy was her name. I knew that she died in that bathroom, and I knew that she was friendly but lonely, but she wanted me to know about her and her death, but didn't actually mean to scare me. I wasn't freaked out, really. It was more relieving to find out what all these events were, or that she wasn't an evil spirit or anything. I tried to run and tell my mom what had just happened, who thought I was being crazy about the whole thing, and was still angry that I messed up her date a week earlier by calling the police when nobody was actually in the house. But she definitely thought I was just acting like a loon, and I mean, who wouldn't think that? Since then, the bathroom is still 100% haunted. Recently I got a new dog, and every single night she jumps off the bed, walks into the bathroom where the bathtub is, and just stands there for several minutes, and then leaves. My dog also frequently jumps up to stare at the bathroom as if she heard a noise, when I can't hear anything. It's also pretty common for things to move on their own in there. Just the other day, I saw all of my products and things on the counter just fly sideways as if someone swept their arm across the counter. And one day, a stack of boxes in the closet toppled down as if they were kicked. None of these things ever scare me though. The ghost and I kind of just coexist. I never feel afraid of the ghost when she does things in there, which I reckon was kind of her goal. I know who she is. Sometimes I speak to her. And I let her carry on her haunting without any issues. Also, I'm pretty sure she and my dog are friends, which is honestly really cute. My mother was an actress for decades. From a very young age, I had been in and out of many theatres. I was in on all of the superstitions and behind the scenes stories that honestly were frightening but I couldn't help but listen to what the cast and crew had to say. Theatre people have a way with telling stories. Of course, I had some experiences of my own. Cold spots, the feeling of being watched, and disembodied footsteps or voices. But I had just chalked it up to being a kid with an overactive imagination. Knowing what I know now, I wonder if it was more than just that, my imagination. Anyway, following the footsteps of my mom. I began my own artistic ventures at the age of seven. I'm in high school now and have been acting for a decade as of this year. Throughout my career, I've been in hundreds of productions and in and out of countless venues. I'm not giving you this information to brag, so I'm very sorry if it comes off that way. I just wanted to give you an idea of how this particular theatre stands out among the others. This particular instance, I was in rehearsals for a school production of an off-campus venue. I don't want to give out the exact name to protect the company and cast, but I can give you the building's name, nickname, the Wendy. I know it's not an exactly striking or chilling name, but it does personify the building in a way other theatres around town aren't. It's made a name for itself. One of the reasons why can be attributed to the fact that many in my city, particularly among theatre folk, consider the building to be alive in a way. Although the entities that haunt it are very, very much dead. As it grew older, my interest in the paranormal grew, and it's been a fun thing to learn about. 
Growing up around these stories and places definitely had made me more and more curious. On this particular day of rehearsals, me and a couple of friends decided to ask our director if anything strange had happened recently. It was January, the start of a new year. This was just before our lunch break and we had finished up all of our work for the morning. Our director sighed and said we would think he was making something up or straight up just going crazy, but we insisted we would believe him. He told us that his experience took place that December, locking up the theatre after the closing of the Christmas show that year. The only two people left in the theatre were himself and another person from the cast. Only two people, or so he may have thought. As he was walking out of the green room, which is a room where actors wait to go on stage, do quick changes, etc., he heard an ear-splitting cackle that sounded like a classic, stereotypical witch. It was crystal clear and sounded like it came from someone standing directly behind him. He whirled around to find no one. He went in search of the other cast member who was in the office down the hall from the green room. He asked what was so funny to make him laugh like that. The cast member looked confused and it explained he hadn't laughed. No one else was in the theater and he didn't hear anything anyway. It's been quiet since. After our director had told us the story, he excused himself to go out to lunch, instructing the cast not to leave a mess in the lobby and not to go into the theater without an adult. Obviously, my friends and I decided to go in. After we made sure he was gone, we snuck up the stairs. The doors were unlocked as we expected them to be and we stepped inside. Since the theatre wasn't in use, all of the lights were off, except the ghost light in the middle of the stage. If you don't know what a ghost light is, Google it to find out more. The history behind them is honestly pretty cool. It was incredible. The theatre holds up to a thousand people. The tiny light wasn't big enough to brighten the entirety of the auditorium, instead casting strange shadows across the audience. The three of us stuck side by side, too scared to walk down the steps towards the stage. As the door shut behind us, it became even darker. We looked around for a little bit from our porch on the steps and eventually started debating whether or not to go into the green room. We talked about our director's story for not even five minutes when there was a weird lull in the conversation. The air got tense and heavy. Each of us just stared at each other. The hair on my neck stood up. Then from the green room, across the stage and the rows and rows of seats, we heard it, a loud, bone-chilling cackle. I can't even describe the feeling I had after hearing that absolutely horrid laugh. It was evil, high-pitched like a woman's laugh and truly terrifying. After it had registered that what we all had heard, we stood there in fear, eyes wide, before I broke the silence. Did you hear that? My friend replied, you mean the fucking cackle? So we all heard it? Once it was confirmed we all had experienced the same thing, that we weren't individually going insane, we bolted out of the theatre. The realisation that whatever it was had been listening, waiting for the perfect moment to taunt us, still haunts me to this day. And it's been quiet since. This happened in Mexico. Me and my family are from a small town on the outskirts of one of the biggest cities in the country. And it's become semi-urbanized since last century. So people here still have a strong folklore about supernatural things in comparison with the rest of the city. So the paranormal stuff is seen here as something more accepted between the people. To the story. It happened at the beginning of last year when the second wave of COVID really hit the country, causing almost all of the hospitals to get overwhelmed. One of my uncles works as a nurse in a hospital, so unfortunately, he caught the virus and ended up infecting his family and parents, as well as my grandparents, even before presenting symptoms. His father and my grandfather were brothers, and all of the tree houses are next to each other. The problem started when my grandpa and his brother started to get worse after they presented symptoms, so my parents decided to take my grandparents to our home in order to take care of them. Fortunately, my grandma didn't even present symptoms, but despite our best efforts, my grandpa was not getting better. 
Taking Kim to a hospital would have been a death sentence due to being overwhelmed, as I mentioned before, due to him being already dependent on oxygen tanks because of the virus. So transporting him was really difficult and a risk for his health. And even if he would have been accepted, the personnel inside of hospitals was not enough. We have more family members working inside hospitals, so we knew what was really going on inside of them, as he needed to be taken care of 24-7. After two weeks and all of our efforts, he didn't make it. So as you can imagine, it took a really big toll on us all. As for the brother of my grandpa, he ended up dying as well, both of them being in their 80s. Now, one of the usual things believed here is that when someone dies, the person stays around for a few days. I've never been someone who believes every story about paranormal stuff. I try to judge things from a more rational side, despite experiencing some things that still make me wonder about what we can really assure about what we know about paranormal things in general. This was my first experience with the belief I mentioned. The brother of my grandpa died a few days before him. The weird thing started the very same day his brother died. It started when I was in another room of my house as I was almost ready to get something to eat. So I was not in the same room as my grandpa when all of a sudden I saw a shadow for a brief moment exiting the kitchen. But I really thought it was my imagination due to the fatigue. My parents and I took turns to take care of grandpa so he was never unattended, even at night, being lied to him when this happened and ignored it. But after I heard the voice of Grandpa's brother coming from the same room Grandpa was in, and I have no doubt about that one, it was clearly him. Obviously I freaked out because it was impossible it was him because we were not in the same city he lives in, and he was also in a delicate condition. So I went to check on Grandpa, but there was no one there, and my other family members were not there at the moment. I gave it not that much of importance, until a few hours later, when we were informed that Grandpa's brother had just died a few hours before. Even worse, after that, my Grandpa started asking the condition of his brother any time he could. He had not until that day, despite not knowing he had died, being impossible, because we knew that if we told him, he would probably just get even worse in his health. So everyone just kept it secret, even my Grandma. Even to his last days, my Grandpa asked about him, and we just told him that he was better. We don't know if he believed it, because he said that his brother came every now and then to visit him. And as you can imagine, that being impossible. The day came when my grandpa did not resist anymore, and passed away. Just a few after his brother. One of the most common things that happens here, is that it's said that after someone has died, some other person who doesn't know that the person dies, sees them. Like if they were making their daily lives for one last time. I did not believe in that before all of this happened, but the news of my grandpa's death took a while to spread, as we were not in the same city they lived in. And as I said at the beginning, being from a non-completely urbanised place, people still knew almost everyone in the town, especially old people. When we went back to my grandparents' house to stay with my grandma, fortunately my parents' work could still be done at home, we found some friends of the family who were really surprised about grandpa passing. As they said, they had seen him just a few days before, still after his passing, and even had a brief chat with him. And knowing them, I do not distrust them, as they are not the ones who attribute everything to paranormal stuff. And also their reaction was complete shock. Maybe I believed more easily due to what I experienced with grandpa's brother. Even for a few days after we arrived there, my grandpa's rocking chair swayed at random times. I would have known if the wind or a minor earthquake were the causes, because I know that house as the palm of my hand, because I lived there for a few years when I was younger. Sometimes plates would appear out of the kitchen without any logic, but we never really felt uncomfortable. I guess that's what it means when people talk about feeling their loved ones still being with them. This started to fade away slowly, and in the end, everything returned to being as normal as it could. This happened in 2012. I want to give all the context, so I apologise it's long. It was the summer after my freshman year of college, and I was at my parents' house. It's a ranch-style house on a hill, where you enter onto the second floor through the front door. And there's a staircase that goes downstairs where you can exit to the woods outside the back of the house. My parents were away for work, 
they work together, and I was planning to pull an all-lighter to meet a writing deadline for my internship. It was Saturday, and my younger brother, 17 at the time, was planning to go to some big party with a handful of his friends, including one of our childhood friends from the Netherlands who was staying with us for the summer. My best friend and I agreed to drop him and his friends off and pick them up. I'll skip ahead to the part when we pick them up from the party. There were five of them from total, the four we dropped off plus another one tagging along who I didn't know, and they were so drunk. I never heard the new kids say a word. We brought them back and they crashed in various parts of the house pretty much immediately. My best friend and I took the California King in the master bedroom downstairs, where I would pull my all-nighter writing once she fell asleep. And one of the friends crashed in the sitting room behind our bedroom. You had to go through our bedroom to get to it. Everyone else was upstairs. My brother was in his room directly above the sitting room. His other friend was in the guest room directly above the master. And our Netherlands friend plus the new kid actually fell asleep sitting up leaning on each other on the couch in the living room upstairs across an open floor plan from the front door slash dining room area. So it's 3am and everyone except me is asleep. I had just come back downstairs after putting on a pot of coffee and had seen the two boys on the couch in the same position they'd been in all night. I got into the bathroom at the foot of the stairs and don't bother locking the door. Just as I sit down to pee, I suddenly hear voices having a conversation upstairs, right near the top of the steps, which is also close to the front door, and it's clearly a man and a woman, so I assume something went wrong on the trip and my parents have come home unexpectedly. They weren't due back for another couple of days. Fearing they would immediately come downstairs to their room, I run over and lock the bathroom door, then finish peeing, washing my hands, etc., And all the while, I can hear this animated conversation upstairs, but can't make out what they're saying, even though it's getting louder and louder. I finish up quickly in the bathroom because I need to go greet my parents and explain why we're in their bed and all these kids, who are surely awake and confused now, at least the ones in the living room, are in the house. So I'm running up the stairs, and the conversation is getting noticeably louder and louder the closer I get. As I'm a couple steps away from the top landing, they're fully yelling, and the moment my foot hits the top of the steps, silence. I look at the front door and scan the whole dining room and living room area for my parents. No one is there. Everything is exactly the same as it was a few minutes ago when I was upstairs, including the two boys sitting exactly as they were before, fast asleep. I start shaking and my heart starts pounding, keeping my back to the stairs. I go back into the kitchen all the way up to the coffee pot, too scared to turn my back on the area the voices were coming from. With shaking hands, I pour another cup of coffee and stand there in shock, desperately trying to rationalize what just happened. At this moment, the friend who was in the guest room comes into the kitchen, barely awake, still drunk, looking for water. I asked, did you hear any of that? And he had no idea what I was talking about. I gave him water and he went back to bed. I told myself the new kid I never heard speak must have a voice like a woman. And him and our friend must have woken up, had the conversation and somehow fallen asleep right when I got upstairs. It didn't make any sense, but I was so terrified, I forced myself to accept it at least until daylight. I went back downstairs, eventually got back to work, And once I finished, I waited until the sun came up to try to get some sleep. A few hours later, everyone was up, and I eagerly said good morning to the new kid to hear his voice. It turned out to be far deeper than anyone else's in the house, and a sharp chill ran down my spine. I asked him and our friend if they woke up and had a heated conversation in the middle of the night, but I already knew the answer. No. In fact, as soon as one woke up and realised they were sleeping on each other, He moved to a different chair. As everyone gathered in the living room, I told them all what happened, and no one knew what to say or had any idea how to explain it. This experience forced me to allow for the existence of the paranormal, ghosts, whatever, because it's been almost 10 years and I still have no explanation. The property borders a wooded wildlife preserve that was originally the home of the Minka tribe, along with the whole neighbourhood and more land beyond that. I'm not sure where this tribe lives today, and don't believe this is even the name they call themselves. 
I don't know why this thought kept entering my head as I tried to figure out what happened. Maybe because I couldn't make out the conversation? The house itself was only 60 years old or so, and to my knowledge, no one died there. Though the woman who lived there before us swore it was haunted. From a cloaked man in a hood without a face, to someone with an affinity for a certain room, as well as several other sightings in between, the Holy Family Parish Church in Maine is haunted with a lot of activities. The Stillwater Montessori School rented out two rooms and utilised a good part of the building for their interests. From 1990 to 1997, I went to this school. Its layout was fairly simple. The door the school used were the ones closest to the road. It opened up to a long hallway immediately in front and the hallway to the right. This right hallway was where the school resided. This shorter hallway on the right side had a classroom that we used as a dining room, then two classrooms, Terry's and Al's. Past those three rooms was a large open coat closet. Around the corner along the adjacent wall was a large kitchen with a few tables. On the left side, a catering hall across Terry's classroom and bathroom across the coat closet. The kitchen. In the large kitchen, something lurked. This room, us students weren't allowed to play in and we used it only periodically if the church needed our normal dining hall for an event. I saw it lurking throughout the day. I always saw whatever this was through the half length window of the closed door. It looked like a man with head with long dark hair. Every time I saw him, he walked past the door. I never saw a face. Being a curious, somewhat mischievous kid, I had to check to see who else was misbehaving. Often the door would be locked. I peeked through the window and see no one inside the room. When the door was unlocked, I stepped inside. I wouldn't be greeted by anyone. The room was all, always empty. Well, it always looked empty. It didn't feel empty. And it didn't sound empty. There was an authoritative energy in the room. It was strict and cold. I was a little nervous that if I stayed there for more than a minute, I'd get a good beating. The minimal moments I poked my whole body in the room, I could faintly hear dishes rattling by the sink and general mixing and cooking sounds. Sometimes we'd have to eat lunch in this room because our normal dining room was occupied. I was the only student not excited to eat my lunch here. Upon finding out we'd be guests in this room, I'd dread it and lose my appetites. I wasn't the only one eating there, so that made it a little bit better. But I still didn't feel welcome. I'd constantly hear extra noises that didn't match students who were eating packed lunches. It was unsettling. I was always glad lunch was over when in this room. The reception hall. The school used the catering hall for potlucks throughout the year. The potlucks would include a theatre show put on by the students. The energy in this hall was somewhat ominous. Due to the kitchen and bathrooms jutting out from an otherwise large rectangular room, there were three sections of this room. The open area in front of the bathrooms, the large area overlooking the kitchen, and the smaller area that faced the entrance. This smaller area had a dark corner where the panelling was different. It looked like a booth or nook that maybe a cash register might be placed. Behind the counter, there was a weird room and closet that didn't feel right. Other than this section, light brown panelling, a suspended ceiling and white grey speckled vinyl adorned the room. In the centre of the longest back wall hung a large crucifix between two large windows. There were two potlucks a year. Rehearsals took place in the hall on a makeshift stage between the two windows. This is where all shows were performed. I always felt an audience of two extra people watching us. In the height of this feeling, Whenever I'd look over by the kitchen wall, directly across from where I was standing, I'd see a faint shadow of a man in a top hat. The man wasn't letting off a whole lot of emotions. He was just there like an overseer, sending wide bits of compassion in a slightly ominous way. Meanwhile, over by the darker panelling, an angry energy lingered behind the shadows, invisible to the eye, but I could feel it. Sorrowful anger, looming, as long as I stood clear of this dark area and never ventured there alone, I knew I was safe. 
midnight mass at Christmas. Growing up, it was a tradition to go to midnight mass on Christmas. My Aunt Claire, my brother Josh and I would nap in the evening and got up at 11 and head to mass. Often the church that would host the mass was the Holy Family Parish Church. One Christmas, while I was in high school, probably 2003, we arrived at the church and entered the church by way of the main entrance, overlooking the road. The three of us walked down the alley to sit in the pew we wanted, towards the middle of the floor. We sat down. As the mass went on, eventually I caught a glimpse of a man on the stage. Anger and confusion added to the overwhelming, gracious, peaceful Christmas atmosphere. He was wearing black cloak. The hood was over his invisible head. It just stood there for a few seconds before it just turned around and disappeared behind a red curtain. Even though this hooded figure scared me, I never mentioned it to anyone. I knew it wouldn't be able to hurt me. Usually, all Catholic churches have some energy. None of the energy is anything like what looms here. Some background on the first incident. My dad and I went on a trip across the country to move to a new state. One of the stops on the way would be my dad's uncle. We'll call him Mark. Cabin. The cabin is situated in rural Illinois, about 55 minutes from the nearest town. There are no street markings whatsoever, and the nearest neighbour is a good six miles away. Mark is a farmer by trade, so his cabin is surrounded by at least 200 acres of farmland, right in the middle of the Shawnee National Forest. On two sides of the cabin, there's a woodland, so you couldn't walk throughout, and on the other two sides, there are fields of crops. Now, the cabin itself is three stories. The basement just houses a small garage and laundry room. The middle floor is the largest, having Mark's bedroom, the kitchen, the living and dining room, and a bathroom. The top floor is just a landing and two bedrooms that connect through a shared bathroom. My dad and I each got one of the bedrooms. The middle floor has a raised deck on three sides that are full of windows and has a massive sliding glass door. And you guessed it, when it's nighttime out there, there is absolutely nothing to subset the darkness. You can't see a single thing out of the windows, no matter how hard you try. Now, let's move on to the creepy part. The first night we stayed there, I was sitting on my dad's bed, chatting. He had his window open to ventilate the room, and you could hear lots of movement up from outside on the ground level. Of course, we couldn't see anything. We could only hear trees swaying, branches and dry grass crunching by something walking on it. Don't worry, we assumed it was deer as there were many in the area, and went to bed without any issues. The next day comes and goes after my dad, and I spent it exploring the area on a UAV. The next night after Mark goes to bed, my dad and I were sitting in the living room watching an old movie on the TV. This was around 9pm. And I remember getting this distinctly anxious feeling while sitting there with my dad. I routinely looked through some of the windows that were surrounding it, but as you guessed, I could see nothing but black. Around 10.30, my dad and I got to our appointed bedrooms and he quickly falls asleep. I messed around on my phone till around 1.30. At this point, I shut my door to the point where only a sliver of light is getting into my room, and I could barely see out into the dim landing. I plug my phone into the charger and hop into bed, ready to go to sleep. Around 20 or 30 minutes goes by of me trying to fall asleep, and that's when I hear it, clear as day. There's a loud and forceful knock on one of the windows. Three distinct knocks. I shoot up in bed and just sit there for a few seconds, listening and looking out through the small crack in the door. I get up and I'm hit with this overwhelming feeling that I should not open my door and go out. So I end up going through the shared bathroom and into my dad's room. I wake the poor guy up from a dead sleep and tell him that I heard someone's knock on either the glass doors or the windows. My dad gets up and I follow him downstairs and he checks the entire house before locking both of the doors that my uncle always leaves open. After turning on the porch light and checking the house, we found nothing and went back up to our rooms. I'm extremely unsettled, but could tell my dad was assuming I had just freaked myself out. The next morning comes around, 
I go downstairs while my dad is sitting at the table with Mark. Apparently the two had been discussing what I had heard last night. That's when my dad tells me that Mark has heard the same knocking at the same time of night on three separate occasions. The first time he heard the knocking, he immediately jumped up from bed and grabbed the shotgun he keeps in his closet. He knew there'd be no one or no thing good knocking at the door in the middle of nowhere at 2am. He saw nothing when he looked outside and when the knocking came twice more, he didn't bother checking it. Now Mark is a 73 year old tough cowboy that's straight up, fearless and doesn't find any enjoyment in lying. We left the same day to continue our journey across the states. The second event occurred just last week. My dad was visiting my mom and I in our two bedroom house. He flew out at the city's airport the next day. Due to him being there, I spent the night on an air mattress on the floor of my mom's bedroom while he slept in my bed. My mom's bedroom is in the back of the house with a small backyard and then a sloped six foot wall leading up into the desert being all there was. Around 5 a.m. I jolted awake with this extremely loud knock on my mum's bedroom window. I sat up and just stared at the curtain covered window. My mum had already been awake, early riser, and had her earphones in while watching something. She yanked them out and asked me if I had heard it as well. The two of us just sit in silence. She tells me that if she opens the curtains, she just knows that something is going to be staring back at her. I go and wake up my dad, poor dad, and tell him the two of us heard someone at my mom's window. He goes outside and finds nothing, but reports that he heard the dogs barking off and on for a little over an hour. Strange. My mom and I heard no barking whatsoever. The sun comes and goes, and nothing else happens the next night, or any night since then. I've told this to family and friends, and I'm always given a sceptical look, or it brings chills to their spine. It sounds far-fetched, but honestly, it was as real as it can get for me, and that's all that matters. I was around 10 or 11 at the time, and was in my old home in Millmont, Pennsylvania. It was after school, and I spent a few hours just gaming in the first full living room. It was only me and my older brother home at the time, since my parents worked second shift until around 11pm. It was around 7 or 8pm when I began to crave one of my favourite snacks. I walked in the kitchen and opened some blueberry pop tarts and sat down at the kitchen table. I was facing away from the living room at the end table. Now I need to explain the layout so you better understand. Before entering the kitchen, there's a small archway with no door. It leads straight from the kitchen to the living room, extending to around 2 feet of open space on either side, after the archway. From the living room continuing straight, there's a staircase to the left, facing away from the kitchen view. I was mid-bite of my Pop-Tarts when all of a sudden, I began feeling what I can only describe as dread mixed with the feeling of being watched. I kind of shook it off because of it being so random. It made no sense as to why I felt that way, so I just kept eating. It was a few more small bites in when the feeling intensified and I only had a gut instinct to turn around. I decided to do so when I shouldn't have. I'm going to try my best to describe the finite details of what I saw. When I turned around, I was immediately focused on the three quarters of a face peeking out, completely sideways on the right side of the archway. Now this face was completely solid and not transparent at the least. It was the face of my older brother Jonathan. His eyes were opened wide, unblinking and staring directly into my own. His face had an absolutely sinister smile. An ear to ear smile that was almost too far stretched out to be normal. My brother's skin was normally pale, but this face was an extremely pale, being for sure a few shades lighter, almost like a slightly cream porcelain. The face's eyes were the same colour as John being bright blue, but it seemed almost glossy. It made no s noise and never attempted to speak. It just stared at me, unmoving. Now I have a condition where I get heart palpitations from a murmur I've had since birth. If I'm surprised or get excited too quickly, I get several quick palpitations. I've had it for as long as I remember. 
When I suddenly saw that face, I had to clutch my chest as an immense immediate fear and surprise caused my heart to palpitate several times. I also got a huge lump in my throat. I couldn't scream or yell. I just stared widely back in a paralyzed terror. What was around five seconds felt more like an eternity. The face then pulled back behind the archway at an angle you wouldn't think possible. For a few seconds I was terrified, but then I just began to trying to rationally think of what I saw in an attempt to pull myself back to earth. In my own mind, I knew it was my brother. It's just his features were a bit oblong and that smile was more sinister than anything I've seen before. I was already used to him pranking me on a weekly basis, so I convinced myself that it was another one of his stupid pranks. I thought to myself that I can also sneak to the archway myself and scare him back since he didn't walk back to the living room. I knew he was just hiding on the right side of the archway, so I slowly and silently got up from the chair and sneaked my way to the right side of the archway from the kitchen. I reached the edge of it, waited a few seconds and then jumped out and yelled BOO! However, to my confusion, there was nothing there. There was no way that my brother could have moved away from that position without me seeing, as that part of the wall only came out about two feet. I still had visible access to the rest of the living room from the kitchen. I was in shock and confusion when all of a sudden I heard a quick walk coming from the staircase on the left side of the living room. I slowly turned towards the staircase and looked up at the sight of my older brother, looking back at me with a confused expression. Dude, who the hell are you yelling at? My brother said as he peeked over the stairwell at me. He was 13 at the time. I was just in utter shock. I tried to make out words, but I just couldn't. My lip was only quivering. I instead turned back around, went back into the kitchen and sat down at the kitchen table again, just staring into my Pop-Tarts for about a minute or two. My brother came down the stairs and into the kitchen and saw the blank look on my face and pressed on his question. I told him everything I saw and he somehow believed me. Maybe due to the fear and panic I had when he first saw my face. I was researching online what I could have possibly seen and I've only been pointed to what is known as a doppelganger. But I saw that they were an exact copy of a living person. That thing was very close to being exact but wasn't 100%. I'd say 90% at best with that stretched smile and the skin tone. Also, my research showed me that they're not sinister or evil, but can be a sign of bad luck. But I swear, the only feeling I got off of it was dread and a sense of sinister evil. I never saw it again after that day. So what exactly was it then? I have no idea. I have other experiences from my 27 years of life. But that was the scariest out of them all. And I just wanted to see if anyone has any idea what I witnessed. This happened when I was 11 or 12. I'm 28 now. And I was staying the night at my friend Danny's house, who lived just a few houses down from mine. There was a large pond behind our neighbourhood, and we spent a lot of time there growing up. We'd go fishing, ride bikes, explore the small forest, etc. But we really enjoyed catching turtles and tree frogs. Might sound weird, but what can I say? We had somewhat of an obsession with reptiles and amphibians. Another thing I should note is that there was an old Native American trail that went through all the backyards in our street. It wasn't the Trail of Tears, but it was related to it in some way, I don't really remember. Back to the story. I was up late playing video games with Danny, and after a while we wanted to do something else. It was close to midnight, but we decided to go out and try and catching some tree frogs. A family that lived in a nearby house had gone on vacation, and they had a perfect backyard for catching frogs. We hopped their fence and started exploring. Almost immediately, I started getting a weird feeling. I had the feeling we were being watched or something was nearby, and there was this odd energy in the air. I don't know how to explain it, but something just felt off. I remember feeling afraid, but I had no reason to be. We'd done this kind of thing many times before and it never inspired fear. About 10 minutes in, we thought we heard the frog saying, help me in a croaky, froggy voice over and over again. The weird thing is, we couldn't see any tree frogs with our flashlights, and the yard wasn't that big. They started chanting in unison, and that made it much louder. Feeling more than a little creeped out, 
we bolted out of there and back to the street. Now, we were standing under a streetlight on the street corner, across from where the frog house was. I looked up at the light and noticed at least 15 dragonflies attached to each other, like the human centipede. They were doing a spiralling motion as they flew closer and closer to the light. It was weird. So we heard and saw two unusual things, but you could possibly explain them away. What happened next, however, made absolutely zero fucking sense. After the dragonflies did their thing and flew away, Danny and I remained standing under that streetlight. We began talking about the strangeness of the frogs in particular. We both heard them croaking the same phrase, and we were pretty much just saying what the fuck was that about? At some point during the conversation, I was instantly overcome with the most intense adrenaline rush I've had in my life. That feeling of fear without a source, while at the frog house, was back, but much, much stronger. It was like my fight or flight response was signalled for no reason. Once again, everything felt off and it felt like there was intense energy all around us, making the hair air heavy. I was terrified and I found out later my buddy was feeling the same thing. I became as still as possible, listening intently to my surroundings. I didn't hear anything unusual, but I suddenly began to feel drawn to look at the street behind me. I knew something was there. Whatever was behind me was the source of my fear, and it was putting out overwhelming energy with its presence alone. I hesitantly turned around and looked. I have full body goosebumps just recalling this. In the middle of the street, about 20 yards away from us, there was an ordinary looking five or seven year old girl with long, dark black hair, wearing a white nightgown. She was sitting Indian style on the street pavement with a doll in her lap, and she was combing the doll's hair with a hairbrush. I was pretty much terrified beyond imagination. I was frozen with fear and could barely think straight. There was an incredible amount of energy in the air and I knew something wasn't natural. She looked innocent enough, but I felt like she would snap me in half with the snap of her fingers if she wanted to. Another creepy detail was that she never even looked at us. She kept her head down and focused on her doll, but she definitely knew we were watching her. After what felt like an hour, Realistically, probably 15 to 30 seconds, a car turned onto the streets and began heading down the hill towards the girl. I remember the headlights getting brighter and brighter as it approached her. You would think maybe I would try to save her real quick, but I legitimately couldn't move. Also, I didn't really expect to get hit for some reason. I never felt like she was in any sort of danger. Eventually, she became lost in the car's headlights, never looking up from her doll this whole time, by the way and the car just passed right through without any sign of a collision. It stopped at the stop sign 15 feet from us and made a right turn. We took our eyes off from where the girl was as we watched the car turn. When we looked back to where the girl had been, she was gone. Instead, there was a dog on the sidewalk precisely parallel to where the girl was sitting in the street. The dog was looking right at me when I noticed it, almost like it was waiting for me to see it. Then, he just turned around and trotted up the hill in the other direction. After a few seconds, the shock wore off and we sprinted back to Danny's house and spent half the night looking out his second story window towards the street. I don't know what I saw, but Danny saw the exact same thing. I've always felt like there was a reason it happened for some reason, or a reason it showed itself, whatever it was, to us of all people. Last thing, the house was in front of where the girl was seen was haunted. I lived on that street for 10 years, and 4 or 5 different families lived in the haunted house during those 10 years. All of them said it was haunted. I have a couple of stories about that too, but this is already way longer than I wanted it to be. So I'd like to start by saying I had a paranormal investigation team come to my apartment. They cleansed it. And it all seemed to calm down for the most part after their third visit. But just before Christmas activity exploded, doors slamming open in my apartment, voices, running footsteps, the faucets turning off and on by itself, even my dog getting pet sometimes, and what looks like slapped others. I also have a clear as day voice memo of my friend and I sitting on the couch. On Saturday, while I was using the bathroom, it sounded like someone broke into my apartment. 
I still have Christmas decorations up and the jingle bells on my front door went ballistic, like someone swung the door open and shut it. Granted, I never heard the door shut and it was locked. It was about 1.30am and I live alone. My dog and kitten were hissing and snarling like someone they hate just walked in. I must stress that my kitten and dog are very loving towards each other and don't ever fight each other. I'm 5'1 and about 110 pounds. I'm not big, but I tried to make myself as seem as mean as possible. And I ran out of the bathroom with one of my little pocket tasers out. What I saw when I exited the bathroom was shocking to say the least. The heavy tray full of random things on my coffee table was now on the floor. Mind you, the only side I had heard before this was booming footsteps. Not something that I have trouble picking up sometimes laying on the ground. All of the cabinets on my side table and coffee table were open. And I think the scariest part was my bar stools were still when I passed them. But as I checked the still locked doors, I heard my cat hissing from behind me. Both of my bar stools were spinning. One clockwise and the other counterclockwise. Then it was like someone had grunted in my ear. Mentally, I tried to reason that my boyfriend had come over and was messing with me until I realized he was at his place more than likely asleep and he doesn't have a key. I was still holding my little taser and I hit the trigger and jammed it backwards, hoping to hit whoever was behind me. No sound, no nothing. No one was behind me. I then called my boyfriend, obviously shaken up and not really wanting to talk about it when he asked. But today things picked up a lot more. See, I work night shift, therefore I sleep during the day. I was showering this morning. I live alone with my kitten and my dog. The kitten was in the shower with me because he's weird and my dog was curled up on the mat next to the toilet. I turned around to reach for my soap and it was like someone was standing in the bathroom, pushing their arm through the shower curtain to touch me. I slapped it, not really knowing what to do. I think I made it mad. The curtain flung open and all the hooks came off the shower rod and the whole thing hit the ground. My dog who was normally tame and a big scaredy cat started growling and ran out of the room. I decided my hair didn't need to be washed and ran out of the room, completely forgetting about my towel. At this point I was standing in the living room sopping wet, my dog crying with the kitten on the couch while I slowly spun around. It was like my apartment was alive, everything seemed to be moving. The bar stools, the Polaroid camera on my coffee table, even the leashes hanging from hooks by the door suede. As fast as it happened, it all stopped. It was quiet for a moment until my pet's food containers flipped over in the kitchen and the water faucets in the bathroom and kitchen turned on full blast. I'd like to note that my kitten has learned how to turn them on so he can sit under the water, which I began to blame on him until I felt him walk up and start licking the water off of my legs. I felt like crying at this point, like this horrible gut-wrenching feeling filled me, like something that felt worse than anything I've ever felt before. That's when I decided I had to go. I started pulling on random clothes that I left hanging over my bar stool and I was putting on my pants. I noticed my extremely thick hair wasn't hanging over my head like it should when I'm pulling my still wet body through leggings. A couple strands were lifted like someone was holding them away from my face. I screamed and ran outside holding my kitten and my very large dog in my arms. I could hear what sounded like growling as I closed the door. I sat in my car for about an hour and a half before I went back inside and put my dog in his kennel. When I shut both latches. At this time I actually left. I was gone for about an hour due to an errand I had to run and when I opened my front door my dog jumped on me. Mind you, I locked him in his cage. His collar was off, unclipped, and he seemed happy enough. The cat bed and blanket that stayed on top of it was also on the floor and the kennel door was still locked. I was in shock to say the least. My dog's a big boy, very muscular and this escape trick has only happened twice before. Once when I first got him and today being the second. The entire apartment was cold and truthfully, I feel like I've tried everything to try and protect myself from my pets. I'm strong in my faith. I pray every day. 
I've saged my apartment, as has the paranormal team that came three times. But nothing seems to be helping. But even with all of this, plus the previous stuff I have yet to post about on this, I have to say my bedroom is the absolute scariest place to be in my very small apartment. If anyone can offer advice or anything, please help me. Okay, so I was around 15 at the time. I was super into demons and the occult as a teen. My siblings and I were staying at my nana's house. It was in the middle of summer, so we had spent the day in the creek. That night, we went to my uncle's house. He lived in an old farmhouse on the property. She had to work the next day, so we went there to be noisy kids. He was dating some woman who had two kids that were around the same age as my brother and sister. At some point in the night, we went to Walmart to buy a shitload of snacks and hit the $1 DVD bin for some classic horror movies. We're all high on sugar and 90 bagel bites. Telling ghost stories, our horror movies sucked. At some point, I bring up the fact that I know how to make Ouija boards and use them to talk with spirits. My uncle, this 6'4", 250 pound bastard of a man, eggs us on. So I made a Ouija board out of a bagel bite box and magic markers. We use a shot glass from maybe Mississippi or Alabama on it. I just remember the Dixie flag on the side of it. Mistakes one and two. We didn't have a candle, so we used a disco ball. You know, the ones that have a lot of colored dots and they spin around. Not the mirror ball type. Us girls start circling the board with the glass, inviting something to join us. A few moments pass, long enough for us all to get bored. Suddenly, the glass jerks to hello and our fingers all slip off. Everyone laughed and were told to quit messing around. My uncle just kind of laughs and asks for a name. The glass spells out Ross. Full disclosure, all of the events are true, but I don't remember its real name. I'm just guessing for the sake of storytelling, but I remember it was short. Only four or five letters and a classic men's name. My uncle fussed us, telling us to quit messing around, that Ross was the name of the guy who built the farm. Ross would also happen to be a distant relative. We didn't know that. I mean, sure, we could have heard the name in passing. We put our fingers back on the glass. The girl is too scared to keep going, but my sister and I do. We put our hands back on the glass and circle the board. Our hands get cold to the point my joints are starting to hurt. I also feel dread and the temperature in the room is dropping, despite only using a small window AC, and it's the middle of Kentucky summer. I ask if it's good or evil. It jerks to E before our fingers are forced off. Everyone is uneasy at this point. My uncle's girlfriend kinda starts to freak out and tells us to stop. I tell her we have to say goodbye. She ends up getting mad and going to bed. So like any teens, we keep going. My sister and I pick up the shot glass, making circles in the opposite direction. We tell Ross we're done talking and thanking him for his time. We all then do a small ritual claiming no evil and try to summon a new spirit. This time, asking for a good spirit. After circling some time, we eventually get another hello. When we ask this spirit what its name is, it spells out Ross. We get a little angry and tell Ross to leave. I know my voice was shaking when I told him we were scared and he was unwelcome. The disco ball starts spinning like someone has their hand on top. Only the bass is spinning slowly winding the cord until it unplugged itself. We all just kind of watch dumbfounded. My uncle immediately stands up and says it's time to go outside for a smoke break. There's a door in the living room that starts shaking like someone is pounding on it. That door is only accessible from the living room. A trailer was placed next to the house to give it extra rooms and a bathroom. So the door is blocked off on the side, whatever is trying to come through. We scramble out, my uncle first and me last. On my way out, something grabbed my ponytail. My sister said something pulled it straight up. While outside, we tried to burn the board. This was just cardboard that Frozen Foon came in and a Sharpie marker. My uncle is actively trying but it won't light or stay lit. He decides to douse it in gas and toss it in the burn barrel. 
It takes an uncomfortable amount of time to burn. I remember watching it after the initial whoosh from the gas. Goodbye was the last corner to burn. My nana had a couple of farm dogs. They were friendly enough to us but were aggressive and hated strangers. These dogs were losing their minds barking at the house. After that, we were all a bit scared. Us kids go to my nana's house. Us girls sleep in the bed and the boys sleep on an air mattress on the floor. The girl ended up wetting the bed. At breakfast, we all talked about having nightmares. They were different, but we all agreed our dreams had fire. Mine was in a burning bed that I couldn't escape. My nana freaked out when she heard what she did. She called the priest and had holy water and oils within an hour. She took us to the creek and did a mock baptism with the oils and water while chewing us out. Then she took crosses to my uncle's house, putting them on both doors in his bathroom door. We went back to my nana's a lot. We'd see my uncle every time too, since he lived 300 feet from my nana. His house always felt cold and unwelcoming. Maybe four to six months pass. My nana's getting ready to feed all her animals and notices my uncle's house on fire. Luckily, he survived. His bedroom was the last to catch. The fire department took a long time to get there and the house was lost. I think they said it was a cigarette he dropped that started it all in the living room. I had some crazy experiences when my family and I moved into our new house when I was eight years old. The first time I noticed something wrong was a day when I was playing with my new RC car. I played with it in the living room for a few minutes, then took a break to use the computer. I left the controller on with the toy car behind me. I then started hearing an odd sound that was happening in bursts, and it sounded like a small power tool coming from beneath the house. I sat there confused looking around, but it stopped. A few minutes later, I heard it again. I turned around and noticed that the long antenna on the RC car was wiggling back and forth. The sound was the car moving by itself. Then there was a time not too long after that, I had another odd experience, and the thought of this one still makes me uncomfortable. One day, I was in the family room watching TV, and there was a computer swivel chair to my slight left in the room. Suddenly, the chair slowly turned and faced me, and it wasn't like the chair had slightly turned, it made a good, decent sized turn. What's even more odd is that that room is known for having an uneven surface, whereas the floor is at a slight slant. The chair swiveled up against the slant towards me. A few months went by and there was a day when I had family come over and visit. It was at night and my family was in the family room across the house. I was watching TV with my brother in his room with the TV to my left and the doorway to the hall in front of me from where I sat. He told me he was going to go hang out with the family and I told him I would join as soon as the episode finished. He leaves and I enjoy my time, but a few minutes go by and I start noticing something. The doorway is in front of me and it's dark with no light. And when I look at the TV, I can see the doorway from the corner of my eye. As I'm watching TV, I seem to notice a human-like figure standing in the dark doorway. I immediately turned my head and saw nothing there, and I figure it's just my eyes playing tricks on me. I go back to looking at the TV, and suddenly I see this figure again, but this time I wait slightly longer before turning to directly look at it. I noticed it was shaped like a woman who was wearing a dress, but no details other than a white shape. I look and it disappears, and at this point I'm kind of freaking out, but I'm trying to convince myself it's not real. I turn to face the TV once more, and the figure reappears, but this time it's moving. Her hands and arms making shapes to make some gestures. After that, I bolted out of the room and ran to my family. After that experience, I still wasn't 100% sure if what I saw was real, and a few weeks went by. One night I was hanging out with my sister in her room. Out the doorway of her room, you can see the doorway into my room on the immediate right. We were talking and joking around until something caught my eye. There was a shadow of what seemed to look like the bottom of a dress on the floor in my room, with the rest of the figure being hidden by the edge of the doorway. It looked like the bottom of the window curtain swaying slightly in the wind. Then it moved up and out of view around the corner to the doorway. I immediately went into my room to check and it was empty. 
I heard no curtains nor anything fabric that could cause that shadow. I went back to my sister's room and told her what I saw. She didn't really take it seriously and brushed over the topic. Soon after, she looked at me concerned and told me, Man, you really did see something, huh? She said that my face was extremely pale. Finally, about a year goes by. One morning I awoke. I opened my bedroom door and my sister came up to me with deep concern on her face. I ask her what's wrong and she begins to tell me the story of what happened overnight while I was sleeping. She tells me that in the middle of the night, she heard what sounded like our mom outside in the hallway, softly calling out my name, James. My sister found this unusual and called my mom via cell phone to ask if it was her. My mom awoke with a groggy voice saying it wasn't her and that she's asleep in her room. My sister got freaked out and went to my mom's room where she slept for the rest of the night. Later on in the same night, my grandmother and grandfather, who live in the back house, went to my mom's room and woke up my mom and sister. They said that they heard a woman crying and screaming in the backyard. After hearing that story, it was like it confirmed everything that I had experienced. Mind you, that I kept most of those experiences to myself and didn't share them much. That was the end of it for a while. Never heard or saw anything for years. But there was one last experience. It was 2011 and I was all grown up now, still living in my mom's house. One morning, I woke up and went to the living room and began opening the blinds on the window to let the light in. As I'm opening the blinds, I hear my mom calling out for me across the house. I told her to give me a second as I finished opening the blinds. I walked to the family room where I heard her and she's not there. I assume she went back into her room and checked. She's not there. I then checked my grandparents' house. She or there are there. I went back to the living room and looked out the window and realised that all my family's cars were gone. I was home alone. I called my mom to conf further confirm she wasn't home and she indeed was not. The voice I heard call my name was as clear as day, didn't even question it in the slightest. That was the last time I came into contact with what seemed to be a woman who had interest in me. I'm not a religious man, rather I'm a man of science and reasoning always trying to pick out possibilities before jumping to conclusions. But everything I had experienced leaves me puzzled. Everything actually happened, and even if I have trouble believing it sometimes, it's overwhelming. I'm 27, and I've been experiencing significant experiences and premonitions since about five years old. Although, my earliest vivid memory of a weird experience is when I was eight. When I was five or six, I just felt like I had a really weird dream. Something happened around that age range for me, but I don't know what. Age eight. Simply, I had a dream where a regular day happened, and then that day repeats itself. I always had a hard time getting up in the morning, so my mum yelled from a different room that I needed to get up. I wasn't getting up, Lil. Then my grandmother helped me up so my mom wouldn't get too upset with me. I finally sit up, slowly waking up and still dazed. So we lived in a two bedroom apartment. It was me, my mom and grandma. My bed was in my grandmother's room since it could fit two beds while my mom had her own yet smaller room. I have to walk past my mom's room to get to the living room and while walking past my grandmother says something to me. Can't remember what exactly. And so did my mom. Fast forward to school now. I can't remember specifics about the day, but the key part is that our class was especially loud and talkative, which annoyed our teacher. So we were threatened with recess being lost if we kept being loud. She walked out of the class to handle something in the school, and so we had it. We started off at a good volume, but over time got ridiculous, and the teacher came back saying she could hear us from the hallway. The door was closed, and so we lost recess. Day ends, back home, sleep. And then I woke up, and the exact same thing started happening. Once my mom yelled at me again, the same way in the morning, and my grandmother helped me up, I started to notice the patterns. Except, at the moment I had a clear memory of the whole day. So when I walked past my mom's room, I said what my grandmother was going to say, and she looked at me like, how did you know? I shrugged my shoulders in confusion. I wanted to tell her, and now wish I did, but I wanted to see if the day was going to end up like my dream. Despite that small moment, 
everything proceeded as I saw in the dream. So my mum appeared and I completed her words too. She was also surprised, but again, I just make it seem like I'm being weird and ignore their questions. Now at school, I'm sure I'm living the same day again. I spent most of class finishing everyone's sentence at times, but no one took any real notice. When the teacher left the room again, I told the class to shut the fuck up or else we'll lose recess. I don't know. A lone eight-year-old kid convinced a class of 23 plus kids to shut up better than most teachers, but it happened. I did it just in time because around five minutes later, the teacher walked in and praised us for being quiet because she could hear us down the hall at first, but then got quiet as if she knew she was coming. From there, the day was completely different because we had recess. Ever since then, I've always had a fear I'd wake up at the age again, making this all a dream. Thanks, 2020. Age 10. This is my first time having premonitions while awake. I can't remember when exactly, but I know it was spring summer solstice because I was still in school as this happened during aftercare. I attended a private school that had aftercare where we would play outside or stay in the auditorium or cafeteria room until our parents picked us up. Anyway, it was a hot day and all of us kids are just kicking it. My friends and I are in the swing set that faces the black top where we all usually play games like dodgeball, etc. There were some kids playing soccer and all of a sudden, I had a vision exactly like that so Raven, where I stared blankly and see what was going to happen with a bright yellow glow and vignette. And then it went away, and I come back to reality. My friends noticed what was happening, and was asking me what I was looking at. I point to a kid running with the ball and say, he's going to fall in three, two, one, and then he fell and flipped over. My friends lose their shit and ask me how did I do that? Of course it just happened, and I'm just as confused. I had a total of five visions that day, but only remember three. The other one was seeing my friends sitting on the playground trucks and getting chased by bees. Specifically, I see my friends on the trucks and one of them yells, nothing's happening, and then they get attacked by bees from a bush. Once again, for this vision, it happened randomly, but this time I didn't know when it would happen. My friends were all into my visions, so I told her what I saw, and so they ran up to the trucks and sat and climbed on them. A couple of minutes goes by, and then one of the girls said, nothing's happening, and then they got bombarded by bees. At that point, we're all convinced that I can see into the future. Last vision was seeing the earth blow up, lol. If it helps, all my vision I had was from my perspective of where I see it, not any other angle. So if it is true, I guess I'll be in space watching the planet explode. Then again, three of the five visions came true if I'm correct. I definitely know because I, I can recall feeling disappointed that not all my visions were accurate. Age 14, now. Since around 14, I would have random premonitions strictly in my dreams and it would be for mundane things, like a lunchbox falling on my face when I open a cabinet or having a specific conversation when walking in a theatre. I have become able to discern my deja vus when I experience in them because I would intentionally try to remember them when it came from a dream or a sequence of events actually repeating itself perfectly. And other times, I just sometimes know when something is going to happen and thus I've predicted a lot of personal events or read people perfectly even though I don't know them. I may have seen a spirit too. Oh, and some something winged demon like flying in the sky. But overall, Premonitions have been the most consistent phenomenon I've experienced throughout my life thus far. I also should tell you my parents built the house my experience happened in. So no one died there. But the village I live in got burned down in the past and witches got burned. Also, there's a vortex slash pause in the bathroom mirrors facing each other. What I'm about to tell you happened 16 years ago when I was 10, but I still remember everything crystal clear as if it just had happened. As I said, I was 10 and always had the feeling of being watched and followed in the dark. Well, it was a bit more specific, but I'll talk about it again soon. I always calmed myself by telling me it would be nothing. Every kid is scared of something silly like that, right? At least I thought. Even though I didn't like the dark, I wouldn't say I was scared. 
I rather proved myself wrong by facing whatever thought it is making me uncomfortable. So again, when there was a dark area around me or if the lights were completely off, I often had very specific thoughts that tried to scare me. Like something is in there watching me reading my book or something just waits till it's dark to grab me and scratch my arm right here. Like it was very specific. What would happen in the dark, you know? When I was a kid, I loved documentary movies. So I knew about survival instincts and stuff. That's when I would tell myself to calm down. It's natural to be scared of the dark because we can't see. It's nothing there. To prove it to me, I would do exactly what my instincts told me not to do. Most likely nothing happened as I told myself, but the next day I had scratches and blue marks on my body where my instincts told me it would be if it was dark. I ignored it. I think I just didn't want it to be anything since it would mean there really is something. That was just to explain the background a bit. Let's talk about the night that changed my life. As I went to bed, I again had this feeling. This is a really, really bad feeling. It was way stronger than before. Something told me to not switch the light off. To explain, I was already in bed. I just had to reach out to hit the light switch. But before I could turn it off, I freezed and just couldn't do it. My thoughts weren't specific this time. I just had this huge fear of doing it and it was just like, you'll regret it. It took me a few minutes to convince myself I was childish and just should do it. Eventually, I turned it off. It was dark around me, like really dark. I had those glow in the dark stars on my wall, but I couldn't even see them. It was just pitch black. Again, this huge fear overcame me and I slipped deeper under my blankets. Everything just felt off. That's when I heard it. A very creepy breathing right behind me in the room. I was facing the wall, eyes wide open. Again, I freezed. I was too scared to turn around or move myself. Jeez, I was even too scared to breathe myself. I just hoped it wouldn't notice me. I can try to describe the breathing sound. It was almost as it would growl in a very, very, very deep tone every time it breathed out. While breathing in, it sounded like it was kind of buzzing at the same time. I can't tell how long I was just laying there, listening to the sound of its breathing. It felt like forever. But considering I didn't breathe the whole time, it can't be that long. Suddenly, I heard the sound of something being moved through the air. How do I explain? Do you know the sound when you take your ruler and just move it in the air real quick? It almost sounds like the wind in the trees, but different. Maybe you know what I mean. After I heard that sound, something hit my face. Well, more like brushed over it. I had long black hair back then, and I felt it being moved forward with the force of it. And then silence. All I could hear was my own heartbeats. I still couldn't move. Not because I was paralyzed or something. It was more like I didn't want to move because I didn't know if it still was there and if it would attack me if it found me. I think it was pretty aware of me being there the whole time, but back then I didn't know that. Everything would have been possible, you know? When my body forced me to breathe again, I was freaked out by the sound of my own breath at first. I thought it would be back. It took me a while to figure it was just me and everything else was still silent, but I still just lay there listening. This time, I can't tell how long it took me, but I didn't move until I noticed my stars on my wall growing again. I reached out and turned the lights back on. I was shaking so badly. I remember how I couldn't hit the switch at first because I kept missing it because of this damn shaking. With the lights back on, I realized this really happened because it was proof right there in front of me. I had a teddy bear on my writing pulled on the other side of the room. Now remember the sound of something moving in the air and how something slid over my face? Well, there he was, my teddy bear laying between me and the wall, his eyes facing directly towards mine. Something threw him at me. I'm still living in the same house and I'm convinced whatever it was is still here. Over the years, I figured there are several ghosts in this house and most of them are friendly. 
But there also is the really evil entity. Well, I'm not sure if it's just this one or even more. Most of the time it's in my old childhood bedroom, so I avoid going up there. My family and I tried to get rid of it several times, but every time there was something that crushed our plans. And so it's still there. This is not at all the scariest thing I encountered, but it was the first one that made me realize that there are paranormal things and I kind of grew up with them. I've moved around the States, but I grew up in Hawaii mostly. So it's like, I do believe lots of different parts of Hawaii are very haunted and especially schools. My middle school would always feel like I'm being followed or even feel something or someone watching me. I'd never tell anyone or ask anyone if they felt the same. The girls locker room for PE, physical education, is always feeling something was wrong. And no matter if all the lights were on, it would still feel dark. Every time I'd walk in, I'd want to leave that area. Just something about that locker room was off for me. I'd also heard about the cafeteria being haunted, that sometimes pots and pans would move on its own, but I had no idea if it was true or not. My high school years became worse with the high school I went to. Even before I went to that high school, at one night, I was with my mom out for a drive. I was at least 11, and I saw the bell tower from afar, and it was 10 p.m. And I looked at the tower and I was 100% I saw a little girl, seven to nine maybe of age, and she was in a white dress and long black hair covering her face. It was so creepy. I wondered why there was a little girl at this time, especially at that tower. I thought maybe her parents were worried, but I brushed it off even though it didn't seem right. So years later, when I started school there, I learned that the tower is off limits for some reason and it's always been off limits for years. And that door leading to the tower is chained up. I did hear some stories about a young girl who hanged herself at the tower. Another story was that she wanted to be alone and was reading a book and people reporting her missing. When the people found her, she was hung at the tower, her body lifeless. Another time I was at my media class, my teacher would say she'd had lots of paranormal experience because she wouldn't have any other explanation for these happenings. She showed a video of a little child shoe print not going anywhere, and it happened when the auditorium was being fit, and the construction workers put cement in the front and let it dry all night, when the next day there was a footprint of a child. Everyone was clueless why only a child footprint of a shoe, but nowhere it led. Another story my teacher would tell me was about a football coach who was walking to leave for the day and all of a sudden, he felt something was wrong. So he turned around to look, and there were lots of students that looked like zombies and walking extremely slow for some reason. And he turned around again, and no one was there. He freaked out and he left. It was around 5pm, so from then on, he doesn't stay past 5pm. He doesn't believe in ghosts or paranormal things, but that afternoon scared him. One time it was my classmates, my teacher and me, I was in the class early, so there was a random sound like something pop or broke, and it was sound the AC area, and it's a couple of feet off the ground, and there's windows in that area, but no explanation what happened or why. It sounded like that the AC didn't break or turn off. It was just odd. Also, the back door where the black room is for developing photos opens and closes randomly when no one is near it or in that room. One time, my teacher had to call the janitor to help her open the door because the door locked somehow. Another time, the bell rang for first lunch to end and go to class and the second lunch students to start. Then as I'm walking to class while looking at something in my science book, I accidentally bump into someone's shoulder and I looked and said, oh, I'm sorry. I looked to see who it was I bump into, but there was no one. It was weird, but I brushed it off then that night as I slept, I had a dream I saw a tall six foot white guy dressed in green military clothes, formal, and I'd say maybe from 1960s area, and he explained that he doesn't understand why he's trapped in my school, or what happened, he said he tried to talk to people for years, but apparently I was the only person to see him and feel him, so he was surprised when he'd bump into my shoulder, 
I apologize. He told me that since I could see him and he knew and felt I'm a good person, he said he'd always protect me no matter what or where I am. When I woke up, I looked in the mirror and saw a heart-shaped bruise on my cheek. I never really told anyone what happened. I just kept to myself and my teacher said years and years ago, the school was a military hospital, so there was a military with injuries and wounds. And lots of them died. And her classroom is where the supposed morgue was located. Someone from the school had a project and they went late at night and went into the area where the cafeteria is in the video. You can see a big trash bin being dragged across the cafeteria from one side to another. And they couldn't get in since the doors were locked and chained up to the cafeteria. My other classmate went to a football game and after she was talking to her friends and she looked up at the girls restroom, she saw a shadow of a lady and the window open and closed the window on its own. Then lights in there turn off and on. I freaked her out that she didn't see anyone physically in the restroom. That she saw in the other class's windows, nothing. It was all closed and lights off, but that restroom freaked her out. She told her friend she had to go and left. Another thing happened to me. I was filming the talent show with my media group and I felt something or someone grabbing my butt behind the curtain. I said really stopped it and I looked and no one was near me. And so I kept filming when it happened again. I was getting upset. I said, seriously, stopped it. No one was near me to do that. And the people standing further away said it wasn't them. And they didn't see anyone there near me. So I don't know, just too odd, weird. I have more experience with ghosts and spirits. If others want to share their stories or experiences with me, I'd be happy to hear. It was a sunny evening in 2012, probably late June. I had just graduated high school after turbulent four years and my parents let me throw a little get together in the backyard with friends and family to celebrate. In total, including myself and immediate family, probably 15 to 20 people tops. My dad had just finished grilling all the food and everyone had moved inside to a small screened in porch area to eat, just in case it started getting buggy. Cliche, here's where it gets weird part. Everyone was just sitting around, eating and talking and in good spirits. Suddenly, the sky gets very, very overcast. I live in an area where sudden storms aren't really a thing, and it didn't feel humid, so it didn't seem like a rainstorm of any kind. It was as though someone switched the sky to a flat grey, where it had been cloudless and sunny moments before. As soon as I noticed how grey the sky had suddenly become, a horrendously loud noise rang out across the sky. It sounded like a passenger jet engine was landing in our backyard. A hush fell across the entire group and everyone looked nervously at each other. No one said a word. Even my dad, a six foot something Norwegian raised by Air Force vets, looked seriously, genuinely rattled. A look I had never seen on him before and never have since. The even stranger part, it passed as quickly as it came and no one spoke about it once the clouds lifted. It was as though time had frozen during that moment and then everyone went back to normal, sort of. The rest of the night just felt strangely off. Everyone acted kind of robotic, like actors in a play or NPC characters. The air felt tense. No one I've spoken to remembers it. Not my parents, my friends, my family members that were there. Even my sister, who remembers what she wore on the first day of kindergarten, didn't seem to remember. Even weirder, I forgot about it until now. I only remembered now that my parents are selling the house. I'm just sitting alone in an empty house in that exact spot and the memory just came flooding right back. I remember rushing to the window with my friends to try to get a look, but I straight up don't even remember if I saw anything or not, which freaks me out that my own memory is so spotty. I finally got in touch with one of my friends and asked her to remember my graduation party as hard as she could before I talked about the event. She remembered it down to the overcast weather etc but didn't remember the actual sound itself until I mentioned it. I tried to transcribe her exact words as best as I could while she told me. Yeah, 
Wait, I vaguely remember something like that. I remember a really loud noise, like a plane landing, and everyone just being like, what the fuck was that? Holy shit. Kind of looking at each other. And then afterwards, brushing it off as a plane since no one knew what it was. But we all looked and I didn't remember seeing anything outside. It shook the entire house down to the nails in the floorboards though. Everything was rattling like crazy. That same year, 2012 in mid-July, I heard loud bangs coming from the sky late at night. I know it wasn't thunder because it wasn't rainy or humid out and hadn't been all day. It definitely didn't sound like thunder either. You know the sound of a dumpster getting slammed back down after it's lifted by a truck? It was like that. Loud, but sounding like it was coming from a small area, directly in front of my neighbour's house. I saw flashes of light right afterwards. It was loud enough that I asked my mom if she had called the neighbours, but she hadn't heard a thing from inside the house. So yeah, that's what my friend said. In my other post, I read that someone else from Eugene, Oregon, the opposite coast as me, I'm in the northeast US, experienced similar events later that year in December 2012. A lot of people were suggesting covert government or military activity. LRAD and Gabriel's trumpet were amongst a few mentions. Many also reported a generally unsettling and sidious feeling throughout and beyond 2012. My thoughts on that? Could this be a government or military activity? I live near a small military base that is used as a weather station and for the local CAP program, pretty much the Air Force ROTC for those unfamiliar. Nothing other than small two to four passenger Cessna planes or the occasional helicopter ever takes off from there. It simply isn't large enough and I've personally jogged the entire perimeter within CAP in high school. During my entire 15 plus years living in that house, there wasn't a single aircraft loud enough to hear from the base. One thing that might be unrelated, but is definitely worth mentioning, I also live near a long abandoned Air Force data center. It's in a restricted area, deep in the middle of a forest preserve. The buildings have been entirely gutted, but remain standing, too hazardous to the environment to be torn down. There are also a ton of large World War II era storage bunkers along the trail, all locked up tight. I used to hike up there a lot with friends to spray paint, do drugs, other hood rat shit, until we started hearing loud bangs at all hours throughout the woods that would reverberate across all the trees. One of the final straws for me was one afternoon when my friend and I were up there alone, and a small yellow helicopter looking drone hovered over us from about 150 to 200 feet in the air. It stayed locked on us even after we noticed it and ran inside one of the buildings to get away. After that, I noticed it started becoming more heavily guarded by intimidating looking park rangers, literally down to the cartoonishly large white vans and tinted sunglasses. But I got the sensation it was being guarded by something else, long before the drone slash rangers slash any of that. I always felt like I was being watched up there. I grew up as a mixed race, mixed culture child. My mother's a black female and my father a Native American. Traditionally, Natives are very in tune with the spiritual world. My mom not so much, mostly holding that good old Christian belief system and often referring to my dad's spiritualism as his crazy Native beliefs. However, I've always connected to ghostly entities and kept quiet for the most part, not wanting my mother to refer to me the same way. I often called the entities my guardians when I was a child because whenever I did something stupid or unsafe, they, or some of them, would protect me. So, I literally grew up not fearing the supernatural. Now, so you can understand why I was so comfortable as a child, I'll elaborate a little on my interactions. I was a latchkey kid, so after school I would walk home, lock myself into the house and then go about my day, feeding myself, doing my homework and watching TV. It wasn't uncommon for an elderly woman spirit to often sit down on the couch with me until my nana, grandmother, got home from work. It wasn't until my teen years that I realised that the elderly woman was my great-grandmother who had passed six years before my birth. Throughout my lifetime, I've interacted with many spirits, most stuck in a loop, a couple I could interact with, and one that still terrifies me to this day. I had just finished my senior year of high school 
and had applied to a local community college. I was one of those students who balanced between poor enough to file for financial aid, but wealthy enough that I didn't get much. Not enough to pay for all of my classes and books. So, I started house-sitting our family and friends' animals to pay the rest. My mother's previous boss was one of those people. She loved travelling, and would often do so two to three times a year for at least a month. She was retired at the time. She lived in a rural area, with one neighbour close enough to contact, just in case of an emergency. I had been to the house twice before when I was a child, and both times I was unsettled. My mother's boss, let's call her Amy, was a teenager during World War II, and was placed in danger because of her parents' open objection of Hitler, so they fled to America. She's a photographer in her spare time. She adores Mexico, and at the time was looking to move there. With that said, she had hundreds of masks hanging on her walls, all throughout the house, accompanied with photos she took of cemeteries or gravestones. For a couple of years, I experienced small things. Voices, dragging noises, periodically things would have been moved. Nothing too terrifying, but when I started dating an old friend, I had him staying with me just to have immediate backup if something were to happen. When this happened, I was 21. My boyfriend had expressed some discomfort in being in the house, especially at night, to which I told him about the multiple spirits I had encountered there. I mentioned that none of them have been hostile, and as long as we left them alone, they would leave us alone, with the exception of the screaming man. He liked to stand outside of the window and scream around three in the morning, and I simply would ask him to quiet down. We were playing games on the second week of our stay, when my significant other had to use the bathroom. I opted to change into my jammies while he went into the darkness, when he screamed very loudly. Now, my significant other isn't easily scared, but he hightailed it back into the living area. He said that the dark entity that often stood behind the homeowner's bedroom door, which happened to also be next to the hall that led into the house from the cars, had turned to look at him. It paused before getting bigger and started running towards him. Very strange behaviour for the being, but I assumed we had upset it, so I apologised for bothering it. From then on, my significant other and I went to the bathroom together during the night. Fast forward to last week, things had gotten a bit more tense. Each entity started getting more and more agitated, until it seemed like our nights were filled with activity, and our space seemed to shrink until it was the single bedroom. I kept my keys on the coffee table in the living room, my computer for school in the family room and a few toiletries. Those objects would appear back in my bedroom, as if someone carelessly tossed them in. Spirits I had no problems with started running away or charging at me. Eventually, I took my significant other home to see if things slowed down. They didn't. By the time my two-month house-sitting job was done, I was exhausted and cranky. I left the house at ten at night, being that the family would be back around four in the morning, and during the long drive on the dirt road, a childlike figure slowly walked across. I paused, seeing the same dark shadow that guarded the entrance to the home, and watched as it ran across the road, taking the child figure away. After a second, I continued on my way home, not wanting to slow to a stop or leave the vehicle to investigate. Four days afterwards, I was chilling at my house finishing up my finals. My grandmother, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and dog were in the bedroom behind me. My grandfather was at his aunt's funeral in Bermuda, and my mom was in California for business. I say this because I need you to understand. I was essentially alone and the only one awake. The sounds of someone dropping and dragging a large box echoed from down the hall. My grandparents have an ensuite bedroom. They had their own living room space where I was doing my work. A bathroom, closet and bedroom that hid behind a door. One that was closed. I paused in my essay, suddenly feeling the familiar unease that I associated at Amy's house. The dragging sounds never left what I assumed was my kitchen and I by no means went to investigate but I'd never had a spirit follow me home, and that night, I didn't sleep, because that spirit didn't wish me well. When I did come out in the morning, I found my house sitting bag torn open with all my house sitting gear tossed about. Safe to say, I never sat for Amy again, and I hadn't experienced anything outside of the norm of what goes on at my house since. But there have been times that I can feel the hairs on my arm raise, like I was being watched, 
when I'm at other houses. So in November 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that we, husband and I, were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I, went, I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labour and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I can elaborate if needed, but I'm skipping this. Anyways, three things happened. My daughter was born. Something latched onto me while I was in ER for the poisoning. And my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going. Week one after leaving the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity wing, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think of it too hard. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the week I was there and about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents, mind you, but onwards of week two from coming home, this happened. November 22nd, 2017. Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th. First unusual cold spot found. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment. Heater. But suddenly, it was freezing in one spot of the room. Never cold there again. December 11th. The baby's mobile battery drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries lasted a month, all following batteries died within 72 hours. Was eventually moved to my mother's house, where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter starts to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th, while outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back and end up hospitalised. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses that from day one of being there, she felt like someone was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th, we decided to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, husband, aunt, daughter and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away, in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I said while he was gone and my aunt confessed to her issues. October 29th. A doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting up right in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter couldn't reach it nor leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard no one in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal. Basically, the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odours, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealing with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th, 
Our friend Elle asks to use our apartment to host a party for an MLM since she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One, who has never stepped foot in our apartment prior, commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when no one was in there. June 29th. My mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explaining. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hover around me and move like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing. Drawing everything out of the main door, my daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was done. The house felt still, like frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof of the outside stairs. Context, I lived in a multifamily home. The stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months later, my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in an old house. I told her why and that we're not moving back there. She replied with good. Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. This happened about 11 years ago when I was a child. Don't really remember the exact age, but I remember it was during the summer holidays. I live in Central Europe, and my father comes from a village in a neighbouring country. The village has a population of about a thousand, so basically the whole village knows each other. And the village is a little bit, well, weird. It doesn't really have much to do with people. They're all really nice and like to see our family when we came there every summer holidays for two weeks. We didn't really go there for about four years because father and uncle had a big fight about grandmother's heritage after she died. But I plan on going there alone once this whole COVID thing is over. So I guess I'll start with the stories. First, the village and the house of my grandmother, where I also have my own experiences. So the first story is one that was around the village where my dad was little. Once there was a church celebration slash mass or what is it called? And it was about this one man. I don't really know much about churches, but this one has that tiny balcony where you can observe things from above, and it has some extra seats. He went there because it was the last place with empty seats. He sat on one in the corner, but had fallen asleep. He woke up some time later, and the church thing was still going, but something felt off. Apparently, after some time, he realised that the people there were already dead, and buried behind the church, and everything was silent. He was scared, so he tried to open the front door, which was unfortunately locked. By the way, the spirits were staring at him this whole time. After some time, he had an idea to go up and wake up the village using the church bell. It worked, and the village gathered and unlocked the door so he got out. The ghosts are not there anymore, and his hair went grey from all the fear. I heard other stories, but I don't remember all of them, so if people who read this once, I can ask my father about other stories. So now to my dad's experiences. It's nothing special, but I'm just surprised at how many of them there are. First, when he was a teen. There was a celebration, and he and his friend were messing around on the edge of the forest. At one point, they both saw the light deep in the forest. They tried to investigate. My father is really brave about these things. So they took a bucket of water in case of fire and went up. When they arrived, no light was to be seen. It was just pitch black like it tends to be in the forest. So they looked around for a bit and then went back. After some time, they again looked up the hill and saw the light again, but this time they were too scared to go there. So they kind of forgot about it and the light disappeared after some time. Then, when he was older and was in high school, this one is probably the creepiest and always seemed too fake to me. So I later thought it was just some bedtime story my dad made up. I joked about it a few years back, however, and my dad started to shout at me and was really angry with me for some time afterwards. That made me believe he was telling the truth because he seemed genuinely angry that I was making fun of it. So he was in high school in a nearby city and would always arrive home pretty late. This one evening was in winter and it was around 11pm. 
From the bus stop, you have to take quite a long road to the house. Then it's just a few more houses and then the forest. So he was walking towards his house. A few hundred meters away, there's a turn, so you cannot see very well what's further down the road. But then there arrived an old lady, and she was coming right towards him. He already knew something was off, because what would an old grandma be doing outside at this time? She was pretty normally dressed. She had a skirt and a headscarf. But after they got closer, he noticed something. She was normally dressed, but instead of a face, there was nothing. Just a black hole. He was obviously really scared, but continued to walk towards her. They crossed each other, but she didn't seem to be aware of his presence. So she kept walking towards the village, and my dad ran home and went to sleep. Those are the two that I remember. There are, of course, a few more. And now to the house stories. So first, my dad when he was already an adult, and slept there for a few nights. His grandmother used to live with them when he was little. He had a room on the second floor, and his bed was facing the door. Every morning, his grandma would look through the glass that was on the door, to see if he was awake, and then she opened the door. So now he's an adult and is sleeping in the same position as when he was little. It was close to midnight and he was looking at the locked door. At one point he asked himself, what would you do if the doors opened right now? And just a few seconds later, the doors would creak and open. He was staring at them for a few minutes, waiting for something to happen. Then he got up and locked them again and went to sleep. The second one is from my uncle when he was about 11 years old and home alone at night. The stairs to the second floor always creak incredibly loudly. He was about to go to sleep when the stairs started to creak, as if someone was walking on them. He was scared, but managed to put the blankets over his head and fall asleep. And now to me and my twin sister. We recently talked about this, and I told my sister I always felt weird and scared on the second floor. And when I had to go up there, I would go super quickly, and then sprint back down. I was surprised she told me that she felt the same. First, her story. Me and my dad were sleeping in a tent in a garden. We were about nine years old. My grandma and mom were sleeping downstairs, and she was sleeping on the second floor. She told me that she heard the door open, and someone was walking around the room. Then she suddenly felt cold, like someone was hugging her. This lasted for about a minute. Then it stopped, and the door closed again. And finally, my story. It's pretty similar to my uncle's. I was quite addicted to video games when I was about 10 years old. So once, there was some kind of celebration and everyone from the house went there except for me, because I wanted to play. So it was around 5pm and I was playing downstairs in the living room, when suddenly I heard the stairs creak incredibly loud, like someone was stomping on it. I waited for nothing and bailed from there to the garden, where I spent the next two hours before everyone got back, and I grew even more scared of the second floor in the stairs. I live in a house with my mom, sister, stepdad, stepsister, two dogs and my cat. My stepdad is a major paranormal skeptic. My sister is a little overbelieving, and my mom and stepsister are mostly neutral. A lot of my family has experienced some really scary things. My grandpa has moved because of it, and a sort of common knowledge that we can all tell if something is paranormal or not. My grandpa has had weird, terrifying things happen that he'll insist aren't paranormal at all, and some things that are slightly less scary that he'll insist were. I can generally tell if someone else is telling the truth about some experience, but for myself, I just can't tell the way they can, and I think it's partially because of my anxiety, which is constantly making my thoughts contradict themselves. Anyway, I have several seemingly disconnected incidents that I guess I can just bullet point out. They're over my entire span of living here, so I can't really remember the order. I'm standing in my sister's doorway. I was leaning on the door frame, reading over a thing she wrote for school. She wanted me to look over, and the dog ran past me, kind of shoving me a little. I said, that's rude, Mr. Sanders. The dog's name is Barry Sanders. We don't watch football, don't ask me. A couple seconds later, I hear my sister crying and look up. The dog was asleep in her lap the entire time, so whatever ran past me was not our dog. We can't talk about it out loud because it still makes us choke up 
just how scared we were in that moment. I was laying in bed. It was pretty dark, but I wasn't asleep yet. I was just sitting on my phone waiting to get tired. I heard a really loud bang come from my closet and my cat ran over and laid directly on my neck, which she does when either one of us gets scared. I already had Snapchat open, so I decided to start recording to see if it happened again, because I was pretty sure there were animals living in the walls, but my parents insisted they weren't that big of a deal. So I was hoping something else would happen so I could have a bit of proof that I had reason to be bothered. You can't see anything in the video though. There's only sound. At the time, that didn't faze me because all I needed was proof the animal made sounds. Instead of another noise down the closet walls, there was a click, which you can barely make out in the video. But from my bed, I could see that it was the door handle turning. After that, the closet door swung back and forth, creaking extremely loudly when it normally hardly does at all. For the 11 seconds, if I remember correctly, that I kept recording. I stopped it because I wanted to turn the light on and immediately went to show the video to my mom. It happened another time after that, at night again, but I didn't record. I didn't feel threatened, but I did start keeping my laundry basket in front of the closet door and haven't had it since then. This one is possibly the scariest experience because no one has been able to explain it in a way that matches up with the story. Me and my sisters were in the kitchen. Both parents were taking a nap and had been for about an hour. We were the only ones in the kitchen for at least the previous hour. On the counter, there were some dirty dishes and out of nowhere, my mom's measuring cup just exploded into tiny pieces all over the kitchen. We couldn't even walk anywhere and had to yell for our parents to put on shoes and sweep the floor around us so we could go and shake the glass out of our hair and clothes. I've looked it up and found some things about Pyrex measuring cups exploding. And not to the extent ours is. And ours was not a Pyrex. It was a really old one with all the measuring letters engraved so they wouldn't wash off. My grandma had given it to my mom about three or four years earlier. I was looking at different measuring cups for the sake of this post and it was the same general look as a bread bunny, but I don't believe ours was. Once, I was on the phone with a friend and two things on my wall, one hung canvas and one hung glass frame, both fell at the exact same time. That's probably the one that can be explained the most easily, I guess, and it's also the shortest, but it's still weird. Similar to the dog incident, we, my stepsister and I, once opened the front door to get ready to go to school and something large and black, a little bigger than our lab, looked like it ran through the house. However, we knew it wasn't the dog because he was already inside and again, this was bigger than him. I don't think it was the same situation as the dog incident though because it didn't push us at all and didn't really have a specific shape. Whereas the previous one was so much like our dog that had it been in another room when it happened, we wouldn't have ever thought about it again. But this was just sort of a black blob that appeared solid but wasn't. By the time we turned around, it was gone. There's some other smaller things, like canned goods falling over when they shouldn't be able to do that by themselves. The shower curtain being open, it was almost definitely closed before. Things going missing and showing up in odd places. My family also had quite a bit of paranormal and non-paranormal disturbing backstory if anyone might be interested in more context. Specifically, some things that happened when I was in my early teens, some things my grandpa said, who my stepdad brought the property from, and my family's very weird trademark of having near-death experiences and dying young, and how death follows us around in general. I really don't know if I'm looking to be proved wrong or told that if I can't be. I guess it would just be nice to get some other opinions. I've also neglected to include the door video because as I said, it's really only audio and I believe that was the first paranormal aligned incident I actually paid attention to and it was over two years ago now. If anyone really thinks it'll help, I can try to find it, but I honestly don't think it'll provide much since it's just the sound of a door creaking and that could be faked pretty easily. Like I said, To start off with, 
I've always been a sensitive person to the point that I'm highly susceptible to migraines, sun sickness and car sickness. Not only are my regular senses heightened, but I could be headed to have six senses. I always say that this is a family thing, but I can't actually remember who told me that, when or why. That said, I've always been able to kind of feel people's energy in the form of emotions and had a bit of an awareness of electromagnetic energy, able to tell when a CRT TV was on anywhere in a house, but most relevant to this, I've always been sensitive to the supernatural. I also usually don't dream, though dreaming has become more common in adulthood, but I attribute that to less consistent sleep, as I must often dream only if I fall back asleep after waking up. As a kid, I remember I was afraid of the dark because I always felt like I saw things in it. But that was very likely my imagination, as I remember that I didn't have a strong ability to differentiate my imagination from reality until I was about eight. I remember around 12 I had an out-of-body experience, but that wasn't really ghostly. Around 14 or 15, I had a very active autumn. On Halloween, I saw three shadow people in one night. One watching me from a fence, one behind an above ground pool while playing hide and seek. And I can't remember the third, but I remember there were three. This all happened at my father's best friend's house during a Halloween party. And I remember people saying I must have seen someone in costume. But the more you think about it, the dumber that sounds because shadow people really just don't look like people in costume. A week or two later in November, I was out late in an appointment with my mother and we were walking back to the car. The building had lights on the sides and I was trailing a few feet behind my mother. It was a short walk, but at one point, I just looked down at my shadow and noticed the second one next to mine, almost twice as long and maybe a foot wider. I looked over my left shoulder to see where it was coming from, but as I did, I heard a rustling in the bushes about five feet to my right. Turning around, I didn't see anything there or in the bushes and the shadow was gone. I freaked out and ran with my mom to the car. I can't remember clearly if I definitely saw shadow people any time in the future after that, but I think I did. The next major things I experienced though were my uncle Frank. He was a very well respected man, and not just my godfather, but felt like the godfather with the way he was treated and the way he carried himself. He had a position high up in American Airlines, and he passed away in 2012. I remember being told that the plane carrying his body back to New York made two trips around the city before landing. I think he landed at JFK, but I don't know for sure. During this time though, I was 17 and attending Stony Brook University, so I had to get picked up and brought home for the funeral. I only had one pair of dress pants that I brought with me, and before we threw it in the wash, we emptied the pockets. But when I took the pants out of the dryer and stuck my hands in my pockets to open them up, I found a freshly minted $20 bill. I still have it pressed into a book in my pocket. Every time I saw Frank, he'd give me money like that. So finding that 20, I just started crying. Frank is an active spirit and I know he's done a few other things, but only one other stands out in my memory. This spring, my cousin Gina got engaged to her longtime boyfriend, Rory. Rory knew about Frank, of course, but I don't think they ever met. And he said that after Gina said yes, they had commented, I wish I could have asked your grandfather, Frank, for permission. They swore that immediately after they said that, a rainbow appeared out of nowhere. When I spoke to my mom about how I can't remember more Frank stories, she assured me that people like him are always around and said she still feels her father around all the time. I asked her about this because she's never mentioned this to me before and she was surprised she hadn't. So I'll share what she said now. Whenever I'm looking for something in the garage, I usually have trouble. So if I can't find something after a moment, I just say, okay, dad, where is it? And suddenly it would appear. I found this a very interesting story for a few reasons. One, my grandfather died long before we got their current house. So kind of funny he'd know where anything in that garage is. And two, my mom has always had a talent for finding things no one else can. And I've joked about her being able to find anything for years. I wonder if that's just because of her dad. The last thing I have to mention is not really fun at all and I still don't know how to explain it. 
So me and my fiancé moved into our apartment last June, and we went to her family's Thanksgiving together for the first time ever that year. So on the way there, we went through a neighbourhood I've never seen before, and the second we entered the neighbourhood, something was very, very wrong. I'm starting to cry and sweat cold just remembering this, but I can't explain it very well. I was just sitting there, and all of a sudden I got a chill. Something was focused on me, a very strange presence. I couldn't say where or what that something was in that neighbourhood. It took us about seven minutes to get from one side to the other. My fiancé was terrified, not because she felt anything, but because I was crying, a horrified mess, complaining to her about something watching me. Something felt like it was out to get me. I had never been so scared in my life. We went to my parents after we left her family's house, so we've never gone back to that neighbourhood. And I wasn't paying attention to where we were going, so I'm not sure where it was. But I don't want to ever go back there again. It's a really hard thing to explain. That sudden sensation of not being watched, but almost haunted. I'd never felt anything like it before, and I never want to feel it again. I never saw anything. It was about three o'clock, so not even dark out, and it seemed like a normal neighborhood, but I swear on my life that something was there, and it felt like it was out to get me for the entire time we were there. So when I was little, the very first house I lived in as a baby was this old 18th century townhouse that my parents rented from the local doctor. Suffice to say, that place was super haunted. It's a story for another day, but three years ago, they finally sealed the upper floors off entirely, and the doctor told my mum that nobody will ever set foot up there again. The bottom floor is now the GP office and waiting room. Now, all of this aside, Growing up in that environment left me with a major sensitivity to spirits that's kind of still active sometimes. I'm 25 now. But when I was a kid, I terrified my entire extended family with the things I would come out with at random. Anyway, one of the more popular stories my parents tell at barbecues and parties, and just to anyone who will listen, happened when I was two, and mum wanted to pop in to visit her grandfather's grave. Her family are from a village about 20 minutes drive away, and there are two graveyards, the new one and the old one. My grandfather is buried in the old one in the old family plot. This graveyard has since been locked, and you have to get a key from the priest to get in. So, being two, I wasn't overly interested in sitting down by a graveside to pray with my parents, and they were happy enough to let me wander, so long I stayed in their sight. And luckily for them, I didn't go far. I bottled down the path, and stopped about halfway back among the tombstones, where I started to sort of sway on the spot and dance as much as a two-year-old is capable of. My parents watched me for a few minutes, but didn't think much of it, and then told me we were leaving. My dad picked me up, and we headed for the gate, but just before we left, I turned over his shoulder, looked around, and smiled and weighed at something. They obviously didn't really think it was anything to be concerned about, because a week later they went back, My grandfather had died the day before their wedding four years earlier, and mum had been very close to him, so they visited fairly often. This time, when we went in, I didn't even wait for permission and ran back down to the same graveside, where I began swaying on the spot again, looking up over the grave of the air as if something was suspended there. It's probably worth describing the grave, but there isn't much to describe. It was a very small patch of earth that didn't even have a border, fairly overgrown and with a totally rusted small iron cross at the head of it. There was no nameplates, no indication of who was buried there, and it clearly wasn't a recent grave. Keep in mind, literally nobody is buried in the cemetery anymore, except a couple more of my family members who went into the family plot. At this point, my parents are creeped out. My dad, who swears blind that he doesn't believe in ghosts and never will, came down to ask what I was doing, and I explained that I was dancing. He asked me why, and I pointed above the iron cross, and in the jumbled English of a toddler said, The boy is singing, and he wants me to dance. My dad picked me up, ran past my mother, and got in the car to wait for mum. They went to my great-grandmother's house across the street and told her the whole story, but they all agreed it sounded a bit ridiculous, the more they thought about it. And since I was only two, it was probably just a game. So they went back. 
They entered through different gates. They went over the wall, no matter what they did to try to confuse two-year-old me, I always went back to the same grave. And once again, there was nothing special about it. It wasn't beautiful or impressive. There was no reason for a two-year-old to be so drawn to this little patch of earth. But I always went straight there. I always danced while he sang to me, and I always waved to him before I left, regardless of which side we left from, or which winding pathway they took out of the place. They brought other family members with them as witnesses. They had family friends question me about it. I always told the same story. My earliest memory is of my grandmother sitting me down on the cemetery wall while I was trying to dance as instructed, while my parents looked at me, totally scared, and asked me to describe him or tell her what his name is. I don't think I answered her, but I remember finding the looks on their faces just so unbelievably funny, because they were so scared of my friend who only wanted to sing to me. What I didn't know was that my great-grandmother had told the priest, brought him in there to show him the grave, and asked if there was any way to know who was buried in the little unmarked plot. He went off and checked the burial records, and sure enough, five-year-old Robert, the blacksmith's son, had died of TB almost a century earlier and lay there, marked only by the little iron cross that his father made for him. Funnily enough, my great-grandmother knew the blacksmith. He was their next-door neighbour, but he was an old man when she was a little girl, so she never knew the little boy. My parents stopped bringing me to see my friend after that. We only went into the cemetery for funerals. We also moved out of the doctor's house, but it was a few years before I stopped being a creepy little kid that terrified anyone that spoke to me. I actually did go back a couple of years ago and brought a friend of mine visiting Europe from Boston. She told me when we met that she could speak to ghosts and after a couple of weeks I started divulging the hundreds of stories I have from childhood and she asked if she could come to the cemetery with me. Since the gate was locked, we had to hop the wall once. We were inside. She pointed clean across the top of the headstone and said, Hey, is it over there? Pointing at its location. I nodded, and she started walking towards it and stopped right at the Iron Cross. This one? I nodded. I swear this is totally real. She stood there for a second and then started backing away. I didn't have to ask why. It was the middle of December, and yet the air seemed to fizzle and get really, really hot. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end and the pressure that built up in my head made it feel like my scalp would split open. She told me she wanted to leave but I was already running out of there and we vaulted the wall like Olympians. I don't know what happened that day since I'm not a child anymore and didn't really see anything. But I couldn't shake the feeling that afterwards that my little friend there felt like I had brought her with me so I could impress her and he didn't like that. Not at all. My family is different. We were raised Christian, but a lot of the family did witchcraft. Not your typical witchcraft. Most of us either followed into it or put that aside. I believe in things that most don't, but I don't practice anything. My brother, on the other hand, went into it hard. With that being said, so I must have been like 23 or 24. I was living with my brother and grandma. My brother at the time would leave the house and not come back for days. He had a massive DVD collection. When I was bored, I would either pick his door or if the key was available, I would use that. On this day, the key was there. So I went in and grabbed a bunch of DVDs and locked the door because I didn't want him knowing I was in there. I watched like two movies, smoked some and then got paranoid. So I went to place the movies back in his room. I closed the door, locked the door. When I locked the door, I heard a sound and was like, what the fuck? So I unlocked the door and the door slammed into the closet doors. The way the room was, the door opens to the left. On the right of the door was his double door closet. So if the closet doors are open, he can't get out of the room. Being blazed, I thought maybe something fell in the closet. So I pushed one closet door closed and made my way in. I looked around and realized there was nothing. I was like, whatever, close the closet, exit the room, lock the door. I heard the same noise. Thinking I'm just being paranoid, I unlock the door and once again, the closet doors were open. 
I push one door closed and make my way in. Looking around, only this time, I felt the coldest shiver ever in my life. I was like, fuck that, and I'm out. Exit the room, lock the door, and that's when I hear the closet door slam against the room door. Not gonna lie, it made me jump. I immediately ran to my grandma and asked if he was there. She replies, no. I was like, you sure? She was like, yep. So now I'm like, this motherfucking got playing with my emotions. I unlocked the door, closed the closet door and went in. I'm like, bruh, stop playing with me. I know you're in here. Nothing. I start looking around. I look under the bed and so I'm not scared if he jumps out. I yell, ha, muffa. There was nothing. I look behind the bed, ha, nothing. Behind the curtains, nothing. I'm like, well, this motherfucker in the closet. I open the closet door, ha, nothing. I move the clothes around, nothing. I'm now convinced I'm lit and it's just my imagination. I repeat the process. This time I didn't lock the door. I ran to my Jima, made her out to get out of bed and took her to this room. I tell her to listen. I lock the door and the closet doors fly open, slamming against the room door. She's like, what was that? I told her and explained what was happening. She's like, well, he's in there. I push the closet door closed, take her in and show her the room. She's like, something must have put pressure on the door. We exit the room, I lock it and it happens again. I'm like, she turns, slaps me in the face and says, keep that kind of shit to yourself and walks away. I push the closet closed, go in. I'm like, whatever you are, you're not welcomed here. I exit the door, lock the door. This time I hear one closet door open. Curious, I open the door. The closet door furthest from the room door was open. I close it and that's when his lights turn off. Mind you, this whole time the lights were on. That scared the bejesus out of me. I turn them on, exit, lock the door. I hear it again. My dumb lit ass goes to look. Closet doors are open. Lights off, I push in, close the closet doors and look in. The room was a lot darker. Almost like you couldn't see anything even with the light coming from the hall. I turn on the light and run out scared shitless. I leave the door unlocked. Around 11 p.m. my brother comes home. I rush to him and I'm like, you want to see something creepy? He looks at me with this pale face and says no. I'm like, well, you're gonna anyway. I take him to his room and he's like, why is the key in the lock? I come clean and tell him the truth. I tell him to lock the door. He looks at me and says, I don't want to. I squint my eyes now knowing he knows something. He makes a big fuss but locks the door. We both hear that shit and he starts spilling the beans. He's like some voodoo guy he knows gave him an original Ouija board. He's like, since he got it, he was having nightmares and hearing things. So we left the house for days. I'm like, so you leave it here and don't say shit? He's like, I thought it was in my head. He took it and I thought he left with it. Instead, this motherfucker puts it in another closet that has a skeleton key lock. Don't say shit. Leave the house for another five days. He comes home and spends like three days in the house. For those three days, everyone is hearing a doorknob jiggling, but we don't know where it's coming from. I ask him, yo, you got rid of that shit, right? He turns super slow and says with this stupid look, no, I put it in the small closet. When he says that, we hear the doorknob jiggle harder. So we go to the closet and you can see the doorknob moving. The thing with that closet is that there is no inside doorknob. I'd like to go in there and get rid of it. This is like I'm scared. What if it tries to eat me or take my soul? I'm like, well, if that's your fate, it is what it is. He takes it back to the old voodoo guy. That's when the old voodoo guy tells him that he found that Ouija board in the Amityville house in the late 70s, early 80s. After that day, my brother stopped doing his weird stuff and started going to church. Till this day, every time I talk about it, I feel cold shivers and get goosebumps.
This was a dream that was very vivid and very real. A month later, and it's still disturbing to me. On an evening a few days before Thanksgiving 2019, my wife and I went to bed fairly early in hopes to get some much needed sleep before our one month old son wakes up for a bottle. I fell asleep fairly quickly. I dreamt that I was in a dark grey night scene. It was a landscape similar to downtown Bangor, Maine, against the waterfront and surrounding land, but there were no cars parked on the streets. There might have been a few stray cars, but for the most part, none parked anywhere. I'm apparently walking home, although I don't know how I got downtown, and I was having difficulty finding the bridge to Brewer. In the eerie grey, everything looked way too much alike. I walked a bit and realised that it was the wrong way. So I circled around in place and chose another direction, and walked a little then. Soon realising that I still wasn't in the right direction, I circled again and chose a direction, and my scenery seemed to be making sense. I was relieved. It was a long walk home, but at least I was on my way. Just as quickly as I was relieved, I was nervous again. I was being followed. I looked around. I couldn't see anyone. Just as I began to relax, thinking it was nothing, a kid wearing black with a grey mask over his face and a hoodie with the hood over his head, walked beside them in front of me, in a weird motion, like a curling walk. I stopped walking. He tilted mask head, one way, then the other. He lifted his right fist up, the index finger, the only finger not locked in a fist. He lifted his other hand in the same way and used index finger to purposefully point at the index finger of his right. He killed backwards, a few steps walked forward and disappeared somewhere behind me. Glad he was gone, I continued to try and find home. That's when I realised the bridge into Brewer didn't exist and that I was trapped in Bangor. I found myself disoriented in a parking lot. I couldn't figure out how or which one it was. I thought maybe the wing lots where I park my car when I go to work, but I could see Hollywood slots, the casino in the close distance, so that didn't make sense. It was also weird. I noticed the parking lot I was in had a road going through it. Then it occurred to me that I was not in a parking lot, but smack bang in the middle of a road. It was like I was in a video game where the rest of the map hadn't been unlocked yet. This location inconsistency helped me realise it was a dream, and I was done with it. I told myself to wake up. It wasn't easy. As much as I tried to wake up, I couldn't. So I figured since now that I knew it was a dream, I could gradually wake myself up, as I should be in a lucid dream state. I continued to walk around. The boy in the mask appears, just appears, no warning right in front of me. He has a pocket knife in his right hand, the short blade is exposed to the air. He signals the number one with his left index finger and then brings his hand closer to his chest and cuts his index finger with the blade. Beads of blood ooze out and fall into his sleeve shirt. He puts his bleeding finger to his masked mouth. Shh, I can hear faintly. Fed up, I try to wake myself up to no avail. I walk around again, saying to myself, this is a dream. I'm dreaming. Wake up. I'm dreaming of waking up. It wasn't long before the masked kid appeared again. I attempted to walk away from him. He wouldn't let me pass. So I decided to run away. He remained in front of me, refusing to let me through. We ended up face to face circling each other. All the while, I'm trying to wake up and try to get away from this creepy kid. No matter what I do, I can't escape. As we circle each other, he cuts his index finger and then puts it to his mouth. When I hear the faint shh, he does it all over again. I'm done. This is fucked up. Wake up, Paul, I demand to myself. No luck. The masked kid disappeared again. Wake up, Paul, I demand to myself again. No luck. Maybe if I avoid acknowledging the presence of the masked kid when I see him again, I thought. I continue to walk around, hoping I just wake up. The masked kid appears again. I don't acknowledge I see him and just keep walking, all the while he remains directly in front of me. As much as I deny the fact that I don't see him, in actuality, I do and can't ignore him. He seems to thrive on the fact that I can't ignore him. He proceeds to cut his index finger as the blood rolls down his finger and into his sleeve. He puts the bloody finger to his masked lips. Shh. Again faintly, he mutters. I began to chant, I need to wake up, as we circle each other as before. 
He repeatedly cuts his finger and then puts it to his face. Shh, he mutters quietly. We repeated the cycle several times. Suddenly, in the background, I hear a baby's whimper. It sounded a lot like my son Matthew. I knew it was. I need to wake up, I yell. The masked kid puts his bloody finger to his mouth, shakes his head, no, and says, shh, in the typical fashion. We continue to circle. I continually tell myself to wake up. Meanwhile, my baby whimpers are getting louder in the background and they're beginning to sound like a cry. As we continue to circle, my wife, Katie, nudges me. Paul, can you feed Matthew? I finally woke up. I'm lying in bed. I can see my bedroom. Yep, I reply sleepily. Then I'm dragged back to the dream, circling again. Matt needs me, I say to the kid. He shakes his head. No. Katie nudges me. Can you feed Matthew? Yep, I replied. I can see my bedroom again. I'm in bed. As I try to get out of bed, I find myself being pulled back into the dream. I resist with all that I can. I shook my head to wake up and force myself out of bed. I'm on my feet, in my bedroom. I touch the dresser next to me to make sure I am awake. I walk around our queen bed to pick up Matthew who's crying in his bassinet. I'm so relieved I'm awake. I take him to the kitchen to get a bottle, heat it up and give it to him in the living room. That was the most vivid dream I've ever had. I haven't been able to get it out of my mind since. It was more like a nightmare. I could smell, touch. Walking in those circles was tiring. Was this nightmare more than just a nightmare? My mum bought a house when I was in second grade. It was built in 1856 or 1857, I'm not entirely sure. The guy who built it was a prominent doctor. He had a few kids. I don't know a whole lot about him, but I know over the years a couple of people died there. Mostly him and his kids. But we got the house because the woman living there, her sister died and she wanted to move into a nursing home. The house wasn't used to treat patients as far as I know. There was a hospital built maybe 80 yards from us, where I'm fairly sure he did most of his work. I know that place is very haunted, but nothing malicious as far as I know. Anyways, I feel like that's enough background about the house. We lived there in the early 2000s. I was 6 or 7, and we moved out when I was 13. We didn't live there for a very long time. The house just seemed to be bad luck. We had a dog named Snowball. He was in an American Eskimo dog. 20 pounds, fluffy and white as snow. He would just stare in dark corners a lot, as would my cat. I'd hear my mom call for me a lot, but when I went to look for her, she wasn't home from work yet or hadn't called for me. A few times we'd be in the kitchen or living room and we'd hear something digging around my shoeboxes full of Polly Pockets. My bedroom was directly above the living room and the floor was thin. When we'd go upstairs to look for the cat or dog, they were usually there in the living room with us. The cat liked to stay under the couch, but when we would investigate, all my dolls and accessories would be thrown about my room and the door was closed. Snowball liked to chew on my dolls as he had a gum disease, and I guess it felt good. But he really didn't like being alone, and his favourite spot was on the green couch where he could look out and watch the street. He was also old and only went upstairs when it was cold, and we would all sleep in one room. He liked the theatre, as did my cat. She was often very close to us. She liked the spot on the red couch where she would watch TV. None of the pets liked going upstairs unless we were there. I spent a lot of my time outside, but I also liked to sit in the office and I would play Neopets, RuneScape, and watch videos on various sites. I'd feel like someone was watching me all the time. I'd turn around and I was alone. Sometimes when I was outside, I knew my mom was still at work. But in her bedroom window, I'd see a man looking down at me. I don't remember being afraid of him, just mind used to seeing him. Mom always said it was just Dr. Green. I'd wave to him and he would just vanish. One night I woke up and someone was sitting on my bed and it was freezing as they were pulling my blanket down. I woke up mad, then panicked, because pulling at my blanket was the man in the window. And I could smell it. Something was burning. I woke my mom up and we found that the microwave was shorting out and had burnt through the cable and was on the verge of catching fire. After that, 
I made my grandma take me to his grave, and I'd leave flowers for him all the time. Dr. Green was a nice ghost. He would just appear, and he woke me that one time. Then there was Luke. Luke was malicious. He'd terrorise the pets. It's why they wouldn't really go upstairs. He always appeared in dark corners, and I could never bring myself to walk past him. It felt like if I did, something bad would happen. He was more active, too. Cabinets would fly open, things would fall off shelves, and he would throw things at us. In the dead of night, you could hear heavy boots slowly climb the stairs. Sometimes the TV would randomly flip channels. You would hear groans, and he actually attacked us. I regularly had nightmares and would wake up with strange bruises, cuts, and scratch marks. This was also happening to my mom. We know his name was Luke because my mom used to record QVC and this sewing channel on the VCR. I think it was QVC and they were doing some craft thing, but they asked the caller what their name was and very clearly, in a masculine voice, someone said Luke. Then the woman who was live on the show goes on to say her name and go on about the product. We're only guessing that the friendly ghost was Dr. Green, as the man always appeared in similar clothing to the photos we had of him. Very nice suits and a hat. Luke was dressed in ratty looking clothing and he wore huge boots with spurs. I can still hear the boots clanging up those squeaky steps. Lastly, there was the ghost dog. I love animals, but I hated this dog. It was huge, black, and made me feel sick to my stomach when it would appear. It also appeared everywhere. Outside, the carport, downstairs, upstairs, and especially the cellar. I could hear its toenails clack on the hardwood, and I would hide under my blankets. The hair on my arms and neck would raise, and I could hear it sniffing me. It makes my skin crawl to think about that dog. If you looked at it, it would growl and vanish. But I only saw it maybe twice. I heard it all the time, though. I'd also have nightmares about this huge black dog following me around. It was a reoccurring dream that scared me so much as a kid. I'd be in the yard and there was a creek that ran through our yard. It went under the road and there were those huge steel cylinders that let the water pass. I could crouch and walk through them. But I'd see the dog there and it was guarding what looked like a kid's body. It would immediately make me up. I never thought to look up and see if a kid had died there. I was a kid and it scared me to think about it, but I still see that dream vividly. I own a big black lab Great Dane mix and sometimes it gives me flashbacks to that dog. I could go on and on about odd things that happened. More happened to my mom, and she has weird pictures, videos and even called a priest to cleanse the house, but I don't think it ever helped. It may have, but the people who live there now have fixed up the house a lot. I've been tempted to knock on the door and ask them but I feel like that would be weird. I drive past the house every time I go visit my grandparents. Also, stepping back on the property makes me feel uneasy. When we were moving out, I was packing my things and something knocked over my cork board and I was frustrated as it broke it. I told whatever it was to leave me alone that I was leaving. Then I heard something behind me clearly say, if you come back, I'll kill you. I don't want to take my chances with the paranormal, with a threat like that, I don't want to mess with it, especially as this was a voice that was very different from Luke's. It hissed, made me feel sick, and made the room very cold as well. This story happened many years ago, around the months of July and June. My family and I often vacationed up at a cabin in Yungambura. Cairns, Australia, during winter. We do this as we miss the cold days we would get from our hometown of Toowoomba during winter, as Cairns is tropical, so it's summer 24-7. Yungabora is a very, very small town that resides on top of a hill. It's one of those towns that, if you blink, you miss it. However, it's quaint and friendly. It's historical, with about 150 plus years of heritage. As usually with rich heritage in small towns, local folk legends form over the years. One of these legends came true. We rented this cabin that was on the brink of bushlands and was next to an old farmhouse that was quite a bit of land, including some of the bushland the cabin backed onto. 
To get to the cabin, you had to walk up to a somewhat steep dirt road that also lead to the aforementioned farmhouse. The dirt road also had a medium-sized pond that ran along it. The dirt road came off one of the main streets of Yungabora. Anyway, on our last night staying there, I went to the pub to see one of my good friends who lives in Yungabora. I had to drive early the next morning, so I didn't have a drop of alcohol. He, on the other hand, didn't have to drive anywhere the next morning, so he pretty much drained the pub. It got to about 11.30 p.m., and I decided I'd better get back to the cabin to go to sleep. The cabin was only a 15 minute walk, so after saying my goodbyes, I started to walk back. As I was walking, I realized not driving was a dumb idea, as it was about five degrees Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. I had a very thin jumper and that was all. As I continued to walk on, it grew colder. I started to shiver big time. I finally reached the entrance to my driveway God, did it look ominous. There were no street lights leading along the dirt road, so it was pitch black. I decided to get out my phone and turn the flashlight on. It was at this point that I knew something was up. After I had my flashlight on, fog started to roll in. At first, it was only light fog, but it continued and developed into heavy fog. Then it surpassed heavy fog. Thereupon, I could barely see my shoes below me. All I could see was white in front of me. I said to myself, here we fucking go. Something's about to happen. Get it over and done with. On recollection, I believe I actually said that out loud. My flashlight was now rendered superfluous. I decided to stop walking as I knew there was a steep ditch with a pond at the bottom. The last thing I wanted was to fall in it. As I stood there, only getting colder and even more terrified, I saw a lantern in the distance. A small amber light coming down the driveway. Then I heard, son, is that you? Come here out of the fog, follow the lamp. It was my mum. I couldn't yet see her, so instead I followed her light. I continued to follow it for about three minutes, safely walking up the dirt driveway. I saw the light climb up steps and I heard a door open, so I knew I was near the cabin. Then the light went out. I continued to walk in the direction I saw it last. I was calling out to my mum to turn it back on. There was no reply. Until I finally ran into a wooden guardrail and some steps. I walked up the steps and instantly my knees felt weak. They had turned to jelly. I was on the doorstep of the old abandoned farmhouse. The door was there, swaying upon in the gentle wind, making a sinister creaking noise along with it. There's three things you do in this type of situation. The three Fs. Flight, fight, freeze. I was frozen to the core. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't turn around and find my way back. I was definitely not stepping foot inside that house. I was stuck. I then heard a voice coming from inside the house. My son, welcome home. Nasty weather, hmm? The voice no longer sounded like my mum's. It had a prominent British accent. It was then I realized I would rather be out in the fog than standing on the doorsteps of this house. I quickly walked down the stairs. I heard the voice now yelling, my son, where are you going? I started to sprint, but as I was running, I smashed my foot and leg against some sort of stone and fell flat onto the ground. I took a chunk out of my knee and cuts all along my hands. I still have the scars. I turned around and realized I hadn't tripped over a stone. I tripped over a tombstone. At this point, I screamed. I got up and started to run even more. I was screaming out for my parents and started to slow down to a jog. I stopped. I thought I got far enough from the house until little amber lights, at least six of them, started to surround me. They started to come closer. I found a gap between them and ran for it. Yet again, I felt like I was sprinting for my life. It was like I was in a race, but the medal at the end was my life. Before I knew it, slam. I ran straight into a wall with my head being the contact point. I blacked out and from what I can remember, I was woken up by my dad who heard something smack into the cabin. Apparently, when he went out to get me, he saw one little amber light flickering near the farmhouse through all the fog. That was the end of my night and any vacation near that cabin. We decided not to leave early the next morning to give me time to rest. This also gave me time to ring up my friend so he could come over and perhaps give me some insight into what I saw and what my dad saw. 
Me and him sat out on the patio. I could see the farmhouse only about 500 meters away. It looked old and desolate. This is the folk legend according to him. Apparently, back when the small town was first being founded, that farmhouse was one of the first built, late 19th century. During the 1910s, a well-known mother, Anne, her apparent name was, let her son play with some of his mates down on the main stretch of town one day. It started to get late. As it got later, Anne grew more worried. Then heavy fog started to roll in. She decided to get her kerosene lamp and go looking for him. As she walked down, she could hear his footsteps. She told him to follow the lamp. When she made her way back to the house, she wasn't accompanied by her son. It was not until the next morning, they found him dead in the bottom of the pond. He hit his head hard and died instantly. The grave is apparently her son's. The mother apparently searches for her son on winter nights and lures males from the pub on late cold darkness, mistaking them for her own son. It all started when I was 12 years old. I can't remember how it came to this, but one day me and a couple of my younger friends were walking out from our block of flats and I saw something with a corner of my eye. I don't know what it was. It was standing in the corner. It was tall. And though I only saw it for a brief second, I experienced literal existential fear and pushed myself and my buddies outside as quickly as possible them not understanding what just happened. We discussed the situation a little, speculated about what was up, but it still wasn't a big thing. We just went on with our day, doing whatever kids are usually doing. It would be fine if it ended with that, but it didn't. After that, the three of us started seeing things. All right, maybe two of us, because the other one is a known liar, and I'm not here to tell lies. And I know for sure some of you will consider me a liar, it wasn't anything clear, but you would just walk home in the evening and suddenly see someone dark and tall standing behind a tree. You knew something was there and it was watching you, but you would think that maybe your mind is messing with you. Soon enough, it went surreal. All I can say is we were all became pretty paranoid, feeling like being watched all the time, but naturally being kids, we also became really curious. That's when we became hunting this stuff. And I'm not kidding, we called ourselves hunters because we would walk all over our area late in the evening, inspecting every dark corner, seeking out the paranormal. I know for sure that most of the experiences were just scared kids' imagination, especially considering the fact we would bring in someone new who didn't experience this stuff previously in order to scare them. This was a kind of bait for whatever haunted us because we hoped it was drawn to fear. But two encounters stand out as very real. Stuff like, I saw it standing next to my bed when I woke up at night for a couple of seconds, and it pushed my back when we were on a hunt, but when I turned around, no one was there. And even, it started loudly chanting something in my ear, even though nobody was there. Won't be included, although it happened. I can't remember most of the smaller stuff anyways. For God's sake, I'm 20 now. The first one occurred when I got us two walkie-talkies, so we could split into two teams and inspect the area more efficiently. Oh yeah, look at those little shits thinking they're SCP Foundation stuff. This time, however, we were hanging out in our yard and playing with only one of them. The other one was right there with us, turned off. That's when someone else appeared on our us unusual frequency. We heard strange noises, and I started repeatedly asking who was the third one on the line. For some time it was dead silent, but then someone finally said, they're calling for you. Nothing more, silence. This is pretty scary on its own. The strange things is, in five minutes, all three of us were called home almost simultaneously. Me and one guy got calls from our parents. The other one was approached by his father directly. And that's when we got paranoid over one more thing. Maybe our parents are under the influence of what we thought to be a demon as well. I know we probably were overthinking, and it was just a coincidence, but come on. When you're scared, you can't really think straight. The second one was worse, to say the least. 
This time, there were two of us, and I swear to God, I would think I'm hallucinating if I was on my own. We were heading to our usual place of hunting, a dark street between a block of flats. Please mind that I'm from Ukraine, and it's not some fancy building, but a Soviet nine-story panel one, wildly overgrown with trees, and an old semi-abandoned factory. It's not clear if it's in use or not, but once in an eternity, we could see its pipe steaming, though everything around it is covered in metal scrap and trash. Our casual talk was interrupted when I suddenly stopped to stare into the bushes. My friend joined me, and now we both stared at something we couldn't exactly understand. It was something white floating at around three meters height. Not see-through like a ghost, but solid white. It almost seemed like we were hypnotized because I don't remember any thoughts coming through my head. I wasn't trying to process what I saw, just looking. And then it frowned. I don't even know how to describe how exactly it frowned while having no distinct features. It felt like its skin, if you can even call it that, wrinkled in a way to express anger. It took us a couple more seconds of stupor before I woke up from it, punched my friend in the shoulder, and we ran somewhere people could see us as quickly as we could. Nobody was around though, so the best option was to say somewhere someone would possibly notice us from a window. I was quietly, hysterically laughing from all the adrenaline. I felt like I finally saw something unimaginable and we almost just died at the same time. Thinks about it now though, this thing would probably end us if it could or wanted. And I know it will sound unbelievable, but we went back. Yeah, yeah, nobody would do that. That's bullshit, all this stuff. I was just curious if it had a body. Here's the thing. It was so dark I couldn't distinguish anything below its supposed head. So we grabbed some rocks and sticks and went back. It was still there. Though a little bit closer to the path we were standing on this time. It wasn't moving, just like us for a moment, because it was freaking terrifying to do what was planned. We didn't know what we were dealing with. We were just impulsive, stupid kids. But we still threw whatever we grabbed at him barely reaching the bushes at all. It still reacted by stretching its damn neck, skin tightening on its tendons or whatever they're called, and it felt like there were way more of them than it should be. At this point, our fright reached its peak, and we finally ran away. The demonical nonsense went on for some time, a couple of years, I'd say, but at some point, everything just ended. I don't know how, I don't know why. Maybe because we got older and we were not as sensitive to the paranormal stuff, or because we were getting more and more brave, bringing kitchen knives and crosses and all that stuff to try and protect ourselves. But maybe this thing just got bored of us and went on. I know that I saw it. Maybe almost everything that we thought happened was just our imagination, but those two instances were real as heck. I would die to know what that thing was and what it wanted from us. It made a couple of years of my life feel like an absolute mess. It would be nice to sort those memories out, to understand the hell we were dealing with, because sometimes it feels like I'm just an idiot who can't get over the games we played as kids. With nobody con to consult with, I prefer not to mention this part of my life to anyone, because I know it sounds like fiction. Sometimes I hope I see this tall bastard again, just so I know he's real. I'm a 22-year-old student male. I live in Fez, Morocco, where the university that I study is located. A few days ago, I was at a public cafe studying for exams, and as I was leaving for home, I ran into my friend, Mehdi. After the usual, hello, how are you, he told me something weird had happened to him. As he was walking to the cafe to meet me, he passed by an abandoned villa situated on a small street behind the cafe. The villa is old and is surrounded by a one and a half metre long wall that is further supported by a two metre long steel fence on top of it. The villa itself can only be viewed partly because of the vegetation behind the fence, old trees, untrimmed plants, the usual horror story stuff. As he was walking past the villa, my friend was caught by a weird creepy guy from behind the fence. When he approached the guy, he gave him a piece of candy rolled inside of a piece of paper as well as another piece of paper folded neatly and covered entirely by scotch tape. 
My friend thought it was weird, but didn't think much of it. As he continued to walk, he unwrapped the piece of candy, just to check if it is an actual candy, and threw it away. And then he moved to the scotched up piece of paper. After struggling with the tape for a bit, he managed to open and unfold it, to be surprised by a weird assortment of letters, symbols, and hard to decipher words in Arabic. In my culture, these things are taken very seriously, and the majority of Moroccans believe this stuff is real and works. So, my friend who studies Islamic jurisprudence was very surprised to know what it was. A hijab, not to be confused with the hijab, is a sort of magic charm that veils its users from harm and protects them from evil spirits. And in some occasions, it could also work as a bringer of love, appreciation and service from other people. When my friend told me the story, I was instantly intrigued. For all my life I've been curious about these things, although I do not believe in them and still don't to this day. I wanted to see if the spell would work. I took the piece of paper from him, gave it a quick scan to see what it was about, and gave it back to my friend, telling him to keep it until we go back home and see what it's about. When we did get back home, we opened it again and read it another time, more closely together. The wording of it is quite weird and hard to decipher, not to mention it has some weird symbols, one in the shape of a cross, and the other is in the shape of an Athala rune, and the other two are of a shape that I couldn't decipher, but they look like the unequal sign, only with three horizontal lines in the middle. Upon closer inspection, the words we could manage to decipher translate to something like this. Oh God, I have sacrificed this unborn child for you to bring your servants. O most great one, to bring unto him acceptance, love and victory. The servants referred to here are the jinn, to whom whoever made this spell wished to appoint the job of bringing the man who gave it to my friend good luck and fortune. When Mehdi read that, he interpreted the supposed sacrifice of the unborn child as bringing the crazy man the love that children get from others. Mehdi was scared, but I was unbothered. Seeing it as nothing but pointless words that have no meaning, but since my friend was really scared because the spell was given to him, he consulted with his roommate, a psychology student, who advised him to burn the spell to break it if it had any real effect, and to relive himself from any unwelcome thoughts that it would invite into his mind if it was kept on him. Mehdi and I went out to the roof to the house and burned the spell together. Skip forward a couple days. Mehdi and I were walking together back from the usual cafe we sit in, and for some reason, he told me to go down a path we never took before. That's completely the opposite side away from where I live. I said yes, and we went for a walk until we arrived at the same villa he got the piece of paper from. And we saw the same guy that gave him the spell, standing behind the fence with his face between the bars of steel and staring aimlessly at nothing. At this point, Mehdi and I no longer cared about the supposed hex or curse he cast on us, so we jokingly agreed to approach the guy and speak to him. The moment he saw us, he called us as we were approaching him, and we started talking to him. He introduced himself as Hamid. The villa he's in is supposedly his uncle's, and so is another cafe in front of it. We didn't believe him, as he's obviously not all sane in the head. He can speak and understand well enough, but something about his empty, emotionless gaze and super relaxed posture as if he doesn't have a single care in the world, as well as the way he speaks completely spontaneously, without even thinking, screams insanity. We asked him about the piece of paper he gave us. He said a police officer gave it to him, an obvious lie. We told him we took the piece of paper to a faki, the Moroccan Islamic version of a priest, and he simply answered something akin to, yeah, sure you did. He saw right through our lie. As we were talking, he started giving us commands as if we were his servants, but doing so in a completely straightforward, non-condescending way, as if it's just natural for him to ask people for things and get them for free. He asked us to get him a simple soft drink from a nearby grocery store, to which we declined, but he insisted. So we told him to wait until tomorrow and we'll get it for him. Fast forward to tomorrow, we go past the villa again and he's there his head between the steel bars of the fence, staring aimlessly at nothing. 
his big round eyes and toothless mouth gaping open. We saw him, said our hellos, and immediately he started giving commands. Go get my drink, now. His commands became more assertive, but still non-condescending and straightforward. The way he speaks is like that of a child. So we told him to ask us nicely and we'll get it for him. He did, and we went to get him the drink. When he got it, he simply threw it to the ground and asked us for a bar of soap. We asked him what he wanted to do with the soap. He said he'll be going to a traditional bathhouse and he needs soap to clean himself. So we got him the soap. And he threw it on the ground next to him too. He asked for something else and we said that's enough. We'll be going back home. And we did. I'm writing this at the usual cafe I sit at, waiting for my friend Mehdi to come over so we can visit the guy again. My friend and I joke about the hex having actually worked on us. And that's why we bought him that stuff yesterday and are going to visit him again tonight too. But something deep inside of me questions me about it actually being true. What if we did get hexed and now we're servants to this crazy homeless guy living in this abandoned villa? I actually bought some pizza earlier that I only ate one slice of and I'm now keeping it for the crazy guy when we go meet him. In fact, it's very likely that the spell did not work and we're just doing this because we think it's fun and like talking to the guy, but I can't help thinking that the spell did work. Anyway, I'd love to read your opinions on the matter. Should I go see the guy again? Or should I just forget about it and never go near the area again for my safety? When I was in high school, I worked at a boy scout camp on the Buffalo National River. It was a summer camp slash high adventure outpost, and I spent two summers working there. The summers of 14 and a month in the summer of 15. When I started working there, older staff members started telling me stories of how haunted the camp and the trials it gave access to across the Buffalo River were. Things like children laughing in the distance, blood curdling screams coming from deep in the woods, a haunted cabin across the river, and a slew of other, for lack of a better term, campfire stories. I, being totally sceptical of all of this, brushed it off and nearly the entirety of the first summer saw or heard nothing out of the ordinary. The only odd thing I saw the whole summer was lightning bugs, one by one turning red near the mouth of the trail, leading to the river until all the lightning bugs you could see in that direction were flashing a sort of sickly red colour. This is something that multiple people I worked with had told me had happened, and it didn't really scare me. It was more of a feeling of bewilderment and curiosity. But once again, I thought little of it. Before I get into the experiences I had the next summer, I think giving a brief overview of how the camp was laid out will be helpful. As I said before, the camp sat on one side of the river, with a large empty field running along the camp side of the river, used for various activities beyond this field. The land rose up in hills and bluffs, and trails led up the hill, to the centre of a camp, where the mess hall and trading post were located as well as the camp office and trails led up and down from this centralised location to the campsites spread in every direction from the mess hall. Across the river, from the trail leading down from the field, you could ford the river and cross to multiple hiking trails and led up to the camp's penultimate hike, Antenna Pine, which three and a half miles up rested atop a ridge and the namesake pine could be seen from the camp itself. The first experience that was truly strange at the camp was the second weekend I had been there in the summer of 15. A friend of mine that I worked there with, who we'll call M, had told me stories of a moonshiner who used to work near the camp. He told me that a still was out there and wanted to go find it. Given it was our day off and a beautiful summer day, I jumped on the opportunity to hike. We headed out of camp, crossed the river and carried on up the trail. We ran across a group of the high adventure staff and asked one of them we knew fairly well if he had heard of a still in the surrounding area. He immediately answered yes, and pointed directly off the trail to our right, telling us that we would run into a creek in the woods out that way, and to follow it away from the camp until we came on a rock outcromping the creek ran over. Having the directions we needed, we stepped off the trail about half a mile from the river, and within about a minute we found the aforementioned creek, we turned up to the creek and followed it away from the river for about 20 minutes, until we saw it. A rock bluff no more than 5 feet high, with about a 20 foot opening. 
However, the entirety of the mouth of the bluff had a handmade rock wall built into it, with a small door about four foot high in height in it, and a small window slash vent for the still about eight inches by eight inches. We were blown away. I can remember it being one of the coolest things I've ever found in the woods, and after we both crawled inside, we found it empty, with the exception of some thin copper tubing and a couple of mash pans that were deteriorated greatly. We hung around for another five minutes or so, investigating the place and noticed trails leading off in the opposite direction we had come in. Not well-made trails, but more like the type created by deer. I noted this, then and my friends seemed convinced they were moonshiner trails. We wanted to follow them and see where they led. Rolling my eyes again to his suggestion of the being hooch runner trails, I followed him. Not having an issue with getting more chances to see nature and enjoy the day I followed along looking to the left and right of me as I went taking in the view. We followed these trails uphill that ran alongside the same creek for probably about a quarter mile before M turned to me and said, hey, let's go back to camp. I don't feel so good. I thought nothing of this and turned around. We walked back the way we came for probably about 10 minutes and I noticed M was sweating more than he had been before. He just told me the sun must be getting to him and kept walking. I had him drink some water and he seemed normal, albeit quieter than usual. We carried on and my worry faded as he was walking and breathing normally. As we walked, I continued to look around and at some point zoned out staring at M's backpack. I eventually ran into the back of M's backpack and was snapped out of my thoughts. I pushed his backpack forward and told him to get moving. No response. I shook his shoulders and asked if he was okay. All he replied was, look, and raised his finger pointing directly ahead of us. Ahead was the still we'd been in not even half an hour beforehand. And immediately to the right of the door was without a doubt the most blood chilling thing I've ever seen. As soon as I laid eyes on it, I was hit with the most real sense of dread and fear I've had in my whole life. It was as if I knew I wasn't supposed to be seeing it and I was paralyzed, frozen still. A black shape stood about seven foot tall motionless, albeit its composition appeared to have some sort of movement within it. It struck me as a shadow at first, and I immediately looked up to see if there was anything that could be casting it. Nothing, just the forest. I looked back quickly and looked at the object for another five seconds or so before it started moving. It moved itself directly center on the doorway. It compressed down to the height of the doorway and rushed in. I thought that it was just a shadow, but when it moved, I could see there was dimensionality to it. And after looking at it for a few seconds, I could make out what seemed to be thick black smoke within this shape and filling it. It seemingly disappeared as soon as it entered the still. And before I could say a word, M was sprinting back towards the main trail and camp. I rapidly followed him and neither of us stopped until we reached the river crossing and could see other staff across the river. As we sat there catching our breath, neither said a word, I sat listening and turned towards the woods we had just come out of, half expecting to hear or see something, crashing through the woods behind. It was silent. All I could hear was my own breathing and the sound of the river feet behind me. No birds, no squirrels, no human voices, despite staff and even outsiders using the trails frequently on the weekends. As I was taking my shoes off to the ford, the river again, Em asked me, what the fuck was that thing? I simply responded with a shrug, not having the nerve to break the silence all around me. I was still hyper aware of how quiet it was while we were crossing and was almost slammed by the noise I experienced when we finally hit the other side. Birds were chirping all over. The wind was making the leaves on the trees rustle and the voices of our fellow staff members carried through the field normally. I've never said anything about the sound, but I honestly think he was so shaken he hadn't noticed. I took him to the camp chaplain, who offered to counsel me on what had happened as well, but I didn't want to talk about it. The one time I asked M later about it, he said out of nowhere he had gotten this feeling telling him he needed to leave now. Something primal feeling almost, he said. He didn't say anything to me because he thought it was strange too, but it decided he wanted to leave. I still don't know what I saw that day, but it scared the shit out of me. I had more creepy stuff happen the next week there and my little brother worked there for two summers as well and had some strange stuff happen.
I've always wanted to share this story. At the time it happened, I did tell my flatmates, but I left out certain details, not wanting to seem like a weirdo to them. I've had a handful of strange experiences throughout my life, but most have been far more subtle than what I'm about to tell you. This happened sometime between 2012 to 2014. I would have been in my late 20s at the time, living in a shared house in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. I worked nights packing shelves at a supermarket, a job I absolutely hated but had kept all through uni. In fact, I'd actually graduated in early 2012, but found I was too lazy to just quit. I ended up spending those last few years in the share house kicking around, working this crappy dead-end job, waiting for everyone to go their separate ways so my life could start. After each shift, I'd catch the bus home from work at around 11pm, get off at the top of the hill at the shops, then walk down the hill towards home. It was only about a 10 minute walk home from the bus stop, and I only mention all these details because I probably caught that bus and made that same walk a thousand times in all the years I held that job. This was the only time anything even remotely creepy happened. I topped off the bus and was headed downhill with the cemetery on my left and a row of simple one and two story homes on my right. I almost never saw any people at this time of night. That's how quiet the area was. The road is also well lit and despite a cemetery looming over your shoulder, there's nothing eerie about it. In fact, it's quite a beautiful, well-tended cemetery, filled with interesting old markers, statues and things. You'd see people jogging or walking through it most days. The cemetery is bordered by a sandstone wall that follows the way downhill, then left along this coastal road that sort of loops back around. I was maybe halfway down the hill when a plain white van drove past on my left. At first, I thought nothing of it. I didn't break pace, and the van didn't stop or slow as it went past. I watched the tail lights go small, sweeping left as it looked, took to the bend at the bottom of the hill. But as soon as it disappeared, I had this very odd feeling come over me that I was going to see it again. I'm not sure how else to describe that. It wasn't like a voice in my head or anything, just an odd fleeting impression that when I got to the bottom of the hill, the same white van would be waiting for me. So. I got to the bottom, turned left, and saw a pair of headlights coming back towards me. They were too far to see if it was the same car, but immediately I knew it was. I didn't feel scared or anything, but I knew then that whatever was about to happen was going to happen, whether I wanted it to or not. Again, just a fleeting impression. This time, the van slowed and came to a stop at the side of the road. There was a young guy driving. I can't remember whether the passenger side window was already open or whether he leaned over to open it. But either way, he leaned across and called to me to come over. All I thought in that moment was, he probably needs directions. But as I approached, I immediately began to feel very uneasy. The gentle impression I'd felt earlier, watching the van drive past, now solidified into a vague feeling of dread. I felt as if I shouldn't get too close, so I came about as far as the grassy verge and then stopped. I remember the radio in the car was playing, just some random pop song. He might have reached over and turned it down, I can't remember. I also don't remember too much of what he looked like, to be honest, except that he was maybe about my age or a little older, had longish blonde hair and a few days of growth on his face. He didn't strike me as threatening, so the unease I felt was more confusing at first. He spoke with a British accent, so I just assumed he was a traveller. Excuse me, he said. Can you help me? I'm trying to get to the cemetery. Do you know where I can find the cemetery? Now I was really confused. Just over his shoulder, on his right, less than 20 feet away, the tops of grave markers and crypts poked above the sandstone wall. Like I said, the way was well lit, and he would have definitely seen the cemetery as he drove this road a moment before. In fact, He'd driven down to the far end of it, then made a U-turn, and that's when I'd seen him coming back. At the other end, where the road loops around the coast, the wall wasn't high, and you could clearly see all the graves, even in the dark, stretching back up the hill. It made no sense. I was just about to answer, when my blood absolutely ran cold. I froze mid-word, my mouth hanging open. 
somewhere in the back of a van, I could clearly hear a woman screaming, crying for help. I could even hear her banging against the inside panelling. I heard it clear as day over the radio playing. I knew it wasn't a recording, but it was also somehow strange and seemed slightly unreal to me. Again, not too sure how to explain it. I definitely heard it and it scared the hell out of me, but I didn't react the way I thought I would. I looked at him and he just stared back and said nothing, making no effort to explain the screams or even acknowledged we were hearing them. But there was no mistaking it. I could still hear it clearly as we started to stare at each other. Sorry, I have no idea, was all I could get out. He nodded, said thanks anyway, and drove off. I ran the rest of the way home, which thankfully was only two minutes away. When I got in, I was out of breath and shaking. My flatmates were all asleep and I went straight to my room. If there had been even 1% of doubt in my mind, like maybe I'd imagined it, I would have probably woken someone first and at least told them what happened. Instead, I called the police. I had to explain the story to two different cops. Long story short, because of a jurisdictional thing. My area actually fell under a police station further away than the local one I'd called. They took it seriously, took all my details and said they'd send a car to look for this van. Unfortunately, I hadn't seen the license plate number. In the moment, I hadn't even thought to check, stupidly. And my description of the driver wasn't much more detailed than what I've described here now. Though they had my details, the police never called back to follow up, and nothing showed up in the news or any newspapers. When I told my flatmates about it, I left out the strange feelings of dread and just stuck to the details. The mostly thought I'd been pranked somehow. And while I guess that's possible, to this day, I know that not what happened. It's one of those had to be there things, but the whole thing felt so unusual and didn't play out like any kind of prank. The whole thing lasted not even three minutes from when we first drove past to when he drove off. And this interaction lasted probably even 20 seconds. But it stayed with me for years and I often think about it, wondering what happened. I thought about it a lot over the years and my gut tells me that there was something else going on. What I mean by this is, I don't actually believe there was anyone screaming for help in the back of the van that night. But I 100% swear on my life that what I heard was a woman screaming and crying for help. And that it was coming from back to the van. I actually don't think the driver could hear it either. But what that means, I really don't know. Anyways, that's my story. Like I said, I've got a few others. But this one is the most dramatic and I suspect it will stay with me the rest of my life. The last paranormal event I witnessed at the camp, and coincidentally, the last time I've been at said camp, took place about a week after the events I recounted in my last experience. Myself and about four other staffers were in the lower field, about 75 yards from the mouth of the river trail enjoying a fire. We had snuck down to smoke cigarettes. While we were sitting there that night, the fireflies around the mouth of the trail were starting to flash red. At first, it seemed to be the whole forest in the direction of the river, filled with red flashes. It was somewhat unnerving given that I had seen the week before, but I myself had witnessed these lightning bugs doing this long before I believed in the paranormal. I smoked another cigarette and joked, talked and cracked wise ones about our boss, and just the people we worked with in general. It was just 15 and 16 year olds doing their thing, lost in conversation for 10 minutes or so. We all failed to notice our friend, who we'll call Kay, standing away from the circle, facing the river trail. I saw her out of the corner of my eye but just figured she was taken aback by the fireflies, that she had never seen them or something. About 30 seconds later, I glanced at her and saw her still standing there. I walked over to check on her and noticed her head was tilted slightly upward, looking up toward Antenna Pine. It's a large pine tree that sits atop a ridge three and a half miles from the camp, across the river. When standing nearly anywhere with an unobstructed view, you can see the pine from camp. I followed her gaze up to the pine and I was blown away. There what couldn't have been more than a hundred feet away from the top of the pine 
was a bright red light. At first, I thought it was a rescue helicopter, maybe recovering someone from the top, but there was no sound. We had had rescue helicopters land before in the field we were standing in, and the way the bluffs and valleys work along the buffalo, sound travels extremely far. I also quickly ruled out the rescue helicopter because there were no campers as it was the weekend. The only ones with access to the antenna pine trail are the Boy Scouts, and anytime someone goes missing or gets rescued off the camp's property, the camp director is immediately notified. This never happened. This object orbited above the pine slowly. I was unable to accurately judge the speed, but it was too slow to be a plane. So we sat watching this object for about seven minutes. It would occasionally speed up or slow down, very gradually, and it wasn't super noticeable. Someone in the group with us then said he was going to go wake all the other staffers up to see and bolted up the hill behind us. Almost immediately after my buddy had got to get more onlookers, the object stopped dead in its tracks about halfway through its orbit of the pine. During this stop, you can make out the cylindrical shape of the object shortly before it darts off almost instantly, completely disappearing from sight. We sat there for another 20 minutes and recounted our story to the few stappers that woke up and believed our buddy. Over these 20 minutes, the fireflies one by one went back to normal and we all eventually went to bed. I remember being somewhat confused because the last inexplicable thing I witnessed had left me horrified not even a week before. And this, there was no dread, fear, weariness or angst over it. Simply a feeling of wonder and bewilderment. I just hope whatever enjoyed the view of the buffalo as much as we had been. The next two stories are my brothers from the same camp. And the last is my most recent involving the fraternity house I live in. Two summers after my spooky experiences there, my little brother decided he too wanted to spend the summer out there. I was fully supportive of this and was excited for him to go. I gave him the normal, it's haunted over there you, which he shrugged off. I wasn't quite sure about the paranormal and had never seen anything. However, my parents had told him about this chat with my grandparents after they died, when he was a small child recently, so I think it had the gears in his head turning. During his first summer there, he was given the task of guiding our troop on the hike to Antenna Pine. They left late afternoon and reached the top about an hour and a half before sunset. They hung at the top for about 30 minutes, admiring the view and then left. On the way down, the troop scoutmaster led the way, and my little brother stayed at the end of the group to make sure no kids got lost, and he would for sure be the last one across. He said that as they continued down the mountain, he got the feeling he was being watched, but chalked it up to the people he was chaperoning. As he continued, this feeling stuck, and he started to hear footsteps almost matching his. But when he stopped and looked back, the footsteps would stop and there was nothing there. Although this creeped him out, he said nothing and kept moving. I think he made the group move a little faster, reasoning it was about to get dark. They continued back to camp and my brother said he felt and heard this phenomenon the whole way. And while it was almost entirely muted footsteps on the rock trail he heard behind him, he heard twigs crack a couple times. He said this scared him the most. They continued down the ridge and finally reached the ford in the river. My brother said that there was the feeling was almost unbearable and he looked into the woods behind him and saw nothing. Still feeling watched, he slowly took off his shoes and began to ford. He got about halfway across and said he was compelled to stop and look back. He said that as he did, a large splash of water rose up at the edge of the river, like someone had just taken their first step in crossing. My little brother stood paralysed before members of our troop calling his name snapped him out of it, and he ran back across. This was summer 17. The following summer, he and a friend decided to go across the river to a cabin. This cabin was an original homestead cabin from Boxley Valley and has been reassembled here at the top of a small waterfall in the 90s to act as a living history exhibit for the camp. They did metalworking and several other pioneer crafts. The cabin had been abandoned since about 1998. I had heard stories of staffers in this cabin being subject to strange paranormal events and one of the staffers who had worked in the cabin had a son working with us. Crazy stories, no doubt. Windows and doors slamming, crosses flipping upside down on the wall, pretty standard ghost story fare. I myself had been there several times, never noticing anything weird, just noting how cool the history behind the thing was. So my little brother and his friend made it to this cabin, and it being a relatively hot day, 
they sat their lawn chairs in the creek that feeds the waterfall. On the way up to this cabin, his friend had asked him multiple times if he heard laughing. While on the way he hadn't, as he sat there, he said he caught it in earshot from multiple directions the whole time they sat there. However, he never heard it clearly. As they sat there talking, a lull in the conversation left them looking at the area around them. My brother said in this moment, he noticed for a split second the only thing he could hear was the creek they were sitting in. And even then, he noted it sounded almost muffled. As he realised this, the most blood-curdling, bloody murder, loudest scream he had ever heard rang out. He said it lasted for a good three or four seconds and then stopped, but echoed loudly off the walls of the waterfall below. He and his friend were both terrified. His friend literally fell out of his chair into the creek and slowly stood up and approached the edge of the waterfall where they had heard the scream come from and peered down, only to see nothing 30 feet below them. No rustling from an animal or person running, simply nothing. This was the last time my bro little brother went across the river, and the next summer, they worked at a different camp altogether. The last experience I have to recount is recent, and multiple variations of it have happened over the past three and a half years. I live in a fraternity house that was built in 1920. It was constructed as the first female housing on our campus, and had seen a couple of owners before our fraternity, purchased it in 1971. When I moved in the fall of 2018, all the members told me the house was haunted, that Jake would sometimes make himself known. I was of course somewhat sceptical, as I thought it was just the older brothers who gave me a spook. The first time I knew Jake existed happened about three months after I moved in. Our entire chapter left the house at about 1am for activities. I ran upstairs and they left to put running shoes on and catch up with them. I sat on my couch and began tying my shoes quickly, when a large stomp outside my door scared the shit out of me, followed by footsteps moving away from my door. I stood up and opened the door expecting to yell at screw you at one of my brothers. However, upon opening the door I saw nothing, just heard footsteps moving away from down the hallway. I knew someone was there but I couldn't see a damn thing. The footsteps completely stopped at the wall at the end of the hall and I just stepped back in my room, locked the door and went to bed. I asked my frat brothers the next morning and they all asked me where I'd been. I told them what happened and that I thought one of them must have pranked me and they all told me I was the only one here. At first I didn't believe them, but I had literally watched every single one of them leave. The house also has the original hardwood floors throughout, which are by no means quiet. You can hear just about anyone going anywhere in this house, so I would have heard doors open, the stairs creaking, etc. As a clairvoyant, I've had my fair share of weird and wonderful encounters with spirits and entities. Most have been good, some bad, but I've only ever dealt with a few evil ones. This is a fairly long read detailing my encounters with the witch who tormented me for five years, in the most horrendous ways. I don't know how she found me or why she hated me, but will tell you the first time I ever saw her. I was dreaming I had entered into a small country pub. The ceilings were low and I had that musty smell of beer and thyme. Outside, the windows was a quiet rural lane surrounded by hedgerows, and what looked like farmer's fields beyond that. It was a lovely warm day, but the scene was eerily quiet. There were two sections to the pub, one side which was devoid of anyone, and what looked like a working bar, and the other side was closed off to the public, and looked like it was being used to store old furniture. I found myself wandering around the furniture, admiring a beautiful antique writing bureau, and I suddenly felt disorientated. My legs started to give way as my head began to spin out of nowhere. My centre of gravity was thrown out of whack and I stumbled onto the floor and a fear I could not explain started to overcome me. I knew something was wrong and had the feeling of being circled by a predator, one I couldn't see. In a state of panic, I shuffled back on the floor until my back made contact with something solid, an old dusty chest of drawers, and I tried to calm my breathing not making any sense of why I felt like I was in so much danger. Then I heard a noise above me, a disturbing croaky death rattle like sound. 
I was terrified, but I found myself slowly raising my head to see what was there. I couldn't help it. I shouldn't have looked, but that macabre sound drew my attention like a moth to flame. Slowly leering over the top of the drawers directly above me, a face came into view, looking down over me. It was a woman strikingly beautiful, if not cold-looking. Pale blonde curls pinned on top of her head. Icy blue eyes. Young, no more than 30, but her mouth was what was the most terrifying. It was stretched open into a gaping black hole, with torn cracked flesh stretching even further, making her face a disfigured, warped, horrifying mess. The rattling coming from within that cavernous abyss. I've never felt a fear like it, the sort of which strips your brain of any normal function and sends your guts plummeting. I could barely scream. I was that scared. It was more like a high-pitched hysterical whimper, which barely left my mouth as her face came closer. Then I woke up sweating and still trying to scream. As disturbing as the dream was, I thought it was just that, a nightmare, although I've never been able to get her face out of my head all these years later. Roughly six weeks later, I had another nightmare in which I was involved in a vicious assault on the street outside my home. In the dream, the police came, and as I was being pinned to the ground and arrested with the assailants, I noticed a figure walking around the periphery of the circle of police and people. As my face was being pushed into the ground, it was hard to see who it was, but they were getting closer and closer to the tangle of bodies on the floor. As the police pulled me up, I saw it was a crooked old woman, bedraggled and dirty hair hanging in her face. It was full of debris and dirt. She was in an old-fashioned white nightdress. My stomach lurched, and although she looked different, I knew it was the same woman I had encountered in my nightmare weeks before. As if she sensed my realisation, she rapidly lurched forward between the police, holding me in place and sank her teeth into my arm and disappeared, leaving my arm an immediate septic mess, crawling with maggots and decaying. The pain was what woke me up. I bolted upright expecting to see teeth marks on my forearm as it throbbed and although there were none in the area, it was red as if I'd been pinched. I suspected then that these were not ordinary dreams and that she was a separate entity, not some recurring imaginary figure. I didn't know yet that she was a witch, but the more she encroached into my dreams and life, the more I physically saw snippets of hers. She had a knack for showing herself two different ways. One, the young, beautiful woman, although never again with that hideous, deformed mouth. And the other, a stereotypical hag. Every few weeks I would encounter her in my dreams, which was where I figured out she was a dreamwalker. As I called this gift, I'm not sure if that's the correct term, a spirit or entity that can manipulate someone's dreams. In another dream, she was standing by my bed. She had around my throat slowly squeezing until I couldn't breathe, until I woke up violently gasping for breath. I had that same experience several times. Another time on my day off, I woke up and feeling lazy decided to lounge in bed a little longer, in and out of sleep, until I became acutely aware of someone very close to me, staring at the back of my head. I knew it was her and everything inside me screamed do not turn around and look at her, so I stayed still face pushed into my pillow, and then something peculiar happened. As if I was standing in the corner of my bedroom, I could see everything. Me lying in bed, covered up and face down, and hovering about two feet above my body, parallel to me, there was an opaque, brown, swirling, humanoid mass. Other times I would dream she was hovering above me, and in a half-sleeping-slash-awake state, too terrified to move. She would reach inside my chest, and I could feel an odd pressure on my heart, squeezing, causing it to beat out of rhythm. All I could do was lay there and pray that I didn't have a heart attack, as the thumping of my heart inside my chest would speed up rapidly, and then slow down, so there were seconds between each beat. I tried putting a protection boundary around my home, but it never seemed to keep her out. In the end, my spirit guide shut me down entirely to protect me from her. I guess being physically open was what kept the link going between us. The complete radio silence I had for three years was eerie to say the least, and not something I was used to as having as random spirits, popping in and out, 
and had been my way of life since I was 11 years old. It did the job. I didn't see her again for three years. When I became pregnant with my daughter, I unintentionally started to open up again. I only had two more experiences with her after this, although I was disheartened to know she was still linked to me. The night she showed herself again, she entered my dream as usual. I was laying in bed, and in this dream I woke and my quilt was hovering a few feet in the air above me. Through the gap in the dark between myself and the floating quilt, I could see someone shuffling around the edge of my bed back and forth. The familiar feeling of fear that came with her held me in place, scared shitless of what she was going to do next. To my absolute horror, the figure climbed un underneath the hovering quilt at the foot of the bed and slowly worked its way up over my body until she was on top of me and her face in front of mine. Her hair trailed across my skin and she smelled of damp earth. Then she spoke, you thought I was gone. She hissed at me and all I could do was try and scream myself awake. Suddenly, the quilt dropped back onto the bed and I bolted up right, finally awake. My quilt, which I usually cocooned myself inside, was stuffed down on the floor, between my bed frame and the wall, with the window that looked out onto the street. I refused to sleep at my home the next night, telling my friend I couldn't believe she was back after all this time had passed. My last encounter I ever had with her was odd to say the least, as it seemed as if she couldn't get as close to me as usual. Again in my dream, I awoke and she had me by the throat, both of us dangling in the air over my bed. Here, she was her younger self, porcelain skin, fair hair, and all just staring into my soul as I struggled to breathe. I can't explain the look she had on her face. It wasn't anger, disgust. I don't know how, just the cold indifference to me with maybe a hint of defeat. I felt different, and although I woke up struggling to breathe and with a sore neck, I don't think she had actually been inside the room with me. It was the last I ever saw of her and hopefully ever will. I questioned myself early on whether it was a form of sleep paralysis, but I know that it wasn't. I've never suffered with it before or since, and that explanation just doesn't seem to fit. I suspect she was trying to stop my heart or physically scare me to death, but why? As I said, I saw glimpses of her life. I know she was a healer woman in a small community, but over time she seemed to get treated with more suspicion and hatred and shunned out of the area until she was living on the very periphery of society. Maybe once respected, then feared. I have no doubt she was immensely gifted in life, but unfortunately, she passed over with them the same gifts, fully understanding how to manipulate energy. Hands down, one of the few spirits which straight up terrified me. When I was 11 or 12, my family moved to a house in some woods, pretty close to the town. It was a lodge, a wooden house. My two brothers, sister and dad. My mum was in another, similar house next to ours, as there wasn't enough space. In the first few days, it seemed good, safe, and even freer than usual. My dad worked in the evenings, so we'd be alone in our room doing homework, chatting, normal stuff. One evening... My dad was going to stay till morning, so me and my brother got his room. We were in bed, trying to sleep. It was about 2am, when I heard footsteps next to the bedroom, and thought it was my sister, so I yelled, Go to sleep, Sarah! No response. The footsteps got closer to the door, and it slowly opened. There was no one there. Then I heard footsteps next to the bed. I wasn't scared. I felt safe. I felt like whatever that was was just checking up on me to see if I was okay. Footsteps stopped and the door closed. I fell asleep with a smile. I felt safer than ever. My dad came in the morning and I was already awake watching TV on the couch. My dad asked me, did mom check up on you during the night as I told her? And I found it to be a strange opportunity. I answered, no, someone else did. My dad was confused, so he asked me who it was. And I said I didn't know. We had a short laugh. The next night, everything over again. Dad stayed at work until morning. This time, I purposely stayed up to repeat like last night. I heard a loud bang on the other side of the wall to my left. I screamed, and that woke my brother up. 
Josh? What the hell just banged so fucking loud? I don't know. Let's check. I was excited. Josh, are you sane? It's two in the morning. I know, but I really want to know what it was. Okay, let's go. I'm going to go first in case someone breaks in. He grabbed a random broom from next to the door and we went there. There was nothing there and everything was in place. I heard footsteps coming towards dad's room's door. Wait, I yelled, knowing my brother heard it too. Josh, who are you talking to? I don't know, but I hear footsteps coming to our room, like last night. Whatever it was was next to me, checking up on me. Are you sane, really? No, no, I believe you, but there's certainly a ghost in here or something. We rushed to the room and went to bed. I suddenly felt unsafe, really endangered. I felt like a sniper scope watched me. It felt so wrong. I felt safe the last time, right? The feeling of fright went through my body and suddenly a smell of blood, like something had just died. I fell asleep if someone had just strangled me. I woke up in the morning and went to make a sandwich as I was starving. I saw something run to the kitchen before me and hear a thump as if someone fell. Sarah? Mike? Ian? Dad? Who's there? Are you okay? Then I stopped. No one was there. I heard the breathing of about five people around me. I turned to say the names of my family. My dad walks in. You called, bud? You need something? No, dad. Is mom here? No, she's over at her house. Okay, um... Then I told him what was happening. He said he believed me, so we sold the houses and moved. Since then, I felt safe. I prayed every morning for three years. I was terrified. Now I'm 21 years old, and I still talk with Sarah and Ian. Not Mike. He died in a house fire. About that whenever we meet. I used to live in Libya, in Tripoli to be exact. Libya is a really rural country, but I lived in the city, which is like the suburbs in America. My mom's aunt lived in the street next to us. I always went there with my sisters to play with my mom's cousin's children. There were three girls, 12, 11, two years old at that time. I was 10 and my sisters were younger than me. I remember we were playing hide and seek. When we were about to start, the oldest of the girls just stopped talking. She looked at us and said hide, but not as in the game, but in real life. She said we have to all hide together. It was just me, my sister and her and her younger sister. We hid behind a car and said we have to peek at the rest of the street. We all looked and then out of nowhere, the whole area we were in was empty with no people or cars. To be honest, it always didn't have a lot of people, but at that time of day, which was the evening, it should have had a few people in cars, but there wasn't any. We waited for a minute and she said we had to make no sound. And then a yellow Canaro came and started doing donuts. I know this might sound kind of weird, and to make it even weirder in Libya, we don't have expensive cars. And a Camaro was really rare to see. After that, I remember me and my sister running home scared and told our parents, but they didn't think it was weird or anything. What made me scared was how the girls I was playing with, especially the oldest, was acting. She was looking at the car and was waiting for it like she knew it was going to happen. Now the thing that made me post this and made me remember it was that she, the eldest, died yesterday because of a car accident. A yellow Camaro hit her and killed her and the car ran away. My sister and I remembered the story and were really spooked right now. I'm 16 years old right now. If this has any importance, magic was and still is somewhat popular in Libya, especially in family fights with other families and love spells. So, to start the story off, my mother was Catholic and my dad, who knows at the time of this story, he never really talked about it. So when this occurred, we lived in Spring, Texas. I was three years old. Weirdly enough, I remember life back to when I was around two. So we moved here when I was one, from Iowa. My dad got a new job and we had some family down the street. So let me start with details on the house layout. 
so you can imagine it's somewhat better. It was a blue square looking house, which was quite poor looking. Old paint, old wood, etc. You walk into the front door, you're in the living room. To the right was a straight shot to the back door, past my room, and my mom dad's room. My room had a door that connected the two rooms also. By the back door was the washer, and an open attic where you can look up into the attic back there. Okay, now that I explain the layout, when I was three, I remember I was going outside sometime in the morning, and I looked up on the way out the back door. I saw a kid, about five I would say. He just had his legs hanging off the ledge in the attic by the back door. We made eye contact, and I remember not being scared, but I was also like, who is that? weird and just ran out the back door. Moving on to the next, my room freaked me out. When my mom read books to me, I would fall asleep and she would just head to her room through the connecting door. The night I had the worst feeling, my blanket was pulled down. I remember waking up in the pitch black looking down and then right when I looked down, it ripped my whole blanket off of me. I still to this day can feel the fear I felt as a child. I screamed so loud with my heart racing, jumped straight out of bed and went to the connecting door to my mom's room, freaking the hell out. When I brought this up to her and she said she didn't know I had that happen, saying I was just crying and panicking until I passed out asleep. So, when starting this conversation, she told me she didn't believe in spirits until that house. She told me about nights of my dad was working, he did overnight work. She would hear someone walking through the wooden kitchen clear as day, telling me that she understood that it's old and houses creak, right? But the part that makes us weirder, the back door would get opened. Easy explanation since the house was old, but the door had two dead bolts and one chain lock with the door handle locked. And while alone, my mom was worried about people breaking in. She would lock all of them and every night all unlocked and open and she wouldn't leave the room until it was quiet. She ended up telling my dad, but he didn't believe her until a night he was off work and it happened. He said to my mom, do you hear that? Someone's in the house walking through the kitchen. And she just said, that's what I told you has been happening. He grabbed a bat and ran, opening their door so that you could see the kitchen and back door. No one was there. The door was still locked. I was told he looked through the whole house, checking locks and windows. No one was there. When they went to sleep and woke up, the back door was wide open, all locks off. Nothing stolen, nothing in different places. This is where my parents started getting worried. After this experience, she said with the door still opening, she was watching TV in the middle of the day. She heard the walking and she looked into the kitchen and said she knew it was walking her way. When the noise stopped, she sighed, but she freaked out when an indention of someone sitting on the cushion right next to her. When she jumped up the spot and stayed until she ran by it, then when she looked back, the cushion was slowly raising back up. She said she called a priest to bless the house that day and said I stopped screaming, but still said I did not want to sleep in that room and that the door and walking stopped after that. I don't actually remember any of this to be clear, because I was a baby, but I've been in the house several times since and my parents and others have told the story so many times that I may as well have experienced it. Basically, I grew up in a late 18th century townhouse, or part of it anyway. The building itself was a doctor's surgery or GP's office, and it was a family home that had been around for generations. My parents rented the top two floors and part of the ground floor. If there were rumours before they moved in, they certainly hadn't heard them, and for the most part the house was okay. Things really only amped up when I was born. It was an old house. The furniture was all antique. There were portraits on the walls, antique silverware in the basements. There were just three bedrooms despite its size, and the master bedroom was enormous, with high Georgian ceilings and clearly old wallpaper and moulding. It was a beautiful room, and they tried to stay in it. But after the first night, it became apparent that it wasn't going to be possible. It was freezing for one thing, and even with the heating on and the fire lit in the room, it was just unbearably cold. Not great for a newborn. So they moved to the back bedroom instead, but the master continued to give them the creeps, and they sealed it up, 
somewhat unsuccessfully. If you closed the door, it popped open again. If you closed the door and locked it, then it would be open again by the next morning. Always the same amount, just about three inches. Only a crack, really. If you closed the door, locked it and piled furniture in front of it, then the banging from inside would keep the baby, me, awake all night. They convinced themselves that the banging was the result of birds nesting in the chimney, rather than something more insidious. But at least it always stopped if you opened the door again. Keep in mind that this is a large, heavy oak Georgian door with an antique handle that has to be turned to open. They decided that based on the cold of the room, it was clearly a draft which was opening the door, closing it every time they went past, just to feel proactive and move on with their lives. Then I reached the age where I moved out of my parents' room and into my own room next door with a baby monitor on at all times to make sure all was well. And it was except for the other voices that came through it. Whenever I was put to bed, by the time they came downstairs, they'd hear me babbling away on the baby monitor, and slightly more troublingly, a deeper adult voice babbling back. They checked, of course, and whenever they'd open the door, I'd be laughing and reaching for someone above me, but promptly stop and look at them. Pretty soon, they realised there was basically nothing they could do, so they just ignored the babbling, and kept an ear open for anything more worrying. My mother tried to convince herself that it was probably interference with another baby monitor on the streets. The noises sure did freak everybody else out a bit though. My uncle once babysat me when he was just 14, and my parents returned home to find him sitting on the front step, shivering and clutching the baby monitor, me babbling away, crackling through the speaker. Good to know his policy was to abandon me to the ghosts, but it was fine. They didn't ask him back, and he told me years later there was no money they could ever have offered him to make him come back anyway. Sometimes when they themselves went to bed, things would get a little rowdier. There was an outhouse down the back of the yard, and sometimes at night the light would flick on down there at night. Not willing to take the risk that it could be rowdy teenagers or burglars, my dad would invariably haul himself out of bed and go to check it out. And invariably, as soon as he left the building, the clattering and banging in various rooms would start. I don't know why it wanted my dad out of the house to do so, but my mother, used to the house by now, would just roll her eyes and wait for him to come back. One morning, they were awakened by banging so loud from the attic, the objects on the bedside locker were vibrating, and my mom was certain that the roof was going to cave in. My dad jumped up grabbed a flashlight and went to check it out. He came down ten minutes later when the banging came to an end and told my mother that a bird had gotten in through a loose slate and he managed to get it out. Years later, after they left, he admitted that there was no bird. He just stood up there, terrified, surrounded by knocking and banging that was almost deafening and then all of a sudden, it just stopped. Things really ramped up when my parents decided to go looking for a new place to live. Tired of renting, they decided to start saving for a deposit, which was perfect, because a woman connected to the house by family ties was really keen to move in and was just about to get married. To her, this big old house was a dream first home. One day, my dad came back from work to find the whole stairs and the walls covered in what he assumed was honey. Annoyed, he blamed the babysitter and asked her not to put honey on my pacifier in case she rotted my teeth. She denied even having any honey on her, and my dad let it slide. But the walls and stairs were sticky for weeks despite frequent cleaning. The banging got worse too. More birds in the attic, he assured my mother. The lady who was due to move in after we left started sending painters in, and she was dead set on making that grandmaster bedroom into her own room. The painters came three times. The first time they painted the walls and ceiling, left it to dry, etc., and when they came back, next day, not only was the paint still wet, it was sloughing off the walls in places like an ill-fitting skin. So they shrugged, it was a cold room, and scraped the paint off to start again. They opened the windows for air, that room always smelled like turned earth, my dad says, because of the damp and cold. Lit a fire in the grate and tried again. Next day, they return, same thing, paint just refusing to stick to the walls. They were annoyed this time, starting the job once again, but by the time lunchtime came, 
they popped their heads into the kitchen, told my mum they'd be back later, and took off unusually quickly. They never came back. They left their paints, brushes, painted clothes, even their radio behind. Dad met them a few days later and asked if they were going to come pick them up, and they waved him off. Don't worry about it, another painter can take the job. Dad said he asked if they'd seen something, and they went quiet for a second before laughing nervously and heading off in the van. Eventually we moved out and left the house behind. My dad once met the previous tenants in a restaurant and they sheepishly asked how he had liked the house, admitting that they could never even walk past the house anymore. My parents didn't mind it much, but when I asked them if they ever go in there again, they hesitated. The tenant after us was my dentist growing up and at one appointment, she gently asked my mother if she had ever seen anything weird, to which my mother laughed and asked what she had seen. The dentist was the owner's sister and she told my mom that she had lasted just three months before she left in the night, one day with her new husband, and handed the keys back to her brother. There was never another tenant. Furthermore, the upper floors have now been boarded up and the stairs removed. Nobody, my dentist said, will ever go upstairs in that house again. The weirdest incident happened after we left, but as none of the three of us were there, we always opted to take it with a pinch of salt. The way she told it to my mother, weird things were happening for weeks after they moved. But it, like my parents, they pretended it wasn't going on. One day though, they could hear trickling water, even though there was no rain outside. Obviously, in an old house, this is less than ideal, so they started looking for the source. Their search led them to the basement. The basement always scared my dad, a lifelong skeptic, more than any other area of the house, and they didn't tend to go down there pretty much ever, so that was fine. It was larger than the footprint of the actual house and contained a vaulted ceiling kitchen and laundry, as well as the servants' quarters and rooms piled high with antiques. At best guess, it's older than the house itself by at least a century and belongs to an earlier building on the site. Anyway, when they opened the door to the basement, they were met with the sight of water running down the back wall, as if the ceiling had split and was allowing a river to run in through the house. Obviously they panicked, called a plumber immediately and waited for him to arrive. When he did, they brought him down, but it had been a half hour by now. The three of them stood at the foot of the stairs, and when they opened the door, six inches of water stayed standing, according to the dentist anyway, at least three or four seconds. Just enough for it to look totally wrong, but not long enough for anyone to say anything before it rushed over their feet. Well, flooding like this required the fire department to vacuum it out, so they ran upstairs, feet sopping wet, and called for help. When the fire department arrived, they traipsed back down, dreaded finding out how much water had built up by now with everything in the room being so valuable, opened the door and nothing. The room was dry, there was no water, and there was a layer of dust over everything, just as there had always been. The dentist thought she was going mad apparently, and the fire department weren't especially impressed with being called out on a joke. Obviously, as my parents never saw anything like this, so they're not sure of what to make of it. But you never know. Details about the history of that part of town could well point to something that weird happening. Whatever was in that house was clearly a poltergeist, but at the same point, it didn't exactly seem to mean any of us any harm. It just liked babies. It's got the house all to itself now, with just the doctor's surgery operating on the ground floor. I hope it's much happier now. This church has been in the same location for nearly 200 years. Although the buildings have been updated, you can't go in the church outside of normal operating hours or in small groups without having an experience. I have several stories that I would like to share, but I'll start with the first thing that happened to us. This took place when we were around 12 to 13 years old. My friend, David, the custodian's son and I, were at the church helping to set up for an event that was to take place later in the evening. While we weren't completely alone, there were only a handful of people in the building, all of whom were on the ground floor. We were tasked with the mission of retrieving a roll of tape from the second floor, so we took a shortcut through the back of the church 
that has a very narrow staircase that leads directly into the sanctuary. Our destination is the secretary's office, which is right beside the sanctuary. As we're walking through the sanctuary, we both hear what sounds exactly like a very loud heartbeat, coming from no particular area. We run out of the sanctuary before even getting the tape and try to figure out where the sound may have come from, coming up with the conclusion that it was supernatural, considering there's no type of instrument in our church that could have made it. And it was too loud to be coming from the ground floor where everyone else is. Fast forward to a few weeks ago, and we're having a gathering at the church. The area where the previously mentioned staircase is has always been a popular place for the kids to play that is out of the way. So I'm in there with the kids because most of them are my cousins and I like to pick on them. They were all daring each other to go into the small storage area that's under the staircase. My youngest cousin, about five, crawls out from under the stairs and says that he saw something under them. I ask him what it is, to which he replies, I saw a beating heart. He's never heard me talk about hearing a heartbeat, so it gave me chills hearing it. I've also never considered him, him someone to have a wild imagination either. May have been a coincidence, but with all the experiences I've had in that church, I'm tempted to believe him. So, my church is haunted, but there are areas that one might consider a hotspot. These areas are the first floor men's bathroom, the bridal room, which is beside the staircase mentioned in my first story, and the baptismal, which is connected to the third floor bathrooms. After years of being the custodian's son slash part-time custodian, my friend has experienced pretty much all the notable spirits and ghosts that are in the church. One of these spirits is little more than a mild inconvenience due to the fact that it likes to throw a wet paper towel in an otherwise clean hallway. My friend had told me about this spirit's antics before the story I'm about to tell occurred. My friend and I were around 16 when this happened. My friend was playing basketball with two other friends from church one day during summer break. This was midday, so there was no one else at the church, and the church remained locked until we decided to go in. Being the custodian's son, my friend had a key. While taking a break from playing, all three of my friends swore that they saw the blinds in one of the windows on the third floor move like someone had brushed their hand from top to bottom. Me, not being a big basketball person and was not at the church to witness this part, immediately after they saw the blinds move, they called me to tell me that they were going to go inside to investigate if I was interested in joining. I arrived a few minutes later and we went in. Obviously, being an old building, the church has a tendency to make noises, but some of these are very distinguishable footsteps. One of my buddies put his phone on the voice recorder and sits in the first pew of the sanctuary while we're wandering about the rest of the building, hoping to record some of the noises we kept hearing. We place the phone down and head to the third floor. Nothing paranormal occurs on our first pass, but for some reason, we decide to take the same exact path that we had just taken over and over. On our second go round is when we notice something strange. There's a broom propped up in the doorway of the men's bathroom on the third floor. This broom was without a doubt not there on the first pass. We don't think much of this until our third trek, when we notice that the broom is still in the doorway, but in a different position. The thing about it was that the broom had not slid out at the bottom, but had been stood up. We continue on this path maybe three or four more times, each time the broom has been moved to a different position in the same doorway. We decided that it had been long enough, so we went to check on the phone that my buddy had put in the sanctuary. We all go in and begin listening to the recording when we realise how stupid of an idea it was, because we couldn't tell what was us and what wasn't. That is, until we hear a loud tap that sounded like someone is coming from a few pews behind the phone. The tapping gets closer, then one more tap even closer. Finally, there was what sounded exactly like a triple tap on the screen of the phone. After listening to the recording, we decided to check on the broom one more time. As we reached the third floor, there were two very obvious things that have changed. 
One, the broom is now in a different doorway. And two, there is a wet paper towel laying in the middle of the hallway in front of the men's restroom. My friend claims to have seen a reflection that wasn't ours in the window across the hall from us. And that's when we decided that we were done ghost hunting for the day. A couple of years later, one of my buddies is helping his dad, who's a plumber, renovate one of the bathrooms in the church. As they're headed to the bathroom, my buddy spots a familiar sight. In the middle of the hallway, there's a wet paper towel. The first story is about the parsonage that is beside the church. For those of you who may not know, a parsonage is a house close to the church that the pastor lives in. Anyway, at the time that this happened, we had a temporary pastor who had been living in the parsonage for a little over a year. The pastor had a son who was my age and told me and my friend this story. While living in the parsonage, he always had a bad feeling just from being in there. His bedroom was in the basement where this story occurs. One day, our pastors went into the basement to retrieve something from one of the storage areas. When he opened the door to the storage room, he was chased from the basement by a single crow. How the crow, if that is what it really was, got into the basement and then into a closed room is still a mystery to me. The second takes place in the ground floor bathroom. In this bathroom is a storage closet that has an unfinished floor that's just dirt. Pretty common in basements. This area is occasionally called the portal to hell by some of the kids my age, due to the uneasy feeling you get from being around it. As I was washing my hands, the door to the closet was pulled open, fast enough to make wind. Luckily, I was only washing my hands because I was out of that bathroom in a second flat. The third story takes place in the second floor bathroom. This bathroom is built up against a storage and maintenance room. During a gathering at the church, I went to an unoccupied area of the church to do my business, because I'm a gentleman. Anyway, as I was sitting there, I heard a loud scratching sound coming from the cinder block wall right behind my head. Trying to stay calm, I told myself something had tipped over in the maintenance room, and that's what made the noise. I finished up and decided to look into the closet. The door, which was normally locked, opened right up to reveal that there was nothing in the room that had tipped, nor was there anything that could have even produced that noise in the first place. My friend David and I were at his graduation party, and we were telling one of his other friends about some of the strange things that go on at our church. David's friend didn't really believe the stories, so we decided to take him to the church that night when we knew no one else would be there. We get to the church around 9pm, unlock the doors and go in. All the lights are off, so we're going room to room, turning them on as we go. Almost immediately, we all hear footsteps on the floor above us. We finish going through the first floor, and as we're ascending the stairs, we hear footsteps come to the top of the stairs, which is around a landing, halfway up the staircase. In the window on the landing, we can clearly see an outline of what looks like a person. At this point, our friend had decided that he had gotten enough proof to believe our stories and was ready to leave. We were standing in the parking lot facing the door, arguing over who was going to have to go back inside and turn all the lights off when, all of a sudden, there are three very distinct taps on the nursery window. The nursery's on the second floor and on the side of the building we were facing. That made the decision about turning the lights out a bit harder. Fun fact about the nursery. Once we got back to David's house, we were telling his mom, the actual custodian for the church, about what had happened. And she told us that she hated to go into the nursery while she was alone, due to the feeling she got going in there. She also said that the old wooden rocking chair that was in there would almost always be rocking when she went in to clean. So she would go clean something else and wait for whoever was in the rocking chair to finish up. I was raised in a family that never once dismissed the paranormal. In fact, we all kind of reveled in it. I mean, hell, I remember at eight years old, my freaking grandma bought me my first ever ghost book called 
the Everything Ghost Book. So needless to say, I was pretty much always a weird kid. My family had always been superstitious and even sensitive to a point. My mum would always say things like, I have a feeling I'm going to see this person today and she would always run into them somehow. My first real experience started 10 years ago when I was 16 years old. My mum had found a cheap foreclosed house in a ridiculously small town called Ponce de Leon in Missouri, or as I like to call it, Misery. Naturally, she fell in love with the house. My mum, my older sister and I moved in not long after. I was homeschooled at this time and I wasn't happy about moving to such a small rural area. When I say small, I mean I could literally walk to the town post office right around the corner, as well as the town church. Not to mention, you had to drive up a few hills to even get cell reception. Although I didn't share my mom's excitement about the move, the quaint town was kind of beautiful. It had a strange little cemetery and many natural springs and waterfalls as the town name suggests. Upon doing recent research of the town, I found this little blurb on wiki of how it got the town name and why people around the town joked about the water's healing powers. The community was founded circa 1875 as a health resort to exploit the mineral spring at the location. The resort was named for the explorer, Juan Ponce de Leon. The resort and town prospered, and with a population of around a thousand, it was the largest town in the country. We soon realised after moving in that the neighbours were pretty close-knit. Upon conversation with one of them, my mum had found out a few things about the house. It was built in the 1950s, and in the 1980s they started an add-on and it was turned into the Baptist preacher's personage, or a church house provided for a member of the clergy. This is the same preacher that spoke at the church right up the road. It was later sold to the prior buyers, then foreclosed and that's when we got it. Nothing more was said of what happened to the preacher. Now, pretty much immediately after we moved in, we started to update the house. We did flooring, painting, and all the things that come with buying an older house. We hadn't experienced anything unusual during this time. After we had gotten settled in and all renovations ceased, I invited my friend over to show her the new house. This is when my first experience happened. I started showing her around the kitchen, living room, bathrooms, etc. first, because I was saving my bedroom for last. As soon as I started to push my bedroom door open, we heard an object scrape across the tile of my bedroom directly towards us. I looked all around, and that's when I saw a little LED book light by my feet. It's important to note that I strictly remember wedging that book light between two heavy books on my bookshelf the night before. And that bookshelf was at least 12 feet from my bedroom door. I remember my friend's face looking tense and uneasy as I tried to explain. I even marched over to my bookshelf and tried to understand the logistics of how it could have happened. Truthfully, there was no way I could explain it. And frankly, the fact that it was thrown in my direction specifically made me feel anxious. That event seemed to be the catalyst. Strange things started happening to not only me, but my family as well. When we started opening up about the whole ordeal as a family, all three of us started to realise we all had the same shared experiences. One we all heard when walking down the same hallway was a man's deep voice saying, Hey, in a rushed, loud tone. Anyone who has heard any kind of voice phenomena knows that it's so strange because it sounded as though it's directly in your ear canal. It's unlike anything else. Another common occurrence we shared was in the bathroom at night. When we had to wake up and pee, we all recounted hearing heavy footsteps, almost like a man in boots approaching the closed bathroom door. The steps would stop right outside the bathroom door and you could bend down and see the shadow of feet under the door then they would walk away. We also frequently heard the front door opening, only to find it was fully closed. At one point my mom, being sensitive as I mentioned earlier, was laying in her bed at night, just about to drift off, when she had a strange feeling come over her. She got the image in her head of an older male. She mentioned she had an angry face, and you could just feel his feeling of anger and hostility. I think she came to the assumption it could have possibly been the preacher, but we have no proof of this. If it was him, I can certainly tell you he did not like me one bit. This is where my story and experiences turn a little darker. We had lived in the house for about a year now or so, and summer started to come around. 
I decided I wanted my own space and moved out to the separated garage space. It was a huge space that we never kept the cars in anyway. I remember completely making the space my own. I bought huge curtains, painted the cement walls, got a mini fridge, brought in a TV, a PS2, and most importantly, all my music equipment. I've always been a music lover and devoted a lot of my time to playing electric guitar in my early teens. This is something that followed me. Right about this time is when I found my love for classic rock, but what really intrigued me was its dark history. It had gotten to a point where my mom and sister barely saw me in the house anymore. I'd become a hermit in the garage, playing music and delving deep into research on my laptop. One figure in classic rock I was particularly engaged in was Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin. According to a lot of books and articles, he was into the occult and followed English occultist Alistair Crowley. I often found myself falling down a rabbit hole and I started to feel so disconnected from reality. It was then when I became obsessed with that old idea. You know, the whole sell your soul to the devil and shred like a madman on guitar. One time while practicing, I believe someone or something gave me a small taste of what it would feel like. There was one solo in particular I had tried to play a few times, but could never quite hammer down. I'd started to practice it again one day and started playing almost all of the fast paced solos perfectly, almost without any effort on my part. I all but ripped my guitar strap trying to get my guitar off. It terrified me. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough for me to stop my isolation and research, but I didn't touch my guitar for a while. My friends that I had then were very like-minded, all very interested in the paranormal, occult, and otherworldly things. My garage started to be a safe place for all the friends I had, and there were plenty of long nights partying and partaking and things no one would be proud of. But we were rebellious, defiant teenagers. None of us cared at that time. It was around this point I remember almost dreading going into the house, when I had to inevitably take a shower or use the bathroom. In a sense, I didn't feel particularly welcome there either. I remember taking a shower one day, listening to Black Sabbath on a nearby iPad. The music kept pausing, so I would reach out and press play again. This happened about three more times when I finally yelled, I know it's you, stop doing that. And it didn't happen again for the remainder of my shower. It could have been a coincidence or a technical fault for sure, but I remember being so bold towards what I thought was the old preacher man, almost fe feeling a hatred towards him. One morning when I was still sleeping in the garage, my mom busted through the door and started to throw all my things around. She was screaming, I don't know what the fuck is going on in here, but something's got to change. Something's not right. Her voice sounded angry, but I could hear the undertones of fear. Keep in mind, it's not like I had a huge pentagram spray painted on the exterior of the garage. As far as I knew, she had no clue of what I was looking into and what I'd been experiencing. The intuition of a loving and concerned mother, I guess. She proceeded to rip down my posters and grabbed random items of mine and threw them outside the garage door into the lawn. I remember this like it was yesterday because I think it finally hit me how far things had gone. And seeing my mom so upset and ultimately scared, I think knocked some sense into me. It was then that I also moved back into the house, as it was turning to fall and started to become too cold to stay in the garage overnight anyways. Ultimately, I purged anything that I had truly had any dark personal significance to me during my move back into the house. The last thing that happened, and probably the worst of all, happened to my sister. The only way I heard her story was by listening to her explaining it to my mom. Even though I was completely moved into the house now, my family still kept their distance. I knew they felt something too. I felt as if I really divided my family. My sister had a job that required her to get up early in the morning, when it was still dark outside. She was smoking a cigarette on the back porch, which has a direct view of the garage and the steep hill that runs alongside the detached garage. She said she saw a dark mass low to the ground. She first spotted it coming from behind the back of the garage. It then started to charge down the steep hill towards the back porch where she was standing. She expressed to my mom she had never felt so much fear in her life. She quickly shut the back door. She also said she didn't believe it was an animal because it was charging towards her. There was absolutely no sound. No paws, hooves or sound of feet on the soft ground. The house seemed to go quiet after that. No voices or footsteps. 
Unfortunately, a few years later, my mom could no longer keep up during a harsh winter. Everything started to break and we didn't have the money to repair things. We couldn't even keep the house warm. We decided to get up and leave. Most of our belongings were still in the house when we did leave. We came back a few times on warmer days to grab some of our things and I started to see our old home become in a complete state of disrepair. Mold growing absolutely everywhere, paint starting to peel and all the hard work we had put into it, gone. It was harder for my mom to see. It was her first house she bought and it killed her to just abandon it. It eventually went back into foreclosure. When I turned 20, I got my first apartment that had to be blessed twice. I thought everything had gone back to normal at that point. I then met my now husband when I was still in my first apartment. He had no idea of my dark past and admitted to me that he felt something dark in my apartment. One night, it got so bad he said to me to pray over me. I've had two apartments since then and we both don't sense anything inherently dark. Sometimes I still wonder if it's truly left. I got in contact with a good friend who distanced herself from me during that dark time. I would actually consider her my closest friend. She recounts things very differently and said that I had definitely changed. She had a few stories of her own and things that I have said to her that were very unlike my true character. The crazy thing is, I don't remember saying some of these things. I truly don't think I knew how bad it had gotten. It was one of the last weeks of Christmas holidays in Oz and my family was getting ready to move out of our Queenslander. The experience happened within a week, the last two days, Tuesday and Wednesday. I had two mates over for a sleepover. The first day of this experience, previous Friday, my grandfather was looking after me. The house was a general layout. There's a long hallway, four bedrooms and two bathrooms that branch off from said hallway. At the bottom of the hallway there's the kitchen, lounge room and dining area. There's a second small hallway leading from the kitchen out to the back deck. This back deck sits far higher up than the backyard, like a giant balcony looking over the backyard. It's worth mentioning that a spare bedroom branches off from the top of the main hallway. This is where the latter of the story is. I should also mention that I had a fascination for electronics. I still do. So I had electronic train sets and I also had a security system, only three security cameras, because I liked playing around with the switchboard. Friday. My mum and dad had left early for work, so I woke up to the smell of crispy bacon and egg breakfast sandwiches. My grandfather always believes that breakfast is the most important meal and never settles for anything that doesn't have sausages, eggs, or some sort of breakfast sandwich. I slowly stumbled into the kitchen, still half asleep, gazing upon my steaming hot meal on the table. Well, you're gonna sit down and eat. It isn't gonna eat itself. For my grandfather's query, I sat down and ate. So did he. We had a bit of a discussion. He said that we would go to the corner shop in the afternoon, but he wanted to watch the midday races, which was code word for he wanted to sleep for three hours after lunch. After breakfast, I played with some Lego and played with my dog, etc. Nothing really happens until after lunch and my grandfather is asleep. So let's skip to them. With my grandfather snoring loudly and reclined in his chair, and I bored with races, I decided to go down into the backyard and say hello to the cockatoos. My neighbours at the time had a pair of sulphur-crested cockatoos. Their cage was outside, down in the middle of the neighbour boundaries, but we didn't mind. I walked down to the cage that sat under two huge avocado trees. Hello, Bluey. Hello, Bluey. The pair knew my name. As I visited them often, they were honestly quite cute. I sat on my little wooden stool I had there and just admired them for five or ten minutes, as well as listening to the magpies flying high above. Then I got that feeling, the feeling of someone watching, that feeling that something is going to happen. Out of instincts, I look behind me and up towards the deck, just barely being able to see the back door due to perspective. After seeing nothing there, I turn back around to the cockatoos. This is when things become hectic. Only 10 seconds after I turned back around, the crests upon both cockatoos rose simultaneously to their full length. They flattened their body feathers and stood up straight. 
Cockatoos and cockatiels do this behavior when they're mostly curious, shocked, surprised, or worried. They started to absolutely scream. They started to shout my name, their owner's name, and also started to native scream. I was now in shock. I didn't want to turn around. I was frozen. Until I felt an icy cold breath on the back of my neck. I instantly turned around from feeling this. I see nothing. While looking behind me, the front leg of my stool just snapped. I fell forward, face planting into the ground. At this point, the cockatoos have started to fly around in their cage. I stand up quickly, frozen again. Then, in the side of my hair, I hear Bluey. It was quiet and sounded like an old, angry man. I felt his breath touch the outside of my ear. I started to sprint. I got no more than a meter when I slipped and fell down onto the ground from a fallen rotten avocado. I tried to get up, but of course, I had badly rolled my ankle. As I tried to stand up, I heard a scream, and I mean a full-on scream, burst into my left ear. Bluey, run! Yet again, it sounded like the same old creepy man. I was stumbling, almost hopping towards the stairs to get up onto the deck. I was probably going a little faster than walking speed. After reaching the top of the deck, I made the last hobble towards the back door. It was locked. I started to absolutely scream for my grandfather. I was banging at the door, just yelling as loud as I humanly could. I saw my granddad through the large glass pane rushing towards the door. He pushed it open, but it slammed back into his face, causing the glass pane to shatter into huge shards. Then it stopped and let the door open. Nothing really happened after that. However, my granddad thought it would be best if we spent the rest of the day in his house. Tuesday to Wednesday. I was still in shock from Friday, but today was the day that two of my good friends came for a sleepover as I was moving cities. Lucas and James arrived around one o'clock. We did the usual things, played in the backyard, hung out in the small wooden tree house that my dad built us. It sat about halfway up on one of the many avocado trees we had in the backyard. I did get that creepy feeling that I got on Friday and I wasn't totally comfortable playing around in the yard. But I had my friends there, so I thought it was okay. It was around six o'clock when my dad told us to come inside for dinner and to bring Fletcher inside. Fletcher is my dog. We always bring him inside of a night. We went and fetched Fletcher. He was sniffing around some deer holes, as lots of schnelzers do. We came into the kitchen and sat down for nachos. We decided to watch a couple of movies, play some Wii, and then go to sleep in the spare bedroom. It was probably 11 o'clock. My parents were in bed and fast asleep. The three of us had just finished watching our third movie and decided we should probably head off to bed too. We shambled up the long, narrow hallway with Fletcher guiding us. We finally reached the spare bedroom. Inside sat a TV, my switchboard for the cameras, a queen and a single bed. The three of us sat on the queen bed as James wanted to have a look outside. So I turned on the TV and the camera system set up. I switched to channel one, the front camera. They had night vision, but as you can imagine, this was around 10 years ago, so it wasn't the best night vision around. But it wasn't very clear. I continued to switch to the second camera, channel two. It pointed towards the driveway, then to the third, which looked down into the backyard. James thought it was awesome, Lucas just wanted to sleep and at this point, I was so tired that I really couldn't care less. James took control and switched through the channels, thinking he was some sort of security guard. Then, some static took a hold of channel two. Bluey, what was that? Bluey? It was just a bit of static. It happens sometimes for James. Fletcher at this point went next to Lucas, the both of them pretty much asleep on the queen's bed. I was in the single, making sure James didn't stuff up the setup on my desk. It was at this point where I got that feeling again. I desperately wanted to turn on the bedroom lights, but I didn't want to seem like a wuss. So instead, I leaned in closer, now watching each cam very carefully along with James. Fletcher, what are you doing? I'm trying to sleep. I turned around to see Lucas disgruntled and Fletcher no longer sleeping, but instead standing up on the bed. His ears were pricked up, 
he was slightly leaning forward, putting pressure on his front legs. Again, this is a common defence and or attack stance for a schnauzer. He started to growl. I was now fully alarmed. So was Lucas and James. Static had not taken over the camera system. Lucas put a chair up against the doorknob. James, get up and shut the blinds. James scrambled up from the office chair. Lucas grabbed one of the two chairs at my desk and quickly put it against the door. I sat down and rebooted the system, in quite a panic if I may add. After rebooting, there was no longer any static. I quickly put it onto channel three to look at the backyard. Sure enough, I could barely see the cockatoos flying and going wild in their cages. I muttered, oh no. Me saying this absolutely freaked the hell out of James and Lucas. They turned to a puddle of mush. Well, what's wrong, Bluey? Well, I'm pretty sure we're going to find out soon enough. Static no longer filled the camera system. No. Instead, the lenses started to fog up. I could no longer see out of channel three. Quick, quick, go to channel one. There's no point, James. They have all condensation on them. At this point, Lucas was very quiet until he said, Guys, someone just poked me. Lucas was on the queen bed. James was on the single and I was sitting in the office chair. James and I went into the Queen with Lucas. The three of us sat huddled. We grabbed Fletcher, still growling towards the door. The three of us watched the camera. We would see faint shadows moving around. I went to turn on the bedroom light. You guessed it, it wouldn't turn on. Then the camera went to static. I changed the channels, nothing, all was static. I rebooted it twice, nothing. Then a cackle was heard. I jumped back into the bed. The cackle went again. At this point, James was on the brink of tears. I felt another breath on the back of my neck. It sent spine tingling shivers throughout my body. Lucas peeked through the blinds. The window had conversation all over it, but that wasn't the problem. Lucas mumbled, oh my God. Written on the outside of the window was end. That window has nothing beneath it, except the ground which was three or four meters below. Lucas quickly crawled back from the window, back to the middle of the room. Fletcher stopped growling, but now instead was whimpering. Just as he started to whimper, we heard a single tap at the window. Then nothing. Fletcher quickly looked towards the door, and sure enough, we heard footsteps, slowly coming closer from the hallway. Then the footsteps stopped, right in front of the door. Silence for 10 seconds. Fletcher began to absolutely cry and for good reason. Three loud knocks were hit with a large amount of force on the door, then again silence. Until rapid tapping on the window took place, a rock then got thrown at the window, smashing it. We started to absolutely scream, moving the chair, trying to pull open the door. Then the same voice screamed in the room, you're wanting to leave so early, I'm that bad of a host. The door flung open, an inertia effect happened and we all fell flat onto the ground. We got up and ran screaming down the hallway. We bolted past a mirror that shattered as we went past it. My parents were now awake and as soon as they stepped outside of their room, it all stopped. James and Lucas went home early and thankfully we moved out of that house three days later. However, the next morning we saw the true aftermath. All three cameras had been ripped out. Only thing left were wires coming from the roof. We never found the cameras. The window had somehow been smashed and the two meter long mirror was in ruins. I never really found out who the spirit was, but he was definitely aggressive. The house wasn't too old. I think it was built in the 1940s from what I can remember. Both experiences were terrifying and I've never owned security cameras again due to the fear of what I may see on them. This took place over a few years in a farmhouse in the desert of Arizona. It was newly developed land. We moved into the place when I was 15. At the time, I was going through a lot emotionally and smoking a lot of weed. That might explain some of my personal experiences, so I'll try not to dwell on them too much. The house was set up almost plantation style. It was very wide and narrow, a big wraparound porch and lots of awkward corners. The front room was a tall library with an open balcony to the upstairs, 
which ran into long, skinny bedrooms. My parents' room was closest to the stairs and attached to a nursery with a sliding ensuite door. My brothers, two years younger, and my room were at the end of a dark hallway. That side of the house never got sun, so it was bad vibes all round. Downstairs, there was a fucked up Harry Potter style closet, a sunken living room, a kitchen in the centre of the house, and a sunken playroom for the baby. It honestly started the first day we moved in. My brother and I were the only ones in the house, unboxing plates. The place was so empty, everything echoed. I swear, it sounded like a little girl laughed, like a creepy track you could get off an app or something. Keep in mind, the TVs were not plugged in. We were on an acre of land far away from the dirt road, and my brother was way too stupid to pull a prank like that. I started hearing voices at night. This wasn't unusual. I honestly used to freak myself out so badly, I think I made up noises to scare myself. My parents had raised me not to talk about things scaring me, to tough it out and be a big girl. It was fine most of the time during the day. Everything came at night. I remember distinctly when it started messing with me in bed. In solidarity, my brother and I kept our bedroom doors open for the hallway's nightlight, and in case we needed to call for each other. We had a pretty fucked up childhood that might have contributed to all the codependency I'll describe during this. I was falling asleep, but not quite out. I felt the blanket slipping off the bed and reached down to grab it. This was common. I didn't have a bed frame with a foot. It kept slipping no matter how I tried to tuck it. In classic horror movie fashion, the last time I pulled it, I felt tension. There was nothing it could have been caught on. I feel like the second I went from confused to terrified, it bounced back to me. I don't know how to explain this well, but I was sure someone was under the bed pulling it from me. Later, I moved another nightlight into the bedroom. It was a kind of spooky amber orange and I convinced my parents to let me paint the walls cherry red. Again, I was almost asleep, but not quite asleep, so I don't think it could have been sleep paralysis. I heard the carpet rustle and maybe joints cracking. It sounded like my mom had come to check on me. I opened my eyes and immediately froze. I don't think I've ever been more scared in my life. There was a woman crawling across my floor, from the far side of my room to the foot of my bed. She was pale and stringy haired like she was going bald. I couldn't see her face. I don't know how I fell asleep. I couldn't scream or move. I think she disappeared under my bed. Again, this could be her hallucination. My baby brother was about seven months old when she started coming out during the day. My mum was a teacher at the time and was able to stay home with us during summer vacation. It was lunchtime. We were watching a movie quietly downstairs while the baby napped. There were noises upstairs like something dropped to the ground. We listened for a second before my mum ran up. She thought the baby had fallen out of his crib. We opened the door and found him asleep. There was some weird shit on the floor. It took us a while to figure out it was drywall or something. There was a crawl space to, to a small attic where the AC and insulation could be reached. It was barely big enough to get into, a good nine feet from the ground. It also had to be pushed up and slid over to open. There was a visible gap. The carpet was a really ugly dark blue, so we could see white fucking spots on the ground like something was dragged from one side of the room to where the crib was. It stopped right in front of it. My mum checked the closet and called my stepdad. He couldn't leave work, so we stayed downstairs until he got home and checked the crawl space. We, we have never had animals. It's really difficult for most things to live in Arizona, so wildlife is pretty rare in that area. He didn't find anything or signs of anything living up there. This happened every day for two weeks. We really didn't know what to make of it. My mom thought it would be the AC suctioning the opening up. It stopped and didn't happen again for two and a half years when my baby sister was born and stayed in the same crib. Again, it happened on and off for a few weeks and never again. The AC never popped the opening open again. To keep my own solo experiences brief, I had a period of three months where I straight up didn't sleep. I went crazy. 
Every night, I felt like my bed was shaking. The instant I laid my head dead, it would vibrate. The metal frame would sway. I'd feel like someone was pushing the mattress between the baseboards or sitting on the corner. I had my brother touch the frame one night to tell me if the shaking was in my head or not. He said it wasn't, but I'm not sure if he was just playing into it. I thought I might be having seizures or something. At one point, I got so frustrated I started sleeping on the couch downstairs with the dog. I started hearing whispers too. Not a noise that sounded odd, but someone calling my name. My name has three fucking syllables. I would be in my room, door open, doing something at night after my parents went to bed. It was a female voice, but it sounded off. I don't know how to explain it. The downstairs really scared me after the lights went out, so I never went down, but I did walk to the balcony to look down. I never saw anything, but the whispering would stop when I got close. My brother started hearing it too. He's kind of weird. His life dream has been enlisting in the army, so his reaction was always getting his knife and walking right downstairs to confront it. He'd turn on the lights and look around before coming back up. He slept on my floor a few nights because he was convinced she wanted me. We had prior haunting experiences, which led to my parents making jokes that the ghosts follow us. They didn't pay much attention to it at this time when it was quiet. One night, my parents went out with the babies. My brother and I were in our rooms, doors open per usual. We started hearing something weird. I thought it was the wind. It got louder until it was clear a woman was fucking wailing. I know it sounds crazy, but it was so clear. We hid in my room for what felt like hours calling my mom. For some reason, it didn't occur to us to call the police. The crying stopped. We had to plan to run for the stairs and out the nearest door. All of the lights were on in the house and my brother had his stupid knives. It's like it knew we were going to leave. We heard shuffling outside the door and maybe breathing. It could have been the air conditioning. We kind of decided that we were ready to die, unlocked the door and booked it. The crying started again and it was clear it was in my parents' room. We stood outside the property line for an hour, waiting for them to come home, watching the house. No one could have gotten out without us seeing. We had huge windows lining the upstairs hallway that showed everything with the lights on. My parents made fun of us and still do about that night. A few other incidents include my baby brother talking to the man upstairs. He'd stand in front of the balcony and talk up to someone. He told us the man was hiding in my room. He talked about the man in the window and would ask, who's that? Direct to the doors at night. I don't want to talk about all of it, but there were so many instances of voices, doors slamming, and things being knocked over in my room. I thought I was losing my mind. I moved out at 18 and come back occasionally, usually to babysit. Apparently, my reluctant believer mother and absolute skeptic stepdad watched a coffee pot jump off the counter. They also were sitting outside having a fire open evening when they saw a figure in the balcony window of their bedroom. It was a tall man, but my stepdad still needed urging to go upstairs. It appeared a second time, closer to where the nursery door was. My mom said she had horrible dreams about a man in the corner of her room after that. She was present for many of the times we heard footsteps upstairs, doors slamming when the AC was off, etc. But she always denied there being anything wrong. My parents left town with the kids for a week. At this point I was 19 and happily living an hour away. My mom begged me to check on my brother and stay a few nights for the weekend. I arrived during the evening after I got off of work. I asked how it had been alone. He said he was fine, he just didn't go upstairs at night and minded his business. He said if he ignored it and tried not to get scared, then it ignored him. He felt safe with the dog. We were watching YouTube and eating when we started to hear a deep noise. At first I thought it was a bike or one of the small buggies people drove out there. And I noticed it was holding a tune. It was humming. The dog had a weird thing about staring into the bathroom if the door was open, which was scary at night. This time... The door was closed and he still stood up and stared. The noise was so deep it sounded like it couldn't be human, but it was definitely melodic. There's nothing I could figure out to explain it. 
My brother and I just kind of looked at each other. Then a door slammed upstairs and we decided to fuck off and go on a walk. When we got back, I decided I would sleep in my parents' room. It didn't feel right to stay in the kids' room, but looking back, it would have been best to stay close to my brother. I fell asleep surprisingly easy. I guess about two hours passed before my brother slammed the door open. The house smelled like it was burning. Not really like a fire smell, but like a burning plastic and trash. I was panicked. I was the adult and didn't know what to do. We checked the house. I turned off the air conditioning thinking it might be on fire. We opened all the windows and fell asleep on the couches downstairs. The next day, the smell was still lingering but less overwhelming. The air conditioner was fine when I turned it back on. Like usual, the day was fine. The next night, my brother and I went on a jack-in-the-box run. It might have been taken 30 minutes. We arrived home to a mess of blood, vomit and shit. The dog was sick all over the living room. We immediately took him to an emergency vet, certain he was dying. They checked him for everything they could and gave him a clean bill. When we got home, all hell broke loose. My brother and I were cleaning up the mess with the doors open for airflow. There was absolutely insane banging noises from upstairs. We hadn't locked up on the way out. My brother thought someone had snuck in and was trashing the upstairs. We went up to check and I hung downstairs ready to call the police. Nothing happened. Nothing even seemed out of place. We kept cleaning but the noises started almost immediately. It kind of sounded like someone was shouting behind a wall of cement. I couldn't tell the gender. My brother told me he had been fine until I got there. I could leave if I wanted. I totally did. And I didn't go back. My parents sold the house this year. During the interim of the move, they stayed in an Airbnb. My brother lived really close to his work, so he stayed in the house with the dog for a few weeks. This story is just his own, so I'm still not sure if I believe it. He's kind of weird, but not one to embellish. He had been hearing the usual things, even his name being called in the night, but had ignored it all. His friends had been coming over to sleep, keep him company. The last day he was supposed to finish moving, he brought a friend. He says he felt they were being watched the whole time they cleared the place out, and his friend left him to lock up. They got into the car facing the house when they noticed the blinds were open. They were definitely closed on the way out. His friend claims he saw them open from the side of his eye. My brother says there was a woman squatting in front of a downstairs window, close to where he had just left from. She was pale, her nose was hooked, and her hair was black and stringy. Again, classic horror movie ghost. He said she had black eyes with visible white dots in the middle, inside out eyes as he called them, as she was smiling. He says it took him a second of shock to realise she was looking right at him. He felt sick like she could walk right out and get him. The burned rubber when his friends snapped out of it and they screamed at each other all the way down the road about what they saw. He called me right after to explain it, but I was with friends and not really willing to listen. What fucks me up is that my mom thought he had a psychotic break. He went into his room and cried all night at the Airbnb. She thought something happened with his girlfriend. My brother isn't a crier. I haven't seen him do it since we were little. When we got together and talked about it, his eyes teared up then too. He said he didn't know why, but he knew she wanted to kill him. He drew a picture of her. Let me know if you're interested in seeing it. It's not great, but it still fills me with the deepest foreboding. It took me a while to realise that I saw her too. Just once in my bedroom almost five years ago. Seeing her suddenly made sense. I knew it didn't feel like a woman, but it felt feminine. It felt like something pretending to be a woman. Anyways, I know this is long. Feel free to offer your opinion. My ex brought this up today. We dated all through high school and had a few experiences together that she recounts as her only paranormal encounters. I'd love to still think that this was my own delusion, but it was shared by too many people to be. Maybe a few things are explainable, but most of it isn't. It's affected me so deeply, I'm still terrified that if I think too much about her, she'll follow us a state away. I also forgot to mention we heard word from neighbours that the previous family had 12 people, Mormons, living in a house we could only fit six into. 
They were really weird, according to multiple families, and they moved in with five kids and left with four. We heard a toddler drowned in the upstairs bathtub. No idea which one or if this is true. We couldn't find any documentation. I wasn't raised in a religious family. I like to think of myself as an analytical person and try to rely on evidence for most of my beliefs. Growing up in Midwestern Michigan, there was a time in my adolescence that I'm sure many people experienced. A time when I was looking for some place to belong. While many teenagers drive their parents nuts by surrounding themselves with drinking and drugs, my rebellion was in the form of a church in my hometown. We had a pretty robust youth group and they accepted me quickly. It was a safe place, a community that acted like a family I could confide in. I threw myself into it and spent a few years being embroiled in everything they did. So much so that my parents questioned whether I was involved in a cult. The prolonged encounter with the church was an important step along my personal development and would also become the catalyst for one of the most frightening moments of my life. This was during a mission trip that we took to Sarasota, Florida in the summer of 1997. Sarasota is a small city with a population of a little more than 50,000 people. The city was very socio-economically divided, being populated by the very rich and the very poor. The mission trip was located at a modest Baptist church within the city. The purpose was to conduct a vacation Bible school, VBS, for the children that lived in the neighborhood, mostly economically disadvantaged youth. I knew nothing else about the church. We were given no information about the congregation or beliefs ahead of time. The only background provided was that our youth pastor, David, made contact with this small church and agreed to donate our time to help coordinate this VBS program. I was relatively close with several of the people on the trip. However, we were joined by a student who was not part of our youth group named Alvin. I do not remember exactly why he came, as I was never close to him, but I remember being told that Al's mother wanted him to be a Christian, in contrast to that Asian American heritage, an idea at the time that he seemed to be disinterested in. A dry, straight-laced young man, he was almost an opposite personality of my friends and me, largely immature, outgoing goof-offs looking for attention. Nevertheless, he attended the trip with the rest of us. We all loaded onto the bus and headed south. We arrived in Sarasota, got to work, and the first part of the trip was pretty uneventful. Nothing seemed unusual. We worked, teaching certain classes ranging in topics that a normal, non-denominational Christian Sunday school would usually teach. It wasn't until the last couple of days of the trip that things started going off the rails. Close to dusk, the second to the last day of our trip, our group was outside playing kickball with the children while we waited for their parents to pick them up. It was a hot summer's day in Florida, so many of us Michigan kids were not used to the humid, hot evenings that followed. I decided to go into the church to get a drink and cool down, escaping the large number of gnats that constantly accosted me whenever I stepped outside. The church itself was made out of white plaster, a common style in Florida. The exterior was peeling, but the inside seemed to have been cared for meticulously. The dark green carpet was everywhere except for the chapel, which itself was burgundy with gold designs. The building of the church was just shaped like a T. You entered the double doors at the bottom of the T. The long hallway had an extended mirror that was attached to one wall, and a sitting bench was on the other. There was wood bedboard type panelling that went halfway up the wall to the mirror. As you continued down the hall at the T-junction, you could take a left and walk into the chapel, or you could go right and walk into a large dining room that was filled with tables. I walked through the doors at the bottom of the T, and as teenagers are wont to do, I glanced at the mirror to check my own reflection, check the outfit, the hair, the overall appearance. Adolescence is a vain time. Anyway, as I looked in the mirror, I saw Alvin sitting on the bench opposite the mirror, just looking at me. I quickly questioned what he was doing inside, away from everyone. Hey Al, what are you doing man? Don't like kick... And then, 
as I'm saying it, interrupting my sentence. He smiled in what felt like a disingenuous, menacing simper. He then raised his hand, forming a gun-shaped hand gesture, and winked while pointing at me, clicking his tongue to make a sound, acting in a way that seemed uncharacteristic for who I knew Alvin to be. I chuckled and turned away from the mirror to speak to him. As I did that, I realised there was no one there. I looked back at the mirror to confirm what I was alone in the hallway. I didn't understand. I didn't just see him out of the corner of my eye. I mean, at first I did. But I then looked right at him into his eyes, with the mirror simply as a conduit. I heard the sound of his tongue making what would soon be a familiar clicking sound. When the image of Al disappeared, the fright washed over me in what seemed to be a similar to a panic attack. A tingling that transformed my warm body into a shaky, nervous husk of who I usually was. I ran outside and grabbed the first person I came in contact with, my friend Ronnie. Ronnie and I were not extremely close, but we had fun together because we were both outgoing, obnoxious, overconfident males that focused more on fun than on the purpose of our visit. When I approached him, I immediately saw in his eyes that he knew something was wrong. Dude, I don't know what's happening. I just saw something super weird. I feel like I'm losing my mind. What happened? Ronnie asked, starting to smile with some humour at how freaked out I seemed. I don't... I just... I walked inside and looked in the mirror to see Al just sitting there, smiling at me. But it wasn't Al. It looked like him, but when I started talking to him, he just stared at me and made this gesture. At this point, I showed him the finger-pointing, winking gesture. Something about the way I recreated the look seemed to take the smile from Ronnie's face. When I started talking to him and I turned to continue the conversation, Al wasn't there. As if we were thinking the exact same thing, we turned to look and find where Alvin was at the moment. Our eyes scanned the crowd in opposite directions, both arriving at the same point where Al sat, watching the kickball game. He wasn't partaking, as I remember him to be a sober, pensive kid, not the kickball type, and definitely not one who would have given me some weird pointing gesture while winking. Al is all the way over there, so what was it? A ghost? Like a demon or something? Ronnie asked, shocked. Dude, how the crap should I know? We spoke in a very strange surfer-like dialect for two mid-Michigan boys. I then saw this look of what seemed to be an understanding wash over Ronnie's face. Like it all made sense to him. He said, you know what? This is right. This is Satan. He's trying to distract you from doing God's work. He has no power here. Let's go tell him. I followed Ronnie into the church, like we were on some mission. It was empty again, but I felt this cold, uneasy feeling as soon as we stepped inside. As I stepped, it was the middle of summer in Florida, and we were inside an old church with a barely functioning AC unit, but I remember instantly being chilled. And Ronnie starts yelling, Hey Satan, you ain't got nothing on us. Bring it, you can't stop us. What you got? Did I mention we were overconfident? We waited in silence for what seemed like an eternity, but was probably only 30 seconds. Nothing happened. We looked at each other, seeing what seemed to be a creeped out factor showing on each of our faces. We paused for a split second, then began laughing out loud at the ridiculousness of the situation. Maybe I just overreacted. Dramatic teenagers and whatnot. The evening ended after the last adult arrived to pick up their child. My youth group and I loaded the bus and headed back to the condo that we had rented. It was dark by this time and I had calmed down a bit, momentarily forgetting what happened. The bus ride took some time, so I usually would just sit there looking out the window at the landscape that were unusual to me, a boy from the north. We drove along the coast passing interesting architecture surrounded by unfamiliar foliage, common to the Florida ecosystem. As we rode, I looked out the window and saw a person sitting on a large stone sign for a different church, a Roman Catholic cathedral. I squinted to see him, as I was curious what the character was doing sitting on such a fancy-looking stone slab sign. 
As the bus got closer and closer, to my growing fright, I started to realise that the person sitting on the slab was someone I knew. That person was Alvin. He was sitting on the sign, looking down at his feet as he kicked them, resembling that of a much younger boy. As we passed him, Alvin sitting on the sign, he looked up from his feet and looked directly at me. His eyes were not Alvin's eyes, they were different. Another older, wiser man's eyes, piercing through the notion and distance. He looked at me and smirked with that menacing, threatening grin. As we began to pass, I turned my head to look to the front of the bus. Just a few seats ahead of me, Al sat, quietly doing what I had been doing a few moments before, looking at the water. I looked back out the window as we passed. The other Alvin raised his hand into the familiar gun-pointing gesture and pointed at me. What was even more strange? I could hear the clicking sound in my head, and I'm not sure how to explain this, but it wasn't coming from me. It wasn't my common inner monologue voice. It was something else. He winked. For the lack of a better phrase, I began to freak out. I shouted and drew attention from some of my friends, my assistant youth pastor Jason, and my pastor David. I remember thinking that I was losing my mind. The intensity of faux Alvin's eyes and the click of his tongue playing on repeat in my brain, and no one seemed to understand my panic. David said we would talk about once we got settled back at our condo. And I should just take a breath. We arrived at the condo. It was lavish accommodations to a small down kid, causing me to wonder how one would arrange payment for such a place, especially for a gaggle of teenagers. It had tall vaulted ceilings and the decor was designed in the early 90s, so it was fitted with brass lightning fixtures and lightly stained oak finishings. Exiting the bus, my knees were shaky. A fog of embarrassment settled over me as other kids gazed with an obvious wonder that only children with a lack of decorum would show. My youth pastors took me into the back bedroom, away from the kids, giving me a pint of Hagen dars coffee ice cream that assisted in calming my nerves. Once settled, they proceeded to talk to me about what they thought was happening. David gave his version of what he believed was transpiring. There's a war happening. A war between heaven and hell, where angels and demons are in a battle for the souls and sanity of God's followers, David shared. And what you and Ronnie did was incredibly stupid. You challenged Satan to a battle that you cannot win. He's too powerful. That was his foothold. You need to be more careful. This did very little to calm my nerves. It seemed uncharacteristically morose of David to be that blunt, especially with a de teenager. He continued. Do not do that again. If you keep doing the right thing, God will protect you. But you cannot tell anyone else that this happened. It spreads fear that Satan thrives on. Being a native young Christian at the time, I believed him. I thought that this war could seem possible, but I also trusted a mentor that I shouldn't share my story. And I followed, and I would follow that advice for years. I went to bed early that night, trying to move past this experience. Alvin's face and the clicking gesture continuing to haunt my thoughts. It didn't work. The next day was our last day at the church. We were done coordinating the VBS program, but the leaders of the church wanted to treat us to a dinner as a way of saying thanks. I didn't think about it at the time, but it was very strange that we hadn't met the pastor or the church until this dinner. Beforehand, we had picked up all of our belongings and were prepared to leave once we finished dinner. We all sat on the east side of the church, in the dining area with all the tables eating the spaghetti dinner that they had provided us. It was a happy scene. I looked around at everyone enjoying the meal, laughing and joking around the tables. Suddenly, the back door of the church opened, and a, and a cold gust of wind rushed past me, bizarre for a Florida summer afternoon, followed by the entrance of a tall, elderly man and two slightly younger women behind him. As with all members of the youth group, I had never met this man before. He was introduced to us as the pastor, but none of us recall ever re hearing his name or last name. All I could focus on was his eyes. 
They seemed familiar to me, although I couldn't place them. They weren't kind eyes, although I couldn't articulate that in my mind at the time. He spoke a short sentence or two of thanks to the group, and then proceeded to move past the tables, sharing short statements of small talk, referring to my friends as guy, ladies, or, in the case of Ronnie, young man. As he slowly approached me, I continued to eat spaghetti because free food. The pasta moved deliberately behind me until I could feel his bony hand touch my right shoulder. I turned around to look and saw the pasta glaring straight into my eyes. Not a polite stranger's glance, but a deep, disturbing stare. Those eyes. I'd seen them before. He took his hand off my shoulder and spoke. Hey, how's it going? Something was wrong, and it was immediately obvious to me. No one had met this pastor. He didn't know any of us from Adam, and he referred to everyone as such, with generic titles like son and darling. But he knew my name. He looked at me like he knew me, and then he did it. He smiled in that familiar, menacing way, lifted his hand and made the pointing gesture while winking. He closed it out with the tongue clicking sound. I shot up, backed up quickly, clambering from my footing as I knocked over some empty chairs and ran out of the dining hall. I ran to the adjacent chapel and did the only thing that came to my mind at that moment, sat in a pew and cried. My pastor and my pastor's wife, Kathy, followed me shortly after. I expected to hear their voice of reassurance, the kind people that had been me mentors to me for years. This is not what followed. What are you doing, P? That was the rudest thing I've ever seen. What's wrong with you, David shouted. You're acting like a baby, Kathy exclaimed. This was extremely uncharacteristic of both of them, so I knew something was wrong. They were usually very calm, kind people in public. So I ran from them. I ran out of the chapel, down the long hallway, past the mirror where I had originally seen who I thought was Alvin, and out of the front doors. Followed directly after me, Kathy stepped out of the door before the door even closed. I turned to see her express transform, from angry hunter to concerned care caregiver. What's wrong, honey? Why are you crying? I knew immediately why the anger left her. She had left the church. She was outside. Something was wrong with that place. After discussing what I felt had happened, I never went to that church again. I waited outside for the rest of my group to finish eating. Afterwards, David, with a small group of us, did some weird type of ritual where he anointed the church and its door with oil. He read some scriptures that were unfamiliar to me and we boarded the bus and left. I haven't spoken with David or Kathy in decades, but directly after this happened, Kathy, while coming short of saying I was lying, disagrees with the sequence of events. She seems to believe that she heard me making a ruckus outside, so she followed me directly out there, concerned for my well-being. David remembers being angry at me, and while he seemed more docile out of the building, he seemed to treat me differently afterwards. The church itself seems to have been disbanded. I cannot find any mention of the church on the internet, and members of the youth group that I have kept in touch with have gone to Sarasota and not been able to find the location. Even though we took the same route several times a day, one particular friend said there's just a field where the building used to be, as if this experience had never happened. Because David had told me that I shouldn't talk about what had happened, I didn't discuss this experience with any of my church friends, at least not for a long while. A few years later, I spoke about these events with friends. I made also at the church. And my story is often met with a mixture of interest and skepticism that I often would experience this phenomenon. I have since left the church and personally have arrived at a certain level of agnosticism. I like to think that I do not believe in ghosts or demons, but I also cannot deny that which happened to me in the summer of 97. I don't have an explanation and there are too many things that do not make sense. I hope that I just had a mental break of some sort because the alternative is much more frightening.